The story of philosophy. The lives and opinions of the greater philosophers. By Will Durant. An adult brain audiobook production. Read by Graham Dunlop. Chapter 1. Plato. 1. The Context of Plato. If you look at a map of Europe, you will observe that Greece is a skeleton-like hand stretching its crooked fingers out into the Mediterranean Sea. South of it lies the great island of Crete, from which those grasping fingers captured, in the second millennium before Christ, the beginnings of civilization and culture. To the east, across the Aegean Sea, lies Asia Minor, quiet and apathetic now but throbbing in pre-Platonic days with industry, commerce, and speculation. To the west, across the Ionian, Italy stands, like a leaning tower in the sea, and Sicily and Spain, each in those days with thriving Greek colonies. And at the end, the pillars of Hercules, which we call Gibraltar, that somber portal through which no ancient mariner dared to pass. And on the north, those still untamed and half-barbaric regions, then named Thessaly and Epirus and Macedonia, from which or through which the vigorous bands had come which fathered the geniuses of Homeric and Periclean Greece. Look again at the map, and you see countless indentations of coast and elevations of land, everywhere gulfs and bays and the intrusive sea, and all the earth tumbled and tossed into mountains and hills. Greece was broken into isolated fragments by these natural barriers of sea and soil. Travel and communication were far more difficult and dangerous then than now. Every valley, therefore, developed its own self-sufficient economic life, its own sovereign government, its own institutions and dialect and religion and culture. In each case, one or two cities and around them, stretching up the mountain slopes and agricultural hinterland, such were the city-states of Euboea and Locris and Aetolia and Phocis and Boeotia and Achaea, and Argolis, and Elis, and Arcadia, and Messenia, and Laconia, with its Sparta, and Attica, with its Athens. Look at the map of last time, and observe the position of Athens. It is the farthest east of the larger cities of Greece. It was favorably placed to be the door through which the Greeks passed out to the busy cities of Asia Minor and through which those elder cities sent their luxuries and their culture to adolescent Greece. It had an admirable port, Piraeus, where countless vessels might find a haven from the rough waters of the sea. And it had a great maritime fleet. In 490 to 470 BC, Sparta and Athens, forgetting their jealousies and joining their forces, fought off the effort of the Persians under Darius and Xerxes, to turn Greece into a colony of the Asiatic Empire. In this struggle of youthful Europe against the senile East, Sparta provided the army and Athens the navy. The war over, Sparta demobilized her troops and suffered the economic disturbances natural to that process, while Athens turned her navy into a merchant fleet and became one of the greatest trading cities of the ancient world. Sparta relapsed into agricultural seclusion and stagnation while Athens became a busy mart and port, the meeting place of many races of men and of diverse cults and customs, whose contact and rivalry begot comparison, analysis, and thought. Traditions and dogmas rub one another down to a minimum in such centers of varied intercourse. Where there are a thousand faiths, we are apt to become skeptical of them all. Probably the traders were the first skeptics. They had seen too much to believe too much and the general disposition of merchants to classify all men as either fools or knaves incline them to question every creed. Gradually, too, they were developing science. Mathematics grew with the increasing complexity of exchange. Astronomy with the increasing audacity of navigation. The growth of wealth brought the leisure and security which are the prerequisite of research and speculation. Men now ask the stars not only for guidance on the seas, but as well for an answer to the riddles of the universe. The first Greek philosophers were astronomers, proud of their achievements, 
says Aristotle. Men pushed farther afield after the Persian Wars. They took all knowledge for their province and sought ever wider studies. Men grew bold enough to attempt natural explanations of processes and events before attributed to supernatural agencies and powers. Magic and ritual slowly gave way to science and control, and philosophy began. At first, this philosophy was physical. It looked out upon the material world and asked, what was the final and irreducible constituent of things? The natural termination of this line of thought was the materialism of Democritus, 460 to 360 BC. In reality, there is nothing but atoms and space. This was one of the main streams of Greek speculation. It passed underground for a time in Plato's day, but emerged in Epicurus, 342 to 270, and became a torrent of eloquence in Lucretius, 98 to 55 BC. But the most characteristic and fertile developments of Greek philosophy took form with the sophists, traveling teachers of wisdom who looked within upon their own thought and nature rather than out upon the world of things. They were all clever men, Georgias and Hippias, for example, and many of them were profound, Protagoras, Prodicus. There was hardly a problem or a solution in our current philosophy of mind and conduct which they did not realize and discuss. They asked questions about anything. They stood unafraid in the presence of religious or political taboos and boldly subpoenaed every creed and institution to appear before the judgment seat of reason. In politics, they divided into two schools. One, like Rousseau, argued that nature is good and civilization bad that by nature all men are equal, becoming unequal only by class-made institutions, and that law is an invention of the strong to chain and rule the weak. Another school, like Nietzsche, claimed that nature is beyond good and evil, that by nature all men are unequal, that morality is an invention of the weak to limit and deter the strong, that power is the supreme virtue and the supreme desire of man and that all forms of government, the wisest and the most natural, is aristocracy. No doubt this attack on democracy reflected the rise of a wealthy minority at Athens which called itself the oligarchical party, and denounced democracy as an incompetent sham. In a sense, there was not much democracy to denounce. For of the 400,000 inhabitants of Athens, 250,000 were slaves, without political rights of any kind. And of the 150,000 free men or citizens, only a small number presented themselves at the Ecclesia, or General Assembly, where the policies of the state were discussed and determined. Yet what democracy they had was as thorough as never since. The General Assembly was the supreme power, and the highest official body, the Dicasteria, or Supreme Court, consisted of over a thousand members to make bribery expensive selected by alphabetical road from the roll of all the citizens. No institution could have been more democratic, nor, said its opponents, more absurd. During the great generation-long Peloponnesian War, 430 to 400 BC, in which the military power of Sparta fought and at last defeated the naval power of Athens, the Athenian oligarchic party, led by Critias, advocated the abandonment of democracy on the score of its inefficiency in war and secretly lauded the aristocratic government of Sparta. Many of the oligarchic leaders were exiled, but when at last Athens surrendered, one of the peace conditions imposed by Sparta was the recall of these exiled aristocrats. They had hardly returned when, with Critias at their head, they declared a rich man's revolution against the Democratic Party that had ruled during the disastrous war. The revolution failed, and Critias was killed on the field of battle. Now, Critias was a pupil of Socrates and an uncle of Plato. 2. Socrates If we may judge from the bust that has come down to us as part of the ruins of ancient sculpture, Socrates was as far from being handsome as even a philosopher can be. A bald head, a great round face, deep-set, staring eyes, a broad and flowery nose that gave vivid testimony to many a symposium. 
it was rather the head of a porter than that of the most famous of philosophers. But if we look again, we see, through the crudity of the stone, something of that human kindliness and unassuming simplicity which made this homely thinker a teacher beloved of the finest youths in Athens. We know so little about him, and yet we know him so much more intimately than the aristocratic Plato or the reserved and scholarly Aristotle. Across 2,300 years we can yet see his ungainly figure, clad always in the same rumpled tunic walking leisurely through the agora, undisturbed by the bedlam of politics, buttonholing his prey, gathering the young and the learned about him, luring them into some shady nook of the temple porticos and asking them to define their terms. They were a motley crowd, these youths who flocked about him and helped him to create European philosophy. There were rich young men like Plato and Alcibiades who relished his satirical analysis of Athenian democracy. There were socialists like Antisthenes who liked the master's careless poverty and made a religion of it. There was even an anarchist or two among them, like Aristippus, who aspired to a world in which there would be neither masters nor slaves and all would be as worrylessly free as Socrates. All the problems that agitate human society today and provide the material of youth's endless debate, agitated as well that little band of thinkers and talkers, who felt, with their teacher, that life without discourse would be unworthy of a man. Every school of social thought had there its representative, and perhaps its origin. How the master lived hardly anybody knew. He never worked, and he took no thought of the morrow. He ate when his disciples asked him to honor their tables. They must have liked his company, for he gave every indication of physiological prosperity. He was not so welcome at home, for he neglected his wife and children. And from Xanthope's point of view, he was a good-for-nothing idler who brought to his family more notoriety than bread. Xanthope liked to talk almost as much as Socrates did, and they seemed to have had some dialogues which Plato failed to record. Yet she too loved him and could not contentedly see him die, even after threescore years and ten. Why did his pupils reverence him so? Perhaps because he was a man as well as a philosopher. He had, at great risk, saved the life of Alcibiades in battle, and he could drink like a gentleman, without fear and without excess. But no doubt they liked best in him the modesty of his wisdom. He did not claim to have wisdom, but only to seek it lovingly. He was wisdom's amateur, not its professional. It was said that the oracle at Delphi, with unusual good sense, had pronounced him the wisest of the Greeks, and he had interpreted this as an approval of the agnosticism which was the starting point of his philosophy. One thing only I know, and that is that I know nothing. Philosophy begins when one learns to doubt, particularly to doubt one's cherished beliefs one's dogmas and one's axioms. Who knows how these cherished beliefs became certainties with us, and whether some secret wish did not furtively beget them, clothing desire in the dress of thought. There is no real philosophy until the mind turns round and examines itself. Know thee, Siotan, said Socrates. Know thyself. There had been philosophers before him, of course, strong men like Thales and Heraclitus, Subtle men like Parmenides and Zeno of Elia, seers like Pythagoras and Empedocles. But for the most part, they had been physical philosophers. They had sought for the physis or nature of external things, the laws and constituents of the material and measurable world. That is very good, said Socrates, but there is an infinitely worthier subject for philosophers than all these trees and stones and even all those stars, there is the mind of man. What is man, and what can he become? So he went about prying into the human soul, uncovering assumptions and questioning certainties. If men discoursed too readily of justice, he asked them quietly, Toti, what is it? What do you mean by these abstract words with which you so easily settle the problems of life and death? What do you mean by honor, virtue, morality, patriotism? What do you mean by yourself? It was with such moral and psychological questions that Socrates loved to deal. Some who suffered from this Socratic method, 
this demand for accurate definitions and clear thinking and exact analysis, objected that he asked more than he answered, and left men's minds more confused than before. Nevertheless, he bequeathed to philosophy two very definite answers to two of our most difficult problems. What is the meaning of virtue, and what is the best state? No topics could have been more vital than these to the young Athenians of that generation. The sophists had destroyed the faith these youths had once had in the gods and goddesses of Olympus, and in the moral code that had taken its sanction so largely from the fear men had for these ubiquitous and innumerable deities. Apparently, there was no reason now why a man should not do as he pleased so long as he remained within the law. A disintegrating individualism had weakened the Athenian character and left the city a prey at last to the sternly nurtured Spartans. And as for the state, what could have been more ridiculous than this mob-led, passion-ridden democracy, this government by a debating society? this precipitate selection and dismissal and execution of generals, this unchoice choice of simple farmers and tradesmen, an alphabetical rotation as members of the Supreme Court of the land. How could a new and natural morality be developed in Athens, and how could the state be saved? It was his reply to these questions that gave Socrates death and immortality. The older citizens would have honored him had he tried to restore the ancient polytheistic faith if he had led his band of emancipated souls to the temples and the sacred groves and bade them sacrifice again to the gods of their fathers. But he felt that that was a hopeless and suicidal policy, a progress backward, into and not over the tombs. He had his own religious faith. He believed in one god and hoped in his modest way that death would not quite destroy him. But he knew that a lasting moral code could not be based upon so uncertain a theology. Note, Voltaire's story of the two Athenians conversing about Socrates, that is the atheist who says there is only one God, philosophical dictionary, art, Socrates. If one could build a system of morality absolutely independent of religious doctrine, as valid for the atheist as for the pietist, then theologies might come and go without loosening the moral cement that makes of willful individuals the peaceful citizens of a community. If, for example, good meant intelligent and virtue meant wisdom, if men could be taught to see clearly their real interests, to see afar the distant results of their deeds, to criticize and coordinate their desires out of a self-canceling chaos into a purposive and creative harmony, this, perhaps, would provide for the educated and sophisticated man the morality, which in the unlettered relies on reiterated precepts and external control. Perhaps all sin is error, partial vision, foolishness. The intelligent man may have the same violent and unsocial impulses as the ignorant man, but surely he will control them better and slip less often into imitation of the beast. And in an intelligently administered society, one that returned to the individual in widened powers, more than it took from him in restricted liberty, the advantage of every man would lie in social and loyal conduct, and only clear sight would be needed to ensure peace and order and goodwill. But if the government itself is a chaos and an absurdity, if it rules without helping and commands without leading, how can we persuade the individual in such a state to obey the laws and confine his self-seeking within the circle of the total good. No wonder an Alcibiades turns against a state that distrusts ability and reverences number more than knowledge. No wonder there is chaos where there is no thought, and the crowd decides in haste and ignorance to repent at leisure and in desolation. Is it not a base superstition that mere numbers will give wisdom? On the contrary, is it not universally seen that men in crowds are more foolish and more violent and more cruel than men separate and alone? Is it not shameful that men should be ruled by orators who go ringing on in long harangues like brazen pots which, when struck, continue to sound till a hand is put upon them? Surely the management of a state is a matter for which men cannot be too intelligent, a matter that needs the unhindered thought of the finest minds. How can a society be saved or be strong except it be led by its wisest men? 
Imagine the reaction of the popular party at Athens to this aristocratic gospel at a time when war seemed to require the silencing of all criticism, and when the wealthy and lettered minority were plotting a revolution. Consider the feelings of Anatus, the democratic leader whose son had become a pupil of Socrates, and had then turned against the gods of his father and laughed in his father's face. Had not Aristophanes predicted precisely such a result from this specious replacement of the old virtues by unsocial intelligence? Note In the clouds, 423 BC, Aristophanes had made great fun of Socrates and his thinking shop, where one learned the art of proving one's self right, however wrong. Pheidippides beats his father on the ground that his father used to beat him and every debt should be repaid. The satire seems to have been good-natured enough. We find Aristophanes frequently in the company of Socrates. They agreed in their scorn of democracy, and Plato recommended the clouds to Dionysius. As the play was brought out twenty-four years before the trial of Socrates, it could have had no great share in bringing the tragic denouement of the philosopher's life. Then the revolution came, and men fought for it and against, bitterly and to the death. When the democracy won, the fate of Socrates was decided. He was the intellectual leader of the revolting party. However pacific he might himself have been, he was the source of the hated aristocratic philosophy. He was the corrupter of youths drunk with debate. It would be better, said Anatus and Miletus, that Socrates should die. The rest of the story all the world knows, for Plato wrote it down in prose more beautiful than poetry. We are privileged to read for ourselves that simple and courageous, if not legendary, apology or defense in which the first martyr of philosophy proclaimed the rights and necessity of free thought, upheld his value to the state, and refused to beg for mercy from the crowd whom he had always contemned. They had the power to pardon him. He disdained to make the appeal. It was a singular confirmation of his theories, that the judges should wish to let him go while the angry crowd voted for his death. Had he not denied the gods? Woe to him who teaches men faster than they can learn. So they decreed that he should drink the hemlock. His friends came to his prison and offered him an easy escape. They had bribed all the officials who stood between him and liberty. He refused. He was seventy years old now, 399 B.C., Perhaps he thought it was time for him to die, and that he could never again die so usefully. Be of good cheer, he told his sorrowing friends, and say that you are burying my body only. When he had spoken these words, said Plato in one of the great passages of the world's literature, he arose and went into the bath chamber with Crito, who bade us wait. And we waited, talking and thinking of the greatness of our sorrow. He was like a father of whom we were being bereaved, and we were about to pass the rest of our lives as orphans. Now the hour of sunset was near, for a good deal of time had passed while he was within. When he came out, he sat down with us again, but not much was said. Soon the jailer entered and stood by him, saying, To you, Socrates, whom I know to be the noblest and gentlest and best of all who ever came to this place, I will not impute the angry feelings of other men who rage and swear at me when, in obedience to the authorities, I bid them drink the poison. Indeed, I am sure that you will not be angry with me, for others, as you are aware, and not I, are the guilty cause. And so fare you well, and try to bear lightly what must needs be. You know my errand. Then, bursting into tears, he turned away and went out. Socrates looked at him and said, I return your good wishes and will do as you bid. Then, turning to us, he said, How charming the man is. Since I've been in prison, he has always been coming to see me, and now see how generously he sorrows for me. But we must do as he says, Crito. Let the cup be brought if the poison is prepared. If not, let the attendant prepare some. Yet, said Crito, the sun is still upon the hilltops, and many a one has taken the draft late, and after the announcement has been made to him, he has eaten and drunk and indulged in sensual delights. Do not hasten, then. There is still time. Socrates said, Yes, Crito, 
and they of whom you speak are right in doing this, for they think that they will gain by the delay. But I am right in not doing thus, for I do not think that I should gain anything by drinking the poison a little later. I should be sparing and saving a life which is already gone. I could only laugh at myself for this. Please then to do as I say and not to refuse me. Crito, when he heard this, made a sign to the servant, and the servant went in and remained for some time and then returned with the jailer carrying the cup of poison. Socrates said, You, my good friend, who are experienced in these matters, shall give me directions how I am to proceed. The man answered, you have only to walk about until your legs are heavy, and then to lie down, and the poison will act. At the same time he handed the cup to Socrates, who in the easiest and gentlest manner, without the least fear or change of color or feature, looking at the man with all his eyes, as his manner was, took the cup and said, What do you say about making a libation out of this cup to any god? May I or not? The man answered, we only prepare, Socrates, just so much as we deem enough. I understand, he said. Yet I may and must pray to the gods to prosper my journey from this to that other world. May this, then, which is my prayer, be granted to me. Then, holding the cup to his lips, quite readily and cheerfully, he drank the poison. And hitherto most of us have been able to control our sorrow. But now when we saw him drinking and saw too that he had finished the draft, we could no longer forbear, and in spite of myself my own tears were flowing fast, so that I covered my face and wept over myself, for certainly I was not weeping over him, but at the thought of my own calamity in having lost such a companion. Nor was I the first, for Crito, when he found himself unable to restrain his tears, had got up and moved away, and I followed. And at that moment, Apollodorus, who had been weeping all the time, broke out into a loud cry, which made cowards of us all. Socrates alone retained his calmness. What is this strange outcry? he said. I sent away the women, mainly in order that they might not offend in this way, for I have heard that a man should die in peace. Be quiet then, and have patience. When we heard that, we were ashamed and restrained our tears and he walked about until, as he said, his legs began to fail, and then he lay on his back according to the directions, and the man who gave him the poison now and then looked at his feet and legs, and after a while he pressed his foot hard and asked him if he could feel, and he said no, and then his leg, and so upwards and upwards, and showed us that he was cold and stiff, and then Socrates felt them himself and said, when the poison reaches the heart, that will be the end. He was beginning to grow cold about the groin when he uncovered his face, for he had covered himself up and said, They were his last words. Crito, I owe a cock to Asclepius. Will you remember to pay that debt? The debt shall be paid, said Crito. Is there anything else? There was no answer to this question, but in a minute or two a movement was heard, and the attendant uncovered him. His eyes were set, and Crito closed his eyes and mouth. Such was the end of our friend, whom I may truly call the wisest, the justest, and the best of all the men whom I have ever known. 3. The Preparation of Plato Plato's meeting with Socrates had been a turning point in his life. He had been brought up in comfort and perhaps in wealth. He was a handsome and vigorous youth, called Plato, it is said, because of the breadth of his shoulders. He had excelled as a soldier and had twice won prizes at the Isthmian Games. Philosophers are not apt to develop out of such an adolescence. But Plato's subtle soul had found a new joy in the dialectic game of Socrates. It was a delight to behold the master deflating dogmas and puncturing presumptions with the sharp point of his questions. Plato entered into his sport as he had in a coarser kind of wrestling, and under the guidance of the old gadfly, as Socrates called himself, he passed from mere debate to careful analysis and fruitful discussion. He became a very passionate lover of wisdom and of his teacher. I thank God, he used to say, that I was born Greek and not barbarian, 
free man and not slave, man and not woman, but above all that I was born in the age of Socrates. He was twenty-eight when the master died, and this tragic end of a quiet life left its mark on every phase of the pupil's thought. It filled him with such a scorn of democracy, such a hatred of the mob, as even his aristocratic lineage and breeding had hardly engendered in him. It led him to a catonic resolve that democracy must be destroyed, to be replaced by the rule of the wisest and the best. It became the absorbing problem of his life to find a method whereby the wisest and the best might be discovered, and then enabled and persuaded to rule. Meanwhile, his efforts to save Socrates had marked him out for suspicion by the democratic leaders. His friends urged that Athens was unsafe for him, that it was an admirably propitious moment for him to see the world. And so, in that year, 399 BC, he set out. Where he went, we cannot for certain say. There is a merry war of the authorities for every turn of his route. He seems to have gone first to Egypt, and was somewhat shocked to hear from the priestly class which ruled that land that Greece was an infant state, without stabilizing traditions or profound culture, not yet therefore to be taken seriously by these sphinxly pundits of the Nile. But nothing so educates us as a shock. The memory of this learned caste, theocratically ruling a static agricultural people, remained alive in Plato's thought and played its part in writing his utopia. And then off he sailed to Sicily, and to Italy. There he joined for a time the school or sect which the great Pythagoras had founded, and once again his susceptible mind was marked with the memory of a small group of men set aside for scholarship and rule, living a plain life despite the possession of power. Twelve years he wandered, imbibing wisdom from every source, sitting at every shrine, tasting every creed, some would have it that he went to Judea and was molded for a while by the tradition of the almost socialistic prophets, and even that he found his way to the banks of the Ganges and learned the mystic meditations of the Hindus. We do not know. He returned to Athens in 387 BC, a man of forty now, ripened to maturity by the variety of many peoples and the wisdom of many lands. He had lost a little of the hot enthusiasms of youth but he had gained a perspective of thought in which every extreme was seen as a half-truth, and the many aspects of every problem blended into a distributive justice to every facet of the truth. He had knowledge and he had art, for once the philosopher and the poet lived in one soul, and he created for himself a medium of expression in which both beauty and truth might find room and play. The dialogue. Never before, we may believe that philosophy assumed so brilliant a garb, and surely never since. Even in translation, this style shines and sparkles and leaps and bubbles over. Plato, says one of his lovers, Shelley, exhibits the rare union of close and subtle logic with the Pythian enthusiasm of poetry, melted by the splendor and harmony of his periods into one irresistible stream of musical impressions which hurry the persuasions onward as in a breathless career. It was not for nothing that the young philosopher had begun as a dramatist. The difficulty in understanding Plato lies precisely in this intoxicating mixture of philosophy and poetry, of science and art. We cannot always tell in which character of the dialogue the author speaks, nor in which form, whether he is literal or speaks in metaphor, whether he jests or is in earnest. His love of jest and irony and myth leaves us at times baffled. Almost we could say of him that he did not teach except in parables. Shall I, as an older person, speak to you as younger men, in apologue or myth? asks his Protagoras. These dialogues, we are told, were written by Plato for the general reading public of his day. By their conversational method, their lively war of pros and cons, and their gradual development and frequent repetition of every important argument, they were explicitly adapted, obscure though they may seem to us now, to the understanding of the man who must taste philosophy as an occasional luxury, and who is compelled by the brevity of life to read as he who runs may read. Therefore we must be prepared to find in these dialogues much that is playful and metaphorical much that is unintelligible except to scholars learned in the social and literary minutia of Plato's time, much that today will seem irrelevant and fanciful 
but might well have served as the very sauce and flavor by which a heavy dish of thought was made digestible from minds unused to philosophic fare. Let us confess, too, that Plato has in sufficient abundance the qualities which he condemns. He inveighs against poets and their myths, and proceeds to add one to the number of poets and hundreds to the number of myths. He complains of the priests, who go about preaching hell and offering redemption from it for a consideration. C.F. The Republic, 364. But he himself is a priest, a theologian, a preacher, a supermoralist, a Savernola denouncing art and inviting vanities to the fire. He acknowledges, Shakespeare-like, that comparisons are slippery. Sophist, 231. But he slips out of one into another and another and another. He condemns the sophists as phrase-mongering disputants but he himself is not above chopping logic like a sophomore. Fouquet parodies him. The whole is greater than the part, surely, and the part is less than the whole? Yes. Therefore, clearly, philosophers should rule the state. What is that? It is evident. Let us go over it again. But this is the worst that we can say of him, and after it is said, the dialogues remain one of the priceless treasures of the world. The best of them, the Republic, is a complete treatise in itself, Plato reduced to a book. Here we shall find his metaphysics, his theology, his ethics, his psychology, his pedagogy, his politics, his theory of art. Here we shall find problems reeking with modernity and contemporary savor. Communism and socialism, feminism and birth control and eugenics, Nietzschean problems of morality and aristocracy. Rousseauian problems of return to nature and libertarian education, Bergsonian Alain Vital and Freudian psychoanalysis, everything is here. It is a feast for the elite served by an unstinting host. Plato is philosophy, and philosophy Plato, says Emerson, and awards to the Republic the words of Omar about the Quran. Burn the libraries, for their value is in this book. Let us study the Republic. 4. The Ethical Problem The discussion takes place in the house of Cephalus, a wealthy aristocrat. In the group are Glaucon and Udimentus, brothers of Plato, and Thrasymachus, a gruff and excitable sophist. Socrates, who serves as the mouthpiece of Plato in the dialogue, asks Cephalus, What do you consider to be the greatest blessing which you have reaped from wealth? Cephalus answers that wealth is a blessing to him chiefly because it enables him to be generous and honest and just. Socrates, after his sly fashion, asks him just what he means by justice, and therewith lets loose the dogs of philosophic war. For nothing is so difficult as definition nor anything so severe a test and exercise of mental clarity and skill. Socrates finds it a simple matter to destroy one after another, the definitions offered him, until at last Thrasymachus, less patient than the rest, breaks out. With a roar. What folly has possessed you, Socrates? And why do you others all drop down at one another's feet in this silly way? I say that if you want to know what justice is, you should answer and not ask, and you shouldn't pride yourself on refuting others, for there are many who can ask but cannot answer. 336. Socrates is not frightened. He continues to ask rather than answer, and after a minute of parry and thrust, he provokes the unwary Thrasymachus to commit himself to a definition. Listen, then, says the angry sophist. I proclaim that might is right and justice is the interest of the stronger. The different forms of government make laws democratic, aristocratic, or autocratic, with a view to their respective interests, and these laws, so made by them to serve their interests, they deliver to their subjects as justice, and punish as unjust anyone who transgresses them. I am speaking of injustice on a large scale, and my meaning will be most clearly seen in autocracy, which by fraud and force takes away the property of others not retail, but wholesale. Now when a man has taken away the money of the citizens and made slaves of them, then, instead of swindler and thief, he is called happy and blessed by all. 
for injustice is censured because those who censure it are afraid of suffering and not from any scruple they might have of doing injustice themselves. 338 to 44. This, of course, is the doctrine which our own day more or less correctly associates with the name of Nietzsche. Verily, I laughed many a time over the weaklings who thought themselves good because they had lame paws. Stirner expressed the idea briefly when he said that a handful of might is better than a bagful of right. Perhaps nowhere in the history of philosophy is the doctrine better formulated than by Plato himself in another dialogue, Gorgias, 483f, where the sophist Callicles denounces morality as an invention of the weak to neutralize the strength of the strong. They distribute praise and censure with a view to their own interests. They say that dishonesty is shameful and unjust, meaning by dishonesty the desire to have more than their neighbors. For knowing their own inferiority, they would be only too glad to have equality. But if there were a man who had sufficient force, enter the superman, he would shake off and break through and escape from all this. He would trample underfoot all our formulas and spells and charms and all our laws that sin against nature. He who would truly live ought to allow his desires to wax to the uttermost. But when they have grown to their greatest, he shall have courage and intelligence to minister to them and to satisfy all his longings. And this I affirm to be natural justice and nobility. But the many cannot do this, and therefore they blame such persons, because they are ashamed of their own inability, which they desire to conceal. And hence they call intemperance base. They enslave the nobler natures, and they praise justice only because they are cowards. This justice is a morality not for men, but for footmen, the phrase here in ancient Greek translated to English, nor indeed of a man, but of a human being of some sort. It is a slave morality, not a hero morality. The real virtues of a man are courage, Andrea, and intelligence, phronesis. Perhaps this hard immoralism reflects the development of imperialism in the foreign policy of Athens and its ruthless treatment of weaker states. Your empire, said Pericles in the oration which Thucydides invents for him, is based on your own strength rather than the goodwill of your subjects. And the same historian reports the Athenian envoys coercing Milos into joining Athens in the war against Sparta. You know as well as we do that right, as the world goes, is only in question for equals in power. The strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. We have here the fundamental problem of ethics, the crux of the theory of moral conduct. What is justice? Shall we seek righteousness, or shall we seek power? Is it better to be good or to be strong? How does Socrates, i.e. Plato, meet the challenge of this theory? At first, he does not meet it at all. He points out that justice is a relation among individuals, depending on social organization, and that in consequence it can be studied better as part of the structure of a community than as a quality of personal conduct. If, he suggests, we can picture a just state, we shall be in a better position to describe a just individual. Plato excuses himself for this digression on the score that in testing a man's vision we make him read first large type, then smaller. So he argues it is easier to analyze justice on a large scale than on the small scale of individual behavior. But we need not be deceived. In truth, the master is patching two books together and uses the argument as a seam. He wishes not only to discuss the problems of personal morality, but the problems of social and political reconstruction as well. He has a utopia up his sleeve and is resolved to produce it. It is easy to forgive him, for the digression forms the core and value of his book. 5. The Political Problem Justice would be a simple matter, says Plato, if men were simple, and anarchist communism would suffice. For a moment, he gives his imagination rein. First, then, let us consider that will be their way of life. Will they not produce corn and wine and clothes and shoes and build houses for themselves? And when they are housed, they will work in summer commonly stripped and barefoot, but in winter substantially clothed and shod. They will feed on barley and wheat, 
baking the wheat and kneading the flour, making noble puddings and loaves. These they will serve up on a mat of reed or clean leaves, themselves reclining while upon beds of yew or myrtle boughs. And they and their children will feast, drinking on the wine which they have made wearing garlands on their heads, and having the praises of the gods on their lips, living in sweet society, and having a care that their families do not exceed their means, for they will have an eye to poverty or war. Of course they will have a relish, salt, olives, and cheese, and onions, and cabbages, or other country herbs which are fit for boiling, and we shall give them a dessert of figs, and pulse, and beans, and myrtle berries, and beech nuts, which they will roast at the fire, drinking in moderation. And with such a diet they may be expected to live in peace to a good old age, and bequeath a similar life to their children after them. 372. Observe here the passing reference to the control of population, by infanticide, presumably, to vegetarianism, and to a return to nature, to the primitive simplicity which Hebrew legend pictures in the Garden of Eden. The whole has the sound of Diogenes, the cynic, who, as the epithet implied, thought we should turn and live with the animals. They are so placid and self-contained. And for a moment, we are likely to classify Plato with St. Simon and Fourier and William Morris and Tolstoy. But he is a little more skeptical than these men of kindly faith. He passes quietly on to the question, why is it that such a simple paradise as he has described never comes? Why is it that these utopias never arrive upon the map? He answers because of greed and luxury. Men are not content with a simple life. They are acquisitive, ambitious, competitive, and jealous. They soon tire of what they have and pine for what they have not, and they seldom desire anything unless it belongs to others. The result is the encroachment of one group upon the territory of another, the rivalry of groups for the resources of the soil, and then war. Trade and finance develop and bring new class divisions. Any ordinary city is in fact two cities, one the city of the poor, the other of the rich, each at war with the other, and in either division there are smaller ones. You would make a great mistake if you treated them as single states. 423. A mercantile bourgeoisie arises whose members seek social position through wealth and conspicuous consumption. They will spend large sums of money on their wives. 548. These changes in the distribution of wealth produce political changes. As the wealth of the merchant overreaches that of the landowner, aristocracy gives way to the plutocratic oligarchy. Wealthy traders and bankers rule the state. Then statesmanship, which is the coordination of social forces and the adjustment of policy to growth, is replaced by politics which is the strategy of party and the lust for the spoils of office. Every form of government tends to perish by excess of its basic principle. Aristocracy ruins itself by limiting too narrowly the circle within which power is confined. Oligarchy ruins itself by the incautious scramble for immediate wealth. In either case, the end is revolution. When revolution comes, it may seem to arise from little causes and petty whims. But though it may spring from slight occasions, it is the precipitate result of grave and accumulated wrongs. When a body is weakened by neglected ills, the merest exposure may bring serious disease. 556. Five, then democracy comes. The poor overcome their opponents, slaughtering some and banishing the rest, and give to the people an equal share of freedom and power. 557. Five, but even democracy ruins itself by excess of democracy. Its basic principle is the equal right of all to hold office and determine public policy. This is, at first glance, a delightful arrangement. It becomes disastrous because the people are not properly equipped by education to select the best rulers and the wisest courses. 588. As to the people, they have no understanding and only repeat what their rulers are pleased to tell them. Protagoras 317. To get a doctrine accepted or rejected, it is only necessary to have it praised or ridiculed in a popular play. A hit, no doubt, at Aristophanes, whose comedies attacked almost every new idea. Mob rule is a rough sea for the ship of state to ride. 
Every wind of oratory stirs up the waters and deflects the course. The upshot of such a democracy is tyranny or autocracy. The crowd so loves flattery, it is so hungry for honey, that at last the most wiliest and most unscrupulous flatterer, calling himself the protector of the people, rises to supreme power. 565. Consider the history of Rome. The more Plato thinks of it, the more astounded he is at the folly of leaving to mob, caprice, and gullibility the selection of political officials. Not to speak of leaving it to those shady and well-serving strategists who pull the oligarchic wires behind the democratic stage. Plato complains that whereas in simpler matters, like shoemaking, we think only a specially trained person will serve our purpose. In politics, we presume that everyone who knows how to get votes knows how to administer a city or a state. When we are ill, we call for a trained physician whose degree is a guarantee of specific preparation and technical competence. We do not ask for the handsomest physician or the most eloquent one. Well then, when the whole state is ill, should we not look for the service and guidance of the wisest and the best? To devise a method of barring incompetence and knavery from public office, and of selecting and preparing the best to rule for the common good. That is the problem of political philosophy. 6. The Psychological Problem But behind these political problems lies the nature of man. To understand politics, we must, unfortunately, understand psychology. Like man, like state. 575. Governments vary as the characters of men vary. States are made out of the human natures which are in them. 544. The state is what it is because its citizens are what they are. Therefore, we need not expect to have better states until we have better men. Till then, all changes will leave every essential thing unchanged. How charming people are, always doctoring, increasing and complicating their disorders, fancying they will be cured by some nostrum, which somebody advises them to try, never getting better but always growing worse? Are they not as good as a play, trying their hand at legislation, and imagining that by reforms they will make an end to the dishonesties and rascalities of mankind, not knowing that in reality they are cutting away at the heads of a hydra? 425. Let us examine for a moment the human material with which political philosophy must deal. Human behavior, says Plato, flows from three main sources, desire, emotion, and knowledge. Desire, appetite, impulse, instinct, these are one. Emotion, spirit, ambition, courage, these are one. Knowledge, thought, intellect, reason, these are one. Desire has its seat in the loins, it is a bursting reservoir of energy, fundamentally sexual. Emotion has its seat in the heart, in the flow and force of the blood. It is the organic resonance of experience and desire. Knowledge has its seat in the head. It is the eye of desire and can become the pilot of the soul. These powers and qualities are all in all men, but in diverse degrees. Some men are but the embodiment of desire. Restless and acquisitive souls who are absorbed in material quests and quarrels, who burn with lust of luxuries and show and who rate their gains always as not compared with their ever-receding goals. These are the men who dominate and manipulate industry. But there are others who are temples of feeling and courage, who care not so much that they fight for as for victory in and for itself. They are pugnacious rather than inquisitive. Their pride is in power rather than in possession. Their joy is on the battlefield rather than in the mart. These are the men who make the armies and navies of the world. And last are the few whose delight is in meditation and understanding, who yearn not for goods nor for victory but for knowledge, who leave both market and battlefield to lose themselves in the quiet clarity of secluded thought, whose will is a light rather than a fire, whose haven is not power but truth. These are the men of wisdom who stand aside unused by the world. Now, just as effective individual action implies that desire, though warmed with emotion, is guided by knowledge, so in the perfect state the industrial forces would produce but they would not rule, the military forces would protect but they would not rule, 
The forces of knowledge and science and philosophy would be nourished and protected, and they would rule. Unguided by knowledge, the people are a multitude without order, like desires in disarray. The people need the guidance of philosophers as desires need the enlightenment of knowledge. Ruin comes when a traitor, whose heart is lifted up by wealth, becomes ruler. 434. Or when the general uses his army to establish a military dictatorship. The producer is at best in the economic field, the warrior is at his best in battle. They are both at their worst in public office, and in their crude hands politics submerges statesmanship. For statesmanship is a science and an art. One must have lived for it and been long prepared. Only a philosopher king is fit to guide a nation. Until philosophers are kings, or the kings and princes of this world have the spirit and power of philosophy, and wisdom and political leadership meet in the same man, cities will never cease from ill, nor the human race. 473. This is the keystone of the arch of Plato's thought. 7. The Psychological Solution Well then, what is to be done? We must begin by sending out into the country all the inhabitants of the city who are more than ten years old, and by taking possession of the children who will thus be protected from the habits of their parents. 540. We cannot build utopia with young people corrupted at every turn by the example of their elders. We must start, so far as we can, with a clean slate. It is quite possible that some enlightened ruler will empower us to make such a beginning with some part or colony of his realm. One ruler did, as we shall see. In any case, we must give to every child and from the outset full equality of educational opportunity. There is no telling where the light of talent or genius will break out. We must seek it impartially everywhere and every rank and race. The first turn on our road is universal education. For the first ten years of life, education shall be predominantly physical. Every school is to have a gymnasium and a playground. Play and sport are to be the entire curriculum. And in this first decade, such health will be stored up as will make all medicine unnecessary. To require the help of medicine because by lives of indolence and luxury, men have filled themselves like pools with waters and winds, flatulence and catarrh. Is not this a disgrace? Our present system of medicine may be said to educate diseases. To draw them out into a long existence rather than to cure them. But this is an absurdity of the idle rich. When a carpenter is ill, he asks the physician for a rough and ready remedy, an emetic, or a purge, or cautery, or the knife. And if anyone tells him that he must go through a course of dietetics and swathe and swaddle his head, and all that sort of thing, he replies at once that he has no time to be ill, and that he sees no good in a life that is spent in nursing his disease to the neglect of his ordinary calling, and therefore saying goodbye to this sort of physicians, he resumes his customary diet, and either gets well and lives and does his business, or, if his constitution fails, he dies and has done with it. 405. 6. We cannot afford to have a nation of malingerers and invalids. Utopia must begin in the body of man. But mere athletics and gymnastics would make a man too one-sided. How shall we find a gentle nature which has also great courage? For they seem to be inconsistent with each other. 375. We do not want a nation of prize fighters and weightlifters. Perhaps music will solve our problem. Through music, the soul learns harmony and rhythm, and even a disposition to justice. For, can he who is harmoniously constituted ever be unjust? Is this not, Glocken, why musical training is so powerful? Because rhythm and harmony find their way into the secret places of the soul, bearing grace in their movements and making the soul graceful? 401, Protagoras 326. Music molds character, and therefore shares in determining social and political issues. Damon tells me, and I can quite believe it, that when modes of music change, the fundamental laws of the state change with them. Note. C.F. Daniel McConnell. Let me write the songs of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. 
Music is valuable not only because it brings refinement of feeling and character, but also because it preserves and restores health. There are some diseases which can be treated only through the mind. Carmides 157. So the Corybantic priest treated hysterical women with wild pipe music, which excited them to dance and dance until they fell to the ground exhausted and went to sleep. When they awoke, they were cured. The unconscious sources of human thought are touched and soothed by such methods, and it is in these substrata of behavior and feeling that genius sinks its roots. No man, when conscious, attains to true or inspired intuition, but rather when the power of intellect is fettered in sleep or by disease or dementia. The prophet Mantik, or genius, is akin to the madman Manik, Phaedrus 244. Plato passes on to a remarkable anticipation of psychoanalysis. Our political psychology is perplexed, he argues, because we have not adequately studied the various appetites or instincts of man. Dreams may give us a clue to some of the subtle and more elusive of these dispositions. Certain of the unnecessary pleasures and instincts are deemed to be unlawful. Every man appears to have them, but in some persons they are subjected to the control of law and reason, sublimated, and the better desires prevailing over them, they are either wholly suppressed or reduced in strength and number, while in other persons these desires are stronger and more abundant. I mean particularly those desires which are awake when the reasoning and taming and ruling power, censor, of the personality is asleep. The wild beast in our nature, gorged with meat and drink, starts up and walks about naked and surfeits at his will. And there is no conceivable folly or crime, however shameless or unnatural, not accepting incest or parricide. Oedipus, complex, of which such a nature may not be guilty. But when a man's pulse is healthy and temperate, and he goes to sleep cool and rational, having indulged his appetites neither too much nor too little, but just enough to lay them to sleep. He is then least likely to be the sport of fanciful and lawless visions. In all of us, even in good men, there is such a latent wild beast nature, which peers out in sleep. 571.2 Music and measure lend grace and health to the soul and to the body. But again, too much music is as dangerous as too much athletics. To be merely an athlete is to be nearly a savage, and to be merely a musician is to be melted and softened beyond what is good. 410. The two must be combined, and after 16, the individual practice of music must be abandoned, though choral singing, like communal games, will go on throughout life. Nor is music to be merely music. It must be used to provide attractive forms for the sometimes unappetizing contents of mathematics, history, and science. There is no reason why for the young these difficult studies should not be smoothed into verse and beautified with song. Even then, these studies are not to be forced upon an unwilling mind. Within limits, a libertarian spirit must prevail. The elements of instruction should be presented to the mind in childhood but not with any compulsion, for a free man should be a free man too in the acquisition of knowledge. Knowledge which is acquired under compulsion has no hold on the mind. Therefore do not use compulsion, but let early education be rather a sort of amusement. This will better enable you to find out the natural bent of the child. 536 with minds so freely growing and bodies made strong by sport and outdoor life of every kind, our ideal state would have a firm psychological and physiological base, broad enough for every possibility and every development. But a moral basis must be provided as well. The members of the community must make a unity. They must learn that they are members of one another, that they owe to one another certain amenities and obligations. Now, since men are by nature acquisitive, jealous, combative, and erotic, how shall we persuade them to behave themselves? By the policeman's omnipresent club? It is a brutal method, costly and irritating. There is a better way, and that is by lending to the moral requirements to the community the sanction of supernatural authority. We must have a religion. Plato believes that a nation cannot be strong unless it believes in God. 
a mere cosmic force or first cause or elan vital, that was not a person, could hardly inspire hope or devotion or sacrifice. It could not offer comfort to the hearts of the distressed, nor courage to the embattled souls. But a living God can do all this, and can stir or frighten the self-seeking individualist into some moderation of his greed, some control of his passion. All the more so if, to belief in God, he added belief in personal immortality. The hope of another life gives us courage to meet our own death and to bear with the death of our loved ones. We are twice armed if we fight with faith. Granted that none of the beliefs can be demonstrated that God may be, after all, only the personified ideal of our love and our hope, and that the soul is like the music of the lyre and dies with the instrument that gave it form. Yet, surely, so runs the argument Pascal-like of the Phaedo, it will do us no harm to believe, and it may do us and our children immeasurable good. For we are likely to have trouble with these children of ours if we undertake to explain and justify everything to their simple minds. We shall have an especially hard time when they arrive at the age of twenty and face the first scrutiny and test of what they have learned in all their years of equal education. Then will come a ruthless weeding out, the great elimination we might call it. That test will be no mere academic examination. It will be practical as well as theoretical. There shall also be toils and pains and conflicts prescribed for them. 4.13 Every kind of ability will have a chance to show itself, and every sort of stupidity will be hunted out into the light. Those who fail will be assigned to the economic work of the nation. They will be businessmen and clerks and factory workers and farmers. The test will be impartial and impersonal. Whether one is to be a farmer or a philosopher will be determined not by monopolized opportunity or nepotic favoritism. The selection will be more democratic than democracy. Those who pass this first test will receive ten more years of education and training, in body and mind and character. And then they will face a second test, far severer than the first. Those who fail will become the auxiliaries, or executive aides and military officers of the state. Now it is just in these great eliminations that we shall need every resource of persuasion to get the eliminated to accept their fate with urbanity and peace. For what is to prevent that great unselected majority in the first test, and that lesser but more vigorous and capable second group of illuminees, from shouldering arms and smashing this utopia of ours into a moldering reminiscence? What is to prevent them from establishing there and then a world in which, again, mere number or mere force will rule, and the sickly comedy of a sham democracy will reenact itself, de capo ad nauseum? Then religion and faith will be our only salvation. We shall tell these young people that the divisions into which they have fallen are God-decreed and irrevocable. Not all their tears shall wipe out one word of it. We shall tell them the myth of the metals. Citizens, you are brothers, yet God has framed you differently. Some of you have the power of command, and these he has made of gold. Wherefore, they have the greatest honor, others of silver, to be auxiliaries. Others again, who are to be husbandmen and craftsmen, he has made of brass and iron, and the species will generally be preserved in the children. But as you are of the same original family, a golden parent will sometimes have a silver son, or a silver parent a golden son. And God proclaims that if the son of a golden or a silver parent has an admixture of brass or iron, then nature requires a transposition of ranks. And the eye of the ruler must not be pitiful towards his child, because he has to descend in the scale to become a husbandman or an artisan just as there may be others sprung from the artisan class who are raised to honor and become guardians and auxiliaries. For an oracle says that when a man of brass or iron guards the state, it will be destroyed. 4.15 Perhaps with this royal fable we shall secure a fairly general consent to the furtherance of our plan. But now what of the lucky remnant that ride these successive waves of selection? They are taught philosophy. They have now reached the age of thirty. It would not have been wise to let them taste the dear delight too early. For young men, when they first get the taste of philosophy in their mouths, argue for amusement and are always contradicting and refuting. 
like puppy dogs who delight to tear and pull at all who come near them. 539. This dear delight philosophy means two things chiefly. To think clearly, which is metaphysics, and to rule wisely, which is politics. First, then, our young elite must learn to think clearly. For that purpose, they shall study the doctrine of ideas. But this famous doctrine of ideas, embellished and obscured by the fancy and poetry of Plato, is a discouraging maze to the modern student, and must have offered another severe test to the survivors of many siftings. The idea of a thing might be the general idea of the class to which it belongs. The idea of John or Dick or Harry is man. Or it might be the law or laws according to which the thing operates. The idea of John would be the reduction of all his behavior to natural laws. Or it might be the perfect purpose and ideal towards which the thing and its class may develop. The idea of John is the John of Utopia. Very probably, the idea is all of these, idea, law, and ideal. Behind the surface phenomena and particulars which greet our senses are generalizations, regularities, and directions of development, unperceived by sensation, but conceived by reason and thought. These ideas, laws, and ideals are more permanent and therefore more real than the sense-perceived particular things through which we conceive and deduce them. Man is more permanent than Tom or Dick or Harry. This circle is born with the movement of my pencil and dies under the attrition of my eraser. But the conception circle goes on forever. This tree stands and that tree falls, but the laws which determine what body shall fall and when and how were without beginning, are now and ever shall be without end. There is, as the gentle Spinoza would say, a world of things perceived by sense and a world of laws inferred by thought. We do not see the law of inverse squares, but it is there and everywhere. It was before anything began and will survive when all the world of things is a finished tale. Here is a bridge. The sense perceives concrete and iron to a hundred million tons. But the mathematician sees with the mind's eye the daring and delicate adjustment of all this mass of material to the laws of mechanics and mathematics and engineering, those laws according to which all good bridges that are made must be made. If the mathematician be also a poet, he will see these laws upholding the bridge. If the laws were violated, the bridge would collapse into the stream beneath. The laws are the god that holds up the bridge in the hollow of his hand. Aristotle hints something of this when he says that by ideas Plato meant what Pythagoras meant by number, when he taught that this is a world of numbers, meaning presumably that the world is ruled by mathematical constancies and regularities. Plutarch tells us that according to Plato, God always geometrizes, or as Spinoza puts the same thought, God and the universal laws of structure and operation are one and the same reality. To Plato, as to Bertrand Russell, mathematics is therefore the indispensable prelude to philosophy and its highest form. Over the doors of his academy, Plato placed dantesquely these words, Let no man ignorant of geometry enter here. Without these ideas, these generalizations, regularities, and ideals, the world would be to us as it must seem to the first opened eyes of the child a mass of unclassified and unmeaning particulars of sensation, for meaning can be given to things only by classifying and generalizing them, by finding the laws of their beings and the purposes and goals of their activity. Or the world without ideas would be a heap of book titles fallen haphazard out of the catalog, as compared to the same titles arranged in order according to their classes, their sequences, and their purposes. It would be the shadows in a cave as compared with the sunlit realities without, which cast those fantastic and deceptive shadows within. 514. Therefore, the essence of a higher education is the search for ideas, for generalizations, laws of sequence, and ideals of development. Behind things we must discover their relation and meaning, their mode of law, of operation, the function and ideal they serve or adumbrate. We must classify and coordinate our sense experience in terms of law and purpose. Only for lack of this does the mind of the imbecile differ from the mind of Caesar. 
Well, after five years of training in this recondite doctrine of ideas, this art of perceiving significant forms and causal sequences and ideal potentialities amid the welter and hazard of sensation, after five years of training in the application of this principle to the behavior of men and the conduct of states, after this long preparation from childhood, through youth and into the maturity of 35, surely now these perfect products are ready to assume the royal purple in the highest functions of public life. Surely they are at last the philosopher kings who are to rule and to free the human race. Alas, not yet. Their education is still unfinished. For after all it has been in the main a theoretical education, something else is needed. Let these PhDs pass down now from the heights of philosophy into the cave of the world of men and things. Generalizations and abstractions are worthless except they be tested by this concrete world. Let our students enter that world with no favor shown them. They shall complete with men of business, with hard-headed grasping individualists, with men of brawn and men of cunning. In this mart of strife they shall learn from the book of life itself. They shall hurt their feelings and scratch their philosophic shins on the crude realities of the world. They shall earn their bread and butter by the sweat of their high brows. And this last and sharpest test shall go on ruthlessly for fifteen long years. Some of our perfect products will break under the pressure and be submerged by this last great wave of elimination. Those that survive, scarred and fifty, sobered and self-reliant, shorn of scholastic vanity by the merciless friction of life, and armed now with all the wisdom that tradition and experience, culture and conflict can cooperate to give, these men at last shall automatically become the rulers of the state. 8. The Political Solution Automatically, without any hypocrisy of voting, Democracy means perfect equality of opportunity, especially in education. Not the rotation of every Tom, Dick, and Harry in public office. Every man shall have an equal chance to make himself fit for the complex tasks of administration. But only those who have proved their metal, or in our myth, their metal, and have emerged from all tests with the insignia of skill shall be eligible to rule. Public officials shall be chosen not by votes, nor by secret cliques pulling the unseen wires of democratic pretense, but by their own ability as demonstrated in the fundamental democracy of an equal race. Nor shall any man hold office without specific training, nor hold high office till he has first filled a lower office well. Gorgias, 514-5 Is this aristocracy... Well, we need not be afraid of the word if the reality is good which it betokens. Words are wise men's counters, without value of their own. They are the money only of fools and politicians. We want to be ruled by the best, which is what aristocracy means. Have we not, Carlyle-like, yearned and prayed to be ruled by the best? But we have come to think of aristocracies as hereditary. Let it be carefully noted that this platonic aristocracy is not of that kind. One would rather call it a democratic aristocracy, for the people, instead of blindly electing the lesser of two evils, presented to them as candidates by nominating cliques, will here be themselves, every one of them, the candidates, and will receive an equal chance of educational election to public office. There is no caste here, no inheritance of position or privilege, no stoppage of talent, impecuniously born. The son of a ruler begins on the same level and receives the same treatment and opportunity as the son of a boot black. If the ruler's son is adult, he falls at the first shearing. If the boot black son is a man of ability, the way is clear for him to become a guardian of the state. 423. Career will be open to talent wherever it is born. This is a democracy of the schools a hundredfold more honest and more effective than a democracy of the Poles. And so, setting aside every other business, the guardians will dedicate themselves wholly to the maintenance of freedom in the state, making this their craft, and engaging in no work which does not bear upon this end. 395. They shall be legislature and executive and court in one, 
Even the law shall not bind them to a dogma in the face of altered circumstance. The rule of the guardians shall be a flexible intelligence unbound by precedent. But how can men of fifty have a flexible intelligence? Will they not be mentally plaster-casted by routine? Adimantus, echoing, no doubt, some hot brotherly debate in Plato's home, objects that philosophers are dolts or rogues who would rule either foolishly or selfishly or both. The votaries of philosophy who carry on the study not only in youth with a view to education, but as the pursuit of their maturer years, these men for the most part grow into very strange beings, not to say utter scoundrels, and the result with those who may be considered the best of them is that they are made useless to the world by the very study which you extol. 487. This is a fair enough description of some bespectacled modern philosophers, but Plato answers that he is guarded against this difficulty by giving his philosophers the training of life, as well as the erudition of the schools, that they will in consequence be men of action rather than merely men of thought, men seasoned to high purpose and noble temper by long experience and trial. By philosophy, Plato means an active culture, wisdom that mixes with the concrete busyness of life. He does not mean a closeted and impractical metaphysician. Plato is the man who least resembles Kant, which is, with all respect, a considerable merit. So much for incompetence. As for rascality, we may provide against that by establishing among the guardians a system of communism. In the first place, none of them should have any property beyond what is absolutely necessary. Neither should they have a private house with bars and bolts closed against anyone who has a mind to enter. Their provisions should be only such as are required by trained warriors, who are men of temperance and courage. Their agreement is to receive from the citizens a fixed rate of pay, enough to meet the expenses of the year and no more. And they will have common meals and live together like soldiers in a camp. Gold and silver we will tell them that they have from God. The diviner metal is within them, and they have therefore no need of that earthly dross, which passes under the name of gold, and ought not to pollute the divine by earthly admixture. For that commoner metal has been the source of many unholy deeds, but their own is undefiled. And they alone of all the citizens may not touch or handle silver or gold, or be under the same roof with them, or wear them, or drink from them. And this will be their salvation, and the salvation of the state. But should they ever acquire homes or lands or monies of their own, they will become housekeepers and husbandmen instead of guardians, enemies and tyrants instead of allies of the other citizens, hating and being hated, plotting and being plotted against. They will pass through life in much greater terror of internal than of external enemies and the hour of ruin both to themselves and to the rest of the state will be at hand. 4. 16. 17. This arrangement will make it unprofitable as well as dangerous for the guardians to rule as a clique seeking the good of their class rather than that of the community as a whole. For they will be protected from want, the necessities and modest luxuries of a noble life will be theirs in regular provision, without the searing and wrinkling care of economic worry. But by the same token, they will be precluded from cupidity and sordid ambitions. They will always have just so much of the world's goods and no more. They will be like physicians establishing and themselves accepting a dietary for a nation. They will eat together like consecrated men. They will sleep together in single barracks like soldiers sworn to simplicity. Friends should have all things in common, as Pythagoras used to say. Laws 807. So the authority of the guardians will be sterilized and their power made poisonless. Their sole reward will be the honor and the sense of service to the group. And they will be such men as from the beginning have deliberately consented to so materially limited a career, and such men as at the end of their stern training will have learned to value the high repute of the statesman above the crass emoluments of the office seeking politicians or the economic man. At their coming, the battles of party politics will be no more. But what will their wives say to all this? 
Will they be content to forego the luxuries of life and the conspicuous consumption of goods? The guardians will have no wives. Their communism is to be of women as well as of goods. They are to be freed not only from the egoism of self, but from the egoism of family. They are not to be narrowed to the anxious acquisitiveness of the prodded husband. They are to be devoted not to a woman, but to the community. Even their children shall not be specifically or distinguishably theirs. All children of guardians shall be taken from their mothers at birth and brought up in common. Their particular parentage will be lost in the scuffle. 460. All the guardian mothers will care for all the guardian children. The brotherhood of man within these limits will graduate from phrase to fact. Every boy will be a brother to every other boy, every girl a sister, every man a father, every woman a mother. But whence will these women come? Some, no doubt, the guardians will woo out of the industrial or military classes. Others will have become by their own right members of the guardian class. For there is to be no sex barrier of any kind in this community, least of all in education. The girl shall have the same intellectual opportunities as the boy, the same chance to rise to the highest positions in the state. When Glocken objects, 453F, that this admission of woman to any office, provided she has passed the tests, violates the principle of the division of labor. He receives the sharp reply that division of labor must be by aptitude and ability, not by sex. If a woman shows herself capable of political administration, let her rule. If a man shows himself to be capable only of washing dishes, let him fulfill the function to which providence has assigned him. Community of wives does not mean indiscriminate mating. Rather, there is to be strict eugenic supervision of all reproductive relations. The argument from the breeding of animals here starts its wandering career. If we get such good results in breeding cattle selectively for qualities desired, and from breeding only from the best in each generation, why should we not apply similar principles to the matings of mankind? 459. For it is not enough. To educate the child properly, they must be properly born of select and healthy ancestry. Education should begin before birth. Laws 789. Therefore no man or woman shall procreate unless in perfect health. A health certificate is to be required of every bride and groom. Laws 772. Men may reproduce only when they are above 30 and under 45. Women only when they are above 20 and under 40. Men unmarried by 35 are to be taxed into felicity. Laws 771. Offspring born of unlicensed matings or deformed are to be exposed and left to die. Before and after the ages specified for procreation, mating is to be free on condition that the fetus be aborted. We grant this permission with strict orders to the parties to do all in their power to prevent any embryo from seeing the light. And if any should force its way to birth, they must understand that the offspring of such a union cannot be maintained, and they must make their arrangements accordingly. 461. The marriage of relatives is prohibited as inducing degeneration. 310. The best of either sex should be united with the best as often as possible, and the interior with the inferior and they are to rear the offspring of the one sort, but not that of the other. For this is the only way of keeping the flock in prime condition. Our braver and better youth, beside their other honors and rewards, are to be permitted a greater variety of mates, for such fathers ought to have as many sons as possible. 459.60 But our eugenic society must be protected not only from disease and deterioration within but from enemies without, it must be ready, if need be, to wage successful war. Our model community would of course be pacific, for it would restrict population within the means of subsistence. But neighboring states, not so managed, might well look upon the orderly prosperity of our utopia as an invitation to raid and repine. Hence, while deploring the necessity, we shall have, in our intermediate class, a sufficient number of well-trained soldiers living a hard and simple life like the guardians, on a state modicum of goods supplied by their maintainers and forefathers, 
the people. At the same time, every precaution must be taken to avoid the occasions of war. The primary occasion is overpopulation, 373. The second is foreign trade, with the inevitable disputes that interrupt it. Indeed, competitive trade is really a form of war. Peace is only a name, Laws, 622. It will be well, then, to situate our ideal state considerably inland so that it shall be shut out from any high development of foreign commerce. The sea fills a country with merchandise and money-making and bargaining. It breeds in men's minds habits of financial greed and faithlessness, alike in its internal and in its foreign relations. Laws 704-7 Foreign trade requires a large navy to protect it and navalism is as bad as militarism. In every case, the guilt of war is confined to a few persons, and the many are friends. 471. The most frequent wars are precisely the vilest. Civil wars, wars of Greek against Greek. Let the Greeks form a pan-Hellenic league of nations, uniting lest the whole Greek race someday fall under the yoke of barbarian peoples. 469. So our political structure will be topped with a small class of guardians. It will be protected by a large class of soldiers and auxiliaries, and it will rest on the broad base of a commercial, industrial, and agricultural population. This last, or economic class, will retain private property, private mates, and private families, but trade and industry will be regulated by the guardians to prevent excessive individual wealth or poverty. Anyone acquiring more than four times the average possession of the citizens must relinquish the excess to the state. Laws 714F Perhaps interest will be forbidden and profits limited. Laws 920 The communism of the guardians is impracticable for the economic class. The distinguishing characteristics of this class are powerful instincts of acquisition and competition. Some noble souls among them will be free from this fever of combative possession but the majority of men are consumed with it. They hunger and thirst not after righteousness, not after honor, but after possessions endlessly multiplied. Now men engrossed in the pursuit of money are unfit to rule a state, and our entire plan rests on the hope that if the guardians rule well and live simply, the economic man will be willing to let them monopolize administration if they permit him to monopolize luxury. In short, the perfect society would be that in which each class and each unit would be doing the work to which its nature and aptitude best adapted it, in which no class or individual would interfere with others, but all would cooperate in difference to produce an efficient and harmonious whole. 433.4 That would be a just state. 9. The Ethical Solution And now our political digression has ended, and we are ready at last to answer the question with which we began. What is justice? There are only three things worthwhile in this world. Justice, beauty, and truth. And perhaps none of them can be defined. Four hundred years after Plato, a Roman procurator of Judea, asked helplessly, What is truth? and philosophers have not yet answered nor told us what is beauty, but for justice Plato ventures a definition. Justice, he says, is the having and doing what is one's own. 433. This has a disappointing sound. After so much delay, we expected an infallible revelation. What does this definition mean? Simply that each man shall receive the equivalent of what he produces and shall perform the function for which he is best fit. A just man is a man in just the right place, doing his best and giving the full equivalent of what he receives. A society of just men would be therefore a highly harmonious and efficient group, or every element would be in its place, fulfilling its appropriate function like the pieces in a perfect orchestra. Justice in a society would be like that harmony of relationships whereby the planets are held together in their orderly, or, as Pythagoras would have said, their musical movement. So organized, a society is fit for survival, and justice receives a kind of Darwinian sanction. Where men are out of their natural places, where the businessman subordinates the statesman, 
or the soldier usurps the position of the king, there the coordination of parts is destroyed, the joints decay, the society disintegrates and dissolves. Justice is effective coordination. And in the individual, too, justice is effective coordination, the harmonious functioning of the elements in a man, each in its fit place and each making its cooperative contribution to behavior. Every individual is a cosmos or a chaos of desires, emotions, and ideas. Let these fall into harmony, and the individual survives and succeeds. Let them lose their proper place and function. Let emotion try to become the light of action as well as its heat, as in the fanatic. Or let thought try to become the heat of action as well as its light, as in the intellectual. And disintegration of personality begins, failure advances like the inevitable night. Justice is a taxis, chi cosmos, an order and beauty of the parts of the soul. It is to the soul as health is to the body. All evil is disharmony between man and nature, or man and men, or man and himself. So Plato replies to Thrasymachus and Callicles, and to all Nietzscheans forever. Justice is not mere strength, but harmonious strength. Desires and men falling into that order which constitutes intelligence and organization. Justice is not the right of the stronger, but the effective harmony of the whole. It is true that the individual who gets out of the place to which his nature and talents adapt him may for a time see some profit and advantage, but an inescapable nemesis pursues him. As Anaxagoras spoke of the Furies pursuing any planet that should wander out of its orbit, the terrible baton of the nature of things drives the refractory instrument back to its place and its pitch and its natural note. The Corsican lieutenant may try to rule Europe with a ceremonious despotism fitted better to an ancient monarchy than to a dynasty born overnight, but he ends on a prison rock in the sea, ruefully recognizing that he is the slave of the nature of things. Injustice will out. There is nothing bizarrely new in this conception, and indeed we shall do well to suspect in philosophy any doctrine which plumes itself on novelty. Truth changes her garments frequently, like every seemly lady, but under the new habit she remains always the same. In morals, we need not expect startling innovations. Despite the interesting adventures of sophists and Nietzscheans, all moral conceptions resolve about the good of the whole. Morality begins with association and interdependence and organization. Life in society requires the concession of some part of the individual sovereignty to the common order and ultimately the norm of conduct becomes the welfare of the group. Nature will have it so, and her judgment is always final. A group survives in competition or conflict with another group according to its unity and power, according to the ability of its members to cooperate for common ends. And what better cooperation could there be than that each should be doing that which he can do best? This is the goal of organization which every society must seek if he would have life. Morality, said Jesus, is kindness to the weak. Morality, said Nietzsche, is the bravery of the strong. Morality, says Plato, is the effective harmony of the whole. Probably all three doctrines must be combined to find a perfect ethic. But can we doubt which of the elements is fundamental? 10. Criticism and now what shall we say of this whole utopia? Is it feasible? And if not, has it any practicable features which we could turn to contemporary use? Has it ever in any place or measure been realized? At least the last question must be answered in Plato's favor. For a thousand years, Europe was ruled by an order of guardians considerably like that which was visioned by our philosopher. During the Middle Ages, it was customary to classify the population of Christendom into laboratories, workers, bellators, soldiers, and orators, clergy. The last group, though small in number, monopolized the instruments and opportunities of culture and ruled with almost unlimited sway half of the most powerful continent on the globe. The clergy, like Plato's guardians, were placed in authority not by the suffrages of the people, but by their talent as shown in ecclesiastical studies and administration, by their disposition to a life of meditation and simplicity, 
and, perhaps it should be added, by the influence of their relatives with the powers of state and church. In the latter half of the period in which they ruled, the clergy were as free from family cares as even Plato could desire, and in some cases, it would seem, they enjoyed no little of the reproductive freedom accorded to the guardians. Celibacy was part of the psychological structure of the power of the clergy, for on the one hand, they were unimpeded by the narrowing egoism of the family, and on the other, their apparent superiority to the call of the flesh added to the awe in which lay sinners held them, and to the readiness of these sinners to bear their lives on the confessional. Much of the politics of Catholicism was derived from Plato's royal lies, or influenced by them. The ideas of heaven, purgatory, and hell, in their medieval form, are traceable to the last book of the Republic. The cosmology of scholasticism comes largely from the Timaeus. The doctrine of realism, the objective reality of general ideas, was an interpretation of the doctrine of ideas. Even the educational quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music, was modeled on the curriculum outlined in Plato. With this body of doctrine, the people of Europe were ruled with hardly any resort to force. They accepted this rule so readily that for a thousand years they contributed plentiful material support to their rulers and asked no voice in the government. Nor was this acquiescence confined to the general population. Merchants and soldiers, feudal chieftains and civil powers all bent the knee to Rome. It was an aristocracy of no mean political sagacity. It built probably the most marvelous and powerful organization which the world has ever known. The Jesuits, who for a time ruled Paraguay, were semi-Platonic guardians, a clerical oligarchy empowered by the possession of knowledge and skill in the midst of a barbarian population. And for a time, the Communist Party, which ruled Russia after the revolution of November 1917, took a form strangely reminiscent of the Republic. They were a small minority held together almost by religious conviction, wielding the weapons of orthodoxy and excommunication, as sternly devoted to their cause as any saint to his, and living a frugal existence while ruling half the soil of Europe. Such examples indicate that within limits and with modifications, Plato's plan is practicable, and indeed he himself had derived it largely from actual practice as seen on his travels. He had been impressed by the Egyptian theocracy. Here was a great and ancient civilization ruled by a small priestly class, and compared with the bickering and tyranny and incompetence of the Athenian ecclesia, Plato felt that the Egyptian government represented a much higher form of state. Laws, 819. In Italy, he had stayed for a time with a Pythagorean community, vegetarian and communist, which had for generations controlled the Greek colony in which it lived. In Sparta, he had seen a small ruling class living a hard and simple life in common in the midst of a subject population, eating together, restricting mating for eugenic ends, and giving to the brave the privilege of many wives. He had no doubt heard Euripides advocate a community of wives, the liberation of slaves, and the pacification of the Greek world by a Hellenic League, Medea, 230, Fragment, 655. No doubt, too, he knew some of the cynics who had developed a strong communist movement among what one would now call the Socratic left. In short, Plato must have felt that in propounding his plan he was not making an impossible advance on realities which his eyes had seen. Yet critics from Aristotle's day to ours have found in this republic many an opening for objection and doubt. These things and many others, says the Staggerite with cynical brevity, have been invented several times over in the course of ages. It is very pretty to plan a society in which all men will be brothers, but to extend such a term to all our male contemporaries is to water out of it all warmth and significance. So with common property, it would mean a dilution of responsibility. When everything belongs to everybody, nobody will take care of anything. And finally, argues the great conservative, communism would fling people into an intolerable continuity of contact. It would leave no room for privacy or individuality. And it would presume such virtues of patience and cooperation as only a saintly minority possess. 
we must neither assume a standard of virtue which is above ordinary persons, nor an education which is exceptionally favored by nature and circumstance. But we must have regard to the life which the majority can share, and to the forms of government to which states in general can attain. So far, Plato's greatest and most jealous pupil and most of the criticisms of later date strike the same chord. Plato underrated, we are told, the force of custom accumulated in the institution of monogamy and in the moral code attached to that institution. He underestimated the possessive jealousy of males in supposing that a man would be content to have merely an aliquot portion of a wife. He minimized the maternal instinct in supposing that mothers would agree to have their children taken from them and brought up in a heartless anonymity. And above all, he forgot that in abolishing the family he was destroying the great nurse of morals and the chief source of those cooperative and communistic habits, which would have been the psychological basis of his state. With unrivaled eloquence he sawed off the branch on which he sat. To all these criticisms one can reply very simply, that they destroy a straw man. Plato explicitly exempts the majority from his communistic plan. He recognizes clearly enough that only a few are capable of the material self-denial which he proposes for his ruling class. Only the guardians will call every guardian brother or sister. Only the guardians will be without gold or goods. The vast majority will retain all respectable institutions. Property, money, luxury, competition, and whatever privacy they may desire. They will have marriage as monogamic as they can bear, and all the morals derived from it and from the family. The fathers shall keep their wives, and the mothers shall keep their children ad libitum and nauseam. As to the guardians, their need is not so much a communistic disposition as a sense of honor and love of it. Pride and not kindness is to hold them up. And as for the maternal instinct, it is not strong before the birth or even the growth of the child. The average mother accepts the newborn babe rather with resignation than with joy. Love for it is a development, not a sudden miracle, and grows as the child grows, as it takes form under the painstaking care of the mother. Not until it has become the embodiment of maternal artistry does it irrevocably catch the heart. Other objections are economic rather than psychological. Plato's Republic, it is argued, denounces the division of every city into two cities and then offers us a city divided into three. The answer is that the division in the first case is by economic conflict. In Plato's state, the guardian and auxiliary classes are specifically excluded from participation in this competition for gold and goods. But then the guardians would have power without responsibility, and would not this lead to tyranny? Not at all. They have political power and direction, but no economic power or wealth. The economic class, if dissatisfied with the guardian's mode of rule, could hold up the food supply, as parliaments control executives by holding up the budget. Well, then, if the guardians have political but not economic power, how can they maintain their rule? Have not Harrington and Marx and many others shown that political power is a reflex of economic power and becomes precarious as soon as economic power passes to a politically subject group, as to the middle classes in the 18th century? This is a very fundamental objection and perhaps a fatal one. The answer might be made that the power of the Roman Catholic Church, which brought even kings to kneel at Carnosa, was based in its earlier centuries of rule rather on the inculcation of dogmas than on the strategy of wealth. But it may be that the long dominion of the Church was due to the agricultural condition of Europe. An agricultural population is inclined to supernatural belief by its helpless dependence on the caprice of the elements and by that inability to control nature which always leads to fear and thence to worship. When industry and commerce developed, a new type of mind and man arose, more realistic and terrestrial, and the power of the church began to crumble as soon as it came into conflict with this new economic fact. Political power must repeatedly readjust itself to the changing balance of economic forces. The economic dependence of Plato's guardians on the economic class would very soon reduce them to the controlled political executives of that class. Even the manipulation of military power would not long forestall this inevitable issue. 
any more than the military forces of revolutionary Russia could prevent the development of a proprietary individualism among the peasants who control the growth of food, and therefore the fate of the nation. Only this would remain to Plato, that even though political policies must be determined by the economically dominant group, it is better that those policies should be administered by officials specifically prepared for the purpose than by men who stumble out of commerce or manufacturing into political office without any training in the arts of statesmanship. What Plato lacks above all, perhaps, is the Heraclitean sense of flux and change. He is too anxious to have the moving picture of this world become a fixed and still tableau. He loves order exclusively, like any timid philosopher. He has been frightened by the democratic turbulence of Athens into an extreme neglect of individual values. He arranges men in classes like an etymologist classifying flies, and he is not averse to using priestly humbug to secure his ends. His state is static. It might easily become an old fogey society ruled by inflexible octogenarians hostile to invention and jealous of change. It is mere science without art. It exalts order so dear to the scientific mind and quite neglects that liberty which is the soul of art. It worships the name of beauty but exiles the artists who alone can make beauty or point it out. It is a Sparta or a Prussia, not an ideal state. And now that these unpleasant necessities are candidly written down, it remains to do willing homage to the power and profundity of Plato's conception. Essentially, he is right, is he not? What this world needs is to be ruled by its wisest men. It is our business to adapt his thought to our own times and limitations. Today we must take democracy for granted. We cannot limit the suffrage as Plato proposed, but we can put restrictions on the holding of office and in this way secure that mixture of democracy and aristocracy which Plato seems to have in mind. We may accept without quarrel his contention that statesmen should be as specifically and thoroughly trained as physicians. We might establish departments of political science and administration in our universities. And when these departments have begun to function adequately, we might make men ineligible for nomination to political office, unless they were graduates of such political schools. We might even make every man eligible for an office who had been trained for it, and thereby eliminate entirely that complex system of nominations in which the corruption of our democracy has its seat. Let the electorate choose any man who, properly trained and qualified, announces himself as a candidate. In this way, democratic choice would be immeasurably wider than now. When Tweedledee and Tweedledum stage their quadrennial show and sham, only one amendment would be required to make quite democratic this plan for the restriction of office to graduates and administrative technique. And that would be such equality of educational opportunity as would open to all men and women, irrespective of the means of their parents, the road to university training and political advancement. It would be very simple to have municipalities and counties and states offer scholarships to all graduates of grammar school, high school and college who had shown a certain standard of ability and whose parents were financially unable to see them through the next stage of the educational process. That would be a democracy worthy of the name. Finally, it is only fair to add that Plato understands that his utopia does not quite fall within the practicable realm. He admits that he has described an ideal difficult of attainment. He answers that there is nevertheless a value in painting these pictures of our desire. Man's significance is that he can image a better world and will some part of it at least into reality. Man is an animal that makes utopias. We look before and after and pine for what is not. Nor is it all without result. Many a dream has grown limbs and walked or grown wings and flown, like the dream of Icarus that men might fly. After all, even if we have but drawn a picture, it may serve as a goal and model of our movement and behavior. When sufficient of us see the picture and follow its gleam, utopia will find its way upon the map. Meanwhile, in heaven there is a laid-up pattern of such a city, and he who desires may behold it, and beholding, govern himself accordingly. But whether there really is or ever will be such a city on earth, he will act according to the laws of that city, and no other. 592. 
The good man will apply even in the imperfect state, the perfect law. Nevertheless, with all these concessions to doubt, the master was bold enough to risk himself when a chance offered to realize his plan. In the year 387 BC, Plato received an invitation from Dionysius, ruler of the then flourishing and powerful Syracuse, capital of Sicily, to come and turn his kingdom into utopia. And the philosopher, thinking the Turgot that it was easier to educate one man, even though a king, than a whole people, consented. But when Dionysius found that the plan required either that he should become a philosopher or cease to be a king, he balked. And the upshot was a bitter quarrel. Story has it that Plato was sold into slavery to be rescued by his friend and pupil, Anaceris, who, when Plato's Athenian followers wished to reimburse him for the ransom he had paid, refused, saying that they should not be the only ones privileged to help philosophy. This, and if we may believe Diogenes Laertius, another similar experience may account for the disillusioned conservatism of Plato's last work, The Laws. And yet the closing years of his long life must have been fairly happy. His pupils had gone out in every direction, and their success had made him honored everywhere. He was at peace in his academe, walking from group to group of his students and giving them problems and tasks on which they were to make research and, when he came to them again, give report and answer. La Rochefoucauld said that, Few know how to grow old. Plato knew. To learn like Solon and to teach like Socrates, to guide the eager young and find the intellectual love of comrades. For his students loved him as he loved them. He was their friend as well as their philosopher and guide. One of his pupils facing that great abyss called marriage invited the master to his wedding feast. Plato came, rich with his eighty years, and joined the merrymakers gladly. But as the hours laughed themselves away, the old philosopher retired into a quiet corner of the house and sat down on a chair to win a little sleep. In the morning, when the feast was over, the tired revelers came to wake him. They found that during the night, quietly and without ado, he had passed from a little sleep to an endless one. All Athens followed him to the grave. Chapter 2 Aristotle and Greek Science 1. The Historical Background Aristotle was born at Stagira, a Macedonian city some 200 miles to the north of Athens in the year 384 BC. His father was friend and physician to Amyntas, king of Macedon, and grandfather of Alexander. Aristotle himself seems to have become a member of the great medical fraternity of Asclepiads. He was brought up in the odor of medicine, as many later philosophers were brought up in the odor of sanctity. He had every opportunity and encouragement to develop a scientific bent of mind. He was prepared from the beginning to become the founder of science. We have a choice of stories for his youth. One narrative represents him as squandering his patrimony and riotous living, joining the army to avoid starvation, returning to Stagira to practice medicine, and going to Athens at the age of 30 to study philosophy under Plato. A more dignified story takes him to Athens at the age of 18 and puts him at once under the tutelage of the great master. But even in this likelier account, there is sufficient echo of a reckless and irregular youth living rapidly. The scandalized reader may console himself by observing that in either story our philosopher anchors at last in the quiet groves of the academy. Under Plato, he studied eight or twenty years. And indeed, the pervasive Platonism of Aristotle's speculations, even of those most anti-Platonic, suggest the longer period. One would like to imagine these as very happy years, a brilliant pupil guided by an incomparable teacher walking like Greek lovers in the gardens of philosophy. But they were both geniuses, and it is notorious that geniuses accord with one another as harmoniously as dynamite with fire. Almost half a century separated them. It was difficult for understanding to bridge the gap of years and cancel the incompatibility of souls. Plato recognizes the greatness of this strange new pupil from the supposedly barbarian north and spoke of him once as the noose of the academy, as if to say, intelligence personified. 
Aristotle had spent money lavishly in the collection of books, that is, in those printless days, manuscripts. He was the first, after Euripides, to gather together a library, and the foundation of the principles of library classification was among his many contributions to scholarship. Therefore, Plato spoke of Aristotle's home as the house of the reader, and seems to have meant the sincerest compliment. But some ancient gossip will have it that the master intended a sly but vigorous dig at a certain book wormishness in Aristotle. A more authentic quarrel seems to have arisen towards the end of Plato's life. Our ambitious youth apparently developed an Oedipus complex against his spiritual father for the favors and affections of philosophy and began to hint that wisdom would not die with Plato. While the old sage spoke of his pupil as a foal that kicks his mother after draining her dry, the learned zeller, in whose pages Aristotle almost achieves the nirvana of respectability, would have us reject these stories. But we may presume that where there is still so much smoke there was once a flame. The other incidents of this Athenian period are still more problematical. Some biographers tell us that Aristotle founded a school of oratory to rival Isocrates, and that he had among his pupils in this school the wealthy Hermias, who was soon to become autocrat of the city-state of Eternius. After reaching this elevation, Hermias invited Aristotle to his court, and in the year 344 BC, he rewarded his teacher for past favors by bestowing upon him a sister, or a niece, in marriage. One might suspect this as a Greek gift. But the historians hasten to assure us that Aristotle, despite his genius, lived happily enough with his wife and spoke of her most affectionately in his will. It was just a year later that Philip, king of Macedon, called Aristotle to the court at Pella to undertake the education of Alexander. It bespeaks the rising repute of our philosopher that the greatest monarch of the time— looking about for the greatest teacher should single out Aristotle to be the tutor of the future master of the world. Philip was determined that his son should have every educational advantage, for he had made for him illimitable designs. His conquest of Thrace in 356 BC had given him command of gold mines, which at once began to yield him precious metal to ten times the amount then coming to Athens from the failing silver of Larium. His people were vigorous peasants and warriors, as yet unspoiled by city luxury and vice. Here was the combination that would make possible the subjugation of a hundred petty city-states and the political unification of Greece. Philip had no sympathy with the individualism that had fostered the art and intellect of Greece, but had at the same time disintegrated her social order. In all these little capitals, he saw not the exhilarating culture and the unsurpassable art but the commercial corruption and the political chaos. He saw insatiable merchants and bankers absorbing the vital resources of the nation, incompetent politicians and clever orators misleading a busy populace into disastrous plots and wars, factions cleaving classes and classes congealing into castes. This, said Philip, was not a nation but only a welter of individuals, geniuses and slaves. He would bring the hand of order down upon this turmoil and make all Greece stand up united and strong as the political center and basis of the world. In his youth in Thebes, he had learned the arts of military strategy and civil organization under the noble Epimenundus. And now, with courage as boundless as his ambition, he bettered the instruction. In 338 BC, he defeated the Athenians at Charonia and saw at last a Greece united, though with chains. And then, as he stood upon this victory and planned how he and his son should master and unify the world, he fell under an assassin's hand. Alexander, when Aristotle came, was a wild youth of thirteen, passionate, epileptic, almost alcoholic. It was his pastime to tame horses untamable by men, the efforts of the philosopher to cool the fires of this budding volcano were not of much avail. Alexander had better success with Bucephalus than Aristotle with Alexander. For a while, says Plutarch, Alexander loved and cherished Aristotle no less than as if he had been his own father, saying that though he had received life from the one, the other had taught him the art of living. 
Life, says a fine Greek adage, is the gift of nature, but beautiful living is the gift of wisdom. For my part, said Alexander in a letter to Aristotle, I had rather excel in the knowledge of what is good than in the extent of my power and dominion. But this was probably no more than a royal youthful compliment. Beneath the enthusiastic Tyro of philosophy was the fiery son of a barbarian princess and an untamed king. The restraints of reason were too delicate to hold these ancestral passions in leash, and Alexander left philosophy after two years to mount the throne and ride the world. History leaves us free to believe, though we should suspect these pleasant thoughts, that Alexander's unifying passion derived some of its force and grandeur from his teacher, the most synthetic thinker in the history of thought, and that the conquest of order in the political realm by the pupil and in the philosophic realm by the master were but diverse sides of one noble and epic project, two magnificent Macedonians unifying two chaotic worlds. Setting out to conquer Asia, Alexander left behind him in the cities of Greece, governments favorable to him but populations resolutely hostile. The long tradition of a free and once imperial Athens made subjection, even to a brilliant world-conquering despot, intolerable, and the bitter eloquence of Demosthenes kept the assembly always on the edge of revolt against the Macedonian party that held the reins of city power. Now when Aristotle, after another period of travel, returned to Athens in the year 334 BC, he very naturally associated with this Macedonian group and took no pains to conceal his approval of Alexander's unifying rule. As we study the remarkable succession of works in speculation and research, which Aristotle proceeded to unfold in the last twelve years of his life, and as we watch him in his multifold tasks of organizing his school, and of coordinating such a wealth of knowledge as probably never before had passed through the mind of one man, let us occasionally remember that this was no quiet and secure pursuit of truth, that at any minute the political sky might change and precipitate a storm in this peaceful philosophic life. Only with this situation in mind shall we understand Aristotle's political philosophy and his tragic end. Two, the work of Aristotle. It was not hard for the instructor of the king of kings to find pupils even in so hostile a city as Athens. When, in the 53rd year of his age, Aristotle established his school, the Lyceum, so many students flocked to him that it became necessary to make complicated regulations for the maintenance of order. The students themselves determined the rules and elected every ten days one of their number to supervise the school. But we must not think of it as a place of rigid discipline. Rather, the picture which comes down to us is of scholars eating their meals in common with the master and learning from him as he and they strolled up and down the walk along the athletic field from which the Lyceum took its name. Note, the walk was called Peripatos, hence the later name Peripatetic School. The athletic field was part of the grounds of the temple of Apollo Lysias, the protector of the flock against the wolf. Lycos. The new school was no mere replica of that which Plato had left behind him. The academy was devoted above all to mathematics and to speculative and political philosophy. The Lyceum had rather a tendency to biology and the natural sciences. If we may believe Pliny, Alexander instructed his hunters, gamekeepers, gardeners, and fishermen to furnish Aristotle with all the zoological and botanical material he might desire. Other ancient writers tell us that at one time he had at his disposal a thousand men scattered throughout Greece and Asia, collecting for him specimens of the fauna and flora of every land. With this wealth of material, he was enabled to establish the first great zoological garden that the world had seen. We can hardly exaggerate the influence of this collection upon his science and his philosophy. Where did Aristotle derive the funds to finance these undertakings? He was himself by this time a man of spacious income, and he had married into the fortune of one of the most powerful public men in Greece. Athenaeus, no doubt with some exaggeration, relates that Alexander gave Aristotle, for physical and biological equipment and research, the sum of 800 talents. 
in modern purchasing power some $4 million. It was at Aristotle's suggestion some think that Alexander sent a costly expedition to explore the sources of the Nile and discover the causes of its periodical overflow. Note. The expedition reported that the inundations were due to the melting of the snow in the mountains of Abyssinia. Such works as the digest of 158 political constitutions drawn up for Aristotle indicate a considerable corpse of aides and secretaries. In short, we have here the first example in European history of the large-scale financing of science by public wealth. What knowledge would we not win if modern states were to support research on a proportionately lavish scale? Yet, we should do Aristotle injustice if we were to ignore the almost fatal limitations of equipment which accompany these unprecedented resources and facilities. He was compelled to fix time without a watch, to compare degrees of heat without a thermometer, to observe the heavens without a telescope and the weather without a barometer. Of all our mathematical, optical, and physical instruments, he possessed only the rule and compass together with the most imperfect substitutes for some few others. Chemical analysis, correct measurements and weights, and a thorough application of mathematics to physics were unknown. The attractive force of matter, the law of gravitation, electrical phenomena, the conditions of chemical combination, pressure of air and its effects, the nature of light, heat, combustion, etc. In short, all the facts on which the physical theories of modern science are based were wholly, or almost wholly, undiscovered. See here how inventions make history. For lack of a telescope, Aristotle's astronomy is a tissue of childish romance. For lack of a microscope, his biology wanders endlessly astray. Indeed, it was in industrial and technical invention that Greece fell farthest below the general standard of its unparalleled achievements. The Greek disdain of manual work kept everybody but the listless slave from direct acquaintance with the process of production, from that stimulating contact with the machinery which reveals defects and prefigures possibilities. Technical invention was possible only to those who had no interest in it and could not derive from it any material reward. Perhaps the very cheapness of the slaves made invention lag. Muscle was still less costly than machines. And so, while Greek commerce conquered the Mediterranean Sea and Greek philosophy conquered the Mediterranean mind, Greek science straggled and Greek industry remained almost where Aegean industry had been when the invading Greeks had come down upon it. At Gnosis, at Tyrens, and Mycenae, a thousand years before. No doubt we have here the reason why Aristotle so seldom appeals to experiment. The mechanism of experiment had not yet been made and the best he could do was to achieve an almost universal and continuous observation. Nevertheless, the vast body of data gathered by him and his assistants became the groundwork of the progress of science, the textbook of knowledge for 2,000 years, one of the wonders of the work of man. Aristotle's writings ran into the hundreds. Some ancient authors credit him with 400 volumes, others with a 1,000. What remains is but a part, and yet it is a library in itself conceive the scope and grandeur of the whole. There are first the logical works, categories, topics, prior and posterior analytics, propositions and sophistical refutation. These works were collected and edited by the later Peripatetics under the general title of Aristotle's Organon, that is the organ or instrument of correct thinking. Secondly, there are the scientific works, physics, on the heavens, growth and decay, meteorology, natural history, on the soul, the parts of animals, the movements of animals, and the generation of animals. There are thirdly the aesthetic works, rhetoric and poetics, and fourthly come the more strictly philosophical works, ethics, politics, and metaphysics. Note, this is the chronological order so far as known, Zeller, I-156. Our discussion will follow this order except in the case of metaphysics. Here, evidently, is the Encyclopedia Britannica of Greece. Every problem under the sun and about it finds a place. No wonder there are more errors and absurdities in Aristotle than in any other philosopher who ever wrote. 
Here's such a synthesis of knowledge and theory as no man would ever achieve again till Spencer's day, and even then not half so magnificently. Here, better than Alexander's fitful and brutal victory, was a conquest of the world. If philosophy is the quest of unity, Aristotle deserves the high name that twenty centuries gave him. Il philosophus. The philosopher. Naturally, in a mind of such scientific turn, poesy was lacking. We must not expect of Aristotle such literary brilliance as floods the pages of the dramatist philosopher Plato. Instead of giving us great literature in which philosophy is embodied and obscured in myth and imagery, Aristotle gives us science, technical, abstract, concentrated. If we go to him for entertainment, we shall sue for the return of our money. Instead of giving terms to literature as Plato did, he built the terminology of science and philosophy. We can hardly speak of any science today without employing terms which he invented. They lie like fossils in the strata of our speech. Faculty, mean, maxim, meaning in Aristotle, the major premise of a syllogism. Category, energy, actuality, motive, end, principle, form. These indispensable coins of philosophic thought were minted in his mind. And perhaps this passage from delightful dialogue to precise scientific treatise was a necessary step in the development of philosophy. And science, which is the basis and backbone of philosophy, could not grow until it had evolved its own strict methods of procedure and expression. Aristotle, too, wrote literary dialogues, as highly reputed in their day as Plato's, but they are lost, just as the scientific treatises of Plato have perished. Probably time has preserved of each man the better part. Finally, it is possible that the writings attributed to Aristotle were not his, but were largely the compilations of students and followers who had embalmed the unadorned substance of his lectures in their notes. It does not appear that Aristotle published in his lifetime any technical writings except those on logic and rhetoric, and the present form of the logical treatises is due to later editing. In the case of the metaphysics and the politics, the notes left by Aristotle seem to have been put together by his executors without revision or alteration. Even the unity of style which marks Aristotle's writings and offers an argument to those who defend his direct authorship may be, after all, merely a unity given them through common editing by the peripatetic school. About this matter there rages a sort of Homeric question of almost epic scope into which the busy reader will not care to go and on which the modest student will not undertake to judge. We may at all events be sure that Aristotle is the spiritual author of all these books that bear his name, that the hand may be in some cases another's hand, but that the head and the heart are his. Note, the reader who wishes to go to the philosopher himself will find the meteorology an interesting example of Aristotle's scientific work. He will derive much practical instruction from the rhetoric, and he will find Aristotle at his best in books 1 to 2 of the Ethics and books 1 to 4 of the Politics. The best translation of the Ethics is Veldun's. Of the Politics, Jowett's Sir Alexander Grant's Aristotle is a simple book. Zeller's Aristotle, Greek philosophy, is scholarly but dry. Gomperz's Greek Thinkers, Volume 4, is masterly but difficult. 3. The Foundation of Logic The first great distinction of Aristotle is that almost without predecessors, almost entirely by his own hard thinking, he created a new science. Logic. Renan speaks of the ill training of every mind that is not directly or indirectly, come under Greek discipline. But in truth, the Greek intellect itself was undisciplined and chaotic till the ruthless formulas of Aristotle provided a ready method for the test and correction of thought. Even Plato, if a lover may so far presume, was an unruly and irregular soul caught up too frequently in a cloud of myth and letting beauty too richly veil the face of truth. Aristotle himself, as we shall see, violated his own canons plentifully. But then he was the product of his past and not of that future which his thought would build. The political and economic decay of Greece brought a weakening of the Hellenic mind and character after Aristotle. 
But when a new race, after a millennium of barbaric darkness, found again the leisure and ability for speculation, it was Aristotle's Organon of Logic, translated by Boethius, 470 to 525 AD, that became the very mold of medieval thought, the strict mother of that scholastic philosophy which, though rendered sterile by encircling dogmas, nevertheless trained the intellect of adolescent Europe to reasoning and subtlety, constructed the terminology of modern science, and laid the basis of that same maturity of mind which was to outgrow and overthrow the very system and methods which had given it birth and sustenance. Logic means simply the art and method of correct thinking. It is the logi, or method of every science, of every discipline and every art, and even music harbors it. It is a science because to a considerable extent the processes of correct thinking can be reduced to rules like physics and geometry, and taught to any normal mind. It is an art because by practice it gives to thought at last that unconscious and immediate accuracy which guides the fingers of the pianist over his instrument to effortless harmonies. Nothing is so dull as logic, and nothing is so important. There was a hint of this new science in Socrates' maddening insistence on definitions, and in Plato's constant refining of every concept. Aristotle's little treatise on definition shows us how his logic found nourishment at this source. If you wish to converse with me, said Voltaire, define your terms. How many a debate would have been deflated into a paragraph if the disputants had dared to define their terms? This is the alpha and omega of logic, the heart and soul of it, that every important term in serious discourse shall be subjected to strictest scrutiny and definition. It is difficult and ruthlessly tests the mind, but once done it is half of any task. How shall we proceed to define an object or a term? Aristotle answers that every good definition has two parts, stands on two solid feet. First, it assigns the object in question to a class or group whose general characteristics are also its own. So man is, first of all, an animal, and secondly, it indicates wherein the object differs from all the other members in its class. So man, in the Aristotelian system, is a rational animal. His specific difference is that, unlike all other animals, he is rational. Here is the origin of a pretty legend. Aristotle drops an object into the ocean of its class, then takes it out, dripping with generic meaning, with the marks of its kind and group, while its individuality and difference shine out all the more clearly for this juxtaposition with other objects that resemble it so much and are so different. Passing out from this rear line of logic, we come into the great battlefield on which Aristotle fought out with Plato the dread question of universals. It was the first conflict in a war which was to last till our own day and make all medieval Europe ring with the clash of realists and nominalists. Note, it was in reference to this debate that Friedrich Schlegel said, every man is born either a Platonist or an Aristotelian. In Ben I-291. A universal, to Aristotle, is any common noun, any name, capable of universal application to the members of a class. So animal, man, book, tree are universals. But these universals are subjective notions, not tangibly objective realities. They are nomina, names, not res, things. All that exists outside us is a world of individual and specific objects, not of generic and universal things. Men exist, and trees and animals, but man in general, or the universal man, does not exist except in thought. He is a handy mental abstraction, not an external presence of reality. Now Aristotle understands Plato to have held that universals have objective existence. And indeed Plato had said that the universal is incomparably more lasting and important and substantial than the individual the latter being but a little wavelet in a ceaseless surf. Men come and go, but man goes on forever. Aristotle's is a matter-of-fact mind. As William James would say, a tough, not a tender mind. He sees the root of endless mysticism and scholarly nonsense in this Platonic realism, and he attacks it with all the vigor of a first polemic. As Brutus loved not Caesar less, but Rome more, so Aristotle says, 
Amicus Plato, said Magis, Amica Veritas. Dear is Plato, but dearer still is truth. A hostile commentator might remark that Aristotle, like Nietzsche, criticizes Plato so keenly because he is conscious of having borrowed from him generously. No man is a hero to his debtors. But Aristotle has a healthy attitude, nevertheless. He is a realist almost in the modern sense. He is resolved to concern himself with the objective present while Plato is absorbed in a subjective future. There was, in the Socratic Platonic demand for definitions, a tendency away from things and facts to theories and ideas, from particulars to generalities, from science to scholasticism. At last, Plato became so devoted to generalities that they began to determine his particulars, so devoted to ideas that they began to define or select his facts. Aristotle preaches a return to things, to the unwithered face of nature and reality. He had a lusty preference for the concrete particular, for the flesh and blood individual. But Plato so loved the general and universal that in Republic he destroyed the individual to make a perfect state. Yet, as is the usual humor of history, the young warrior takes over many of the qualities of the old master whom he assails. We have always goodly stock in us of that which we condemn, as only similars can be profitably contrasted, so only similar people quarrel, and the bitterest wars are over the slightest variations of purpose or belief. The knightly crusaders found in Saladin a gentleman with whom they could quarrel amicably, but when the Christians of Europe broke into hostile camps, there was no quarter for even the courtliest foe. Aristotle is so ruthless with Plato because there is so much of Plato in him. He, too, remains a lover of abstractions and generalities, repeatedly betraying the simple fact for some speciously bedizened theory, and compelled to a continuous struggle to conquer his philosophic passion for exploring the Empyrean. There is a heavy trace of this in the most characteristic and original of Aristotle's contributions to philosophy, the doctrine of the syllogism. A syllogism is a trio of propositions of which the third, the conclusion, follows from the conceded truth of the other two, the major and minor premises. Example, man is a rational animal, but Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is a rational animal. The mathematical reader will see at once that the structure of the syllogism resembles the proposition that two things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. If A is B and C is A, then C is B. As in the mathematical case, the conclusion is reached by cancelling from both premises their common term, A. So in our syllogism, their conclusion is reached by cancelling from both premises their common term, man, and combining what remains. The difficulty, as logicians have pointed out from the days of Pyro to those of Stuart Mill, lies in this that the major premise of the syllogism takes for granted precisely the point to be proved. For if Socrates is not rational, and no one questions that he is a man, it is not universally true that man is a rational animal. Aristotle would reply, no doubt, that where an individual is found to have a large number of qualities characteristic of a class, Socrates is a man, a strong presumption is established that the individual has the other qualities characteristic of the class rationality. But apparently the syllogism is not a mechanism for the discovery of truth, so much as for the clarification of exposition and thought. All this, like the many other items of the organon, has its value. Aristotle has discovered and formulated every canon of theoretical consistency and every artifice of dialectical debate, with an industry and acuteness which cannot be too highly extolled and his labors in this direction have perhaps contributed more than any single writer to the intellectual stimulation of after ages. But no man ever lived who could lift logic to a lofty strain. A guide to correct reasoning is as elevating as a manual of etiquette. We may use it, but it hardly spurs us to nobility. Not even the bravest philosopher would sing to a book of logic underneath the bow. One always feels toward logic as Virgil bade Dante feel towards those who had been damned because of their colorless neutrality. Non regionam dilor magarda e passa. Let us think no more about them, but look once and pass on. 4. 
the organization of science. 1. Greek science before Aristotle. Socrates, says Renan, gave philosophy to mankind, and Aristotle gave it science. There was philosophy before Socrates and science before Aristotle. And since Socrates and since Aristotle, philosophy and science have made immense advances. But all has been built upon the foundation which they laid. Before Aristotle, science was in embryo. With him, it was born. Earlier civilizations than the Greek had made attempts at science. But so far as we can catch their thought through their still obscure cuneiform and hieroglyphic script, their science was indistinguishable from theology. That is to say, these pre-Hellenic peoples explained every obscure operation in nature by some supernatural agency. Everywhere there were gods. Apparently it was the Ionian Greeks who first dared to give natural explanations of cosmic complexities and mysterious events. They sought in physics the natural causes of particular incidents and in philosophy a natural theory of the whole. Thales, 640 to 550 BC, the father of philosophy, was primarily an astronomer who astonished the natives of Miletus by informing them that the sun and stars, which they were wont to worship as gods, were merely balls of fire. His pupil Anaximander, 610 to 540 BC, the first Greek to make astronomical and geographical charts, believed that the universe had begun as an undifferentiated mass, from which all things had arisen by the separation of opposites. That astronomic history periodically repeated itself in the evolution and dissolution of an infinite number of worlds, that the earth was at rest in space by a balance of internal impulsions, like Buridan's ass, that all of our planets had once been fluid, but had been evaporated by the sun, that life had first been formed in the sea but had been driven upon the land by the subsidence of the water, that of these stranded animals some had developed the capacity to breathe air, and had so become the progenitors of all later land life, that man could not from the beginning have been what he now was. For if man on his first appearance had been so helpless at birth, and had required so long an adolescence, as in these later days, he could not possibly have survived. Anaximenes, another Milesian, 450 BC, described the primeval condition of things as a very rarefied mass, gradually condensing into wind, cloud, water, earth, and stone. The three forms of matter, gas, liquid, and solid, were progressive stages of condensation. Heat and cold were merely rarefaction and condensation. Earthquakes were due to the solidification of originally fluid earth. Life and soul were one, an animating and expansive force presenting in everything everywhere. Anaxagoras, 500-428 BC, teacher of Pericles, seemed to have given a correct explanation of solar and lunar eclipses. He discovered the processes of respiration in plants and fishes. And he explained man's intelligence by the power of manipulation that came when the forelimbs were freed from the tasks of locomotion. Slowly, in these men, knowledge grew into science. Heraclitus, 530-470 BC, who left wealth and its cares to live a life of poverty and study in the shade of the temple, porticos at Ephesus, turned science from astronomy to earthlier concerns. All things forever flow and change, he said. Even in the stillest matter there is unseen flux and movement. Cosmic history runs in repetitious cycles each beginning and ending in fire. Here is one source of the Stoic and Christian doctrine of last judgment in hell. Through strife, says Heraclitus, all things arise and pass away. War is the father and king of all. Some he has made gods and some men, some slaves and some free. Where there is no strife, there is decay. The mixture which is not shaken decomposes. In this flux of change and struggle and selection, only one thing is constant, and that is law. This order, the same for all things, no one of gods or men has made, but it always was and is and shall be. Empedocles, 445 BC in Sicily, developed to a further stage the idea of evolution. Organs arise not by design but by selection, 
Nature makes many trials and experiments with organisms, combining organs variously. Where the combination meets environmental needs, the organism survives and perpetuates its like. Where the combination fails, the organism is weeded out. As time goes on, organisms are more and more intricately and successfully adapted to their surroundings. Finally, in Lucipus, 445 BC, and Democritus, 460 to 360, master and pupil in Thracian Abdera, we get the last stage of pre-Aristotelian science, materialistic, deterministic atomism. Everything, said Lucipus, is driven by necessity. In reality, said Democritus, there are only atoms and the void. Perception is due to the expulsion of atoms from the object upon the sense organ. There is or have been or will be an infinite number of worlds. At every moment, planets are colliding and dying, and new worlds are rising out of chaos by the selective aggregation of atoms of similar size and shape. There is no design. The universe is a machine. This, in dizzy and superficial summary, is the story of Greek science before Aristotle. Its cruder items can be well forgiven when we consider the narrow circle of experimental and observational equipment within which these pioneers were compelled to work. The stagnation of Greek industry under the incubus of slavery prevented the full development of these magnificent beginnings. And the rapid complication of political life in Athens turned the sophists and Socrates and Plato away from physical and biological research into the paths of ethical and political theory. It is one of the many glories of Aristotle that he was broad and brave enough to compass and combine these two lines of Greek thought, the physical and the moral, that going back beyond his teacher, he caught again the thread of scientific development in the pre-Socratic Greeks, carried on their work with more resolute detail and more varied observation, and brought together all the accumulated results in a magnificent body of organized science. 2. Aristotle as a Naturalist If we begin here chronologically with his physics, we shall be disappointed, for we find that this treatise is really a metaphysics, an abstruse analysis of matter, motion, space, time, infinity, cause, and other such ultimate concepts. One of the more lively passages is an attack on Democritus. Void there can be no void or vacuum in nature, says Aristotle, for in a vacuum all bodies would fall with equal velocity. This being impossible, the supposed void turns out to have nothing in it. An instance, at once, of Aristotle's very occasional humor, his addiction to unproved assumptions and his tendency to disparage his predecessors in philosophy. It was the habit of our philosopher to preface his works with historical sketches of previous contributions to the subject in hand, and to add to every contribution an annihilating refutation. Aristotle, after the Ottoman manner, says Bacon, thought he could not reign secure without putting all of his brethren to death. But to this fratricidal mania we owe much of our knowledge of pre-Socratic thought. For reasons already given, Aristotle's astronomy represents very little advance upon his predecessors. He rejects the view of Pythagoras that the sun is the center of our system. He prefers to give that honor to the earth. But the little treatise on meteorology is full of brilliant observations, and even its speculations strike illuminating fire. This is a cyclic world, says our philosopher. The sun forever evaporates the sea, dries up rivers and springs, and transforms at last the boundless ocean into the barest rock. While conversely, the uplifted moisture gathered into clouds falls and renews the rivers and the seas. Everywhere, change goes on, imperceptibly but effectively. Egypt is the work of the Nile, the product of its deposits through a thousand centuries. Here the sea encroaches upon the land. There the land reaches out timidly into the sea. New continents and new oceans rise, old oceans and old continents disappear, and all the face of the world is changed and rechanged in a great systole and diastole of growth and dissolution. Sometimes these vast effects occur suddenly and destroy the geological and material bases of civilization and even of life. 
Great catastrophes have periodically denuded the earth and reduced man again to his first beginnings. Like Sisyphus, civilization has repeatedly neared its zenith only to fall back into barbarism and begin de capo, its upward travail. Hence the almost eternal recurrence in civilization after civilization of the same inventions and discoveries, the same dark ages of slow economic and cultural accumulation, the same rebirths of learning and science and art. No doubt some popular myths are vague traditions surviving from earlier cultures. So the story of man runs in a dreary circle, because he is not yet master of the earth that holds him. Three, the foundation of biology. As Aristotle walked wandering through his great zoological garden, he became convinced that the infinite variety of life could be arranged in a continuous series in which each link would be almost indistinguishable from the next. In all respects, whether in structure or mode of life or reproduction and rearing or sensation and feeling, there are minute gradations and progressions from the lowest organisms to the highest. At the bottom of the scale, we can scarcely divide the living from the dead. Nature makes so gradual a transition from the inanimate to the animate kingdom that the boundary lines which separate them are indistinct and doubtful. And perhaps a degree of life exists even in the inorganic. Again, many species cannot with certainty be called plants or animals. And as in these lower organisms, it is almost impossible at times to assign them to their proper genus and species. So similar are they. So in every order of life, the continuity of gradations and differences is as remarkable as the diversity of functions and forms. But in the midst of this bewildering richness of structures, certain things stand out convincingly. That life has grown steadily in complexity and in power that intelligence has progressed in correlation with complexity of structure and mobility of form, that there has been an increasing specialization of function and a continuous centralization of physiological control. Slowly, life created for itself a nervous system and a brain, and mind moved resolutely on towards the mastery of its environment. The remarkable fact here is that with all these gradations and similarities leaping to Aristotle's eyes, he does not come to the theory of evolution. He rejects Empedocles' doctrine that all organs and organisms are a survival of the fittest, and Anaxagoras' idea that man became intelligent by using his hands for manipulation rather than for movement. Aristotle thinks, on the contrary, that man so used his hands because he had become intelligent. Indeed, Aristotle makes as many mistakes as possible for a man who is founding the science of biology. He thinks, for example, that the male element in reproduction merely stimulates and quickens. It does not occur to him, what we know from experiments in parthenogenesis, that the essential function of the sperm is not so much to fertilize the ovum as to provide the embryo with the heritable qualities of the male parent, and so permit the offspring to be a vigorous variant, a new admixture of two ancestral lines. As human dissection was not practiced in his time, he is particularly fertile in physiological errors. He knows nothing of muscles, not even of their existence. He does not distinguish arteries from veins. He thinks the brain is an organ for cooling the blood. He believes, forgivably, that man has more sutures in the skull than women. He believes, less forgivably, that man has only eight ribs on each side. He believes, incredibly and unforgivably, that a woman has fewer teeth than man. Apparently, his relations with women were of the most amicable kind. Yet he makes a greater total advance in biology than any Greek before or after him. He perceives that birds and reptiles are near allied in structure, that the monkey is in form immediate between quadrupeds and man. And once he boldly declares that man belongs in one group of animals with the viviparous quadrupeds, or mammals, he remarks that the soul in infancy is scarcely distinguishable from the soul of animals. He makes the illuminating observation that diet often determines the mode of life. For of beasts, some are gregarious and others solitary. They live in the way which is best adapted to obtain the food of their choice. He anticipates von Baer's famous law that characters common to the genus, like eyes and ears, 
appear in the developing organism before characters peculiar to its species, like the formula of the teeth, or to its individual self, like the final color of the eyes. And he reaches out across 2,000 years to anticipate Spencer's generalization that individuation varies inversely as genesis. That is, that the more highly developed and specialized a species or an individual it happens to be, the smaller will be the number of its offspring. He notices and explains reversion to type, the tendency of a prominent variation, like genius, to be diluted in mating and lost in successive generations. He makes many zoological observations which, temporarily rejected by later biologists, have been confirmed by modern research. The fishes that make nests, for example, and sharks that boast of a placenta. And finally, he establishes the science of embryology. He who sees things grow from their beginning, he writes, will have the finest view of them. Hippocrates, B. 460 B.C., greatest of Greek physicians, had given a fine example of the experimental method by breaking a hen's eggs at various stages of incubation and had applied the results of these studies in his treatise on the origin of the child. Aristotle followed this lead and performed experiments that enabled him to give a description of the development of the chick, which even today arouses the admiration of embryologists. He must have performed some novel experiments in genetics, for he disproves the theory that the sex of the child depends on what testis supplies the reproductive fluid by quoting a case where the right testes of the father had been tied and yet the children had been of different sexes. He raises some very modern problems of heredity. A woman of Ellis had married a Negro. Her children were all whites, but in the next generation, Negroes reappeared. Where, asks Aristotle, was the blackness hidden in the middle generation? There was but a step from such a vital and intelligent query to the apocal experiments of Gregor Mendel, 1822-1882. Prudens questio dimidium scientiae. To know what to ask is already to know half. Surely, despite the errors that mar these biological works, they form the greatest monument ever raised to science by any one man. When we consider that before Aristotle there had been, so far as we know, no biology beyond scattered observations, we perceive that this achievement alone might have sufficed for one lifetime and would have given immortality. But Aristotle had only begun. 5. Metaphysics and the Nature of God his metaphysics grew out of his biology. Everything in the world is moved by an inner urge to become something greater than it is. Everything is both the form or reality which has grown out of something which was its matter or raw material, and it may in turn be the matter out of which still higher forms will grow. So the man is the form of which the child was the matter. The child is the form and its embryo the matter the embryo the form, the ovum the matter, and so back till we reach in a vague way the conception of matter without form at all. But such a formless matter would be no thing, for everything has a form. Matter, in its widest sense, is the possibility of form. Form is the actuality, the finished reality of matter. Matter obstructs, form constructs. Form is not merely the shape, but the shaping force, an inner necessity and impulse which molds mere material to a specific figure and purpose. It is the realization of a potential capacity of matter. It is the sum of the powers residing in anything to do, to be, or to become. Nature is the conquest of matter by form, the constant progression and victory of life. Note, half of our readers will be pleased and the other half amused. To learn that among Aristotle's favorite examples of matter and form are woman and man. The male is the active, formative principle. The female is passive, clay, waiting to be formed. Female offspring are the result of the failure of form to dominate matter. Degen N. 1 2. Everything in the world moves naturally to a specific fulfillment. Of the varied causes which determine an event, the final cause which determines the purpose is the most decisive and important. The mistakes and futilities of nature are due to the inertia of matter resisting the forming force of purpose. 
hence the abortions and monsters that mar the panorama of life. Development is not haphazard or accidental, else how could we explain the almost universal appearance and transmission of useful organs? Everything is guided in a certain direction from within by its nature and structure and entelechy. The egg of the hen is internally designed or destined to become not a duck but a chick. The acorn becomes not a willow but an oak. Note, entelechia, having echo, its purpose, telos, within entos, one of those magnificent Aristotelian terms which gather up into themselves a whole philosophy. This does not mean for Aristotle that there is an external providence designing earthly structures and events. Rather, the design is internal and arises from the type and function of the thing. Divine providence coincides completely for Aristotle with the operation of natural causes. Yet there is a God, though not perhaps the simple and human God conceived by the forgivable anthropomorphism of the adolescent mind. Aristotle approaches the problem from the old puzzle about motion. How, he asks, does motion begin? He will not accept the possibility that motion is as beginningless as he conceives matter to be. Matter may be eternal, because it is merely the everlasting possibility of future forms. But when and how did that vast process of motion and formation begin, which at last filled the wide universe with an infinity of shapes? Surely motion has a source, says Aristotle, and if we are not to plunge drearily into an infinite regress, putting back our problem step by step endlessly, we must posit a prime mover unmoved. Primum mobile emotum, a being incorporeal, indivisible, spaceless, sexless, passionless, changeless, perfect, and eternal. God does not create, but he moves the world, and he moves it not as a mechanical force, but as the total motive of all operations in the world. God moves the world as the beloved object moves the lover. He is the final cause of nature, the drive and purpose of things, the form of the world the principle of its life, the sum of its vital processes and powers, the inherent goal of its growth, the energizing entelechy of the whole. He is pure energy, the scholastic actus purus activity per se, perhaps the mystic force of modern physics and philosophy. He is not so much a person as a magnetic power. Yet, with his usual inconsistency, Aristotle represents God as self-conscious spirit a rather mysterious spirit, for Aristotle's God never does anything. He has no desires, no will, no purpose. He has activity so pure that he never acts. He is absolutely perfect. Therefore, he cannot desire anything. Therefore, he does nothing. His only occupation is to contemplate the essence of things. And since he himself is the essence of all things, the form of all forms, his sole employment is the contemplation of himself. Poor Aristotelian god, he is a Roy Fanon, a do-nothing king. The king reigns, but he does not rule. No wonder the British like Aristotle. His god is obviously copied from their king. Or from Aristotle himself. Our philosopher so loved contemplation that he sacrificed to it his conception of divinity. His god is of the quiet Aristotelian type, nothing romantic withdrawn to his ivory tower from the strife and stain of things. All the world away from the philosopher kings of Plato, or from the stern flesh and blood reality of Yahweh, or the gentle and solicitous fatherhood of the Christian God. 6. Psychology and the Nature of Art Aristotle's psychology is marred with similar obscurity and vacillation. There are many interesting passages. The power of habit is emphasized and is for the first time called second nature, and the laws of association, though not developed, find here a definite formulation. But both the crucial problems of philosophical psychology, the freedom of the will and the immortality of the soul, are left in haze and doubt. Aristotle talks at times like a determinist. We cannot directly will to be different from what we are. But he goes on to argue against determinism that we can choose what we shall be by choosing now the environment that shall mold us. 
So we are free in the sense that we would mold our own characters by our choice of friends, books, occupations, and amusements. He does not anticipate the determinist's ready reply that these formative choices are themselves determined by our antecedent character, and this at last by unchosen heredity and early environment. He presses the point that our persistent use of praise and blame presupposes moral responsibility and free will. It does not occur to him that the determinist might reach from the same premises a precisely opposite conclusion, that praise and blame are given that they may be part of the factors determining subsequent action. Aristotle's theory of the soul begins with an interesting definition. The soul is the entire vital principle of any organism, the sum of its powers and processes. In plants, the soul is merely a nutritive and reproductive power. In animals, it is also a sensitive and locomotive power. In man, it is as well the power of reason and thought. The soul, as the sum of the powers of the body, cannot exist without it. The two are as form and wax, separable only in thought, but in reality one organic whole. The soul is not put into the body like the quicksilver inserted by Daedalus into the images of Venus to make stand-ups of them. A personal and particular soul can exist only in its own body. Nevertheless, the soul is not material as Democritus would have it, nor does it all die. Part of the rational power of the human soul is passive. It is bound up with memory and dies with the body that bore the memory. But the active reason, the pure power of thought, is independent of memory and is untouched with decay. The active reason is the universal as distinguished from the individual element in man. What survives is not the personality with its transitory affections and desires, but mind in its most abstract and impersonal form. In short, Aristotle destroys the soul in order to give it immortality. The immortal soul is pure thought, undefiled with reality, just as Aristotle's God is pure activity, undefiled with action. Let him who can be comforted with this theology. One wonders sometimes whether this metaphysical eating of one's cake and keeping it is not Aristotle's subtle way of saving himself from anti-Macedonian hemlock. In the safer field of psychology, he writes more originally and to the point, and almost creates the study of aesthetics, the theory of beauty and art. Artistic creation, says Aristotle, springs from the formative impulse and the craving for emotional expression. Essentially, the form of art is an imitation of reality. It holds the mirror up to nature. There is in man a pleasure in imitation, apparently missing in lower animals. Yet the aim of art is to represent not the outward appearance of things, but their inward significance. For this, and not the external mannerism and detail, is their reality. There may be more human verity in the sternly classic moderation of the Oedipus Rex than in all the realistic tears of the Trojan women. The noblest art appeals to the intellect as well as to the feelings as a symphony appeals to us not only by its harmonies and sequences, but by its structure and development. And this intellectual pleasure is the highest form of joy to which a man can rise. Hence a work of art should aim at form, and above all, at unity, which is the backbone of structure and the focus of form. A drama, example, should have unity of action. There should be no confusing subplots nor any digressive episodes. But above all, the function of art is catharsis, purification. Emotions accumulated in us under the pressure of social restraints and liable to sudden issue and unsocial and destructive action are touched off and sluiced away in the harmless form of theatrical excitement. So tragedy, through pity and fear, affects the proper purgation of these emotions. Aristotle misses certain features of tragedy. Example, the conflict of principles and personalities. But in this theory of catharsis, he has made a suggestion endlessly fertile in the understanding of the almost mystic power of art. It is an illuminating instance of his ability to enter every field of speculation and to adorn whatever he touches. 7. Ethics and the Nature of Happiness and yet, as Aristotle developed, and young men crowded about him to be taught and formed, more and more his mind turned from the details of science to the larger and vaguer problems of conduct and character. 
It came to him more clearly that above all questions of the physical world, there loomed the question of questions. What is the best life? What is life's supreme good? What is virtue? How shall we find happiness and fulfillment? He is realistically simple in his ethics. His scientific training keeps him from the preachment of superhuman ideals and empty counsels of perfection. In Aristotle, says Santayana, the conception of human nature is perfectly sound. Every ideal has a natural basis and everything natural has an ideal development. Aristotle begins by frankly recognizing that the aim of life is not goodness for its own sake, but happiness. For we choose happiness for itself, and never with a view to anything further, whereas we choose honor, pleasure, intellect, because we believe that through them we shall be made happy. But he realizes that to call happiness the supreme good is a mere truism. What is wanted is some clearer account of the nature of happiness and the way to it. He hopes to find this way by asking wherein man differs from other beings, and by presuming that man's happiness will lie in the full functioning of this specifically human quality. Now the peculiar excellence of man is his power of thought. It is by this that he surpasses and rules all other forms of life. And as the growth of this faculty has given him his supremacy, so we may presume its development will give him fulfillment and happiness. The chief condition of happiness, then, barring certain physical prerequisites, is the life of reason, the specific glory and power of man. Virtue, or rather excellence, will depend on clear judgment, self-control, symmetry of desire, artistry of means. It is not the possession of the simple man, nor the gift of innocent intent, but the achievement of experience in the fully developed man. Note. The word excellence is probably the fittest translation of the Greek arit, usually mistranslated virtue. The reader will avoid misunderstanding Plato and Aristotle if, where translators write virtue, he will substitute excellence, ability, or capacity. The Greek arit is the Roman virtus. Both imply a masculine sort of excellence. Ares, god of war, vir, a male. Classical antiquity conceived virtue in terms of man, just as medieval Christianity conceived it in terms of woman. Yet, there is a road to it, a guide to excellence, which may save many detours and delays. It is the middle way, the golden mean. The qualities of character can be arranged in triads, in each of which the first and last qualities will be extremes and vices, and the middle quality a virtue or an excellence. So between cowardice and rashness is courage, between stinginess and extravagance is liberality, between sloth and greed is ambition, between humility and pride is modesty, between secrecy and loquacity, honesty, between moroseness and buffoonery, good humor, between quarrelsomeness and flattery, friendship, between Hamlet's indecisiveness and Quixote's impulsiveness is self-control. Right, then, in ethics or conduct is not different from right in mathematics or engineering. It means correct, fit, what works best to the best result. The golden mean, however, is not like the mathematical mean, an exact average of two precise calculable extremes. It fluctuates with the collateral circumstances of each situation and discovers itself only to mature and flexible reason. Excellence is an art won by training and habituation. We do not act rightly because we have virtue or excellence, but we rather have these because we have acted rightly. These virtues are formed in man by doing the actions. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act but a habit. The good of man is a working of the soul in the way of excellence in a complete life. For as it is not one swallow or one fine day that makes a spring, so it is not one day or a short time that makes a man blessed and happy. Youth is the age of extremes. If the young commit a fault, it is always on the side of excess and exaggeration. The great difficulty of youth, and of many of youth's elders, is to get out of one extreme without falling into its opposite. For one extreme easily passes into the other, whether through overcorrection or elsewise. Insincerity doth protest too much, and humility hovers on the precipice of conceit. Note. The vanity of Antisthenes, the cynic, 
said Plato, peeps out through the holes in his cloak. Those who are consciously at one extreme will give the name of virtue not to the mean but to the opposite extreme. Sometimes this is well, for if we are conscious of erring in one extreme, we should aim at the other, and so we may reach the middle position, as men do in straightening bent timber. But unconscious extremists look upon the golden mean as the greatest vice. They expel towards each other the man in the middle position. The brave man is called rash by the coward, and cowardly by the rash man, and in other cases accordingly. So in modern politics, the liberal is called conservative and radical by the radical and the conservative. It is obvious that this doctrine of the mean is the formulation of a characteristic attitude which appears in almost every system of Greek philosophy. Plato had had it in mind when he had called virtue harmonious action. Socrates, when he identified virtue with knowledge. The seven wise men had established the tradition by engraving on the temple of Apollo at Delphi the motto, Midin Agan, nothing in excess. Perhaps, as Nietzsche claims, all these were attempts of the Greeks to check their own violence and impulsiveness of character. More truly, they reflected the Greek feeling that passions are not of themselves vices, but the raw material of both vice and virtue, according as they function in excess and disproportion, or in measure and harmony. Note, a sociological formulation of the same idea. Values are never absolute but only relative. A certain quality in human nature is deemed to be less abundant than it ought to be. Therefore, we place a value upon it and encourage and cultivate it. As a result of this valuation, we call it a virtue. But if the same quality should become superabundant, we should call it a vice and try to repress it. Carver, Essays in Social Justice but the golden mean, says our matter-of-fact philosopher, is not all of the secret of happiness. We must have, too, a fair degree of worldly goods. Poverty makes one stingy and grasping, while possessions give one that freedom from care and greed, which is the source of aristocratic ease and charm. The noblest of these external aids to happiness is friendship. Indeed, friendship is more necessary to the happy than to the unhappy, for happiness is multiplied by being shared. It is more important than justice. For when men are friends, justice is unnecessary. But when men are just, friendship is still a boon. A friend is one soul in two bodies. Yet friendship implies few friends rather than many. He who has many friends has no friend. And to be a friend to many people in the way of perfect friendship is impossible. Fine friendship requires duration rather than fitful intensity, and this implies stability of character. It is to altered character that we must attribute the dissolving kaleidoscope of friendship. And friendship requires equality, for gratitude gives it at best a slippery basis. Benefactors are commonly held to have more friendship for the objects of their kindness than these for them. The account of the matter which satisfied most persons is that the one are debtors and the others creditors, and that the debtors wish their creditors out of the way, while the creditors are anxious that their debtors should be preserved. Aristotle rejects this interpretation. He prefers to believe that the greater tenderness of the benefactor is to be explained on the analogy of the artist's affection for his work, or the mother's for her child. We love that which we have made. And yet, Though external goods and relationships are necessary to happiness, its essence remains within us in rounded knowledge and clarity of soul. Surely sense pleasure is not the way. That road is a circle, as Socrates phrased the coarser Epicurean idea. We scratch that we may itch, and itch that we may scratch. Nor can a political career be the way, for therein we walk subject to the whims of the people, and nothing is so fickle as the crowd. No, happiness must be a pleasure of the mind, and we may trust it only when it comes from the pursuit or the capture of truth. The operation of the intellect aims at no end beyond itself and finds in itself the pleasure which stimulates it to further operation. And since the attributes of self-sufficiency, unweariedness, and capacity for rest plainly belong to this occupation, in it must lie perfect happiness. 
Aristotle's ideal man, however, is no mere metaphysician. He does not expose himself needlessly to danger, since there are few things for which he cares sufficiently, but he is willing in great crises to give even his life, knowing that under certain conditions it is not worthwhile to live. He is of a disposition to do men service, though he is ashamed to have a service done to him. To confer a kindness is a mark of superiority, to receive one is a mark of subordination. He does not take part in public displays. He is open in his dislikes and preferences. He talks and acts, frankly, because of his contempt for men and things. He is never fired with admiration, since there is nothing great in his eyes. He cannot live in complacence with others, except it be a friend. Complacence is the characteristic of a slave. He never feels malice and always forgets and passes over injuries. He is not fond of talking. It is of no concern of his that he should be praised or that others should be blamed. He does not speak evil of others, even of his enemies, unless it be to themselves. His carriage is sedate, his voice deep, his speech measured. He is not given to hurry, for he is concerned about only a few things. He is not prone to vehemence, for he thinks nothing very important. A shrill voice and hasty steps come to a man through care. He bears the accidents of life with dignity and grace, making the best of his circumstances, like a skillful general who marshals his limited forces with all the strategy of war. He is his own best friend and takes delight in privacy, whereas the man of no virtue or ability is his own worst enemy and is afraid of solitude. Such is the Superman of Aristotle. 8. Politics 1. Communism and Conservatism from so aristocratic an ethic, there naturally follows, or was the sequence the other way, a severely aristocratic political philosophy. It was not to be expected that the tutor of an emperor and the husband of a princess would have any exaggerated attachment to the common people, or even to the mercantile bourgeoisie. Our philosophy is where our treasure lies. But further, Aristotle was honestly conservative because of the turmoil and disaster that had come out of Athenian democracy. Like a typical scholar, he longed for order, security, and peace. This, he felt, was no time for political extravaganzas. Radicalism is a luxury of stability. We may dare to change things only when things lie steady under our hands. And in general, says Aristotle, the habit of lightly changing the laws is an evil, and when the advantage of change is small, some defects, whether in the law or in the ruler, had better be met with philosophic toleration. The citizen will gain less by the change than he will lose by acquiring the habit of disobedience. The power of the law to secure observance and therefore to maintain political stability rests very largely on custom, and... To pass lightly from old laws to new ones is a certain means of weakening the inmost essence of all law whatever. Let us not disregard the experience of ages. Surely in the multitude of years these things, if they were good, would not have remained unknown. These things, of course, means chiefly Plato's communistic republic. Aristotle fights the realism of Plato about universals and the idealism of Plato about government. He finds many dark spots in the picture painted by the master. He does not relish the barrack-like continuity of contact to which Plato apparently condemned his guardian philosophers. Conservative though he is, Aristotle values individual quality, privacy, and liberty above social efficiency and power. He would not care to call every contemporary brother or sister, nor every elder person father or mother. If all are your brothers, none is, and... How much better is it to be the real cousin of somebody than to be the son after Plato's fashion? In a state having women and children in common, love will be watery. Of the two qualities which chiefly inspire regard and affection, that a thing is your own and that it awakens real love in you, neither can exist in such a state as Plato's. Perhaps there was, in the dim past, a communistic society when the family was the only state and pasturage or simple tillage the only form of life. But, in a more divided state of society, 
where the division of labor into unequally important functions elicits and enlarges the natural inequality of men, communism breaks down because it provides no adequate incentive for the exertion of superior abilities. The stimulus of gain is necessary to arduous work, and the stimulus of ownership is necessary to proper industry, husbandry, and care. When everybody owns everything, nobody will take care of anything. That which is common to the greatest number has the least attention bestowed upon it. Everyone thinks chiefly of his own, hardly ever of the public interest. And there is always a difficulty in living together or having things in common, but especially in having common property, the partnerships of fellow travelers. To say nothing of the arduous communism of marriage are an example to the point, for they generally fall out by the way and quarrel about any trifle that turns up. Men readily listen to utopias and are easily induced to believe that in some wonderful manner everyone will become everybody's friend, especially when someone is heard denouncing the evils now existing, which are said to arise out of the possession of private property. These evils, however, arise from quite another source. The wickedness of human nature. Note. Note that conservatives are pessimists and radicals are optimists about human nature, which is probably neither so good nor so bad as they would like to believe, and have been not so much nature as early training and environment. Political science does not make men, but must take them as they come from nature. And human nature, the human average, is nearer to the beast than to the god. The great majority of men are natural dunces and sluggards. In any system, whatever these men will sink to the bottom, and to help them with state subsidies is like pouring water into a leaking cask. Such people must be ruled in politics and directed in industry, with their consent if possible, without if necessary. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection and others for command. For he who can foresee with his mind is by nature intended to be lord and master, and he who can work only with his body is by nature a slave. Note. Perhaps slave is too harsh a rendering of doulos. The word was merely a frank recognition of a brutal fact which in our day is perfumed with talk about the dignity of labor and the brotherhood of man. We easily excel the ancients in making phrases. The slave is to the master what the body is to the mind, and as the body should be subject to the mind, so it is better for all inferiors that they should be under the rule of a master. The slave is a tool with life in it. The tool is a lifeless slave. And then our hard-hearted philosopher, with a glimmer of possibilities which the Industrial Revolution has opened to our hands, writes for a moment with wistful hope. If every instrument would accomplish its own work, obeying or anticipating the will of others, if the shuttle would weave, or the plectrum touch the lyre, without a hand to guide them, then chief workmen would not need assistance nor masters' slaves. This philosophy typifies the Greek disdain for manual labor. Such work in Athens had not become so complicated as it is today, when the intelligence demanded in many manual trades is at times greater than that required for the operations of the lower middle class. And even a college professor may look upon an automobile mechanic, in certain exigencies, as a very god. Manual work was then merely manual, and Aristotle looked down upon it from the heights of philosophy, as belonging to men without minds, as only fit for slaves and only fitting men for slavery. Manual labor, he believes, dulls and deteriorates the mind, and leaves neither time nor energy for political intelligence. It seems to Aristotle a reasonable corollary that only one person's of some leisure should have a voice in government. The best form of state will not admit mechanics to citizenship. At Thebes, there was a law that no man could hold office who had not retired from business ten years before. Even merchants and financiers are classed by Aristotle among slaves. Retail trade is unnatural and a mode by which men gain from one another. The most hated sort of such exchange is usury, which makes a gain out of money itself and not from its natural use. For money was intended as an instrument of exchange and not as the mother of interest. This usury, pokos, which means the birth of money from money, 
is of all modes of gain the most unnatural. Note, this view influenced the medieval prohibition of interest. Money should not breed. Hence, the discussion of the theory of finance is not unworthy of philosophy, but to be engaged in finance or in money-making is unworthy of a free man. Note, Aristotle adds that philosophers could succeed in such fields if they cared to descend into them, and he proudly points to Thales, who, foreseeing a good harvest, brought up all the reapers in his city, and then, at harvest time, sold them at his own sweet price, whereupon Aristotle observes that the universal secret of great riches is the creation of a monopoly. Two, Marriage and Education Woman is to man as the slave to the master, the manual to the mental worker, the barbarian to the Greek. Woman is an unfinished man left standing on a lower step in the scale of development. Note Animalium, Weinlinger, and Meredith's Women Will Be the Last Thing Civilized by Man. Ordeal of Richard Feverell, page 1. It appears, however, that man was, or will be, the last thing civilized by women. For the great civilizing agencies are the family and a settled economic life, and both of these are the creations of woman. The male is by nature superior and the female inferior. The one rules and the other is ruled, and this principle extends of necessity to all mankind. Woman is weak of will and therefore incapable of independence of character or position. Her best condition is a quiet home life in which, which ruled by the man in her external relations, she may be in domestic affairs supreme. Woman should not be made more like man, as in Plato's Republic. Rather, the dissimilarity should be increased. Nothing is so attractive as the different. The courage of a man and that of a woman are not, as Socrates supposed, the same. The courage of a man is shown in commanding that of a woman in obeying. As the poet says, Silence is a woman's glory. Aristotle seems to suspect that this ideal enslavement of woman is a rare achievement for man, and that as often as not the scepter is with the tongue rather than with the arm. As if to give the male an indispensable advantage, he advises him to defer marriage till the vicinity of thirty-seven, and then to marry a lass of some twenty years. A girl who is rounding the twenties is usually the equal of a man of thirty but may perhaps be managed by a seasoned warrior of thirty-seven. What attracts Aristotle to this matrimonial mathematics is the consideration that two such disparate persons will lose their reproductive power and passions at approximately the same time. If the man is still able to beget children, while the woman is unable to bear them, or vice versa, quarrels and differences will arise. Since the time of generation is commonly limited within the age of seventy years in the man and fifty in the woman, the commencement of their union should conform to these periods. The union of the male and the female when too young is bad for the creation of children. In all animals, the offspring of the young are small and ill-developed, and generally female. Health is more important than love. Further. It conduces to temperance not to marry too soon, for women who marry early are apt to be wanton, and in men, too, the bodily frame is stunted if they marry while they are growing. Note. It is apparent that Aristotle has in mind only the temperance of women. The moral effect of deferred marriage upon men does not seem to agitate him. These matters should not be left to youthful caprice. They should be under state supervision and control. The state should determine the minimum and maximum ages of marriage for each sex, the best seasons for conception and the rate of increase in population. If the natural rate of increase is too high, the cruel practice of infanticide may be replaced by abortion. And let abortion be procured before sense and life have begun. There is an ideal number of population for every state, varying with its position and resources. A state, when composed of too few, is not, as a state should be, self-sufficing. While if it has too many, it becomes a nation and not a state, and is almost incapable of constitutional government, or of ethic or political unity, anything in excess of a population of 10,000 is undesirable. Education, too, should be in the hands of the state. 
That which most contributes to the permanence of constitutions is the adaptation of education to the form of government. The citizen should be molded to the form of government under which he lives. By state control of schools, we might divert men from industry and trade to agriculture, and we might train men while keeping property private to open their possessions to discriminately common use. Among good men with respect to the use of property, the proverb will hold that friends should have all things in common. But above all, the growing citizen must be taught obedience to law, else a state is impossible. It has been well said that he who has never learned to obey cannot be a good commander. The good citizen should be capable of both. And only a state system of schools can achieve social unity amid ethnic heterogeneity. The state is a plurality which must be made into a unity and a community by education. Let youth be taught, too, the great boon it has in the state, the unappreciated security which comes of social organization, the freedom that comes of law. Man, when perfected, is the best of animals, but when isolated he is the worst of all, for injustice is more dangerous when armed, and man is equipped at birth with the weapon of intelligence and with qualities of character which he may use for the vilest ends. Wherefore, if he have not virtue, he is the most unholy and savage of animals, full of gluttony and lust. And only social control can give him virtue. Through speech man evolved society, through society intelligence, through intelligence order, and through order civilization. In such an ordered state, the individual has a thousand opportunities and avenues of development open to him, which a solitary life would never give. To live alone. Then, one must be either an animal or a god. Note. Or, adds Nietzsche, who takes nearly all of his political philosophy from Aristotle, one must be both, that is, a philosopher. Hence, revolution is almost always unwise. It may achieve some good, but at the cost of many evils, the chief of which is the disturbance and perhaps the dissolution of that social order and structure on which every political good depends. The direct consequences of revolutionary innovations may be calculable and salutary, but the indirect are generally incalculable and not seldom disastrous. They who take only a few points into account find it easy to pronounce judgment. And a man can make up his mind quickly if he has only a little to make up. Young men are easily deceived, for they are quick to hope. The suppression of long-established habits brings the overthrow of innovating governments because the old habits persist among the people. Characters are not so easily changed as laws. If a constitution is to be permanent, all the parties of a society must desire it to be maintained. Therefore, a ruler who would avoid revolution should prevent extremes of poverty and wealth. A condition which is most often the result of war. He should, like the English, encourage colonization as an outlet for a dangerously congested population. And he should foster and practice religion. An autocratic ruler particularly should appear to be earnest in the worship of the gods. For if men think that a ruler is religious and reveres the gods, they are less afraid of suffering injustice at his hands, and are less disposed to conspire against him, since they believe that the gods themselves are fighting on his side. 3. Democracy and Aristocracy with such safeguards in religion, in education, and in the ordering of family life, almost any of the traditional forms of government will serve. All forms have good and bad commingled in them, and are severally adapted to various conditions. Theoretically, the ideal form of government would be the centralization of all political power in the one best man. Homer is right. Bad is the lordship of many. Let one be your ruler and master. For such a man, law would be rather an instrument than a limit. For men of eminent ability, there is no law. They are themselves a law. Anyone would be ridiculous who should attempt to make laws for them. They would probably retort what, in the fable of Antisthenes, the lion said to the hares when, in the Council of Beasts, the latter began haranguing and claiming equality for all. Where are your claws? Note. 
Aristotle probably had Alexander or Philip in mind while writing this passage, just as Nietzsche seems to have been influenced towards similar conclusions by the alluring careers of Bismarck and Napoleon. But in practice, monarchy is usually the worst form of government, where great strength and great virtue are not near allied. Hence, the best practicable polity is aristocracy, the rule of the informed and capable few. Government is too complex a thing to have its issues decided by number when lesser issues are reserved for knowledge and ability. As the physician ought to be judged by the physician, so ought men in general to be judged by their peers. Now does not this same principle apply to elections? For a right election can only be made by those who have knowledge. A geometrician, example, will choose rightly in matters of geometry, or a pilot in matters of navigation, so that neither the election of magistrates nor the calling of them to account should be entrusted to the many. Note The Modern Argument for Occupational Representation The difficulty with hereditary aristocracy is that it has no permanent economic base. The eternal recurrence of the nouveau riches puts political office sooner or later at the disposal of the highest bidder. It is surely a bad thing that the greatest offices should be bought. The law which permits this abuse makes wealth of more account than ability, and the whole state becomes avaricious. For whenever the chiefs of the state deem anything honorable, the other citizens are sure to follow their example. The prestige imitation of modern social psychology, and where ability has not the first place, there is no real aristocracy. Democracy is usually the result of a revolution against plutocracy. Love of gain in the ruling classes tends constantly to diminish their number. Marx's elimination of the middle class, and so to strengthen the masses who, in the end, set upon their masters and establish democracies. This rule by the poor has some advantages. The people, though individually they may be worse judges than those who have special knowledge, are collectively as good. Moreover, there are some artists whose works are best judged not by themselves alone, but by those who do not possess the art. Example, the user or master of a house will be a better judge of it than the builder. And the guest will be a better judge of a feast than the cook. And... The many are more incorruptible than the few. They are like the greater quantity of water, which is less easily spoiled than a little. The individual is liable to be overcome by anger or by some other passion, and then his judgment is necessarily perverted. But it is hardly to be supposed that a great number of persons would all get into a passion and go wrong at the same moment. Note Politics 315 Tard Laban and other social psychologists assert precisely the contrary. And though they exaggerate the vices of the crowd, they might find better support than Aristotle in the behavior of the Athenian assembly, 430 to 330 BC. Yet, democracy is on the whole inferior to aristocracy. For it is based on a false assumption of equality. It arises out of the notion that those who are equal in one respect example in respect of the law, are equal in all respects. Because men are equally free, they claim to be absolutely equal. The upshot is that ability is sacrificed to number, while numbers are manipulated by trickery. Because the people are so easily misled and so fickle in their views, the ballot should be limited to the intelligent. What we need is a combination of aristocracy and democracy. Constitutional government offers this happy union, it is not the best conceivable government, that would be an aristocracy of education, but it is the best possible state. We must ask, what is the best constitution for most states, and the best life for most men? Neither assuming a standard of excellence which will be above ordinary persons, nor an education exceptionally favored by nature or circumstance, nor yet an ideal state which will only be an aspiration but having in mind such a life as the majority will be able to share, and a form of government to which states in general can attain. It is necessary to begin by assuming a principle of general application, namely, that that part of the state which desires the continuance of the government must be stronger than that which does not. And strength consists neither in number alone, nor in property alone, 
nor in military or political ability alone, but in a combination of these, so that regard has to be taken of freedom, wealth, culture, and noble birth, as well as of mere numerical superiority. Now where shall we find such an economic majority to support our constitutional government? Perhaps best in the middle class. Here again we have the golden mean, just as constitutional government itself would be a mean between democracy and aristocracy. Our state will be sufficiently democratic if the road to every office is open to all, and sufficiently aristocratic if the offices themselves are closed except to those who have traveled the road and arrived fully prepared. From whatever angle we approach our eternal political problem, we monotonously reach the same conclusion, that the community should determine the ends to be pursued, but that only experts should select and apply the means. That choice should be democratically spread, but that office should be rigidly reserved for the equipped and winnowed best. 9. Criticism What shall we say of this philosophy? Perhaps nothing rapturous. It is difficult to be enthusiastic about Aristotle because it was difficult for him to be enthusiastic about anything. And civis me flere. Primum tibi flendum. Note. If you wish me to weep, you must weep first. Horace, Ars Poetica, to actors and writers. His motto is nil admirari, to admire or marvel at nothing. And we hesitate to violate his motto in his case. We miss in him the reforming zeal of Plato, the angry love of humanity which made the great idealist denounce his fellow men. We miss the daring originality of his teacher, the lofty imagination, the capacity for generous delusion. And yet, after reading Plato, nothing could be so salutary for us as Aristotle's skeptic calm. Let us summarize our disagreement. We are bothered at the outset with his insistence on logic. He thinks the syllogism a description of man's way of reasoning whereas it merely describes man's way of dressing up his reasoning for the persuasion of another mind. He supposes that thought begins with premises and seeks their conclusions, when actually thought begins with hypothetical conclusions and seeks their justifying premises, and seeks them best by the observation of particular events under the controlled and isolated conditions of experiment. Yet how foolish we should be to forget that 2,000 years have changed merely the incidentals of Aristotle's logic, that Occam and Bacon and Waywell and Mill and a hundred others have but found spots in his son, and that Aristotle's creation of this new discipline of thought and his firm establishment of its essential lines remain among the lasting achievements of the human mind. It is again the absence of experiment and fruitful hypothesis that leaves Aristotle's natural science a mass of undigested observations. His specialty is the collection and classification of data. In every field he wields his categories and produces catalogues. But side by side with this bent and talent for observation goes a platonic addiction to metaphysics. This trips him up in every science and inveigles him into the wild presuppositions. Here indeed was the great defect of the Greek mind. It was not disciplined. It lacked limiting and steadying traditions. It moved freely in an uncharted field and ran too readily to theories and conclusions. So Greek philosophy leaped onto heights unreached again, while Greek science limped behind. Our modern danger is precisely opposite. Inductive data fall upon us from all sides like the lava of Vesuvius. We suffocate with uncoordinated facts. Our minds are overwhelmed with sciences breeding and multiplying into specialistic chaos for want of synthetic thought and a unifying philosophy. We are all mere fragments of what a man might be. Aristotle's ethics is a branch of his logic. The ideal life is like a proper syllogism. It gives us a handbook of propriety rather than a stimulus to improvement. An ancient critic spoke of him as moderate to excess. An extremist might call the ethics the champion collection of platitudes in all literature. And an anglophobe would be consoled with the thought that Englishmen in their youth had done advanced penance for the imperialistic sins of their adult years, since both at Cambridge and at Oxford they had been compelled to read every word of the Nicomachean ethics. 
We long to mingle fresh green leaves of grass with these drier pages, to add Whitman's exhilarating justification of sense joy to Aristotle's exaltation of a purely intellectual happiness. We wonder if this Aristotelian ideal of immoderate moderation has anything to do with the colorless virtue, the starched perfection, the expressionless good form of the British aristocracy. Matthew Arnold tells us that in his time Oxford tutors looked upon the ethics as infallible. For 300 years this book and the politics have formed the ruling British mind, perhaps to great and noble achievements, but certainly to a hard and cold efficiency. What would the result have been if the masters of the greatest of empires had been nurtured, instead on the holy fervor and the constructive passion of the Republic? After all, Aristotle was not quite Greek. He had been settled and formed before coming to Athens. There was nothing Athenian about him, nothing of the hasty and inspiriting experimentalism which made Athens throb with political elan and at last helped to subject her to a unifying despot. He realized too completely the Delphic command to avoid excess. He is so anxious to pare away extremes that at last nothing is left. He is so fearful of disorder that he forgets to be fearful of slavery. He is so timid of uncertain change that he prefers a certain changelessness that near resembles death. He lacks that Heracletian sense of flux which justifies the conservative in believing that all permanent change is gradual and justifies the radical in believing that no changelessness is permanent. He forgets that Plato's communism was meant only for the elite, the unselfish and ungreedy few, and he comes deviously to a platonic result when he says that, though property should be private, its use should be as far as possible common. He does not see, and perhaps he could not be expected in his early day to see, that individual control of the means of production was stimulating and salutary only when these means were so simple as to be purchasable by any man, and that their increasing complexity and cost led to a dangerous centralization of ownership and power, and to an artificial and finally disruptive inequality. But after all, these are quite inessential criticisms of what remains the most marvelous and influential system of thought ever put together by any single mind. It may be doubted if any other thinker had contributed so much to the enlightenment of the world. Every later age has drawn upon Aristotle and stood upon his shoulders to see the truth. The varied and magnificent culture of Alexandria found its scientific inspiration in him. His organon played a central role in shaping the minds of the medieval barbarians into disciplined and consistent thought. The other works, translated by Nestorian Christians into Syriac in the 5th century AD, and thence into Arabic and Hebrew in the 10th century, and thence into Latin towards 1225, turned scholasticism from its eloquent beginnings in Abelard to encyclopedic completion in Thomas Aquinas. The Crusaders brought back more accurate Greek copies of the philosopher's texts and the Greek scholars of Constantinople brought further Aristotelian treasures with them when after 1453 they fled from the besieging Turks. The works of Aristotle came to be for European philosophy what the Bible was for theology, an almost infallible text with solutions for every problem. In 1215 the papal legate at Paris forbade teachers to lecture on his works. In 1231, Gregory IX appointed a commission to expurgate him. By 1260, he was de rigueur in every Christian school, and ecclesiastical assemblies penalized deviations from his views. Chaucer describes his student as happy by having at his bedded's head twenty books clothed in blake or red of Aristotle and his philosophic. And in the first circles of hell, says Dante, I saw the master there of those who know, amid the philosophic family, by all admired and by all reverenced. There Plato too I saw, and Socrates, who stood beside him closer than the rest. Such lines give us some inkling of the honor which a thousand years offered to the Staggerite. Not till new instruments, accumulated observations, and patient experiments remade science and gave irresistible weapons to Occam and Ramus, to Roger and Francis Bacon was the reign of Aristotle ended. No other mind had for so long a time ruled the intellect of mankind. 10. 
later life and death. Meanwhile, life had become unmanageably complicated for our philosopher. He found himself, on the one hand, embroiled with Alexander for protesting against the execution of Callisthenes, a nephew of Aristotle, who had refused to worship Alexander as a god. And Alexander had answered the protest by hinting that it was quite within his omnipotence to put even philosophers to death. At the same time, Aristotle was busy defending Alexander among the Athenians. He preferred Greek solidarity to city patriotism and thought culture and science would flourish better when petty sovereignties and disputes were ended. And he saw in Alexander what Goethe was to see in Napoleon, the philosophic unity of a chaotic and intolerably manifold world. The Athenians, hungering for liberty, growled at Aristotle and became bitter when Alexander had a statue of the philosopher put up in the heart of the hostile city. In this turmoil, we get an impression of Aristotle quite contrary to that left upon us by his ethics. Here is a man not cold and inhumanly calm, but a fighter pursuing his titanic work in a circle of enemies on every side. The successors of Plato at the Academy, the oratorical school of Isocrates, and the angry crowds that hung on Demosthenes' acid eloquence intrigued and clamored for his exile or his death. And then suddenly, 323 BC, Alexander died. Athens went wild with patriotic joy. The Macedonian party was overthrown, and Athenian independence was proclaimed. Antipater, successor of Alexander and intimate friend of Aristotle, marched upon the rebellious city. Most of the Macedonian party fled. Eurymedon, a chief priest, brought in an indictment against Aristotle, charging him with having taught that prayer and sacrifice were of no avail. Aristotle saw himself fated to be tried by juries and crowds incomparably more hostile than those that had murdered Socrates. Very wisely, he left the city, saying that he would not give Athens a chance to sin a second time against philosophy. There was no cowardice in this. An accused person at Athens had always the option of preferring exile. Arrived at Calchas, Aristotle fell ill. Diogenes Laertius tells us that the old philosopher, in utter disappointment with the turn of all things against him, committed suicide by drinking hemlock. However induced, his illness proved fatal, and after a few months after leaving Athens, 322 BC, the lonely Aristotle died. In the same year, and at the same age, 62, Demosthenes, greatest of Alexander's enemies, drank poison. Within twelve months, Greece had lost her greatest ruler, her greatest orator, and her greatest philosopher. The glory that had been Greece faded now in the dawn of the Roman sun, and the grandeur that was Rome was the pomp of power rather than the light of thought. Then that grandeur too decayed. That little light went almost out. For a thousand years, darkness brooded over the face of Europe. All the world awaited the resurrection of philosophy. Chapter 3 Francis Bacon 1. From Aristotle to the Renaissance When Sparta blockaded and defeated Athens towards the close of the 5th century BC, political supremacy passed from the mother of Greek philosophy and art and the vigor and independence of the Athenian mind decayed. When in 399 BC Socrates was put to death, the soul of Athens died with him, lingering only in his proud pupil Plato. And when Philip of Macedon defeated the Athenians at Coronia in 338 BC, and Alexander burned the great city of Thebes to the ground three years later, even the ostentatious sparing of Pindar's home could not cover up the fact that Athenian independence in government and in thought, was irrevocably destroyed. The domination of Greek philosophy by the Macedonian Aristotle mirrored the political subjection of Greece by the virile and younger peoples of the north. The death of Alexander, 323 BC, quickened this process of decay. The boy emperor, barbarian though he remained after all of Aristotle's tutoring, had yet learned to revere the rich culture of Greece and had dreamed of spreading that culture through the Orient in the wake of his victorious armies. The development of Greek commerce and the multiplication of Greek trading posts throughout Asia Minor had provided an economic basis for the unification of this region as part of the Hellenic Empire. 
and Alexander hoped that from these busy stations Greek thought, as well as Greek goods, would radiate and conquer. But he had underrated the inertia and resistance of the Oriental mind, and the mass and depth of Oriental culture. It was only a youthful fancy, after all, to suppose that so immature and unstable a civilization as that of Greece could be imposed upon a civilization immeasurably more widespread and rooted in the most venerable traditions. The quantity of Asia proved too much for the quality of Greece. Alexander himself, in the hour of his triumph, was conquered by the soul of the East. He married, among several ladies, the daughter of Darius. He adopted the Persian diadem and robe of the state. He introduced into Europe the oriental notion of the divine right of kings. And at last he astonished a skeptic Greece by announcing, in magnificent Eastern style, that he was a god. Greece laughed, and Alexander drank himself to death. The subtle infusion of an Asiatic soul into the wearied body of the master Greek was followed rapidly by the pouring of Oriental cults and faiths into Greece, along those very lines of communication which the young conqueror had opened up. The broken dikes let in the ocean of Eastern thought upon the lowlands of the still adolescent European mind. The mystic and superstitious faiths which had taken root among the poorer people of Hellas were reinforced and spread about, and the oriental spirit of apathy and resignation found a ready soil in decadent and despondent Greece. The introduction of the Stoic philosophy into Athens by the Phoenician merchant Zeno about 310 BC was but one of a multitude of oriental infiltrations. Both Stoicism and Epicureanism the apathetic acceptance of defeat and the effort to forget defeat in the arms of pleasure, were theories as to how one might yet be happy, though subjugated or enslaved, precisely as the pessimistic oriental stoicism of Schopenhauer and the despondent epicureanism of Renan were in the 19th century the symbols of a shattered revolution and a broken France. Not that these natural antitheses of ethical theory were quite new to Greece, one finds them in the gloomy Heraclitus and the laughing philosopher Democritus, and one sees the pupils of Socrates dividing into cynics and Cyrenaics under the lead of Antisthenes and Aristippus, and extolling the one school apathy, the other happiness. Yet these were even then almost exotic modes of thought. Imperial Athens did not take to them, but when Greece had seen Caronia in blood and Thebes in ashes, it listened to Diogenes, and when the glory had departed from Athens, she was ripe for Zeno and Epicurus. Zeno built his philosophy on apathia, on a determinism which a later Stoic, Chrysippus, found it hard to distinguish from Oriental fatalism. When Zeno, who did not believe in slavery, was beating his slave for some offense, the slave pleaded in mitigation that by his master's philosophy he had been destined from all eternity to commit this fault. To which Zeno replied, with the calm of a sage, that on the same philosophy he, Zeno, had been destined to beat him for it. As Schopenhauer deemed it useless for the individual will to fight the universal will, so the Stoic argued that philosophic indifference was the only reasonable attitude to a life in which the struggle for existence is so unfairly doomed to inevitable defeat. If victory is quite impossible, it should be scorned. The secret of peace is not to make our achievements equal to our desires, but to lower our desires to the level of our achievements. If what you have seems insufficient to you, said the Roman Stoic Seneca, 65 AD, then, though you possess the world, you will yet be miserable. Such a principle cried out to heaven for its opposite, and Epicurus, though himself a Stoic in life as Zeno, supplied it. Epicurus says Fenelon, bought a fair garden, which he tilled himself. There it was he set up his school, and there he lived a gentle and agreeable life with his disciples, whom he taught as he walked and worked. He was gentle and affable to all men. He held there was nothing nobler than to apply oneself to philosophy. His starting point is a conviction that apathy is impossible, and that pleasure though not necessarily sensual pleasure, is the only conceivable and quite legitimate end of life and action. Nature leads every organism to prefer its own good to every other good. 
Even the Stoic finds a subtle pleasure in renunciation. We must not avoid pleasures, but we must select them. Epicurus, then, is no Epicurean. He exalts the joys of intellect rather than those of sense. He warns against pleasures that excite and disturb the soul, which they should rather quiet and appease. In the end, he proposes to seek not pleasure in its usual sense, but atataxia, tranquility, equanimity, repose of mind, all of which trembles on the verge of Zeno's apathy. The Romans, coming to despoil Hellas in 146 BC, found these rival schools dividing the philosophic field and having neither leisure nor subtlety for speculation themselves, brought back these philosophies with their other spoils to Rome. Great organizers, as much as inevitable slaves, tend to stoic moods. It is difficult to be either master or servant if one is sensitive. So, such philosophy as Rome had was mostly of Zeno's school, whether in Marcus Aurelius the emperor or in Epictetus the slave, and even Lucretius talked Epicureanism stoically, like Heine's Englishman taking his pleasures sadly, and concluded his stern gospel of pleasure by committing suicide. His noble epic on the nature of things follows Epicurus in damning pleasure with faint praise. Note, Professor Shotwell, Introduction to the History of History, calls it the most marvelous performance in all antique literature. Almost contemporary with Caesar and Pompey, he lived in the midst of turmoil and alarms. His nervous pen is forever inditing prayers to tranquility and peace. One pictures him as a timid soul whose youth had been darkened with religious fears, for he never tires of telling his readers that there is no hell except here, and that there are no gods except gentlemanly ones who live in a garden of Epicurus in the clouds, but never intrude in the affairs of men. To the rising cult of heaven and hell, among the people of Rome, he opposes a ruthless materialism. Soul and mind are evolved with the body, grow with its growth, ail with its ailments, and die with its death. Nothing exists but atoms, space, and law, and the law of laws is that of evolution and dissolution everywhere. No single thing abides, but all things flow. Fragment to fragment clings, the things thus grow until we know and name them. By degrees they melt, and are no more the things we know. Globed from the atoms, falling slow or swift, I see the suns, I see the systems lift. Their forms, and even the systems and their suns, shall go back slowly to the eternal drift. Thou too, O earth, thine empires, lands, and seas, least with thy stars of all the galaxies. Globed from the drift like these, Like these thou too shalt go. Thou art going hour by hour like these. Nothing abides thy seas in delicate haze. Go off. These moon sands forsake their place, and where they are shall other seas in turn. Mow with their scythes of whiteness other bays. To astronomical evolution and dissolution add the origin and elimination of species. Many monsters too the earth of old tried to produce. Things of strange face and limbs, some without feet, some without hands, some without mouth, some without eyes. Every other monster of this kind earth would produce but in vain, for nature set a ban on their increase. They could not reach the coveted flower of age, nor find food, nor be united in marriage. And many races of living things must then have died out and been unusable to beget and continue their breed. For in the case of all things which you see breathing the breath of life, either craft or courage or speed has from the beginning of its existence protected and preserved each particular race. Those to whom nature has granted none of these qualities would lie exposed as a prey and booty to others, until nature brought their kind to extinction. Nations, too, like individuals, slowly grow and surely die. Some nations wax, others wane. And in a brief space the races of living things are changed, and like runners hand over the lamp of life. In the face of warfare and inevitable death, there is no wisdom but in ataraxia. To look on all things with a mind at peace. Here, clearly, the old pagan joy of life is gone, and an almost exotic spirit touches a broken lyre. History, which is nothing if not humorous, 
was never so facetious as when she gave to this abstemious and epic pessimist the name of Epicurean. And if this is the spirit of the follower of Epicurus, imagine the exhilarating optimism of explicit Stoics like Aurelius or Epictetus. Nothing in all literature is so depressing as the dissertations of the slave, unless it be the meditations of the emperor. Seek not to have things happen as you choose them, but rather choose that they should happen as they do, and you shall live prosperously. No doubt one can in this manner dictate the future and play royal highness to the universe. Story has it that Epictetus's master, who treated him with consistent cruelty, one day took to twisting Epictetus's leg to pass the time away. If you go on, said Epictetus calmly, you will break my leg. The master went on, and the leg was broken. Did I not tell you, Epictetus observed mildly, that you would break my leg? Yet there is a certain mystic nobility in this philosophy, as in the quiet courage of some Dostoevskian pacifist. Never, in any case, say, I have lost such a thing, but I have returned it. Is thy child dead? It is returned. Is thy wife dead? She is returned. Art thou deprived of thy estate? Is not this also returned? In such passages, we feel the proximity of Christianity and its dauntless martyrs. Indeed, were not the Christian ethic of self-denial, the Christian political ideal of an almost communistic brotherhood of man, and the Christian eschatology of the final conflagration of all the world, fragments of Stoic doctrine floating on the stream of thought, in Epictetus, the Greco-Roman soul has lost its paganism and is ready for a new faith. His book had the distinction of being adopted as a religious manual by the early Christian church. From these dissertations and Aurelius's meditations, there is but a step to the imitation of Christ. Meanwhile, the historical background was melting into newer scenes. There is a remarkable passage in Lucretius, which describes the decay of agriculture in the Roman state and attributes it to the exhaustion of the soil. Whatever the cause, the wealth of Rome passed into poverty, the organization into disintegration, the power and pride into decadence and apathy. Cities faded back into the undistinguished hinterland. The roads fell into disrepair and no longer hummed with trade. The small families of the educated Romans were outbred by the vigorous and untutored German stocks that crept year after year across the frontier. Pagan culture yielded to Oriental cults, and almost imperceptibly the empire passed into the papacy. The church, supported in its earlier centuries by the emperors whose powers it gradually absorbed, grew rapidly in numbers, wealth, and range of influence. By the 13th century it owned one-third of the soil of Europe, and its coffers bulged with donations of rich and poor. For a thousand years it united, with the magic of an unvarying creed, most of the peoples of a continent. Never before or since was organization so widespread or so pacific. But this unity demanded, as the Church thought, a common faith exalted by supernatural sanctions beyond the changes and corrosions of time. Therefore dogma, definite and defined, was cast like a shell over the adolescent mind of medieval Europe. It was within this shell that scholastic philosophy moved narrowly from faith to reason and back again, in a baffling circuit of uncriticized assumptions and preordained conclusions. In the 13th century, all Christendom was startled and stimulated by Arabic and Jewish translations of Aristotle. But the power of the Church was still adequate to secure, through Thomas Aquinas and others, the transmogrification of Aristotle into a medieval theologian. The result was subtlety, but not wisdom. The wit and mind of man, as Bacon put it, if it work upon the matter, worketh according to the stuff, and is limited thereby. But if it work upon itself, as the spider worketh his web, then it is endless, and bringeth forth indeed cobwebs of learning, admirable for the fineness of thread and work, but of no substance or profit. Sooner or later the intellect of Europe would burst out of this shell. After a thousand years of tillage, the soil bloomed again. Goods were multiplied into a surplus that compelled trade. 
and trade at its crossroads built again great cities wherein men might cooperate to nourish culture and rebuild civilization. Note, the reader probably knows that city, civility, culture, and civilization have all one identical Latin root, just as one Greek word gives us polity, politics, and policemen. The Crusades opened the routes to the East and let in a stream of luxuries and heresies that doomed aestheticism and dogma. Paper now came cheaply from Egypt, replacing the costly parchment that had made learning the monopoly of priests. Printing, which had long awaited an inexpensive medium, broke out like a liberated explosive and spread its destructive and clarifying influence everywhere. Braved mariners armed now with compasses ventured out into the wilderness of the sea and conquered man's ignorance of the earth. Patient observers armed with telescopes ventured out beyond the confines of dogma and conquered man's ignorance of the sky. Here and there, in universities and monasteries and hidden retreats, men ceased to dispute and began to search. Deviously, out of the effort to change baser metal into gold, alchemy was transmuted into chemistry. Out of astrology, men groped their way with timid boldness to astronomy. And out of the fables of speaking animals came the science of zoology. The awakening began with Roger Bacon, 1294. It grew with the limitless Leonardo, 1452 to 1519. It reached its fullness in the astronomy of Copernicus. 1473 to 1543, and Galileo, 1564 to 1642, in the researches of Gilbert, 1544 to 1603, in magnetism and electricity of Vesalius, 1514 to 1564, in anatomy and of Harvey, 1578 to 1657, on the circulation of the blood. As knowledge grew, fear decreased. Men thought less of worshipping the unknown and more of overcoming it. Every vital spirit was lifted up with a new confidence. Barriers were broken down. There was no bound now to what man might do. But that little vessels like the celestial bodies should sail round the whole globe is the happiness of our age. These times may justly use plus ultra. More beyond. Where the ancients used non plus ultra. It was an age of achievement, hope, and vigor, of new beginnings and enterprises in every field. Note Bacon, The Advancement of Learning, Chapter 10, a medieval motto showed a ship turning back at Gibraltar into the Mediterranean with the inscription non plus ultra, go no further. An age that waited for a voice, some synthetic soul to sum up its spirit and resolve. It was Francis Bacon. The most powerful mind of modern times. Who rang the bell that called the wits together. And announced that Europe had come of age. 2. The Political Career of Francis Bacon Bacon was born on January 22, 1561, at York House, London, the residence of his father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, who for the first twenty years of Elizabeth's reign had been keeper of the Great Seal. The fame of the father, says Macaulay, has been thrown into the shade by that of the son, but Sir Nicholas was no ordinary man. It is as one might have suspected. For genius is an apex to which a family builds itself through talent, and through talent in the genius's offspring subsides again towards the mediocrity of man. Bacon's mother was Lady Anne Cook, sister-in-law of Sir William Cecil, Lord Burghley, who was Elizabeth's Lord Treasurer and one of the most powerful men in England. Her father had been chief tutor of King England VI. She herself was a linguist and a theologian and thought nothing of corresponding in Greek with bishops. She made herself instructress of her son and spared no pains in his education. But the real nurse of Bacon's greatness was Elizabethan England, the greatest age of the most powerful of modern nations. The discovery of America had diverted trade from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, had raised the Atlantic nations, Spain and France and Holland and England to that commercial and financial supremacy which had been Italy's when half of Europe 
had made her its port of entry and exit in the eastern trade. And with this change, the Renaissance had passed from Florence and Rome and Milan and Venice to Madrid and Paris and Amsterdam and London. After the destruction of the Spanish naval power in 1588, the commerce of England spread over every sea, her towns throve with domestic industry, her sailors circumnavigated the globe, and her captains won America. Her literature blossomed into Spencer's poetry and Sidney's prose. Her stage throbbed with the dramas of Shakespeare and Marlowe and Ben Jonson and a hundred vigorous pens. No man could fail to flourish in such a time and country, if there was seed in him at all. At the age of twelve, Bacon was sent to Trinity College, Cambridge. He stayed there three years and left it with a strong dislike of its texts and methods, a confirmed hostility to the cult of Aristotle, and a resolve to set philosophy into a more fertile path to turn it from scholastic disputation to the illumination and increase of human good. Though still a lad of sixteen, he was offered an appointment to the staff of the English ambassador in France. And after careful casting up of pros and cons, he accepted. In the prome to the interpretation of nature, he discusses this fateful decision that turned him from philosophy to politics. It is an indispensable passage. Whereas I believe myself born for the service of mankind and reckoned the care of the common weal to be among those duties that are of public right, open to all alike, even as the waters and the air, I therefore asked myself what could most advantage mankind, and for the performance of what tasks I seemed to be shaped by nature. But when I searched, I found no work so meritorious as the discovery and development of the arts and inventions that tend to civilize the life of man. Above all, if any man could succeed, not merely in bringing to light some one particular invention, however useful, but in kindling in nature a luminary which would, at its first rising, shed some light on the present limits and borders of human discoveries, and which afterwards, as it rose still higher, would reveal and bring into clear view every nook and cranny of darkness, it seemed to me that such a discoverer would deserve to be called the true extender of the kingdom of man over the universe, the champion of human liberty, and the exterminator of the necessities that now keep men in bondage. Moreover, I found in my own nature a special adaptation for the contemplation of truth, for I had a mind at once versatile enough for that most important object, I mean the recognition of similitudes and at the same time sufficiently steady and concentrated for the observation of subtle shades of difference. I possessed a passion for research, a power of suspending judgment with patience, of meditating with pleasure, of assenting with caution, of correcting false impressions with readiness, and of arranging my thoughts with scrupulous pains. I had no hankering after novelty, no blind admiration for antiquity, Imposture in every shape I utterly detested. For all these reasons I considered that my nature and disposition had, as it were, a kind of kinship and connection with truth. But my birth, my rearing, and education had all pointed not toward philosophy but toward politics. I had been, as it were, imbued in politics from childhood, and as is not unfrequently the case with young men, I was sometimes shaken in my mind by opinions. I also thought that my duty towards my country had special claims upon me, such as could not be urged by other duties of life. Lastly, I conceived the hope that, if I held some honorable office in the state, I might have secure helps and support to aid my labors with a view to the accomplishment of my destined task. With these motives, I applied myself to politics. Sir Nicholas Bacon died suddenly in 1579. He had intended to provide Francis with an estate. But death overreached his plans, and the young diplomat, called hurriedly to London, saw himself at the age of eighteen fatherless and penniless. He had become accustomed to most of the luxuries of the age, and he found it hard to reconcile himself now to a forced simplicity of life. He took up the practice of law, while he importuned his influential relatives to advance him to some political office, which would liberate him from economic worry. His almost begging letters had small result considering the grace and vigor of their style and the proved ability of their author. 
Perhaps it was because Bacon did not underrate this ability and looked upon position as his due that Burgley failed to make the desired response. And perhaps also these letters protested too much the past, present and future loyalty of the writer to the Honorable Lord. In politics, as in love, it does not do to give one's self wholly. One should at all times give, but at no time all. Gratitude is nourished with expectation. Eventually, Bacon climbed without being lifted from above, but every step cost him many years. In 1583, he was elected to Parliament for Taunton, and his constituents liked him so well that they returned him to his seat in election after election. He had a terse and vivid eloquence in debate and was an orator without oratory. No man, said Ben Johnson, ever spoke more neatly, more compressedly, more weightily, or suffered less emptiness, less idleness in what he uttered. No member of his speech but consisted of its own graces. His hearers could not cough or look aside from him without loss. He commanded where he spoke. No man had their affections more in his power. The fear of every man that heard him was less that he should make an end. Enviable Orator One powerful friend was generous to him, that handsome Earl of Essex whom Elizabeth loved unsuccessfully and so learned to hate. In 1595, Essex, to atone for his failure in securing a political post for Bacon, presented him with a pretty estate at Twickenham. It was a magnificent gift, which one might presume would bind Bacon to Essex for life, but it did not. A few years later, Essex organized a conspiracy to imprison Elizabeth and select her successor to the throne. Bacon wrote letter after letter to his benefactor, protesting against this treason, and when Essex persisted, Bacon warned him that he would put loyalty to his queen above even gratitude to his friend. Essex made his effort, failed, and was arrested. Bacon pled with the queen in his behalf so incessantly that at last she bade him speak of any other subject. When Essex, temporarily freed, gathered armed forces about him, marched into London, and tried to rouse its populace to revolution, Bacon turned against him angrily. Meanwhile, he had been given a place in the prosecuting office of the realm, and when Essex, again arrested, was tried for treason, Bacon took active part in the prosecution of the man who had been his unstinting friend. Note, Hundreds of volumes have been written on this aspect of Bacon's career. The case against Bacon as the wisest and meanest of mankind, so Pope called him, will be found in Macaulay's essay, and more circumstantially in Abbott's Francis Bacon. These would apply to him his own words. Wisdom for a man's self is the wisdom of rats. That will be sure to leave a house somewhat before it falls. Essay of wisdom for a man's self. The case for Bacon is given in Spedding's Life and Times of Francis Bacon, and in his evenings with a reviewer, a detailed reply to Macaulay, in Medio Veritas. Essex was found guilty and was put to death. Bacon's part in the trial made him for a while unpopular and from this time on he lived in the midst of enemies watching for a chance to destroy him. His insatiable ambition left him no rest. He was ever discontent and always a year or so ahead of his income. He was lavish in his expenditures, and display was to him a part of policy. When, at the age of forty-five, he married, the pompous and costly ceremony made a great gap in the dowry, which had constituted one of the lady's attractions. In 1598 he was arrested for debt. Nevertheless, he continued to advance. His varied ability and almost endless knowledge made him a valuable member of every important committee. Gradually, higher offices were opened to him. In 1606, he was made Solicitor General. In 1613, he became Attorney General. In 1618, at the age of 57, he was at last Lord Chancellor. Three. The Essays. Note, the author has thought it better in this section to make no attempt to concentrate further the already compact thought of Bacon, and has preferred to put the philosopher's wisdom in his own incomparable English, rather than to take probably greater space to say the same things with less clarity, beauty, and force. His elevation seemed to realize Plato's dreams of a philosopher king. 
For step by step with his climb to political power, Bacon had been mounting the summits of philosophy. It is almost incredible that the vast learning and literary achievements of this man were but the incidents and diversions of a turbulent political career. It was his motto that one lived best by the widest life. Bene wixit, qui bene latuit. He could not quite make up his mind whether he liked more the contemplative or the active life. His hope was to be the philosopher and statesman, too, like Seneca, though he suspected that this double direction of his life would shorten his reach and lessen his attainment. It is hard to say, he writes, whether mixture of contemplations with an active life or retiring wholly to contemplations do disable or hinder the mind more. He felt that studies could not be either end or wisdom in themselves, and that knowledge unapplied in action was a pale academic vanity. To spend too much time in studies is sloth, to use them too much for ornament is affectation, to make judgment wholly by the rules is the humor of a scholar. Crafty men condemn studies, simple men admire them, and wise men use them or they teach not their own use. But that is a wisdom without them and above them, won by observation. Here is a new note which marks the end of scholasticism, i.e. the divorce of knowledge from use and observation, and places that emphasis on experience and results which distinguishes English philosophy and culminates in pragmatism. Not that Bacon for a moment ceased to love books and meditation. In words reminiscent of Socrates, he writes, Without philosophy, I care not to live. And he describes himself as, after all, a man naturally fitted rather for literature than for anything else, and born by some destiny against the inclination of his genius, i.e., character, into active life. Almost his first publication was called The Praise of Knowledge. Its enthusiasm for philosophy compels quotation my praise shall be dedicated to the mind itself. The mind is the man, and knowledge mind. A man is but what he knoweth. Are not the pleasures of the affections greater than the pleasures of the senses? And are not the pleasures of the intellect greater than the pleasures of the affections? Is not that only a true and natural pleasure whereof there is no satiety? Is not that knowledge alone that doth clear the mind of all perturbations? How many things be there which we imagine are not? How many things do we esteem and value more than they are? These vain imaginations, these ill-proportioned estimations, these be the clouds of error that turn into the storms of perturbations. Is there then any such happiness as for a man's mind to be raised above the confusion of things, where he may have a respect of the order of nature and the error of men? Is there but a view only of delight and not of discovery? of contentment and not of benefit? Shall we not discern as well the riches of nature's warehouse as the beauty of her shop? Is truth barren? Shall we not thereby be able to produce worthy effects and to endow the life of man with infinite commodities? His finest literary product, the Essays, 1597-1623, to show him still torn between these two loves for politics and for philosophy. In the Essay of Honor and Reputation, he gives all the degrees of honor to political and military achievements, none to the literary or the philosophical. But in the Essay of Truth, he writes, The inquiry of truth, which is the love-making or wooing of it, the knowledge of truth, which is the praise of it, and the belief of truth, which is the enjoying of it, is the sovereign good of human natures. In books, we converse with the wise as in action with fools, that is, if we know how to select our books. Some books are to be tasted, reads a famous passage, others to be swallowed, and some few to be chewed and digested. All these groups forming, no doubt, an infinitesimal portion of the oceans and cataracts of ink in which the world is daily bathed and poisoned and drowned. Surely the essays must be numbered among the few books that deserve to be chewed and digested. Rarely shall you find so much meat so admirably dressed and flavored in so small a dish. Bacon abhors padding and disdains to waste a word. He offers us infinite riches in a little phrase. Each of these essays gives in a page or two the distilled subtlety of a mastermind on a major issue of life. 
It is difficult to say whether the matter or the manner more excels. For here is language as supreme in prose as Shakespeare's is in verse. It is a style like sturdy Tacitus's, compact yet polished, and indeed some of its conciseness is due to the skillful adaptation of Latin idiom and phrase. But its wealth of metaphor is characteristically Elizabethan and reflects the exuberance of the Renaissance. No man in English literature is so fertile in pregnant and pithy comparisons. Their lavish array is the one defect of Bacon's style. The endless metaphors and allegories and allusions fall like whips upon our nerves and tire us out at last. The essays are like rich and heavy food which cannot be digested in large quantities at once. But taken four or five at a time, they are the finest intellectual nourishment in English. What shall we extract from this extracted wisdom? Perhaps the best starting point and the most arresting deviation from the fashions of medieval philosophy is Bacon's frank acceptance of the Epicurean ethic. That philosophical progression, use not that you may not wish, wish not that you may not fear, seems an indication of a weak, diffident, and timorous mind. And indeed, most doctrines of the philosophers appear to be too distrustful and to take more care of mankind than the nature of the thing requires. Thus they increase the fears of death by the remedies they bring against it. For whilst they make the life of man little more than a preparation and discipline for death, it is impossible, but the enemy must appear terrible when there is no end of the defense to be made against him. Nothing could be so injurious to health as the stoic repression of desire. What is the use of prolonging a life which apathy has turned into premature death? And besides, it is an impossible philosophy, for instinct will out. Nature is often hidden, sometimes overcome, seldom extinguished. Force maketh nature more violent in the return. Doctrine and discourse maketh nature less importune. But custom only doth alter or subdue nature. But let not a man trust his victory over his nature too far. For nature will lay buried a great time, and yet revive upon the occasion or temptation. Like as it was with Aesop's damsel, turned from a cat to a woman who sat very demurely at the board's end, till a mouse ran before her. Therefore let a man either avoid the occasion altogether, or put himself off into it, that he may be little moved with it. Indeed, Bacon thinks the body should be inured to excesses as well as to restraint, else even a moment of unrestraint may ruin it. So one accustomed to the purest and most digestible foods is easily upset when forgetfulness or necessity diverts him from perfection. Yet, variety of delights rather than surfeit of them. For, strength of nature and youth passeth over many excesses which are owing a man till his age. A man's maturity pays the price of his youth. One royal road to health is a garden. Bacon agrees with the author of Genesis that, God Almighty first planted a garden, and with Voltaire that we must cultivate our backyards. The moral philosophy of the essays smacks rather of Machiavelli than of the Christianity to which Bacon made so many astute obeisances. We are beholden to Machiavelli and writers of that kind who openly and unmasked declare what men do in fact, and not what they ought to do. For it is impossible to join the wisdom of the serpent and the innocence of the dove without a previous knowledge of the nature of evil, as without this, virtue lies exposed and unguarded. The Italians have an ungracious proverb, tanto buon die val niente, so good that he is good for nothing. Bacon accords his preaching with his practice and advises a judicious mixture of dissimulation with honesty, like an alloy that will make the pure but softer metal capable of longer life. He wants a full and varied career, giving acquaintance with everything that can broaden, deepen, strengthen, or sharpen the mind. He does not admire the merely contemplative life. Like Goethe, he scorns knowledge that does not lead to action. Men ought to know that in the theater of human life it is only for gods and angels to be spectators. His religion is patriotically like the king's. Though he was more than once accused of atheism and the whole trend of his philosophy is secular and rationalistic, he makes an eloquent and apparently sincere disclaimer of unbelief. I had rather believe all the fables in the legend and the Talmud and the Alcoran than this universal frame is without a mind. 
A little philosophy bringeth men's minds about to religion. For while the mind of man looketh upon second causes scattered, it may sometimes rest in them and go no further. But when it beholdeth the chain of them, confederate and linked together, it must needs fly to providence and deity. Religious indifference is due to a multiplicity of factions. The causes of atheism are divisions in religion, if they be many. For any one division addeth zeal to both sides, but many divisions introduce atheism. And lastly, learned times, especially with peace and prosperity, for troubles and adversities do more bow men's minds to religion. But Bacon's value lies less in theology and ethics than in psychology. He is an undeceivable analyst of human nature and sends his shaft into every heart. On the stalest subject in the world, he is refreshingly original. A married man is seven years older in his thoughts the first day. It is often seen that bad husbands have good wives. Bacon was an exception. A single life doth well with churchmen, for charity will hardly water the ground where it must first fill a pool. He that hath wife and children hath given hostages to fortune, for they are impediments to great enterprises, either of virtue or mischief. Note. Of marriage and single life, contrast the more pleasing phrase of Shakespeare that love gives to every power a double power. Bacon seems to have worked too hard to have had time for love, and perhaps he never quite felt it to its depths. It is a strange thing to note the excess of this passion. There was never proud man thought so absurdly well of himself as the lover doth of the person beloved. You may observe that amongst all the great and worthy persons, whereof the memory remaineth either ancient or recent, there is not one that hath been transported to the mad degree of love, which shows that great spirits and great business do keep out this weak passion. He values friendship more than love, though of friendship, too, he can be skeptical. There is little friendship in the world, and least of all between equals, which was wont to be magnified. That that is, is between superior and inferior, whose fortunes may comprehend the one, the other. A principal fruit of friendship is the ease and discharge of the fullness and swellings of the heart, which passions of all kinds do cause and induce. A friend is an ear. Those that want friends to open themselves and to are cannibals of their own hearts. Whoever hath his mind fraught with many thoughts, his wits and understanding do clarify and break up in the communicating and discoursing with another. He tosseth his thoughts more easily, he marshalleth them more orderly. He seeth how they look when they are turned into words. Finally, he waxeth wiser than himself, and that more by one hour's discourse than by a day's meditation. In the essay of Youth and Age, he puts a book into a paragraph. Young men are fitter to invent than to judge, fitter for execution than for counsel, and fitter for new projects than for settled business. For the experience of age in things that fall within the compass of it directeth them, but in new things abuseth them. Young men in the conduct and management of actions embrace more than they can hold, stir more than they can quiet, fly to the end without consideration of the means and degrees pursue absurdly some few principles which they have chanced upon, care not to, i.e., how they innovate, which draws unknown inconveniences. Men of age object too much, consult too long, adventure too little, repent too soon, and seldom drive business home to the full period, but content themselves with a mediocrity of success. Certainly it is good to compel employments of both, because the virtues of either may correct the defects of both. He thinks, nevertheless, that youth and childhood may get too great liberty, and so grow disordered and lax. Let parents choose betimes the vocations and courses they mean their children should take, for then they are the most flexible. And let them not too much apply themselves to the disposition of their children, as thinking they will take best to that which they have most mind to. It is true that... If the affections or aptness of the children be extraordinary, then it is good not to cross it, but generally the precept of the Pythagoreans as good optimum lege suave et fecile illud faciet consuetudo. 
Choose the best. Custom will make it pleasant and easy. 4. Custom is the principal magistrate of man's life. The politics of the essays preach a conservatism natural in one who aspired to rule. Bacon wants a strong central power. Monarchy is the best form of government, and usually the efficiency of a state varies with the concentration of power. There be three points of business in government. The preparation, the debate or examination, and the perfection or execution. Whereof, if you look for dispatch, let the middle only be the work of many, and the first and last the work of few. He is an outspoken militarist. He deplores the growth of industry as unfitting men for war, and bewails long peace as lulling the warrior in man. Nevertheless, he recognizes the importance of raw materials. Solon said well to Croesus, when in ostentation Croesus showed him his gold. Sir, if any other come to half better iron than you, he will be master of all this gold. Like Aristotle, he has some advice on avoiding revolutions. The surest way to prevent seditions is to take away the matter of them. For if there be fuel prepared, it is hard to tell whence the spark shall come that shall set it on fire. Neither doth it follow that the suppressing of flames, i.e. discussion, with too much severity should be a remedy of troubles, for the despising of them many times checks them best, and the going about to stop them but makes a wonder long-lived. The matter of sedition is of two kinds, much poverty and much discontentment. The causes and motives of seditions are innovation in religion, taxes, alteration of laws and customs, breaking of privileges, general oppression, advancement of unworthy persons, strangers, dearths, disbanded soldiers, factions grown desperate, and whatsoever in offending a people joineth them in common cause. The cue of every leader, of course, is to divide his enemies and to unite his friends. Generally, the dividing and breaking of all factions that are adverse to the state and setting them at a distance, or at least distrust among themselves, is not one of the worst remedies. For it is a desperate case, if those that hold with the proceeding of the state be full of discord and faction, and those that are against it be entire and united. A better recipe for the avoidance of revolutions is an equitable distribution of wealth. Money is like muck, not good unless it be spread. But this does not mean socialism or even democracy. Bacon distrusts the people, who were in his day quite without access to education. The lowest of all flatteries is the flattery of the common people. And Phocion took it right, who being applauded by the multitude asked, What had he done amiss? What Bacon wants is first a yeomanry of owning farmers, then an aristocracy for administration, and above all a philosopher king. It is almost without instance that any government was unprosperous under learned governors. He mentions Seneca, Antoninus, Pius, and Aurelius. It was his hope that to their names posterity would add his own. 4. The Great Reconstruction Unconsciously, in the midst of his triumphs, his heart was with philosophy. It had been his nurse in youth, it was his companion in office, it was to be his consolation in prison and disgrace. He lamented the ill repute into which, he thought, philosophy had fallen and blamed an arid scholasticism. People are very apt to condemn truth on account of the controversies raised about it and to think those all in a wrong way who never meet. The sciences stand almost at a stay without receiving any augmentations worthy of the human race. And all the tradition and succession of schools is still a succession of masters and scholars, not of inventors. And what is now done in the matter of science, there is only a whirling about and perpetual agitation ending where it began. All through the years of his rise and exaltation, he brooded over the restoration or reconstruction of philosophy. Mad detour. Insta urati onem, philosophiae. He planned to center all his studies around this task. First of all, he tells us in his plan of the work, he would write some introductory treatises, explaining the stagnation of philosophy through the posthumous persistence of old methods. 
and outlining his proposals for a new beginning. Secondly, he would attempt a new classification of the sciences, allocating their material to them and listing the unsolved problems in each field. Thirdly, he would describe his new method for the interpretation of nature. Fourthly, he would try his busy hand at actual natural science and investigate the phenomena of nature. Fifthly, he would show the ladder of the intellect by which the writers of the past had mounted towards the truths that were now taking form out of the background of medieval verbiage. Sixthly, he would attempt certain anticipations of the scientific results which he was confident would come from the use of his method. And lastly, as second or applied philosophy, he would picture the utopia which would flower out of all this budding science of which he hoped to be the prophet. The whole would constitute the magna instauratio, the great reconstruction of philosophy. Note, Bacon's actual works under the foregoing heads are chiefly these. 1. Introduction to the Interpretation of Nature, 1603. A Criticism of Philosophies, 1609. 2. The Advancement of Learning, 1603-5. to 3. Things Thought and Seen, 1607. Thread of the Labyrinth, 1606. The New Organon, 1608-20. to 4. Natural History, 1622. Description of the Intellectual Globe, 1612. 5. Forest of Forests, 1624. 6. On Origins, 1621. And 7. The New Atlantis, 1624. Note, all of the above but the New Atlantis and the advancement of learning were written in Latin, and the latter was translated into Latin by Bacon and his aides to win for it a European audience. It was a magnificent enterprise and except for Aristotle, without precedent in the history of thought. It would differ from every other philosophy in aiming at practice rather than at theory, at specific concrete goods rather than at speculative symmetry. Knowledge is power, not mere argument or ornament. It is not an opinion to be held, but a work to be done, and I am laboring to lay the foundation not of any sect or doctrine, but of utility and power. Here, for the first time, are the voice and tone of modern science. 1. The Advancement of Learning To produce works, one must have knowledge. Nature cannot be commanded except by being obeyed. Let us learn the laws of nature and we shall be her masters as we are now, in ignorance, her thralls. Science is the road to utopia. But in what condition this road is, tortuous, unlit, turning back upon itself, lost in useless bypaths, and leading not to light but to chaos? Let us then begin by making a survey of the state of the sciences and marking out for them their proper and distinctive fields. Let us seat the sciences each in its proper place, examine their defects, their needs, and their possibilities, indicate the new problems that await their light, and in general, open and stir the earth a little about the roots of them. This is the task which Bacon set himself in the advancement of learning. It is my intention, he writes, like a king entering his realm, to make the circuit of knowledge, noticing what parts lie waste and uncultivated and abandoned by the industry of man, with a view to engage by a faithful mapping out of the deserted tracts, the energies of public and private persons in their environment. He would be the royal surveyor of the weed-grown soil, making straight the road and dividing the fields among the laborers. It was a plan audacious to the edge of immodesty. But Bacon was still young enough, 42 is young and a philosopher, to plan great voyages. I have taken all knowledge to be my province, he had written to Burgley in 1592 not meaning that he would make himself a premature edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, but implying merely that his work would bring him into every field, as the critic and coordinator of every science in the task of social reconstruction. The very magnitude of his purpose gives a stately magnificence to his style, and brings him at times to the height of English prose. So he ranges over the vast battleground in which human research struggles with natural hindrance and human ignorance. 
and in every field he sheds illumination. He attaches great importance to physiology and medicine. He exalts the latter as regulating the musical instrument of much and exquisite workmanship, easily put out of tune. But he objects to the lax empiricism of contemporary doctors and their facile tendency to treat all ailments with the same prescription, usually physic. Our physicians are like bishops. They have the keys of binding and loosing, but no more. They rely too much on mere haphazard, uncoordinated individual experience. Let them experiment more widely. Let them illuminate human with comparative anatomy. Let them dissect and, if necessary, vivisect. And above all, let them construct an easily accessible and intelligible record of experiments and results. Bacon believes that the medical profession should be permitted to ease and quicken death. Euthanasia where the end would be otherwise only delayed for a few days and at the cost of great pain. But he urges the physicians to give more study to the art of prolonging life. This is a new art of medicine, and efficient, though the most noble of all. For if it may be supplied, medicine will not then be wholly versed in sordid cures, nor physicians be honored only for necessity, but as dispensers of the greatest earthly happiness they could well be conferred on mortals. One can hear some sour Schopenhauerian protesting at this point against the assumption that longer life would be a boon and urging, on the contrary, that the speed with which some physicians put an end to our illnesses is a consummation devoutly to be praised. But Bacon, worried and married and harassed though he was, never doubted that life was a very fine thing after all. In psychology, he is almost a behaviorist. He demands a strict study of cause and effect in human action and wishes to eliminate the word chance from the vocabulary of science. Chance is the name of a thing that does not exist. And what chance is in the universe, so will is in man. Here is a word of meaning and a challenge of war, all in a little line. The scholastic doctrine of free will is pushed aside as beneath discussion and the universal assumption of a will, distinct from the intellect, is discarded. These are leads which Bacon does not follow up. It is not the only case in which he puts a book into phrase and then passes blithely on. Again, in a few words, Bacon invents a new science, social psychology. Philosophers should diligently inquire into the powers and energy of custom, exercise, habit, education, example, imitation, emulation, Company, friendship, praise, reproof, exhortation, reputation, laws, books, studies, etc. For these are the things that reign in men's morals. By these agents the mind is formed and subdued. So closely has this outline been followed by the new science that it reads almost like a table of contents for the works of Tard, Le Bon, Ross, Wallace, and Durkheim. Nothing is beneath science, nor above it. Sorceries, dreams, predictions, telepathic communications, psychical phenomena, in general must be subjected to scientific examination. For it is not known in what cases and how far effects attributed to superstition participate of natural causes. Despite his strong naturalistic bent, he feels the fascination of these problems. Nothing human is alien to him. Who knows what unsuspected truth, what new science indeed may grow out of these investigations, as chemistry butted out from alchemy. Alchemy may be compared to the man who told his sons he had left them gold buried somewhere in his vineyard, where they, by digging, found no gold, but by turning up the mold about the roots of the vines procured a plentiful vintage. So the search and endeavors to make gold have brought many useful inventions and instructive experiments to light. Still another science grows to form in Book 8, the science of success in life. Not yet having fallen from power, Bacon offers some preliminary hints on how to rise in the world. The first requisite is knowledge of ourselves and of others. Know thee, say Aoutun, is but half. Know thyself is valuable chiefly as a means of knowing others. We must diligently... Inform ourselves of the particular persons we have to deal with, their tempers, desires, views, customs, habits, the assistances, helps, and assurances whereupon they principally rely, 
and whence they receive their power, their defects and weaknesses, whereat they chiefly lie open and are accessible, their friends, factions, patrons, dependents, enemies, enviers, rivals, their times and manners of access, but the surest key for unlocking the minds of others turns upon searching and sifting either their tempers and natures or their ends and designs. And the more weak and simple are best judged by their temper, but the more prudent and close by their designs. But the shortest way to this whole inquiry rests upon three particulars, viz. one, in procuring numerous friendships, two, and observing a prudent mean and moderation between freedom of discourse and silence. But above all, nothing conduces more to the well-representing of a man's self and securing his own right than not to disarm one's self by too much sweetness and good nature, which exposes a man to injuries and reproaches, but rather at times to dart out some sparks of a free and generous mind that have no less of the sting than the honey. Friends are for Bacon chiefly a means to power. He shares with Machiavelli a point of view which one is at first inclined to attribute to the Renaissance, till one thinks of the fine and uncalculating friendships of Michelangelo and Cavalieri, Montaigne and Labouti, Sir Philip Sidney and Hubert Languet. Perhaps this very practical assessment of friendship helps to explain Bacon's fall from power, as similar views help to explain Napoleon's. For a man's friends will seldom practice a higher philosophy in their relations with him than that which he professes in his treatment of them. Bacon goes on to quote Bias, one of the seven wise men of ancient Greece. Love your friend as if he were to become your enemy, and your enemy as if he were to become your friend. Do not betray even to your friend too much of your real purposes and thoughts. In conversation ask questions oftener than you express opinions. And when you speak, offer data and information rather than beliefs and judgments. Manifest pride is a help to advancement, and ostentation is a fault in ethics rather than in politics. Here again, one is reminded of Napoleon. Bacon, like the little Corsican, was a simple man enough within his walls. But outside them, he effected a ceremony and display which he thought indispensable to public repute. So Bacon runs from field to field, pouring the seed of his thought into every science. At the end of his survey, he comes to the conclusion that science by itself is not enough. There must be a force and discipline outside the sciences to coordinate them and point them to a goal. There is another great and powerful cause why the sciences have made but little progress, which is this. It is not possible to run a course or right when the goal itself has not been rightly placed. What science needs is philosophy the analysis of scientific method and the coordination of scientific purposes and results. Without this, any science must be superficial. For as no perfect view of a country can be taken from a flat, so it is impossible to discover that remote and deep parts of any science by standing upon the level of the same science, or without ascending to a higher. He condemns the habit of looking at isolated facts out of their context, without considering the unity of nature. As if, he says, one should carry a small candle about the corners of a room radiant with a central light. Philosophy, rather than science, is in the long run Bacon's love. It is only philosophy which can give even to a life of turmoil and grief the stately peace that comes of understanding. Learning conquers or mitigates the fear of death and adverse fortune. He quotes Virgil's great lines. Happy the man who has learned the causes of things, and has put under his feet all fears, an inexorable fate, and the noisy strife of the hell of greed. It is perhaps the best fruit of philosophy that through it we unlearn the lessons of endless acquisition, which an industrial environment so insistently repeats. Philosophy directs us first to seek the goods of the mind, and the rest will either be supplied or not much wanted. A bit of wisdom is a joy forever. Government suffers precisely like science for lack of philosophy. Philosophy bears to science the same relationship which statesmanship bears to politics. Movement guided by a total knowledge and perspective, as against aimless and individual seeking. Just as the pursuit of knowledge becomes scholasticism when divorced from the actual needs of men and life, so the pursuit of politics becomes a destructive bedlam when divorced from science and philosophy. 
It is wrong to trust the natural body to empirics, who commonly have a few receipts whereupon they rely, but who know neither the cause, nor the disease, nor the constitution of patients, nor the danger of accidents, nor the true methods of cure. And so it must needs be dangerous to have the civil body of states managed by empirical statesmen, unless well mixed with others who are grounded in learning. Though he might be thought partial to his profession who said, States would then be happy when either kings were philosophers or philosophers kings. Yet so much is verified by experience that the best times have happened under wise and learned princes. And he reminds us of the great emperors who ruled Rome after Domitian and before Commodus. So Bacon, like Plato and us all, exalted his hobby and offered it as the salvation of man. But he recognized much more clearly than Plato, and the distinction announces the modern age, the necessity of specialist science and of soldiers and armies of specialist research. No one mind, not even Bacon's, could cover the whole field, though he should look from Olympus's top itself. He knew he needed help and keenly felt his loneliness in the mountain air of his unaided enterprise. What comrades have you in your work? He asks a friend. As for me, I am in the completest solitude. He dreams of scientists coordinated in specialization by constant communion and cooperation, and by some great organization holding them together to a goal. Consider what may be expected from men abounding in leisure, and from association of labors, and from successions of ages, the rather because it is not a way over which only one man can pass at a time, as is the case with that of reasoning but within which the labors and industries of men, especially as regards the collecting of experience, may with the best effort be collected and distributed, and then combined. For then only will men begin to know their strength when, instead of great numbers doing all the same things, one shall take charge of one thing and another of another. Science, which is the organization of knowledge, must itself be organized. And this organization must be international. Let it pass freely over the frontiers, and it may make Europe intellectually one. The next want, I discover, is the little sympathy and correspondence which exists between colleges and universities, as well throughout Europe as in the same state and kingdom. Let all these universities allot subjects and problems among themselves and cooperate both in research and in publication. So organized and correlated the universities might be deemed worthy of such royal support as would make them what they shall be in utopia, centers of impartial learning ruling the world. Bacon notes, The mean salaries apportioned to public lectureships, whether in the sciences or the arts, and he feels that this will continue till governments take over the great tasks of education. The wisdom of the ancientist and best times always complained the states were too busy with laws and too remiss in point of education. His great dream is the socialization of science for the conquest of nature and the enlargement of the power of man. And so he appeals to James I, showering upon him the flattery which he knew his royal highness loved to sip. James was a scholar as well as a monarch, prouder of his pen than of his scepter or his sword. Something might be expected of so literary and erudite a king. Bacon tells James that the plans he has sketched are, indeed, opera basilica, kingly tasks, towards which the endeavors of one man can be but as an image on a crossroad which points out the way but cannot tread it. Certainly these royal undertakings will involve expense, but... As the secretaries and spies of princes and states bring in bills for intelligence, so you must allow the spies and intelligencers of nature to bring in their bills if you would not be ignorant of many things worthy to be known. And if Alexander placed so large a treasure at Aristotle's command for the support of hunters, fowlers, fishers, and the like, in much more need do they stand of this beneficence who unfold the labyrinths of nature. With such royal aid, the great reconstruction can be completed in a few years. Without it, the task will require generations. What is refreshingly new in Bacon is the magnificent assurance with which he predicts the conquest of nature by man. I stake all on the victory of art over nature in the race. That which men have done is... 
but an earnest of the things they shall do. But why this great hope? Had not men been seeking truth and exploring the paths of science these two thousand years? Why should one hope now for such great success where so long a time had given so modest a result? Yes, Bacon answers. But what if the methods men have used have been wrong and useless? What if the road has been lost and research has gone into bypaths ending in the air? We need a ruthless revolution in our methods of research and thought, in our system of science and logic. We need a new organon, better than Aristotle's, fit for this larger world. And so Bacon offers us his supreme book. 2. The New Organon Bacon's greatest performance, says his bitterest critic, is the first book of Novum Organum. Never did a man put more life into logic, making induction an epic adventure and a conquest. If one must study logic, let him begin with this book. This part of the human philosophy which regards logic as disagreeable to the taste of many, as appearing to them no other than a net and a snare of thorny subtlety. But if we would rate things according to their real worth, the rational sciences are the keys to all the rest. Philosophy has been barren so long, says Bacon, because she needed a new method to make her fertile. The great mistake of the Greek philosophers was that they spent so much time in theory, so little in observation. But thought should be the aid of observation, not its substitute. Man, says the first aphorism of the Novum Organum, as if flinging a challenge to all metaphysics. Man, as the minister and interpreter of nature, does and understands as much as his observations on the order of nature. Permit him, and neither knows nor is capable of more. The predecessors of Socrates were in this matter sounder than his followers. Democritus, in particular, had a nose for facts rather than an eye for the clouds. No wonder that philosophy has advanced so little since Aristotle's day. It has been using Aristotle's methods. To go beyond Aristotle by the light of Aristotle is to think that a borrowed light can increase the original light from which it is taken. Now, after 2,000 years of logic chopping with the machinery invented by Aristotle, philosophy has fallen so low that none will ever do her reverence. All these medieval theories, theorems, and disputations must be cast out and forgotten. To renew herself, philosophy must begin anew with a clean slate and a cleansed mind. The first step, therefore, is the expurgation of the intellect. We must become as little children, innocent of isms and abstractions, washed clear of prejudices and preconceptions. We must destroy the idols of the mind. An idol, as Bacon uses the word, reflecting perhaps the Protestant rejection of the image worship, is a picture taken for a reality, a thought mistaken for a thing. Errors come under this head, and the first problem of logic is to trace and damn the sources of these errors. Bacon proceeds now to a justly famous analysis of fallacies. No man, said Condiac, has better known than Bacon the causes of human error. These errors are first idols of the tribe, fallacies natural to humanity in general. For man's sense is falsely asserted. By Protagoras's man is the measure of all things. To be the standard of things, on the contrary, all the perceptions, both of the senses and the mind, bear reference to man and not to the universe. And the human mind resembles those uneven mirrors which impart their own properties to different objects, and distort and disfigure them. Our thoughts are pictures rather of ourselves than of their objects. For example, the human understanding from its peculiar nature easily supposes a greater degree of order and regularity in things that it really finds, hence the fiction that all celestial bodies move in perfect circles. Again, the human understanding, when any proposition has been once laid down, either from general admission and belief or from the pleasure it affords, forces everything else to add fresh support and confirmation. And although most cogent and abundant instances may exist to the contrary, yet either does not observe or despises them, or it gets rid of and rejects them by some distinction with violent and injurious prejudice, 
rather than sacrifice the authority of its first conclusions. It was well answered by him who was shown in a temple the votive tablets suspended by such as had escaped the peril of shipwreck, and was pressed as to whether he would then recognize the power of the gods. But where are the portraits of those that have perished in spite of their vows? All superstition is much the same, whether it be that of astrology, dreams, omens, retributive judgment, or the like, in all of which that deluded believers observe events which are fulfilled, but neglect and pass over their failure, though it be much more common. Having first determined the question according to his will, man then resorts to experience, and bending her into conformity with his placets, leads her about like a captive in a procession. In short, the human understanding is no dry light, but receives an infusion from the will and affections, whence proceed sciences which may be called sciences as one would. For what a man had rather were true, he more readily believes. Is it not so? Bacon gives at this point a word of golden counsel. In general, let every student of nature take this as a rule that whatever his mind seizes and dwells upon with peculiar satisfaction is to be held in suspicion, and that so much the more care is to be taken in dealing with such questions to keep the understanding even and clear. The understanding must not be allowed to jump and fly from particulars to remote axioms and of almost the highest generality. It must not be supplied with wings, but rather hung with weights to keep it from leaping and flying. The imagination may be the greatest enemy of the intellect, whereas it should be only its tentative and experiment. A second class of errors Bacon calls idols of the cave, errors peculiar to the individual man. For everyone has a cave or den of his own, which refracts and discolors the light of nature. This is his character as formed by nature and nurture, and by his mood or condition of body and mind. Some minds, example, are constitutionally analytic and see differences everywhere. Others are constitutionally synthetic and see resemblances. So we have the scientist and the painter on the one hand, and on the other hand the poet and the philosopher. Again, some dispositions evince an unbounded admiration for antiquity. Others eagerly embrace novelty. Only a few can preserve the just medium and neither tear up what the ancients have correctly established, nor despise the just innovations of the moderns. Truth knows no parties. Thirdly, idols of the marketplace arising from the commerce and association of men with one another. For men converse by means of language, but words are imposed according to the understanding of the crowd, and there arises from a bad and inapt formation of words a wonderful obstruction to the mind. Philosophers deal out infinites with the careless assurance of grammarians handling infinitives. And yet does any man know what this infinite is, or whether it has even taken the precaution of existing? Philosophers talk about first cause uncaused, or first mover unmoved, but are not these again figly phrases used to cover naked ignorance, and perhaps indicative of a guilty conscience in the user? Every clear and honest head knows that no cause can be causeless, nor any mover unmoved. Perhaps the greatest reconstruction in philosophy would be simply this, that we should stop lying. Lastly, there are idols which have migrated into men's minds from the various dogmas of philosophers, and also from wrong laws of demonstration. These I call idols of the theater, because in my judgment all the received systems of philosophy are but so many stage plays representing worlds of their own creation after an unreal and scenic fashion. And in the plays of this philosophic theater you may observe the same thing which is found in the theater of the poets, that stories invented for the stage are more compact and elegant, and more as we would wish them to be than true stories out of history. The world, as Plato describes it, is merely a world constructed by Plato and pictures Plato rather than the world. We shall never get far along towards the truth that these idols are still to trip us up, even the best of us at every turn. We need new modes of reasoning, new tools for the understanding. And as the immense regions of the West Indies had never been discovered, if the use of the compass had not first been known, 
It is no wonder that the discovery and advancement of arts hath made no greater progress, when the art of inventing and discovering of the sciences remains hitherto unknown. And surely it would be disgraceful if, while the regions of the material globe have been in our times laid widely open and revealed, the intellectual globe should remain shut up within the narrow limits of old discoveries. Ultimately, our troubles are due to dogma and deduction. We find no new truth because we take some venerable but questionable proposition as an indubitable starting point, and never think of putting this assumption itself to the test of observation or experiment. Now, if a man will begin with certainties, he shall end in doubts. But if he will be content to begin in doubts, he shall end in certainties. Alas, it is not quite inevitable. Here a note common in the youth of modern philosophy, part of its Declaration of Independence. Descartes, too, would presently talk of the necessity of methodic doubt as the cobweb-clearing prerequisite of honest thought. Bacon proceeds to give an admirable description of the scientific method of inquiry. There remains simple experience, which, if taken as it comes, is called accident, empirical. If sought for, experiment, the true method of experience first lights the candle, hypothesis, and then by means of the candle shows the way, arranges, and delimits the experiment. Commencing as it does with experience duly ordered and digested, not bungling, nor erratic, and from it adducing axioms, and from established axioms again new experiments. We have here, as again in a later passage, which speaks of the results of initial experiments as a first vintage to guide further research, an explicit, though perhaps inadequate, recognition of that need for hypotheses experiment and deduction which some of Bacon's critics suppose him to have entirely overlooked. We must go to nature instead of to books, traditions, and authorities. We must put nature on the rack and compel her to bear witness, even against herself, so that we may control her to our ends. We must gather together from every quarter a natural history of the world, built by the united research of Europe's scientists. We must have induction. But induction does not mean simple enumeration of all the data. Conceivably, this might be endless and useless. No mass of material can by itself make science. This would be like chasing a quarry over an open country. We must narrow and enclose our field in order to capture our prey. The method of induction must include a technique for the classification of data and the elimination of hypothesis so that by the progressive cancelling of possible explanations, one only shall at last remain. Perhaps the most useful item in this technique is the table of more or less, which lists instances in which two qualities or conditions increase or decrease together, and so reveals presumably a causal relation between the simultaneously varying phenomena. So Bacon asking, what is heat? seeks for some factor that increases with the increases of heat and decreases with its decrease. He finds, after long analysis, an exact correlation between heat and motion. And his conclusion that heat is a form of motion constitutes one of his few scientific contributions to natural science. By this insistent accumulation and analysis of data, we come, in Bacon's phrase, to the form of the phenomena which we study to its secret nature and its inner essence. The theory of forms in Bacon is very much like the theory of ideas in Plato, the metaphysics of science. When we speak of forms, we mean nothing else than those laws and regulations of simple action which arrange and constitute any simple nature. The form of heat or the form of light, therefore, means no more than the law of heat or the law of light. In a similar strain, Spinoza was to say that the law of the circle is its substance. For although nothing exists in nature except individual bodies exhibiting clear individual effects according to particular laws, yet in each branch of learning those very laws, their investigation, discovery, and development are the foundation both of theory and of practice. Of theory and of practice. One without the other is useless and perilous. Knowledge that does not generate achievement is a pale and bloodless thing, unworthy of mankind. 
We strive to learn the forms of things, not for the sake of the forms, but because by knowing the forms, the laws, we may remake things in the image of our desire. So we study mathematics in order to reckon quantities and build bridges. We study psychology in order to find our way in the jungle of society. When science has sufficiently ferreted out the forms of things, the world will be merely the raw material of whatever utopia man may decide to make. 3. The Utopia of Science To perfect science so, and then to perfect social order by putting science in control, would itself be utopia enough. Such is the world described for us in Bacon's brief fragment and last work, The New Atlantis, published two years before his death. Wells thinks it's Bacon's greatest service to science to have drawn for us even so sketchily the picture of a society in which at last science has its proper place as the master of things. It was a royal act of imagination by which for three centuries one goal has been held in view by the great army of warriors in the battle of knowledge and invention against ignorance and poverty. Here in these few pages we have the essence and the form of Francis Bacon, the law of his being and his life, the secret and continuous aspiration of his soul, Plato in the Timaeus had told of the old legend of Atlantis, the sunken continent in the western seas. Bacon and others identified the new America of Columbus and Cabot with this old Atlantis. The great continent had not sunk after all, but only men's courage to navigate the sea. Since this old Atlantis was now known and seemed inhabited by a race vigorous enough, but not quite like the brilliant utopias of Bacon's fancy, he conceived of a new Atlantis, an isle in that distant Pacific which only Drake and Magellan had traversed, an isle distant enough from Europe and from knowledge to give generous scope to the utopian imagination. The story begins in the most artfully artless way, like the great tales of Defoe and Swift. We sailed from Peru, where we had continued for the space of one whole year, for China and Japan by the South Sea came a great calm in which the ships for weeks lay quietly on the boundless ocean like specks upon a mirror, while the provisions of the adventures ebbed away. And then resistless winds drove the vessels piteously north and north and north, out of the isle dotted south into an endless wilderness of sea. The rations were reduced and reduced again and again reduced, and disease took hold of the crew. At last, when they had resigned themselves to death, they saw, almost unbelieving, a fair island looming up under the sky. On the shore, as their vessel neared it, they saw not savages, but men simply and yet beautifully clothed, clean and manifestly of developed intelligence. They were permitted to land, but were told that the island government allowed no strangers to remain. Nevertheless, since some of the crew were sick, they might all stay till these were well again. During the weeks of convalescence, the wanderers unraveled day by day the mystery of the new Atlantis. There reigned in this island about nineteen hundred years ago, one of the inhabitants tells them, a king whose memory above all others we most adore. His name was Solomona, and we esteem him as the lawgiver of our nation. This king had a large heart and was wholly bent to make his kingdom and people happy. Among the excellent acts of that king, one above all hath the preeminence. It was the creation and institution of the order, or society, which is called Solomon's House, the noblest foundation, as we think, that was ever upon the earth, and the land theron of this kingdom. There follows a description of Solomon's House, too complicated for a quoted abstract, but eloquent enough to draw from the hostile Macaulay the judgment that, there is not to be found in any human composition a passage more eminently distinguished by profound and serene wisdom. Solomon's house takes the place in the New Atlantis of the Houses of Parliament in London. It is the home of the island government, but there are no politicians there, no insolent elected persons, no national palaver, as Carlyle would say. No parties, caucuses, primaries, conventions, campaigns, buttons, lithographs editorials, speeches, lies, and elections. The idea of filling public office by such dramatic methods seems never to have entered the heads of these Atlantans. But the road to the heights of scientific repute is open to all, 
and only those who have traveled the road sit in the councils of the state. It is a government of the people and for the people by the selected best of the people. A government by technicians, architects, astronomers, geologists, biologists, physicians, chemists, economists, sociologists, psychologists, and philosophers. Complicated enough, but think of a government without politicians. Indeed, there is little government at all in the new Atlantis. These governors are engaged rather in controlling nature than in ruling man. The end of our foundation is the knowledge of causes and secret motions of things, and the enlargement of the bounds of human empire to the effecting of all things possible. This is the key sentence of the book and of Francis Bacon. We find the governors engaged in such undignified tasks as studying the stars, arranging to utilize for industry the power of falling water, developing gases for the cure of various ailments, experimenting on animals for surgical knowledge, growing new varieties of plants and animals by crossbreeding, etc. We imitate the flights of birds. We have some degree of flying in the air. We have ships and boats for going underwater. There is foreign trade, but of an unusual sort. The island produces what it consumes and consumes what it produces. It does not go to war for foreign markets. We maintain a trade not of gold, silver, or jewels, nor for silks, nor for spices, nor for any other commodity or matter, but only for God's first creature, which was light, to have light of the growth of all parts of the world. These merchants of light are members of Solomon's house, who are sent abroad every twelve years to live among foreign peoples of every quarter of the civilized globe to learn their language and to study their sciences and industries and literatures, and to return at the end of the twelve years to report their findings to the leaders of Solomon's house, while their places abroad are taken by a new group of scientific explorers. In this way, the best of all the world comes soon to the new Atlantis. Brief as the picture is, we see in it again the outline of every philosopher's utopia, a people guided in peace and modest plenty by their wisest men. The dream of every thinker is to replace the politician by the scientist. Why does it remain only a dream after so many incarnations? Is it because the thinker is too dreamily intellectual to go out into the arena of affairs and build his concept into reality? Is it because the hard ambition of the narrowly acquisitive soul is forever destined to overcome the gentle and scrupulous aspirations of philosophers and saints? Or is it that science has not yet grown to maturity and conscious power? That only in our day do physicists and chemists and technicians begin to see that the rising role of science in industry and war gives them a pivotal position in social strategy and points to the time when their organized strength will persuade the world to call them to leadership? Perhaps science has not yet merited the mastery of the world, and perhaps in a little while it will. 5. Criticism and now, how shall we appraise this philosophy of Francis Bacon's? Is there anything new in it? Macaulay thinks that induction, as described by Bacon, is a very old-fashioned affair, over which there is no need of raising any commotion, much less a monument. Induction has been practiced from morning till night by every human being since the world began. The man who infers that mince pies disagreed with him because he was ill when he ate them, well, when he ate them not, most ill when he ate most, and least ill when he ate least, has employed, unconsciously but sufficiently, all the tables of the noum organum. But John Smith hardly handles his table of more or less so accurately, and more probably will continue his mince pies despite the seismic disturbances of his lower strata. And even were John Smith so wise, it would not shear bacon of his merit. For what does logic do but formulate the experience and methods of the wise? What does any discipline do but try by rules to turn the art of a few into a science teachable to all? But is the formulation Bacon's own? Is not the Socratic method inductive? Is not Aristotle's biology inductive? Did not Roger Bacon practice as well as preach the inductive method, which Francis Bacon merely preached? Did not Galileo formulate better the procedure that science has actually used? 
true of Roger Bacon, less true of Galileo, less true yet of Aristotle, least true of Socrates. Galileo outlined the aim rather than the method of science, holding up before its followers the goal of mathematical and quantitative formulation of all experience and relationships. Aristotle practiced induction when there was nothing else for him to do, and where the material did not lend itself to his penchant for the deduction of specific conclusions from magnificently general assumptions, and Socrates did not so much practice induction, the gathering of data, as analysis, the definition and discrimination of words and ideas. Bacon makes no claim to parthenogenetic originality. Like Shakespeare, he takes with a lordly hand and with the same excuse that he adorns whatever he touches. Every man has his sources, as every organism has its food. What is his is the way in which he digests them and turns them into flesh and blood. As Raleigh puts it, Bacon contemned no man's observations, but would light his torch at every man's candle. But Bacon acknowledges these debts. He refers to that useful method of Hippocrates. So sending us at once to the real source of inductive logic among the Greeks. And Plato, he writes, where less accurately we write Socrates, giveth good example of inquiry by induction and view of particulars though in such a wandering manner as is of no force or fruit. He would have disdained to dispute his obligations to these predecessors, and we should disdain to exaggerate them. But then again, is the Baconian method correct? Is it the method most fruitfully used in modern science? No. Generally, science has used, with best result, not the accumulation of data, natural history, and their manipulation by the complicated tables of the no wum or ganum, but the simpler method of hypothesis, deduction, and experiment. So Darwin, reading Malthus's essay on population, conceived the idea of applying to all organisms the Malthusian hypothesis, that population tends to increase faster than the means of subsistence. Deduced from this hypothesis the probable conclusion that the pressure of population on the food supply results in a struggle for existence in which the fittest survive, and by which in each generation every species is changed into closer adaptation to its environment. And finally, having by hypothesis and deduction limited his problem and his field of observation, turned to the unwithered face of nature, and made for twenty years a patient inductive examination of the facts. Again, Einstein conceived or took from Newton the hypothesis that light travels in curved, not straight lines, deduced from it the conclusion that a star appearing to be on straight line theory in a certain position in the heavens is really a little to one side of that position, and he invited experiment and observation to test the conclusion. Obviously, the function of hypothesis and imagination is greater than Bacon supposed and the procedure of science is more direct and circumscribed than in the Baconian scheme. Bacon himself anticipated the superannuation of his method. The actual practice of science would discover better modes of investigation than could be worked out in the interludes of statesmanship. These things require some ages for the ripening of them. Even a lover of the Baconian spirit must concede, too, that the great Chancellor, while laying down the law for science, failed to keep abreast of the science of his time. He rejected Copernicus and ignored Kepler and Tycho Brahe. He depreciated Gilbert and seemed unaware of Harvey. In truth, he loved discourse better than research, or perhaps he had no time for toilsome investigations. Such work as he did in philosophy and science was left in fragments and chaos at his death, full of repetitions, contradictions, aspirations, and introductions. Ars longa vita brevis. Art is long and time is fleeting. This is the tragedy of every great soul. To assign to so overworked a man whose reconstruction of philosophy had to be crowded into the crevices of a harassed and burdened political career, the vast and complicated creations of Shakespeare, is to waste the time of students with the parlor controversies of idle theorists. Shakespeare lacks just that which distinguishes the lordly chancellor, erudition and philosophy. 
Shakespeare has an impressive smattering of many sciences and a mastery of none. And all of them he speaks with the eloquence of an amateur. He accepts astrology. This huge state, whereon the stars in secret influence comment. He is forever making mistakes which the learned Bacon could not possibly have made. His Hector quotes Aristotle, and his Coriolanus alludes to Cato. He supposes the Lupercalia to be a hill, and he understands Caesar about as profoundly as Caesar is understood by H. G. Wells. He makes countless references to his early life and his matrimonial tribulations. He perpetrates vulgarities, obscenities, and puns natural enough in a gentle roisterer who could not quite outlive the Stratford rioter and the butcher's son, but hardly to be expected in the cold and calm philosopher. Carlyle calls Shakespeare the greatest of intellects, but he was rather the greatest of imaginations and the keenest eye. He is an inescapable psychologist, but he is not a philosopher. He has no structure of thought unified by a purpose for his own life and for mankind. He is immersed in love and its problems, and thinks of philosophy, through Montaigne's phrases, only when his heart is broken. Otherwise, he accepts the world blithely enough. He is not consumed with the reconstructive vision that ennobled Plato or Nietzsche or Bacon. Now the greatness and the weakness of Bacon lay precisely in his passion for unity, his desire to spread the wings of his coordinating genius over a hundred sciences. He aspired to be like Plato. A man of sublime genius who took a view of everything as from a lofty rock. He broke down under the weight of the tasks he had laid upon himself. He failed forgivably because he undertook so much. He could not enter the promised land of science. But as Cowley's epitaph expressed it, he could at least stand upon its border and point out its fair features in a distance. His achievement was not the less great because it was indirect. His philosophical works, though little read now, Move the intellects which move the world. He made himself the eloquent voice of the optimism and resolution of the Renaissance. Never was any man so great a stimulus to other thinkers. King James, it is true, refused to accept his suggestion for the support of science, and said of the novum organum that it was like the peace of God which passeth all understanding. But better men, in 1662, founding that royal society, which was to become the greatest association of scientists in the world, named Bacon as their model and inspiration. They hoped that this organization of English research would lead the way toward the Europe-wide association, which the advancement of learning had taught them to desire. And when the great minds of the French Enlightenment undertook that masterpiece of intellectual enterprise, the Encyclopédie, they dedicated it to Francis Bacon. If, said Diderot in the prospectus, we have come of it successfully, we shall owe most to the Chancellor Bacon, who threw out the plan of an universal dictionary of sciences and arts, at a time when, so to say, neither arts nor sciences existed. That extraordinary genius, when it was impossible to write a history of what was known wrote one of what it was necessary to learn. De Lambert called Bacon the greatest, the most universal, and the most eloquent of philosophers. The convention published the works of Bacon at the expense of the state. The whole tenor and career of British thought have followed the philosophy of Bacon. His tendency to conceive the world in democracy and mechanical terms gave to his secretary Hobbes the starting point for a thoroughgoing materialism, his inductive method gave to Locke the idea of an empirical psychology, bound by observation and freed from theology and metaphysics, and his emphasis on commodities and fruits, found formulation in Bentham's identification of the useful and the good. Wherever the spirit of control has overcome the spirit of resignation, Bacon's influence has been felt. He is the voice of all those Europeans who have changed a continent from a forest into a treasure land of art and science, and have made their little peninsula the center of the world. Men are not animals erect, said Bacon, but immortal gods. The Creator has given us souls equal to all the world, and yet satiable, not even with a world. Everything is possible to man, 
Time is young. Give us some little centuries, and we shall control and remake all things. We shall perhaps at least learn the noblest lesson of all, that man must not fight man, but must make war only on the obstacles that nature offers to the triumph of man. It will not be amiss, writes Bacon, in one of his finest passages, to distinguish the three kinds, and as it were grades of ambition in mankind. The first is of those who desire to extend their power in their native country, which kind is vulgar and degenerate. The second is of those who labor to extend their power of their country and its dominion among men. This certainly has more dignity, but not less covetousness. But if a man endeavor to establish and extend the power and dominion of the human race itself over the universe, his ambition is without doubt both a more wholesome thing and a nobler than the other two. It was Bacon's fate to be torn to pieces by these hostile ambitions struggling for his soul. Six. Epilogue. Men in great place are thrice servants. Servants to the sovereign or state, servants of fame, and servants of business. So as they have no freedom, neither in their persons nor in their action, nor in their time. The rising unto place is laborious, and by pains men come to greater pains. And it is sometimes base, and by indignities men come to dignities. The standing is slippery, and the regress is either a downfall or at least an eclipse. What a wistful summary of Bacon's epilogue. A man's shortcomings, said Goethe are taken from his epic, his virtues and greatness belong to himself. This seems a little unfair to the zeitgeist, but it is exceptionally just in the case of Bacon. Abbott, after a painstaking study of the morals prevalent at Elizabeth's court, concludes that all of the leading figures, male and female, were disciples of Machiavelli. Roger Ascham described in doggerel the four cardinal virtues in demand at the court of the queen. Cog, lie, flatter, and face. Four ways in court to win men grace. If thou be thrall to none of these, away, good peers, home, John Cheese. It was one of the customs of those lively days for judges to take presents from persons trying cases in their courts. Bacon was not above the age in this matter and his tendency to keep his expenditure several years in advance of his income forbade him the luxury of scruples. It might have passed unnoticed except that he had made enemies in Essex's case, and by his readiness to saber foes with his speech. A friend had warned him that It is too common in every man's mouth in court that, as your tongue hath been a razor to some, so shall theirs be to you. But he left the warnings unnoticed. He seemed to be in good favor with the king. He had been made Baron Verulam of Verulam in 1618, and Viscount St. Albans in 1621, and for three years he had been chancellor. Then suddenly the blow came. In 1621 a disappointed suitor charged him with taking money for the despatch of a suit. It was no unusual matter, but Bacon knew at once that if his enemies wished to press it, they could force his fall. He retired to his home and waited developments. When he learned that all his foes were clamoring for his dismissal, he sent in his confession and humble submission to the king. James, yielding to pressure from now victorious parliament against which Bacon had too persistently defended him, sent him to the tower. But Bacon was released after two days, and the heavy fine which had been laid upon him was remitted by the king. His pride was not quite broken. I was the justest judge that was in England these fifty years, he said. But it was the justest judgment that was in Parliament these two hundred years. He spent the five years that remained to him in the obscurity and peace of his home, harassed by an unwanted poverty, but solaced by the active pursuit of philosophy. In these five years he wrote his greatest Latin work, De Augmentis Scientarium published an enlarged edition of the Essays, a fragment called Silva, Silverum, and a history of Henry VII. He mourned that he had not sooner abandoned politics and given all his time to literature and science. 
to the very last moment he was occupied with work and died, so to speak, on the field of battle. In his essay of death, he had voiced a wish to die. In an earnest pursuit, which is like one wounded in hot blood, who for the time scarce feels the hurt. Like Caesar, he was granted his choice. In March 1626, while riding from London to Highgate and turning over in his mind the question how far flesh might be preserved from putrefaction by being covered with snow, he resolved to put the matter to a test at once. Stopping off at a cottage, he bought a fowl, killed it, and stuffed it with snow. While he was doing this, he was seized with chills and weakness, and finding himself too ill to ride back to town, he gave directions that he should be taken to the nearby home of Lord Arundel, where he took to bed. He did not yet resign life. He wrote cheerfully that the experiment succeeded excellently well, but it was his last. The fitful fever of his varied life had quite consumed him. He was all burnt out now, too weak to fight the disease that crept up slowly to his heart. He died on the 9th of April, 1626, at the age of 65. He had written in his will these proud and characteristic words. I bequeath my soul to God, my body to be buried obscurely, my name to the next ages and to foreign nations. The ages and the nations have accepted him. Chapter 4 Spinoza 1. Historical and Biographical 1. The Odyssey of the Jews the story of the Jews since the dispersion is one of the epics of European history. Driven from their natural home by the Roman capture of Jerusalem, 70 AD, and scattered by flight and trade among all the nations and to all the continents, persecuted and decimated by the adherents of the great religions, Christianity and Mohammedanism, which had been born of their scriptures and their memories, Barred by the feudal system from owning land and by the guilds from taking part in industry, shut up with congested ghettos and narrowing pursuits, mobbed by the people and robbed by the kings, building with their finance and trade the towns and cities indispensable to civilization, outcast and excommunicated, insulted and injured, yet without any political structure, without any legal compulsion to social unity, without even a common language. This wonderful people has maintained itself in body and soul, has preserved its racial and cultural integrity, has guarded with jealous love its oldest rituals and traditions, has patiently and resolutely awaited the day of its deliverance, and has emerged greater in number than ever before, renowned in every field for the contributions of its geniuses, and triumphantly restored, after two thousand years of wandering to its ancient and unforgotten home. What drama could rival the grandeur of these sufferings, the variety of these scenes, and the glory and justice of this fulfillment? What fiction could match the romance of this reality? The dispersion had begun many centuries before the fall of the holy city. Through Tyre and Sidon and other ports, the Jews had spread abroad into every nook of the Mediterranean, to Athens and Antioch, to Alexandria and Carthage, to Rome and Marseille and even to distant Spain. After the destruction of the temple, the dispersion became almost a mass migration. Ultimately, the movement followed two streams, one along the Danube and the Rhine, and thence later into Poland and Russia, the other into Spain and Portugal with the conquering Moors, 711 AD. In Central Europe, the Jews distinguished themselves as merchants and financiers. In the peninsula, they absorbed gladly the mathematical, medical, and philosophical lore of the Arabs and developed their own culture in the great schools of Cordova, Barcelona, and Seville. Here in the 12th and 13th centuries, the Jews played a prominent part in transmitting ancient and oriental culture to Western Europe. It was at Cordova that Moses Mamanides, 1135-1204, the greatest physician of his age, wrote his famous biblical commentary. The Guide to the Perplexed. It was at Barcelona that Hasde Crescas, 1370-1430, propounded heresies that shook all Judaism. The Jews of Spain prospered and flourished until the conquest of Granada by Ferdinand in 1492, 
and the final expulsion of the Moors. The Peninsular Jews now lost the liberty which they had enjoyed under the lenient ascendancy of Islam. The Inquisition swept down upon them with the choice of baptism and the practice of Christianity, or exile and the confiscation of their goods. It was not that the Church was violently hostile to the Jews. The popes repeatedly protested against the barbarities of the Inquisition, but the King of Spain thought he might fatten his purse with the patiently garnered wealth of this alien race. Almost in the year that Columbus discovered America, Ferdinand discovered the Jews. The great majority of the Jews accepted the harder alternative and looked about them for a place of refuge. Some took ship and sought entry into Genoa and other Italian ports. They were refused and sailed on in growing misery and disease till they reached the coast of Africa, where many of them were murdered for the jewels they were believed to have swallowed. A few were received into Venice, which knew how much of its maritime ascendancy it owed to its Jews. Others financed the voyage of Columbus, a man perhaps of their own race, hoping that the great navigator would find them a new home. A large number of them embarked in the frail vessels of that day and sailed up the Atlantic, between hostile England and hostile France, to find at last some measure of welcome in little big souled Holland. Among these was a family of Portuguese Jews named Espinosa. Thereafter, Spain decayed and Holland prospered. The Jews built their first synagogue in Amsterdam in 1598, and when, 75 years later, they built another, the most magnificent in Europe, their Christian neighbors helped them to finance the enterprise. The Jews were happy now, if we may judge from the stout content of their merchants and rabbis to whom Rembrandt has given immortality. But towards the middle of the 17th century, the even tenor of events was interrupted by a bitter controversy within the synagogue. Uriel Acosta, a passionate youth who had felt, like some other Jews, the skeptical influence of the Renaissance, wrote a treatise vigorously attacking the belief in another life. This negative attitude was not necessarily contrary to older Jewish doctrine, but the synagogue compelled him to retract publicly, lest it should incur the disfavor of a community that had welcomed them generously, but would be unappeasably hostile to any heresy striking so sharply at what was considered the very essence of Christianity. The formula of retraction and penance required the proud author to lie down athwart the threshold of the synagogue, while the members of the congregation walked over his body. Humiliated beyond sufferance, Uriel went home, wrote a fierce denunciation of his persecutors, and shot himself. Note, Gutzkow had turned this story into a drama which still finds place in European repertoires. This was in 1647. At that time, Baruch Spinoza, the greatest Jew of modern times, and the greatest of modern philosophers was a lad of 15, the favorite student of the synagogue. 2. The Education of Spinoza it was this odyssey of the Jews that filled the background of Spinoza's mind and made him irrevocably, however excommunicate, a Jew. Though his father was a successful merchant, the youth had no leaning to such a career and preferred to spend his time in and around the synagogue, absorbing the religion and the history of his people. He was a brilliant scholar, and the elders looked upon him as a future light of their community and their faith. Very soon he passed from the Bible itself to the exactingly subtle commentaries of the Talmud, and from these to the writings of Mamanides, Levi ben Gerson, Ibn Ezra, and Hasdai Kreskas. And his promiscuous veracity extended even to the mystical philosophy of Ibn Gibral and the Kabbalistic intricacies of Moses of Cordova. He was struck by the latter's identification of God and the universe. He followed up the idea in Ben Gerson, who taught the eternity of the world, and in Hesdai Crescas, who believed the universe of matter to be the body of God. He read in Mamonides a half-favorable discussion of the doctrine of Averroes that immortality is impersonal, but he found in the guide to the perplexed more perplexities than guidance. For the great rabbi propounded more questions than he answered, and Spinoza found the contradictions and improbabilities of the Old Testament lingering in his thought long after the solutions of Mammonides had dissolved into forgetfulness. 
The cleverest defenders of a faith are its greatest enemies, for their subtleties engender doubt and stimulate the mind. And if this was so with the writings of Mamonides, so much the more was it the case with the commentaries of Ibn Ezra, where the problems of the old faith were more directly expressed and sometimes abandoned as unanswerable. The more Spinoza read and pondered, the more his simple certainties melted away into wondering and doubt. His curiosity was aroused to inquire what the thinkers of the Christian world had written on those great questions of God and human destiny. He took up the study of Latin with a Dutch scholar, Van den Ende, and moved into a wider sphere of experience and knowledge. His new teacher was something of a heretic himself, a critic of creeds and governments, an adventurous fellow who stepped out of his library to join a conspiracy against the King of France and adorned a scaffold in 1674. He had a pretty daughter who became the successful rival of Latin for the affections of Spinoza. Even a modern collegian might be persuaded to study Latin by such inducements. But the young lady was not so much of an intellectual as to be blind to the main chance, and when another suitor came bearing costly presents, she lost interest in Spinoza. No doubt it was at that moment that our hero became a philosopher. At any rate, he had conquered Latin, and through Latin he entered into the heritage of ancient and medieval European thought. He seems to have studied Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, but he preferred to them the great atomists, Democritus, Epicurus, and Lucretius, and the Stoics left their mark upon him ineffably. He read the scholastic philosophers and took from them not only their terminology, but their geometrical method of exposition by axiom, definition, proposition, proof, scolium, and corollary. He studied Bruno, 1548 to 1600, that magnificent rebel whose fires not all the snows of the Caucasus could quench, who wandered from country to country and from creed to creed, and evermore came out by the same door wherein he went, searching and wandering, and who at last was sentenced by the Inquisition to be killed as mercifully as possible and without the shedding of blood, i.e., to be burned alive. What a wealth of ideas there was in this romantic Italian. First of all, the master idea of unity. All reality is one in substance, one in cause, one in origin, and God and this reality are one. Again, to Bruno, mind and matter are one. Every particle of reality is composed inseparably of the physical and the psychical. The object of philosophy, therefore, is to perceive unity in diversity, mind in matter, and matter in mind, to find the synthesis in which the opposites and contradictions meet and merge, to rise to that highest knowledge of universal unity which is the intellectual equivalent of the love of God. Every one of these ideas became part of the intimate structure of Spinoza's thought. Finally, and above all, he was influenced by Descartes, 1596 to 1650, father of the subjective and idealistic, as was Bacon of the objective and realistic, tradition in modern philosophy. To his French followers and English enemies, the central notion in Descartes was the primacy of consciousness, his apparently obvious proposition that the mind knows itself more immediately and directly than it can ever know anything else that it knows the external world only through that world's impress upon the mind in sensation and perception, that all philosophy must in consequence, though it should doubt everything else, begin with the individual mind and self and make its first argument in three words. I think, therefore I am. Perhaps there was something of Renaissance individualism in this starting point. Certainly there was in it a whole magician's hat full of consequences for later speculation. Now began the great game of epistemology, which in Leibniz, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, and Kant waxed into a three hundred years war that at once stimulated and devastated modern philosophy. Note, epistemology means, etymologically, the logic, logos, of understanding. Epistemi, i.e., the origin, nature, and validity of knowledge. But this side of Descartes' thought did not interest Spinoza. He would not lose himself in the labyrinths of epistemology. 
What attracted him was Descartes' conception of a homogeneous substance underlying all forms of matter, and another homogeneous substance underlying all forms of mind. This separation of reality into two ultimate substances was a challenge to the unifying passion of Spinoza, and acted like a fertilizing sperm upon the accumulations of his thought. What attracted him again was Descartes' desire to explain all of the world except God and the soul by mechanical and mathematical laws. An idea going back to Leonardo and Galileo, and perhaps reflecting the development of machinery and industry in the cities of Italy. Given an initial push by God, said Descartes, very much as Anaxagoras had said 2,000 years before, and the rest of astronomic, geologic, and all non mental processes and developments can be explained from a homogeneous substance existing at first in a disintegrated form, the nebular hypothesis of Laplace and Kant, and every movement of every animal and even of the human body is a mechanical movement. The circulation of the blood, for example, and reflex action. All the world and every body is a machine. But outside the world is God, and within the body is the spiritual soul. Here Descartes stopped, but Spinoza eagerly passed on. 3. Excommunication these were the mental antecedents of the externally quiet but internally disturbed youth who, in 1656, he had been born in 1632, was summoned before the elders of the synagogue on the charge of heresy. Was it true, they asked him, that he had said to his friends that God might have a body, the world of matter, that angels might be hallucinations, that the soul might be merely life, and that the Old Testament said nothing of immortality? We do not know what he answered. We only know that he was offered an annuity of $500 if he would consent to maintain at least an external loyalty to his synagogue and his faith. That he refused the offer. And that on July 27, 1656, he was excommunicated with all the somber formalities of Hebrew ritual. During the reading of the curse, the wailing and protracted note of a great horn was heard to fall in from time to time. The lights, seen brightly burning at the beginning of the ceremony, were extinguished one by one as it proceeded, till at the end the last went out, typical of the extinction of the spiritual life of the excommunicated man, and the congregation was left in total darkness. Van Vloten has given us the formula used for excommunication. The heads of the ecclesiastical council hereby make known that already well assured of the evil opinions and doings of Baruch de Espinosa, they have endeavored in sundry ways and by various promises to turn him from his evil courses. But as they have been unable to bring him to any better way of thinking, on the contrary, as they are every day better certified of the horrible heresies entertained and avowed by him, and of the insolence with which these heresies are promulgated and spread abroad, and many persons worthy of credit having borne witness to these in the presence of the said Espinosa. He has been held fully convicted of the same. Review having therefore been made of the whole matter before the chiefs of the ecclesiastical council, it has been resolved, the councillors assenting thereto, to anathematize the said Spinoza, and to cut him off from the people of Israel, and from the present hour to place him in anathema with the following malediction. With the judgment of the angels and the sentence of the saints, we anathematize, execrate, curse, and cast out Baruch de Espinosa, the whole of the sacred community assenting in presence of the sacred books with the 613 precepts written therein, pronouncing against him the malediction wherewith Elisha cursed the children, and all the maledictions written in the book of the law. Let him be accursed by day and accursed by night. Let him be accursed in his lying down and accursed in his rising up. Accursed in going out and accursed in coming in. May the Lord never more pardon or acknowledge him. May the wrath and displeasure of the Lord burn henceforth against this man. Load him with all the curses written in the book of the law and blot out his name from under the sky. May the Lord sever him for evil from all the tribes of Israel. Wait him with all the maledictions of the firmament contained in the book of the law. And may all ye who are obedient to the Lord your God be saved this day. 
Hereby then are admonished that none hold converse with him by word of mouth, none hold communication with him by writing, that none do him any service, no one abide under the same roof with him, no one approach within four cubits length of him, and no one read any document dictated by him or written by his hand. Let us not be too quick to judge the leaders of the synagogue, for they faced a delicate situation. No doubt they were hesitated to subject themselves to the charge that they were as intolerant of heterodoxy as the Inquisition, which had exiled them from Spain. But they felt that gratitude to their hosts in Holland demanded the excommunication of a man whose doubts struck at Christian doctrine quite as vitally as at Judaism. Protestantism was not then the liberal and fluent philosophy which it now becomes. The wars of religion had left each group entrenched immovably in its own creed, cherished now all the more because of the blood just shed in its defense. What would the Dutch authorities say to a Jewish community which repaid Christian toleration and protection by turning out in one generation on Acosta, and in the next a Spinoza? Furthermore, religious unanimity seemed to the elders their sole means of preserving the little Jewish group in Amsterdam from disintegration, and almost the last means of preserving the unity, and so ensuring the survival of the scattered Jews of the world. If they had had their own state, their own civil law, their own establishments of secular force and power, to compel internal cohesion and external respect, they might have been more tolerant. But their religion was to them their patriotism as well as their faith. The synagogue was their center of social and political life as well as of ritual and worship. And the Bible, whose veracity Spinoza had impugned, was the portable fatherland of their people. Under these circumstances, they thought heresy was treason and toleration suicide. One feels that they should have bravely run these risks. But it is as hard to judge another justly as it is to get out of one's skin. Perhaps Menasa, Ben Israel, spiritual head of the whole Amsterdam community of Jews, could have found some conciliatory formula within which both the synagogue and the philosopher might have found room to live in mutual peace. But the great rabbi was then in London, persuading Cromwell to open England to the Jews. Fate had written that Spinoza should belong to the world. 4. Retirement and death. He took the excommunication with quiet courage, saying, It compels me to nothing which I should not have done in any case. But this was whistling in the dark. In truth, the young student now found himself bitterly and piteously alone. Nothing is so terrible as solitude, and few forms of it are so difficult as the isolation of a Jew from all his people. Spinoza had already suffered in the loss of his old faith. To so uproot the contents of one's mind is a major operation and leaves many wounds. Had Spinoza entered another fold, embraced another of the orthodoxies in which men were grouped like kine huddling together for warmth, he might have found in the role of a distinguished convert some of the life which he had lost by being utterly outcast from his family and his race. But he joined no other sect and lived his life alone. His father, who had looked forward to his son's preeminence in Hebrew learning, sent him away. His sister tried to cheat him of a small inheritance. His former friends shunned him. Note, he contested the case in court, won it, and then turned over the bequest to the sister. No wonder there is little humor in Spinoza. And no wonder he breaks out with some bitterness occasionally when he thinks of the keepers of the law. Those who wish to seek out the causes of miracles and to understand the things of nature as philosophers and not to stare at them in astonishment like fools are soon considered heretical and impious and proclaimed as such by those whom the mob adore as the interpreters of nature and the gods. For these men know that once ignorance is put aside, that wonderment would be taken away which is the only means by which their authority is preserved. The culminating experience came shortly after the excommunication. One night, as Spinoza was walking through the streets, a pious ruffian bent on demonstrating his theology by murder attacked the young student with drawn dagger. Spinoza, turning quickly, escaped with a slight wound on the neck. 
concluding that there are few places in this world where it is safe to be a philosopher, he went to live in a quiet attic room on the outer deck road outside of Amsterdam. It was now probably that he changed his name from Baruch to Benedict. His host and hostess were Christians of the Mennonite sect and could in some measure understand a heretic. They liked his sadly kind face. Those who have suffered much become very bitter or very gentle and were delighted when occasionally he would come down of an evening, smoke his pipe with them and tune his talk to their simple strain. He made his living at first by teaching children in Van den Enden's school, and then by polishing lenses, as if he had an inclination for dealing with refractory material. He had learned the optical trade while living in the Jewish community. It was in accord with Hebrew canon that every student should acquire some manual art, not only because study and honest teaching can seldom make a livelihood, but as Gamaliel had said, work keeps one virtuous, whereas Every learned man who fails to acquire a trade will at last turn out a rogue. Five years later, 1660, his host moved to Rheinsberg, near Leiden, and Spinoza moved with him. The house still stands, and the road bears the philosopher's name. These were years of plain living and high thinking. Many times he stayed in his room for two or three days together, seeing nobody, and having his modest meals brought up to him. The lenses were well done, but not so continuously as to earn for Spinoza more than merely enough. He loved wisdom too much to be a successful man. Colerus, who followed Spinoza in these lodgings and wrote a short life of the philosophers from the reports of those who had known him, says, He was very careful to cast up his accounts every quarter, which he did that he might spend neither more nor less than what he had to spend for each year. And he would say sometimes, to the people of the house, that he was like the serpent who forms a circle with his tail in his mouth, to denote that he had nothing left at the year's end. But in his modest way he was happy. To one who advised him to trust in revelation rather than in reason, he answered, Though I were at times to find the fruit unreal, which I gather by my natural understanding, yet this would not make me otherwise than content. Because in the gathering I am happy, and pass my days not in sighing and sorrow, but in peace, serenity, and joy. If Napoleon had been as intelligent as Spinoza, says a great sage, he would have lived in a garret and written four books. To the portraits of Spinoza which have come down to us, we may add a word of description from Colerus. He was of a middle size, he had good features in his face, the skin somewhat black, the hair dark and curly, the eyebrows long and black, so that one might easily know by his looks that he was descended from Portuguese Jews. As for his clothes, he was very careless of them, and they were not better than those of the meanest citizen. One of the most eminent counselors of state went to see him and found him in a very untidy morning gown, whereupon the counselor reproached him for it and offered him another. Spinoza answered that a man was never the better for having a fine gown, and added, it is unreasonable to wrap up things of little or no value in a precious cover. Spinoza's sartorial philosophy was not always so aesthetic. It is not a disorderly or slovenly carriage that makes us sages, he writes, for affected indifference to personal appearance is rather evidence of a poor spirit in which true wisdom could find no worthy dwelling place, and science could only meet with disorder and disarray. It was during this five-year stay at Rheinsberg that Spinoza wrote the little fragment on the improvement of the intellect and the ethics geometrically demonstrated. The latter was finished in 1665, but for ten years Spinoza made no effort to publish it. In 1668, Adrian Corba, for printing opinions similar to Spinoza's, was sent to jail for ten years and died thereafter serving eighteen months of his sentence. When, in 1675, Spinoza went to Amsterdam, trusting that he might now safely publish his chef d'oeuvre, a rumor was spread about, as he writes to his friend Oldenburg, that a book of mine was soon to appear, in which I endeavored to prove that there is no God. This report, I regret to add, was by many received as true. Certain theologians, who probably were themselves the author of the rumor, 
took occasion upon this to lodge a complaint against me with the prince and the magistrates. Having received a hint of this state of things from some trustworthy friends who assured me further that the theologians were everywhere lying in wait for me, I determined to put off my attempted publication until such time as I should see what turn affairs would take. Only after Spinoza's death did the ethics appear, 1677, along with an unfinished treatise on politics and a treatise on the rainbow. All these works were in Latin as the universal language of European philosophy and science in the 17th century. A short treatise on God and man written in Dutch was discovered by Van Vloten in 1852. It was apparently a preparatory sketch for the ethics. The only books published by Spinoza in his lifetime were The Principles of the Cartesian Philosophy, 1663, and A Treatise on Religion and the State, which appeared anonymously in 1670. It was at once honored with a place in the Index Expurgatorius, and its sale was prohibited by the civil authorities. With this assistance, it attained to a considerable circulation under cover of title pages, which disguised it as a medical treatise or an historical narrative. Countless volumes were written to refute it, one called Spinoza, the most impious atheist that ever lived upon the face of the earth. Colerus speaks of another refutation as a treasure of infinite value which shall never perish. Only this notice remains of it. In addition to such public chastisements, Spinoza received a number of letters intended to reform him. That of a former pupil, Albert Berg, who had been converted to Catholicism, may be taken as a sample. You assume that you have at last found the true philosophy. How do you know that your philosophy is the best of all those which have ever been taught in the world, are now taught, or shall be taught hereafter? To say nothing of what may be devised in the future, have you examined all those philosophies, both ancient and modern, which are taught here in India? and all the world over. And even supposing that you have duly examined them, how do you know that you have chosen the best? How dare you set up yourself above all the patriarchs, prophets, apostles, martyrs, doctors, and confessors of the church? Miserable man and worm upon the earth that you are, yea, ashes and food for worms, how can you confront the eternal wisdom with your unspeakable blasphemy? What foundation have you for this rash, insane, deplorable, accursed doctrine. What devilish pride puffs you up to pass judgment on the mysteries which Catholics themselves declare to be incomprehensible, etc., etc. To which Spinoza replied, You, who assume that you have at last found the best religion, or rather the best teachers, and fixed your credulity upon them, how do you know that they are the best among those who have taught religions? or now teach, or shall hereafter teach them? Have you examined all those religions, ancient and modern, which are taught here, and in India, and all the world over? And even supposing that you have duly examined them, how do you know that you have chosen the best? Apparently the gentle philosopher could be firm enough when occasion called for it. Not all the letters were of this uncomfortable kind. Many of them were for men of mature culture and high position. Most prominent of these correspondents were Henry Oldenburg, secretary of the recently established Royal Society of England, von Schoenhaus, a young German inventor and nobleman, Huygens, the Dutch scientist, Leibniz, the philosopher who visited Spinoza in 1676, Louis Meyer, a physician of The Hague, and Simon de Vries, a rich merchant of Amsterdam. The latter so admired Spinoza that he begged him to accept a gift of $1,000. Spinoza refused, and later, when de Vries, making his will, proposed to leave his entire fortune to him, Spinoza persuaded de Vries instead to bequeath his wealth to his brother. When the merchant died, it was found that his will required that an annuity of $250 should be paid to Spinoza out of the income of the property. Spinoza wished again to refuse, saying, Nature is satisfied with little, and if she is, I am also. But he was at last prevailed upon to accept $150 a year. Another friend, Jan de Witt, chief magistrate of the Dutch Republic, gave him a state annuity of $50. 
Finally, the Grand Monarch himself, Louis XIV, offered him a substantial pension with the implied condition that Spinoza should dedicate his next book to the king. Spinoza courteously declined. To please his friends and correspondents, Spinoza moved to Vorburg, a suburb of The Hague, in 1665, and in 1670 to The Hague itself. During these later years, he developed an affectionate intimacy with Jan de Witt. And when de Witt and his brother were murdered in the streets by a mob which believed them responsible for the defeat of the Dutch troops by the French in 1672, Spinoza, on being apprised of the infamy, burst into tears and but for the force which was used to restrain him, would have sallied forth a second Antony to denounce the crime on the spot where it had been committed. Not long afterward, the Prince de Condé, head of the invading French army, invited Spinoza to his headquarters to convey to him the offer of a royal pension from France and to introduce certain admirers of Spinoza who were with the prince. Spinoza, who seems to have been rather a good European, then a nationalist thought it nothing strange for him to cross the lines and go to Condé's camp. When he returned to The Hague, the news of his visit spread about, and there were angry murmurs among the people. Spinoza's host, Van de Spike, was in fear of an attack upon his house. But Spinoza calmed him, saying, I can easily clear myself of all suspicion of treason, but should the people show the slightest disposition to molest you, should they even assemble and make a noise before your house, I will go down to them, though they should serve me as they did poor De Witt. But when the crowd learned that Spinoza was merely a philosopher, they concluded that he must be harmless, and the commotion quieted down. Spinoza's life, as we see it in these little incidents, was not as impoverished and secluded as it had been traditionally pictured. He had some degree of economic security, he had influential and congenial friends, he took an interest in the political issues of his time, and he was not without adventures that came close to being matters of life and death. That he had made his way, despite excommunication and interdict, into the respect of his contemporaries, appears from the offer which came to him in 1673 of the Chair of Philosophy at the University of Heidelberg, an offer couched in the most complimentary terms and promising the most perfect freedom in philosophizing which His Highness feels assured you would not abuse by calling in question the established religion of the state. Spinoza replied characteristically, Honored sir, had it ever been my wish to undertake the duties of a professor in any faculty, my desires would have been amply gratified in accepting the position which His Serene Highness, the Prince Palatine, does me the honor to offer me through you. The offer, too, is much enhanced in value in my eyes by the freedom of philosophizing attached to it, but I do not know within what precise limits that the same liberty of philosophizing would have to be restrained, so that I would not seem to interfere with the established religion of the principality. You see, therefore, honored sir, that I do not look for any higher worldly position than that which I now enjoy, and that for love of the quiet which I think I cannot otherwise secure, I must abstain from entering upon the career of a public teacher. The closing chapter came in 1677. Spinoza was now only 44, but his friends knew that he had not many years left to him. He had come of consumptive parentage, and his comparative confinement in which he had lived, as well as the dust-laden atmosphere in which he had labored, were not calculated to correct this initial disadvantage. More and more he suffered from difficulty in breathing. Year by year, his sensitive lungs decayed. He reconciled himself to an early end and feared only that the book, which he had not dared to publish during his lifetime, would be lost or destroyed after his death. He placed the MS in a small writing desk, locked it, and gave the key to his host, asking him to transmit desk and key to Jan Riewertz, the Amsterdam publisher, when the inevitable should come. On Sunday, February 20th, the family with whom Spinoza lived went to church after receiving his assurance that he was not unusually ill. Dr. Meyer alone remained with him. When they returned, they found the philosopher lying dead in the arms of his friend. Many mourned him, for the simple folk had loved him as much for his gentleness and the learned had honored him for his wisdom. Philosophers and magistrates joined the people in following him to his final rest and men of varied faiths met at his grave. 
Nietzsche says somewhere that the last Christian died upon the cross. He had forgotten Spinoza. Two. The Treatise on Religion and the State Let us study his four books in the order in which he wrote them. The Tractatus Theologico Politicus is perhaps the least interesting of them to us today, because the movement of higher criticism which Spinoza initiated has made into platitudes the propositions for which Spinoza risked his life. It is unwise of an author to prove his point too thoroughly. His conclusions pass into the currency of all educated minds, and his works no longer have that mystery about them which draws us ever on. So it has been with Voltaire, and so with Spinoza's treatise on religion and the state. The essential principle of the book is that the language of the Bible is deliberately metaphorical or allegorical, not only because it partakes of the oriental tendency to high literary color and ornament and exaggerated descriptive expressions, but because, too, the prophets and the apostles, to convey their doctrine by arousing the imagination, were compelled to adapt themselves to the capacities and predispositions of the popular mind. All scripture was written primarily for an entire people, and secondarily for the whole human race. Consequently, its contents must necessarily be adapted as far as possible to the understanding of the masses. Scripture does not explain things by their secondary causes but only narrates them in the order and style which has most power to move men, and especially uneducated men, to devotion. Its object is not to convince the reason, but to attract and lay hold of the imagination. Hence the abundant miracles and the repeated appearances of God. The masses think that the power and providence of God are most clearly displayed by events that are extraordinary, and contrary to the conception which they have formed of nature. They suppose, indeed, that God is inactive so long as nature works in our accustomed order, and vice versa, that the power of nature and natural causes are idle so long as God is acting. Thus they imagine two powers distinct from one another, the power of God and the power of nature. Here enters the basic idea of Spinoza's philosophy, that God and the processes of nature are one. Men love to believe that God breaks the natural order of events for them, so the Jews gave a miraculous interpretation of the lengthening of the day in order to impress others, and perhaps themselves, with the conviction that the Jews were the favorites of God. And similar incidents abound in the early history of every people. Sober and literal statements do not move the soul. If Moses had said that it was merely the east wind, as we gather from a later passage, that cleared a path for them through the Red Sea, it would have made little impression on the minds of the masses he was leading. Again, the apostles resorted to miracle stories for the same reason that they resorted to parables. It was a necessary adaptation to the public mind. The greater influence of such men as compared with philosophers and scientists is largely attributable to the vivid and metaphorical forms of speech, which the founders of religion, by the nature of their mission and their own emotional intensity, are driven to adopt. Interpreted on this principle, the Bible, says Spinoza, contains nothing contrary to reason. But interpreted literally, it is full of errors, contradictions, and obvious impossibilities. As that the Pentateuch was written by Moses. The more philosophical interpretation reveals, through the mist of allegory and poetry, the profound thought of great thinkers and leaders, and makes intelligible the persistence of the Bible and its immeasurable influence upon men. Both interpretations have a proper place and function. The people will always demand a religion phrased in imagery and hallowed with the supernatural. If one such form of faith is destroyed, they will create another. But the philosopher knows that the God and nature are one being, acting by necessity and according to invariable law. It is this majestic law which he will reverence and obey. He knows that in the scriptures... God is described as a lawgiver or prince and styled just, merciful, etc., merely in concession to the understanding of the people and their imperfect knowledge, that in reality God acts, by the necessity of his nature and his decrees, are eternal truths. Spinoza makes no separation between Old and New Testament and looks upon the Jewish and the Christian religion as one, 
When popular hatred and misunderstandings are laid aside and philosophical interpretation finds the hidden core and essence of the rival faiths, I have often wondered that persons who make boast of professing the Christian religion, namely love, joy, peace, temperance, and charity to all men, should quarrel with such rancorous animosity and display daily toward one another such bitter hatred, that this, rather than the virtues which they profess, is the readiest criterion of their faith. The Jews have survived chiefly because of Christian hatred of them. Persecution gave them the unity and solidarity necessary for continued racial existence. Without persecution, they might have mingled and married with the peoples of Europe and been engulfed in the majorities with which they were everywhere surrounded. But there is no reason why the philosophic Jew and the philosophic Christian, when all nonsense is discarded, should not agree sufficiently in creed to live in peace and cooperation. The first step toward this consummation, Spinoza thinks, would be a mutual understanding about Jesus. Let improbable dogmas be withdrawn, and the Jews would soon recognize in Jesus the greatest and noblest of the prophets. Spinoza does not accept the divinity of Christ, but he puts him first among men. The eternal wisdom of God has shown itself forth in all things, but chiefly in the mind of man and most of all in Jesus Christ. Christ was sent to teach not only the Jews, but the whole human race. Hence, he accommodated himself to the comprehension of the people, and most often taught by parables. He considers that the ethics of Jesus are almost synonymous with wisdom, and reverencing him one rises to the intellectual love of God. So noble a figure, freed from the impediment of dogmas that lead only to divisions and disputes, would draw all men to him. And perhaps in his name, a world torn with suicidal wars of tongue and sword might find a unity of faith and a possibility of brotherhood at last. 3. The Improvement of the Intellect Opening Spinoza's next book, we come at the outset upon one of the gems of philosophic literature. Spinoza tells why he gave up everything for philosophy. After experience had taught me that all things which frequently take place in ordinary life are vain and futile, and when I saw that all the things I feared and which feared me had nothing good or bad in them save insofar as the mind was affected by them, I determined at last to inquire whether there was anything which might be truly good and able to communicate its goodness and by which the mind might be affected to the exclusion of all other things. I determined, I say, to inquire whether I might discover and attain the faculty of enjoying throughout eternity continual supreme happiness. I could see the many advantages acquired from honor and riches and that I should be debarred from acquiring these things if I wished seriously to investigate a new matter. But the more one possesses of either of them, the more the pleasure is increased, and the more one is in consequence encouraged to increase them. Whereas if at any time our hope is frustrated, there arises in us the deepest pain. Fame has also this great drawback, that if we pursue it we must direct our lives in such a way as to please the fancy of men avoiding what they dislike and seeking what pleases them. But the love towards a thing eternal and infinite alone feeds the mind with a pleasure secure from all pain. The greatest good is the knowledge of the union which the mind has with the whole of nature. The more the mind knows, the better it understands its forces and the order of nature. The more it understands its forces or strength, the better it will be able to direct itself and lay down the rules for itself. And the more it understands the order of nature, the more easily it will be able to liberate itself from useless things. This is the whole method. Only knowledge, then, is power and freedom. And the only permanent happiness is the pursuit of knowledge and the joy of understanding. Meanwhile, however, the philosopher must remain a man and a citizen. What shall be his mode of life during his pursuit of truth? Spinoza lays down a simple rule of conduct to which, so far as we know, his actual behavior thoroughly conformed. 1. To speak in a manner comprehensible to the people, and to do for them all things that do not prevent us from attaining our ends. 
to to enjoy only such pleasures as are necessary for the preservation of health. Three, finally, to seek only enough money as is necessary for the maintenance of our life and health and to comply with such customs as are not opposed to what we seek. But in setting out upon such a quest, the honest and clear-headed philosopher comes at once upon the problem. How do I know that my knowledge is knowledge, that my senses can be trusted in the material which they bring to my reason, and that my reason can be trusted with the conclusions which it derives from the material of sensation? Should we not examine the vehicle before abandoning ourselves to its directions? Should we not do all we can to perfect it? Before all things, says Spinoza, Baconianly, a means must be devised for improving and clarifying the intellect. We must distinguish carefully the various forms of knowledge and trust only the best. First, then, there is hearsay knowledge, by which, for example, I know the day of my birth. Second, vague experience, empirical knowledge in the derogatory sense, as when a physician knows a cure not by any scientific formulation of experimental tests, but by a general impression that it has usually worked. Third, immediate deduction or knowledge reached by reasoning, as when I conclude to the immensity of the sun from seeing that in the case of other objects, distance decreases the apparent size. This kind of knowledge is superior to the other two, but is yet precariously subject to sudden refutation by direct experience. So science, for a hundred years, reasoned its way to an ether, which is now in high disfavor with the physicist elite. Hence the highest kind of knowledge is the fourth form, which comes by immediate deduction and direct perception as when we see at once that six is the missing number in the proportion two to four, three to x, or as when we perceive that the whole is greater than the part. Spinoza believes that men versed in mathematics know most of Euclid in this intuitive way, but he admits ruefully that the things which I have been able to know by this knowledge so far have been very few. In the ethics, Spinoza reduces the first two forms of knowledge to one and calls intuitive knowledge a perception of things subspecie eternitatis in their eternal aspects and relations, which gives in a phrase a definition of philosophy, scientia intuitiva, therefore tries to find behind things and events their laws and eternal relations. Hence, Spinoza's very fundamental distinction, the basis of his entire system, between the temporal order, the world, of things and incidents, and the eternal order, the world of laws and structure. Let us study this distinction carefully. It must be noted that I do not understand here by the series of causes and real entities, a series of individual mutable things, but rather the series of fixed and eternal things. For it would be impossible for human weakness to follow up the series of individual mutable things not only because their number surpasses all count, but because of the many circumstances, in one and the same thing, each of which may be the cause of the thing's existence. For indeed, the existence of particular things has no connection with their essence, and is not an eternal truth. However, there is no need that we should understand this series of individual mutable things, for their essence is only to be found in fixed and eternal things and from the laws inscribed in those things as their true codes, according to which all individual things are made and arranged. Nay, these individual and mutable things depend so intimately and essentially on these fixed ones, that without them they can neither exist nor be conceived. Note, page 259, C.F. Bacon, Noum Organum, 2.2. For although nothing exists in nature except individual bodies, exhibiting clear individual effects according to particular laws, yet in each branch of learning those very laws, their investigation, discovery, and development, are the foundation both of theory and of practice. Fundamentally, all philosophers agree. 
If we will keep this passage in mind as we study Spinoza's masterpiece, it will itself be clarified, and much in the ethics that is discouragingly complex will unravel itself into simplicity and understanding. 4. The Ethics The most precious production in modern philosophy is cast into geometrical form, to make the thought Euclideanly clear but the result is a laconic obscurity in which every line requires a Talmud of commentary. The scholastics had formulated their thoughts so, but never so pithily, and they had been helped to clarity by their foreordained conclusions. Descartes had suggested that philosophy could not be exact until it expressed itself in the forms of mathematics, but he had never grappled with his own ideal. Spinoza came to the suggestion with a mind trained in mathematics as the very basis of all rigorous scientific procedure, and impressed with the achievements of Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo. To our more loosely textured minds, the result is an exhausting concentration of both matter and form, and we are tempted to console ourselves by denouncing the philosophic geometry as an artificial chess game of thought, in which axioms, definitions, theorems, and proofs are manipulated like kings and bishops, knights and pawns, a logical solitaire invented to solace Spinoza's loneliness. Order is against the grain of our minds. We prefer to follow the straggling lines of fantasy and to weave our philosophy precariously out of our dreams. But Spinoza had but one compelling desire, to reduce the intolerable chaos of the world to unity and order. He had the northern hunger for truth rather than the southern lust for beauty. The artist in him was purely an architect, building a system of thought to perfect symmetry and form. Again, the modern student will stumble and grumble over the terminology of Spinoza. Writing in Latin, he was compelled to express his essentially modern thought in medieval and scholastic terms. There was no other language of philosophy which would then have been understood. So he uses the term substance, where we should write reality or essence. Perfect, where we should write complete. Ideal, for our object. Objectively, for subjectively. And formally, for objectively. These are hurdles in the race, which will deter the weakling, but will stimulate the strong. In short, Spinoza is not to be read, he is to be studied. You must approach him as you would approach Euclid recognizing that in these brief 200 pages a man has written down his lifetime's thought with stoic sculpture of everything superfluous. Do not think to find its core by running over it rapidly. Never in a work of philosophy was there so little that could be skipped without loss. Every part depends on preceding parts. Some obvious and apparently needless propositions turns out to be the cornerstone of an imposing development of logic. You will not understand any important section thoroughly till you have read and pondered the whole. Though one need not say, with Jacobi's enthusiastic exaggeration, that no one understood Spinoza to whom a single line of the ethics remains obscure. Here, doubtless, says Spinoza in the second part of his book, the reader will become confused and will recollect many things which will bring him to a standstill and therefore I pray him to proceed gently with me and form no judgment concerning these things, until he shall have read all. Read the book, not all at once, but in small portions at many sittings, and having finished it, consider that you have but begun to understand it. Read then some commentary like Pollock's Spinoza, or Martinau's Study of Spinoza, or better, both. Finally, read the ethics again. It will be a new book to you. When you have finished it a second time, you will remain forever a lover of philosophy. 1. Nature and God Page 1 plunges us at once into the maelstrom of metaphysics. Our modern hard-headed, or is it soft-headed, abhorrence of metaphysics captures us, and for a moment we wish we were anywhere except in Spinoza. But then metaphysics, as William James said, is nothing but an attempt to think things out clearly to their ultimate significance, to find their substantial essence in the scheme of reality, or, as Spinoza puts it, their essential substance, and thereby to unify all truth and reach that highest of all generalizations, which, even to the practical Englishman, constitutes philosophy. 
Science itself, which so superciliously scorns metaphysics, assumes a metaphysic in its every thought. It happens that the metaphysic which it assumes is the metaphysic of Spinoza. There are three pivotal terms in Spinoza's system, substance, attribute, and mode. Attribute we put aside temporarily for simplicity's sake. The mode is any individual thing or event, any particular form or shape, which reality transiently assumes. You, your body, your thoughts, your group, your species, your planet, are modes. All these are forms, modes, almost literally fashions of some eternal and invariable reality lying behind and beneath them. What is this underlying reality? Spinoza calls it substance, as literally that which stands beneath. Eight generations have fought voluminous battles over the meaning of this term. We must not be discouraged if we fail to resolve the matter in a paragraph. One error we should guard against. Substance does not mean the constituent material of anything, as when we speak of wood as the substance of a chair. We approach Spinoza's use of the word when we speak of the substance of his remarks. If we go back to the scholastic philosophers from whom Spinoza took the term, we find that they used it as a translation of the Greek usia, which is the present participle of ainai, to be, and indicates the inner being or essence. Substance, then, is that which is, Spinoza had not forgotten the impressive I am who am of Genesis, that which eternally and unchangeably is and of which everything else must be a transient form or mode If we now compare this division of the world into substance and modes with its division in the improvement of the intellect into the eternal order of laws and invariable relations on the one hand and the temporal order of time-begotten and death-destined things on the other, we are impelled to the conclusion that Spinoza means by substance here very nearly what he meant by the eternal order there. Let us provisionally take it as one element in the term substance, then, that it betokens the very structure of existence, underlying all events and things and constituting the essence of the world. But further, Spinoza identifies substance with nature and God. After the manner of the scholastics, he conceives nature under a double aspect, as active and vital process, which Spinoza calls natura naturans, nature begetting the élan vital and creative evolution of Bergson. And as the passive product of this process, natura naturata, nature begotten, the material and contents of nature, its woods and winds and waters, its hills and fields and myriad external forms. It is in the latter sense that he denies, and in the former sense that he affirms, the identity of nature and substance and God substance and modes, the eternal order and the temporal order, active nature and passive nature, God and the world. All these are for Spinoza coincident and synonymous dichotomies. Each divides the universe into essence and incident. That substance is insubstantial, that it is form and not matter. That it has nothing to do with that mongrel and neuter composite of matter and thought which some interpreters have supposed it to be stands out clearly enough from this identification of substance with creative but not with passive or material nature. A passage from Spinoza's correspondence may help us. I take a totally different view of God and nature from that which the later Christians usually entertain, for I hold that God is the imminent and not the extraneous cause of all things. I say all is in God, all lives and moves in God. And this I maintain with the Apostle Paul, and perhaps with every one of the philosophers of antiquity, although, in a way other than theirs, I might even venture to say that my view is the same as that entertained by the Hebrews of old, if so much may be inferred from certain traditions, greatly altered or falsified though they may be. It is, however, a complete mistake on the part of those who say that my purpose— is to show that God and nature, under which last term they understand a certain mass of corporeal matter, are one and the same. I had no such intention. Again, in the Treatise on Religion and the State, he writes, By the help of God I mean the fixed and unchangeable order of nature, or the chain of natural events. 
The universal laws of nature and the eternal decrees of God are one and the same thing. From the infinite nature of God all things follow by the same necessity, and in the same way as it follows from the nature of a triangle, from eternity to eternity, that its three angles are equal to two right angles. What the laws of the circle are to all circles, God is to the world. Like substance, God is the causal chain or process, the underlying condition of all things, the law and structure of the world. This concrete universe of modes and things is to God as a bridge is to its design, its structure, and the laws of mathematics and mechanics according to which it is built. These are the sustaining basis, the underlying condition, the substance of the bridge. Without them it would fall. And like the bridge, the world itself is sustained by its structure and its laws. It is upheld in the hand of God. The will of God and the laws of nature being one and the same reality diversely phrased, it follows that all events are the mechanical operation of invariable laws and not the whim of an irresponsible autocrat seated in the stars. The mechanism which Descartes saw in matter and body alone, Spinoza sees in God and mind as well. It is a world of determinism not of design. Because we act for conscious ends, we suppose that all processes have such ends in view. And because we are human, we suppose that all events lead up to man and are designed to subserve his needs. But this is an anthropocentric delusion. Like so much of our thinking, the root of the greatest errors in philosophy lies in projecting our human purposes, criteria, and preferences into the objective universe. Hence our problem of evil we strive to reconcile the ills of life with the goodness of god forgetting the lesson taught to job that god is beyond our little good and evil good and bad are relative to human and often individual tastes and ends and have no validity for a universe in which individuals are ephemera and in which the moving finger writes even the history of the race in water Whenever, then, anything in nature seems to us ridiculous, absurd, or evil, it is because we have but a partial knowledge of things, and are in the main ignorant of the order and coherence of nature as a whole, and because we want everything to be arranged according to the dictates of our own reason. Although, in fact, what our reason pronounces bad is not bad as regards the order and laws of universal nature, but only as regards the laws of our own nature, taken separately. As for the terms good and bad, they indicate nothing positive considered in themselves. For one and the same thing can at the same time be good, bad, and indifferent. For example, music is good to the melancholy, bad to the mourners, and indifferent to the dead. Bad and good are prejudices which the eternal reality cannot recognize. It is right that the world should illustrate the full nature of the infinite and not merely the particular ideals of man. And as with good and bad, so with the ugly and the beautiful. These two are subjective and personal terms which, flung at the universe, will be returned to the sender unhonored. I would warn you that I do not attribute to nature either beauty or deformity, order or confusion. Only in relation to our imagination can things be called beautiful or ugly, well-ordered or confused. For example, if motion which the nerves receive by means of the eyes from objects before us is conducive of health, those objects are called beautiful. If it is not, those objects are called ugly. In such passages, Spinoza passes beyond Plato who thought that his aesthetic judgments must be the laws of creation and the eternal decrees of God. Is God a person? Not in any human sense of this word. Spinoza notices, The popular belief which still pictures God as of the male, not of the female sex. And he is gallant enough to reject a conception which mirrored the earthly subordination of woman to man. To a correspondent who objected to his impersonal conception of deity, Spinoza writes in terms reminiscent of the old Greek skeptic Xenophanes, When you say that if I allow not in God the operations of seeing, hearing, observing, willing, and the like, you know not what sort of God mine is. I thence conjecture that you believe there is no greater perfection than such as can be explained by the attributes aforesaid. 
I do not wonder at it, for I believe that a triangle, if it could speak, would in like manner say that God is eminently triangular, and a circle that is the divine nature is eminently circular, and thus would everyone ascribe his own attributes to God. Finally, neither intellect nor will pertains to the nature of God. In the usual sense in which these human qualities are attributed to the deity, Rather, the will of God is the sum of all causes and all laws, and the intellect of God is the sum of all mind. The mind of God, as Spinoza conceives it, is all the mentality that is scattered over space and time, the diffused consciousness that animates the world. All things, in however diverse degree, are animated. Life or mind is one phase or aspect of everything that we know, as material extension or body is another. These are two phases or attributes, as Spinoza calls them, through which we perceive the operation of substance or God. In this sense, God, the universal process and eternal reality behind the flux of things, may be said to have both a mind and a body. Neither mind nor matter is God, but the mental processes and the molecular processes which constitute the double history of the world. These and their causes and their laws are God. 2. Matter and Mind But what is mind and what is matter? Is the mind material, as some unimaginative people suppose, or is the body merely an idea? as some imaginative people suppose. Is the mental process the cause or the effect or the cerebral process? Or are they, as Malebranche taught, unrelated and independent and only providentially parallel? Neither is mind material, answers Spinoza, nor is matter mental. Neither is the brain process the cause, nor is it the effect of thought. Nor are the two processes independent and parallel. For there are not two processes, and there are not two entities. There is but one process, seen now inwardly as thought, and now outwardly as motion. There is but one entity, seen now inwardly as mind, now outwardly as matter. But in reality, an inextricable mixture and unity of both. Mind and body do not act upon each other, because they are not other. They are one. The body cannot determine the mind to think, nor the mind to determine the body to remain in motion or at rest or in any other state. For the simple reason that the decision of the mind and the desire and determination of the body are one and the same thing. And all the world is unifiedly double in this way. Wherever there is an external material process, it is but one side or aspect of the real process which, to a fuller view, would be seen to include as well an internal process correlative, in however different a degree with the mental process which we see within ourselves. The inward and mental process corresponds at every stage with the external and material process. The order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things. Thinking substance and extended substance are one and the same thing comprehended now through this, now through that, attribute, or aspect. Certain of the Jews seem to have perceived this, though confusedly, for they said that God and his intellect and the things conceived by his intellect were one and the same thing. If mind be taken in a large sense to correspond with the nervous system and all its ramifications, then every change in the body will be accompanied by, or better, form a whole with a correlative change in the mind. Just as thoughts and mental processes are connected and arranged in the mind, so in the body its modifications and the modifications of things affecting the body through sensations are arranged according to their order and nothing can happen to the body which is not perceived by the mind and consciously or unconsciously felt. Just as the emotion as felt is part of a whole, of which changes in the circulatory and respiratory and digestive systems are the basis, so an idea is a part, along with bodily changes of one complex organic process, 
Even the infinitesimal subtleties of mathematical reflection have their correlate in the body. Have not the behaviorists proposed to detect a man's thoughts by recording those involuntary vibrations of the vocal cords that seem to accompany all thinking? After so trying to melt away the distinction between body and mind, Spinoza goes on to reduce to a question of degree the difference between intellect and will. There are no faculties in the mind, no separate entities called intellect or will, much less imagination or memory. The mind is not an agency that deals with ideas, but it is the ideas themselves in their process and concatenation. Intellect is merely an abstract and shorthand term for a series of ideas, and will an abstract term for a series of actions or volitions. The intellect and the will are related to this or that idea or volition as rockiness to this or that rock. Finally, will and intellect are one and the same thing. For a volition is merely an idea which, by richness of associations, or perhaps through the absence of competitive ideas, has remained long enough in consciousness to pass over into action. Every idea becomes an action unless stopped in the transition by a different idea. The idea is itself the first stage of a unified organic process of which external action is the completion. What is often called will, as the impulsive force which determines the duration of an idea in consciousness, should be called desire, which is the very essence of man. Desire is an appetite or instinct of which we are conscious, but instincts need not always operate through conscious desire. Behind the instincts is the vague and varied effort for self-preservation. Spinoza sees this in all human and even infrahuman activity. Just as Schopenhauer and Nietzsche were to see the will to live or the will to power everywhere. Note, Spinoza is alive to the power of the unconscious as seen in somnambulism. To, to note, and notes the phenomena of double personality. 439 note. Philosophers seldom disagree. Everything, insofar as it is in itself, endeavors to persist in its own being, and the endeavor wherewith a thing seeks to persist in its own being is nothing else than the actual essence of that thing. The power whereby a thing persists is the core and essence of its being. Every instinct is a device developed by nature to preserve the individual, or, as our solitary bachelor fails to add, the species or the group. Pleasure and pain are the satisfaction or the hindrance of an instinct. They are not the causes of our desires, but their results. We do not desire things because they give us pleasure, but they give us pleasure because we desire them, and we desire them because we must. There is consequently no free will. The necessities of survival determine instinct, instinct determines desire, and desire determines thought and actions. The decisions of the mind are nothing save desires, which vary according to various dispositions. There is in the mind no absolute or free will, but the mind is determined in willing this or that by a cause which is determined in its turn by another cause, and this by another, and so on to infinity. Men think themselves free because they are conscious of their volitions and desires, but are ignorant of the causes by which they are led to wish and desire. Spinoza compares the feeling of free will to a stone's thinking as it travels through space that it determines its own trajectory and selects the place and time of its fall. Since human actions obey laws as fixed as those of geometry, psychology should be studied in geometrical form and with mathematical objectivity. I will write about human beings as though I were concerned with lines and planes and solids. I have labored carefully not to mock, lament, or execrate, but to understand human actions and to this end I have looked upon passions, not as vices of human nature, but as properties just as pertinent to it as are heat, cold, storm, thunder, and the like to the nature of the atmosphere. It is this impartiality of approach that gives to Spinoza's study of human nature such superiority that Freud called it. The most complete by far which has ever been made by any moral philosopher. Taine knew no better way of praising Bell's 
analysis than to compare it with Spinoza's, while Johannes Mueller, coming to the subject of the instincts and emotions, wrote, With regard to the relations of the passions to one another, apart from their physiological conditions, it is impossible to give any better account than that which Spinoza has laid down with unsurpassed mastery. And the famous physiologist, with the modesty which usually accompanies real greatness, went on to quote in extenso the third book of the Ethics. It is through that analysis of human conduct that Spinoza approaches at last the problems which give the title to his masterpiece. 3. Intelligence and Morals Ultimately, there are but three systems of ethics, three conceptions of the ideal character and the moral life. One is that of Buddha and Jesus which stresses the feminine virtues, considers all men to be equally precious, resists evil only by returning good, identifies virtue with love, and inclines in politics to unlimited democracy. Another is the ethic of Machiavelli and Nietzsche, which stresses the masculine virtues, accepts the inequality of men, relishes the risks of combat and conquest and rule, identifies virtue with power, and exalts and the hereditary aristocracy. A third, the ethic of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, denies the universal applicability of either the feminine or the masculine virtues, considers that only the informed and mature mind can judge, according to diverse circumstance, when love should rule and when power, identifies virtue, therefore, with intelligence and advocates a varying mixture of aristocracy and democracy in government. It is the distinction of Spinoza that his ethic unconsciously reconciles these apparently hostile philosophies, weaves them into a harmonious unity and gives us, in consequence, a system of morals, which is the supreme achievement of modern thought. He begins by making happiness the goal of conduct, and he defines happiness very simply as the presence of pleasure and the absence of pain. But pleasure and pain are relative, not absolute and they are not states, but transitions. Pleasure is man's transition from a lesser state of perfection, i.e. completeness or fulfillment, to a greater. Joy consists in this, that one's power is increased. Pain is man's transition from a greater state of perfection to a lesser. I say transition, for pleasure is not perfection itself, if a man were born with the perfection to which he passes, he would be without the emotion of pleasure. And the contrary of this makes it still more apparent. Note, C.F. Nietzsche, what is happiness? The feeling that power increases, that resistance is overcome. Antichrist, section 2. All passions are passages, all emotions are motions, towards or from completeness and power. By emotion, affect us, I understand the modifications of the body by which the power of action in the body is increased or diminished, aided or restrained, and at the same time the ideas of these modifications. This theory of emotion is usually credited to James and Lang. It is here formulated more precisely than by either of these psychologists, and accords remarkably with the findings of Professor Cannon. A passion or an emotion is bad or good not in itself, but only as it decreases or enhances our power. By virtue and power, I mean the same thing. A virtue is a power of acting, a form of ability. The more a man can preserve his being and seek what is useful to him, the greater is his virtue. Spinoza does not ask a man to sacrifice himself to another's good. He is more lenient than nature. He thinks that egoism is a necessary corollary of the supreme instinct of self-preservation. No one ever neglects anything which he judges to be good except with the hope of gaining a greater good. This seems to Spinoza perfectly reasonable. Since reason demands nothing against nature... It concedes that each man must love himself and seek what is useful to him and desire whatever leads him truly to a greater state of perfection, and that each man should endeavor to preserve his being so far as in him lies. So he builds his ethic not on altruism and the natural goodness of man like utopian reformers, 
nor on selfishness and the natural wickedness of man like cynical conservatives, but on what he considers to be an inevitable and justifiable egoism, a system of morals that teaches a man to be weak is worthless. The foundation of virtue is no other than the effort to maintain one's being, and man's happiness consists in the power of so doing. Like Nietzsche, Spinoza has not much use for humility. It is either the hypocrisy of a schemer or the timidity of a slave. It implies the absence of power, whereas to Spinoza, all virtues are forms of ability and power. So is remorse a defect rather than a virtue? He who repents is twice unhappy and doubly weak. But he does not spend so much time as Nietzsche in inveighing against humility, for humility is very rare. And as Cicero said, even the philosophers who write books in its praise take care to put their names on the title page. One who despises himself is the nearest to a proud man, says Spinoza putting in a sentence a pet theory of the psychoanalysts that every conscious virtue is an effort to conceal or correct a secret vice. And whereas Spinoza dislikes humility, he admires modesty and objects to a pride that is not tenoned and mortized in deeds. Conceit makes man a nuisance to one another. The conceited man relates only his own great deeds and only the evil ones of others. He delights in the presence of his inferiors, who will gape at his perfections and exploits, and becomes at last the victim of those who praise him most. For none are more taken in by flattery than the proud. So far, our gentle philosopher offers us a rather Spartan ethic, but he strikes in other passages a softer tone. He marvels at the amount of envy, recrimination, mutual belittlement, and even hatred which agitates and separates men, and sees no remedy for our social ills except in the elimination of these and similar emotions. He believes it is a simple matter to show that hatred, perhaps because it trembles on the verge of love, can be more easily overcome by love than by reciprocated hate. For hatred is fed on the feeling that it is returned, whereas... He who believes himself to be loved by one whom he hates is a prey to the conflicting emotions of hatred and love, since, as Spinoza perhaps too optimistically believes, love tends to beget love, so that his hatred disintegrates and loses force. To hate is to acknowledge our inferiority and our fear. We do not hate a foe whom we are confident we can overcome. He who wishes to revenge injuries by reciprocal hatred will live in misery, but he who endeavors to drive away hatred by means of love fights with the pleasure and confidence. He resists equally one or many men, and scarcely needs at all the help of fortune. Those whom he conquers yield joyfully. Minds are conquered not by arms, but by greatness of soul. In such passages, Spinoza sees something of the light which shone on the hills of Galilee. But the essence of his ethic is rather Greek than Christian. The endeavor to understand is the first and only basis of virtue. Nothing could be more simply and thoroughly Socratic. For we are tossed about by external causes in many ways, and like waves driven by contrary winds, we waver and are unconscious of the issue and our fate. We think we are most ourselves when we are most passionate, whereas it is then we are most passive, caught in some ancestral torrent of impulse or feeling, and swept on to a precipitate reaction which meets only part of the situation, because without thought only part of the situation can be perceived. A passion is an inadequate idea. A thought is response delayed till every vital angle of a problem has aroused a correlative reaction inherited or acquired, only so is the idea adequate, the response all that it can be. Note, to phrase it in later terms, reflex action is a local response to a local stimulus. Instinctive action is a partial response to part of a situation. Reason is total response to the whole situation. The instincts are magnificent as a driving force, but dangerous as guides. 
For by what we may call the individualism of the instincts, each of them seeks its own fulfillment, regardless of the good of the whole personality. What havoc has come to men, for example, from uncontrolled greed, pugnacity, or lust, till such men have become but the appendages of the instinct that has mastered them. The emotions by which we are daily assailed have reference rather to some part of the body which is affected beyond the others, and so the emotions as a rule are in excess, and detain the mind in the contemplation of one object so that it cannot think of others. But desire that arises from pleasure or pain which has reference to one or certain parts of the body has no advantage to man as a whole. To be ourselves, we must complete ourselves. All this is, of course, the old philosophic distinction between reason and passion. But Spinoza adds vitally to Socrates and the Stoics. He knows that as passion without reason is blind, reason without passion is dead. An emotion can neither be hindered nor removed except by a contrary and stronger emotion. Instead of uselessly opposing reason to passion, a contest in which the more deeply rooted and ancestral element usually wins, he opposes reasonless passions to passions coordinated by reasons, put into place by the total perspective of the situation. Thought should not lack the heat of desire nor desire the light of thought. A passion ceases to be a passion as soon as we form a clear and distinct idea of it and the mind is subject to passions in proportion to the number of adequate ideas which it has. All appetites are passions only so far as they arise from inadequate ideas. They are virtues, when generated by adequate ideas. Note Notice the resemblance between the last two quotations and the psychoanalytic doctrine that desires are complexes, only so long as we are not aware of the precise causes of these desires, and that the first element in treatment is therefore an attempt to bring the desire and its causes to consciousness, to form adequate ideas of it and them. All intelligent behavior, i.e., all reaction which meets the total situation, is virtuous action, and in the end there is no virtue but intelligence. Spinoza's ethics flow from his metaphysics. Just as reason there lay in the perception of law in the chaotic flux of things, so here it lies in the establishment of law in the chaotic flux of desires. There it lay in seeing, here it lies in acting. Subspecie eternitatis, under the form of eternity, and making perception and action fit the eternal perspective of the whole. Thought helps us to this larger view because it is aided by imagination, which presents to consciousness those distant effects of present actions, which could have no play upon reaction if reaction were thoughtlessly immediate. The great obstacle to intelligent behavior is the superior vividness of present sensations as compared with those projected memories, which we call imagination. In so far as the mind conceives a thing according to the dictates of reason, it will be equally affected whether the idea be of anything present, past, or future. By imagination and reason we turn experience into foresight. We become the creators of our future and cease to be the slaves of our past. So we achieve the only freedom possible to man. The passivity of passion is human bondage. The action of reason is human liberty. Freedom is not from causal law or process, but from partial passion or impulse and freedom not from passion, but from uncoordinated and uncompleted passion. We are free only where we know. Note, C.F. Professor Dewey, a physician or engineer is free in his thought and his action, in the degree in which he knows what he deals with. Possibly we find here the key to any freedom. Human Nature and Conduct, New York, 1922, page 303. To be a superman is to be free not from the restraints of social justice and amenity, but from the individualism of the instincts. With this completeness and integrity comes the equanimity of the wise man, not the aristocratic self-complacency of Aristotle's hero, much less the supercilious superiority of Nietzsche's ideal, but a more camaraderie poise and peace of mind. Men who are good by reason i.e. men who, under the guidance of reason, seek what is useful to them, 
desire nothing for themselves which they do not also desire for the rest of mankind. To be great is not to be placed above humanity ruling others, but to stand above the partialities and futilities of uninformed desire and to rule one's self. This is a nobler freedom than that which men call free will. For the will is not free, and perhaps there is no will. And let no one suppose that because he is no longer free, he is no longer morally responsible for his behavior and the structure of his life. Precisely because men's actions are determined by their memories, society must for its protection form its citizens through their hopes and fears into some measure of social order and cooperation. Note 418 E. F. Whitman By God, I will not have anything that all cannot have their counterpart of on the same terms. All education presupposes determinism and pours into the open mind of youth a store of prohibitions which are expected to participate in determining conduct. The evil which ensues from evil deeds is not therefore less to be feared because it comes of necessity. Whether our actions are free or not, our motives still are hope and fear. Therefore the assertion is false that I would leave no room for precepts and commands. On the contrary, determinism makes for a better moral life. It teaches us not to despise or ridicule anyone, or be angry with anyone. Men are not guilty, and though we punish miscreants, it will be without hate. We forgive them because they know not what they do. Above all, determinism fortifies us to expect and to bear both faces of fortune with an equal mind. We remember that all things follow by the eternal decrees of God. Perhaps even it will teach us the intellectual love of God, whereby we shall accept the laws of nature gladly and find our fulfillment within her limitations. He who sees all things as determined cannot complain, though he may resist, for he perceives things under a certain species of eternity, and he understands that his mischances are not chances in the total scheme that they find some justification in the eternal sequence and structure of the world. So minded, he rises from the fitful pleasures of passion to the high serenity of contemplation, which sees all things as parts of an eternal order and development. He learns to smile in the face of the inevitable. And, whether he comes into his own now, or in a thousand years, he sits content. He learns the old lesson that God is no capricious personality absorbed in the private affairs of his devotees, but the invariable sustaining order of the universe. Plato words the same conception beautifully in the Republic. He whose mind is fixed upon true being has no time to look down upon the little affairs of men, or to be filled with jealousy and enmity in the struggle against them. His eye is ever directed towards fixed and immutable principles which he sees neither injuring nor injured by one another, but all in order moving and according to reason. These he imitates, and to these he would, as far as he can, conform himself. That which is necessary, says Nietzsche, does not offend me, amor fati. Love of fate is the core of my nature. Note, Asi Homo, page 130. It was rather Nietzsche's hope than his attainment. Or Keats. To bear all naked truths and to envisage circumstance all calm, that is the top of sovereignty. Such a philosophy teaches us to say yea to life and even to death. A free man thinks of nothing less than of death and his wisdom is a meditation not on death, but on life. It calms our fretted egos with its large perspective. It reconciles us to the limitations within which our purposes must be circumscribed. It may lead to resignation and to an orientally supine passivity, but it is also the indispensable basis of all wisdom and all strength. 4. Religion and Immortality After all, as we perceive, Spinoza's philosophy was an attempt to love even a world in which he was outcast and alone. Again, like Job, he typified his people, 
and asked how it could be that even the just man, like the chosen people, should suffer persecution and exile and every desolation. For a time the conception of the world as a process of impersonal and invariable law soothed and sufficed him. But in the end, his essentially religious spirit turned this mute process into something almost lovable. He tried to merge his own desires with the universal order of things to become an almost indistinguishable part of nature. The greatest good is the knowledge of the union which the mind has with the whole nature. Indeed, our individual separateness is, in a sense, illusory. We are parts of the great stream of law and cause, parts of God. We are the flitting forms of a being greater than ourselves and endless while we die. Our bodies are cells in the body of our race. Our race is an incident in the drama of life. Our minds are the fitful flashes of an eternal light. Our mind, in so far as it understands, is an eternal mode of thinking, which is determined by another mode of thinking, and this one again by another, and so on, to infinity, so that they all constitute at the same time the eternal and infinite intellect of God. In this pantheistic merging of the individual with the all, the Orient speaks again. We hear the echo of Omar, who... Never called the one two. End of the old Hindu poem. Know in thyself and all one self-same soul. Banish the dream that sunders part from whole. Sometimes, said Thoreau, as I drift idly on Walden Pond, I cease to live and begin to be. As such, parts of such a whole we are immortal. The human mind cannot be absolutely destroyed with the human body, but there is some part of it which remains eternal. This is the part that conceives things subspecies eternitatis. The more we so conceive things, the more eternal our thought is. Spinoza is even more than usually obscure here, and after endless controversy among interpreters, his language yet speaks differently to different minds. Sometimes one imagines him to mean George Eliot's immortality by repute whereby that which is most rational and beautiful in our thought and our lives survives us to have an almost timeless efficacy down the years. Sometimes again Spinoza seems to have in mind a personal and individual immortality, and it may be that as death loomed up so prematurely in his path, he yearned to console himself with this hope that springs eternally in the human breast. Yet he insistently differentiates eternity from everlastingness, if we pay attention to the common opinion of men, we shall see that they are conscious of the eternity of their minds, but they confuse eternity with duration and attribute it to the imagination or memory, which they believe will remain after death. But like Aristotle, Spinoza, though talking of immortality, denies the survival of personal memory. The mind can neither imagine nor recollect anything save while in the body nor does he believe in heavenly rewards. Those are far astray from a true estimate of virtue who expect for their virtue, as if it were the greatest slavery, that God will adorn them with the greatest rewards, as if virtue and the serving of God were not happiness itself and the greatest liberty. Blessedness, reads the last proposition of Spinoza's book, is not the reward of virtue, but virtue itself. And perhaps in the like manner, immortality is not the reward of clear thinking. It is clear thought itself, as it carries up the past into the present and reaches out into the future, so overcoming the limits and narrowness of time, and catching the perspective that remains eternally behind the kaleidoscope of change. Such thought is immortal because every truth is a permanent creation, part of the eternal acquisition of man influencing him endlessly. With this solemn and hopeful note, the ethics ends. Seldom has one book enclosed so much thought and fathered so much commentary while yet remaining so bloody a battleground for hostile interpretations. Its metaphysic may be faulty, its psychology imperfect, its theology unsatisfactory and obscure, but of the soul of the book, its spirit and essence, no man who has read it will speak otherwise than reverently. In the concluding paragraph, that essential spirit shines forth in simple eloquence. 
Thus I have completed all I wish to show concerning the power of the mind over emotions, or the freedom of the mind, from which it is clear how much a wise man is in front of, and how stronger he is than an ignorant one, who is guided by lust alone. For an ignorant man, besides being agitated in many ways by external causes, never enjoys one true satisfaction of the mind. He lives, moreover, almost unconscious of himself, God, and things, and as soon as he ceases to be passive, ceases to be. On the contrary, the wise man, insofar as he is considered as such, is scarcely moved in spirit. He is conscious of himself, of God, and things by a certain eternal necessity. He never ceases to be, and always enjoys satisfaction of mind. If the road I have shown to lead to this is very difficult, it can yet be discovered. And clearly it must be very hard when it is so seldom found. For how can it be that it is neglected practically by all, if salvation were close at hand and could be found without difficulty? But all excellent things are as difficult as they are rare. 5. The Political Treatise There remains for our analysis that tragic torso, the Tractatus Politicus. The work of Spinoza's maturest years stopped suddenly short by his early death. It is a brief thing, and yet full of thought, so that one feels again how much was lost when this gentle life was closed at the very moment that it was ripening to its fullest powers. In the same generation which saw Hobbes exalting absolute monarchy and denouncing the uprising of the English people against their king, almost as vigorously as Milton was defending it, Spinoza, friend of the Republican DeWitts, formulated a political philosophy which expressed the liberal and democratic hopes of his day in Holland, and became one of the main sources of that stream of thought which culminated in Rousseau and the Revolution. All political philosophy, Spinoza thinks, must grow out of a distinction between the natural and the moral order. That is, between existence before and existence after the formation of organized societies. Spinoza supposes that men once lived in comparative isolation, without law or social organization. There were then, he says, no conceptions of right and wrong. Justice or injustice, might and right, were one. Nothing can exist in a natural state which can be called good or bad by common assent, since every man who is in a natural state consults only his own advantage and determines what is good or bad according to his own fancy and insofar as he has regard for his own advantage alone and holds himself responsible to no one save himself by any law. And therefore sin cannot be conceived in a natural state, but only in a civil state, where it is decreed by common consent what is good or bad, and each one holds himself responsible to the state. The law and ordinance of nature under which all men are born, and for the most part live, forbids nothing but what no one wishes or is able to do, and is not opposed to strife, hatred, anger, treachery, or, in general, anything that appetite suggests. We get an inkling of this law of nature, or this lawlessness of nature, by observing the behavior of states. There is no altruism among nations. For there can be law and morality only where there is an accepted organization, a common and recognized authority. The rights of states are now what the rights of individuals used to be, and still often are. That is, their might, and the leading states, by some forgetful honesty of diplomats, are very properly called the great powers. So it is too among species. There being no common organization, there is not among them any morality or law. Each species does to the other what it wishes and can. But among men, as mutual needs begets mutual aid, this natural order of powers passes into a moral order of rights. Since fear of solitude exists in all men, because no one in solitude is strong enough to defend himself and procure the necessaries of life, it follows that men by nature tend towards social organization. To guard against danger, the force or strength of one man would hardly suffice if men did not arrange mutual aid and exchange. 
Men are not by nature, however, equipped for the mutual forbearance of social order. But danger begets association, which gradually nourishes and strengthens the social instincts. Men are not born for citizenship, but must be made fit for it. Most men are at heart individualistic rebels against law or custom. The social instincts are later and weaker than the individualistic and need reinforcement. Man is not good by nature, as Rousseau was so disastrously to suppose. But through association, if even merely in the family, sympathy comes, a feeling of kind, and at last of kindness. We like what is like us. We pity not only a thing we have loved, but also one which we judge similar to ourselves. Out of this comes an imitation of emotions. And finally, some degree of conscience. Conscience, however, is not innate, but acquired and varies with geography. It is the deposit in the mind of the growing individual, of the moral traditions of the group. Through it, society creates for itself an ally in the heart of its enemy, the naturally individualistic soul. Gradually, in this development, it comes out that the law of individual power, which obtains in a state of nature, yields in organized society to the legal and moral power of the whole. Might still remains right, but the might of the whole limits the might of the individual, limits it theoretically to his rights, to such exercise of his powers as agrees with the equal freedom of others. Part of the individual's natural might or sovereignty is handed over to the organized community in return for the enlargement of the sphere of his remaining powers. We abandon, for example, the right to fly from anger to violence and are freed from the danger of such violence from others. Law is necessary because men are subject to passions. If all men were reasonable, law would be superfluous. The perfect law would bear to individuals the same relation which perfect reason bears to passions. It would be the coordination of conflicting forces to avoid the ruin and increase the power of the whole. Just as in metaphysics, reason is the perception of order in things, and in ethics the establishment of order among desires. So in politics it is the establishment of order among men. The perfect state would limit the powers of its citizens only as far as these powers were mutually destructive. It would withdraw no liberty except to add a greater one. The last end of the state is not to dominate men, nor to restrain them by fear. Rather, it is so to free each man from fear that he may live and act with full security and without injury to himself or his neighbor. The end of the state, I repeat, is not to make rational beings into brute beasts and machines. It is to enable their bodies and their minds to function safely. It is to lead men to live by and to exercise a free reason, that they may not waste their strength in hatred, anger, and guile, nor act unfairly toward one another. Thus the end of the state is really liberty. Freedom is the goal of the state because the function of the state is to promote growth, and growth depends on capacity finding freedom. But what if laws stifle growth and freedom? What shall a man do if the state, seeking, like every organism or organization, to preserve its own existence, which ordinarily means that office holders seek to keep themselves in office, becomes a mechanism of domineering and exploitation? Obey even the unjust law, answers Spinoza. If reasonable protest and discussion are allowed and speech is left free to secure a peaceful change. I confess that from such freedom inconveniences may sometimes arise, but what question was ever settled so wisely that no abuses could spring therefrom? Laws against free speech are subversive of all law, for men will not long respect laws which they may not criticize. The more a government strives to curtail freedom of speech, the more obstinately is it resisted, not indeed by the avaricious, but by those whom good education, sound morality, and virtue have rendered more free. Men in general are so constituted that there is nothing they will endure with so little patience, as that views which they believe to be true should be counted crimes against the laws. Under such circumstances, they do not think it disgraceful but most honorable to hold the laws in abhorrence, 
and to refrain from no action against the government. Laws which can be broken without any wrong to one's neighbor are counted but a laughing stock, and so far from such laws restraining the appetites and lusts of mankind, they rather heighten them. Niti mor in weititum semper cupimus quenegata. Note, TP, chapter 10. We always resist prohibitions and yearn for what is denied us. And Spinoza concludes like a good American constitutionalist. If actions only could be made the ground of criminal prosecutions, and words were always allowed to pass free, sedition would be divested of every semblance of justification. The less control the state has over the mind, the better for both the citizen and the state. Spinoza, while reorganizing the necessity of the state, distrusts it, knowing that power corrupts even the incorruptible. Was this not the name of Robespierre? And he does not look with equanimity upon the extension of its authority from the bodies and actions to the souls and thoughts of men. That would be the end of the growth and the death of the group. So he disapproves of state control of education, especially in the universities. Academies that are founded at the public expense are instituted not so much to cultivate men's natural abilities as to restrain them. But in a free commonwealth, arts and sciences will be better cultivated to the full if everyone that asks leave is allowed to teach publicly at his own cost and risk. How to find a middle way between universities controlled by the state and universities controlled by private wealth is a problem which Spinoza does not solve. Private wealth had not, in his day, grown to such proportions as to suggest the difficulty. His ideal, apparently, was higher education, such as once flourished in Greece, coming not from institutions but from free individuals, sophists, who traveled from city to city and taught independently of either public or private control. These things premised, it makes no great difference what is the form of government and Spinoza expressed only a mild preference for democracy. Any of the traditional political forms can be framed so that every man may prefer public right to private advantage. This is the task of the lawgiver. Monarchy is efficient, but oppressive and militaristic. Experience is thought to teach that it makes for peace and concord to confer the whole authority on one man. For no dominion has stood so long without any notable change as that of the Turks. And on the other hand, there were none so little lasting as those which were popular or democratic, nor any in which so many seditions arose. Yet if slavery, barbarism, and desolation are to be called peace, men can have no worse misfortune. No doubt there are usually more and sharper quarrels between parents and children than between masters and slaves. Yet it advances not the art of household management to change a father's right into a right of property and count children but as slaves. Slavery then, and not peace, is furthered by handing over the whole authority to one man. To which he adds a word on secret diplomacy. It has been the one song of those who thirst after absolute power that the interest of the state requires that its affairs should be conducted in secret. But the more such arguments disguise themselves under the mask of public welfare, the more oppressive is the slavery to which they will lead. Better that right counsels be known to enemies than the evil secrets of tyrants should be concealed from the citizens. They who can treat secretly of the affairs of a nation have it absolutely under their authority. And as they plot against the enemy in time of war, so do they against the citizens in time of peace. Democracy is the most reasonable form of government, for in it, everyone submits to the control of authority over his actions, but not over his judgment and reason, i.e., seeing that all cannot think alike, the voice of the majority has the force of law. The military basis of this democracy should be universal military service, the citizens retaining their arms during peace. Its fiscal basis should be the single tax. Note, the fields and the whole soil, and, if it can be managed, the houses, should be public property. Let at a yearly rental to the citizen, and with this exception, let them all be free from every kind of taxation in time of peace. 
TPCH6. The defect of democracy is its tendency to put mediocrity into power, and there is no way of avoiding this except by limiting office to men of trained skill. Numbers by themselves cannot produce wisdom and may give the best favors of office to the grossest flatterers. The fickle disposition of the multitude almost reduces those who have experience of it to despair, for it is governed solely by emotions and not by reason. Thus, democratic government becomes a procession of brief-lived demagogues, and men of worth are loath to enter lists where they must be judged and rated by their inferiors. Sooner or later, the more capable men rebel against such a system, though they be in a minority. Hence, I think it is that democracies change into aristocracies, and these at length into monarchies. People at last prefer tyranny to chaos. Equality of power is an unstable condition. Men are by nature unequal. And he who seeks equality between unequal seeks an absurdity. Democracy has still to solve the problem of enlisting the best energies of men while giving to all alike the choice of those among the trained and fit by whom they wish to be ruled. Who knows what light the genius of Spinoza might have cast upon this pivotal problem of modern politics had he been spared to complete his work. But even that which we have of this treatise was but the first and imperfect draft of his thought. While writing the chapter on democracy, he died. 6. The Influence of Spinoza Spinoza did not seek to found a sect, and he founded none. Yet all philosophy after him is permeated with his thought. During the generation that followed his death, his name was held in abhorrence. Even Hume spoke of his hideous hypothesis. People talked of Spinoza, said Lessing, as if he were a dead dog. It was Lessing who restored him to repute. The great critics surprised Jacobi in their famous conversation in 1784 by saying that he had been a Spinozist throughout his mature life and affirming that there is no other philosophy than that of Spinoza. His love of Spinoza had strengthened his friendship with Moses Mendelssohn, and in his great play, Nathan Der Weiss, he poured into one mold that conception of the ideal Jew which had come to him from the living merchant and the dead philosopher. A few years later, Herder's Einige Gespre über Spinoza's system turned the attention of liberal theologians to the ethics. Schliermacher, leader of this school, wrote of the holy and excommunicated Spinoza, while the Catholic poet Novalis called him the God-intoxicated man. Meanwhile, Jacobi had brought Spinoza to the attention of Goethe. The great poet was converted, he tells us, at the first reading of the ethics. It was precisely the philosophy for which his deepening soul had yearned. Henceforth, it pervaded his poetry and his prose. It was here that he found the lesson Das Virent Sagen Zolen that we must accept the limitations which nature puts upon us. And it was partly by breathing the calm air of Spinoza that he rose out of the wild romanticism of Gotz and Werther to the classic poise of his later life. It was by combining Spinoza with Kant's epistemology that Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel reached their varied pantheisms. It was from the Conatus Cese Preservandi the effort to preserve oneself that Fichte's Ick was born, and Schopenhauer's will to live and Nietzsche's will to power and Bergson's Elan Vital. Hegel objected that Spinoza's system was too lifeless and rigid. He was forgetting this dynamic element of it and remembering only that majestic conception of God as law which he had appropriated for his absolute reason. But he was honest enough when he said, to be a philosopher, one must first be a Spinozist. In England, the influence of Spinoza rose on the tide of the revolutionary movement, and young rebels like Coleridge and Wordsworth talked about Spinoza. 
which the spy set by the government to watch them took as a reference to his own nasal facilities, with the same ardor that animated the conversation of Russian intellectuals in the halcyon days of Y. Narud. Coolridge filled his guests with Spinozist table talk, and Wordsworth caught something of the philosopher's thought in his famous lines about something whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit which impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Shelley quoted the Treatise on Religion and the State in the original notes to Queen Mab and began a translation of it for which Byron promised a preface. A fragment of this MS came into the hands of C.S. Middleton, who took it for a work of Shelley's own, and called it Schoolboy Speculation, too crude for publication entire. In a later and tamer age, George Eliot translated the ethics, though she never published the translation. And one may suspect that Spencer's conception of the unknowable owes something to Spinoza through his intimacy with the novelist. There are not wanting men of eminence of the present day, says Belfort Bax, who declare that in Spinoza is contained the fullness of modern science. Perhaps so many were influenced by Spinoza because he lends himself to so many interpretations and yields new riches at every reading. All profound utterances have varied facets for diverse minds. One may say of Spinoza what Ecclesiastes said of wisdom. The first man knew him not perfectly. No more shall the last find him out. For his thoughts are more than the sea, and his counsels profounder than the great deep. On the second centenary of Spinoza's death, subscriptions were collected for the erection of a statue to him at The Hague. Contributions came from every corner of the educated world. Never did a monument rise upon so wide a pedestal of love. At the unveiling in 1882, Ernest Renan concluded his address with the words, which may fitly conclude also our chapter. Woe to him who in passing should hurl an insult at this gentle and pensive head. He would be punished, as all vulgar souls are punished, by his very vulgarity and by his incapacity to conceive what is divine. This man from his granite pedestal will point out to all men the way of blessedness which he found. And ages hence, the cultivated traveler passing by this spot will say in his heart, The truest vision ever had of God came, perhaps here. Chapter 5 Voltaire and the French Enlightenment 1. Paris Oedipi at Paris in 1742, Voltaire was coaching Madame Dumény to rise to tragic heights in a rehearsal of his play, Merope. She complained that she would have to have the very devil in her to stimulate such passion as he required. That is just it, answered Voltaire. You must have the devil in you to succeed in any of the arts. Even his critics and his enemies admitted that he himself met this requirement perfectly. Il avait le diable au corps. He had the devil in his body, said saint Bove, and de Maistre called him the man into whose hands hell had given all its powers. Unprepossessing, ugly, vain, flippant, obscene, unscrupulous, even at times dishonest. Voltaire was a man with the faults of his time and place, missing hardly one. And yet, this same Voltaire turns out to have been tirelessly kind, considerate, lavish of his energy and his purse, as sedulous in helping friends as in crushing enemies, able to kill with a stroke of his pen and yet disarmed by the first advance of conciliation. So contradictory is man. But all of these qualities, good and bad, were secondary not of the essence of Voltaire. The astounding and basic thing in him was the inexhaustible fertility and brilliance of his mind. His works fill ninety-nine volumes, of which every page is sparkling and fruitful, though they range from subject to subject across the world as fitfully and bravely 
as in an encyclopedia. My trade is to say what I think. And what he thought was always worth saying, as what he said was always said incomparably well. If we do not read him now, though men like Anatoly France had been formed to subtlety and wisdom by poring over his pages, it is because the theological battles which he fought for us no longer interest us intimately. We have passed on perhaps to other battlefields and are more absorbed with the economics of this life than with the geography of the next. The very thoroughness of Voltaire's victory over ecclesiasticism and superstition makes dead those issues which he found alive. Much of his fame, too, came of his inimitable conversation. But scripta manent, verba volant. Written words remain while spoken words fly away, the winged words of Voltaire with the rest. What is left to us is too much the flesh of Voltaire, too little the divine fire of his spirit. And yet, darkly as we see him through the glass of time, what a spirit. Sheer intelligence transmuting anger into fun, fire into light. A creature of air and flame, the most excitable that ever lived, composed of more ethereal and more throbbing atoms than those of other men. There is none whose mental machinery is more delicate nor whose equilibrium is at the same time more shifting and more exact. Was he perhaps the greatest intellectual energy in all history? Certainly, he worked harder and accomplished more than any other man of his epoch. Not to be occupied and not to exist amount to the same thing, he said. All people are good except those who are idle. His secretary said that he was a miser only of his time. One must give oneself all the occupation one can to make life supportable in this world. The further I advance in age, the more I find work necessary. It becomes in the long run the greatest of pleasures and takes the place of the illusions of life. If you do not want to commit suicide, always have something to do. Suicide must have been forever tempting him, for he was ever at work. It was because he was so thoroughly alive that he filled the whole era with his life. Contemporary with one of the greatest of centuries, 1694 to 1778, he was the soul and essence of it. To name Voltaire, said Victor Hugo, is to characterize the entire 18th century. Italy had a Renaissance, and Germany had a Reformation, but France had Voltaire. He was for his country both Renaissance and Reformation, and half the Revolution. He carried on the antiseptic skepticism of Montaigne, and the healthy earthly humor of Rabelais. He fought superstition and corruption more savagely and effectively than Luther or Erasmus, Calvin or Knox or Melanchthon. He helped to make the powder with which Mirabeau and Marat, Danton and Robespierre blew up the old regime. If we judge of men by what they have done, said Lamartine, then Voltaire is incontestably the greatest writer of modern Europe. Destiny gave him 83 years of existence that he might slowly decompose the decayed age. He had the time to combat time, and when he fell, he was the conqueror. No, never has a writer had in his lifetime such influence. Despite exile, imprisonment, and the suppression of almost every one of his books by the minions of church and state, he forged fiercely a path for his truth until at last kings, popes, and emperors catered to him. Thrones trembled before him, and half the world listened to catch his every word. It was an age in which many things called for a destroyer. Laughing lions must come, said Nietzsche. Well, Voltaire came and annihilated with laughter. He and Rousseau were two voices of a vast process of economic and political transition from feudal aristocracy to the rule of the middle class. When a rising class is inconvenienced by existing law or custom, it appeals from custom to reason and from law to nature, just as conflicting desires in the individual sparkle into thought. So the wealthy bourgeoisie supported the rationalism of Voltaire and the naturalism of Rousseau, 
It was necessary to loosen old habits and customs, to renovate and invigorate feeling and thought, to open the mind to experiment and change, before the great revolution could come. Not that Voltaire and Rousseau were the causes of the revolution. Perhaps rather they were co-results with it of the forces that seethed and surged beneath the political and social surface of French life. They were the accompanying light and brilliance of the volcanic heat and conflagration. Philosophy is to history as reason is to desire. In either case, an unconscious process determines from below the conscious thought above. Yet we must not bend back too far in attempting to correct the philosopher's tendency to exaggerate the influence of philosophy. Louis XVI, seeing in his temple prison the works of Voltaire and Rousseau, said, Those two men have destroyed France, meaning his dynasty. The Bourbons might have preserved themselves, said Napoleon, if they had controlled writing materials. The advent of cannon killed the feudal system. Ink will kill the modern social organization. Books rule the world, said Voltaire, or at least those nations in which have written language. The others do not count. Nothing enfranchises like education. And he proceeded to enfranchise France. When once a nation begins to think, it is impossible to stop it. But with Voltaire, France began to think. Voltaire, that is to say, François-Marie Herouet, was born at Paris in 1694, the son of a comfortably successful notary and a somewhat aristocratic mother. He owed to his father perhaps his shrewdness and irascibility, and to his mother something of his levity and wit. He came into the world, so to speak, by a narrow margin. His mother did not survive his birth and he was so puny and sickly an infant that the nurse did not give him more than a day to live. She was slightly in error as he lived almost to eighty-four. But throughout his life his frail body tormented with illness, his unconquerable spirit. He had, for his edification, a model elder brother, Armand, a pious lad who fell in love with the Jansenist heresy and courted martyrdom for his faith. Well said Armand to a friend who advised the better part of valor. If you do not want to be hanged, at least do not put off other people. The father said he had two fools for his sons, one in verse and the other in prose. The fact that Francois made verses almost as soon as he could write his name convinced his very practical father that nothing good would come of him. But the famous hetera Ninon de l'Enclos who lived in the provincial town to which the Arrowways had returned after the birth of Francois, saw in the youth signs of greatness, and when she died she left him two thousand francs for the purchase of books. His early education came from these, and from a dissolute abbe, a Jerome Cognard in the flesh, who taught him skepticism along with his prayers. His later educators, the Jesuits, gave him the very instrument of skepticism by teaching him dialectic, the art of proving anything, and therefore at last the habit of believing nothing. Francois became an adept at argument. While the boys played games in the fields, he, aged twelve, stayed behind to discuss theology with the doctors. When the time came for him to earn his living, he scandalized his father by proposing to take up literature as a profession. Literature, said Monsieur Arroway, is the profession of the man who wishes to be useless to society and a burden to his relatives and to die of hunger. One can see the table trembling under his emphasis. So Francois went in for literature. Not that he was a quiet and merely studious lad, he burnt the midnight oil of others. He took to staying out late, frolicking with the wits and roisterers of the town and experimenting with the commandments, until his exasperated father sent him off to a relative at Cain with instructions to keep the youth practically in confinement. But his jailer fell in love with his wit and soon gave him free reign. After imprisonment, now as later, came exile. His father sent him to The Hague with the French ambassador, requesting strict surveillance of the madcap boy. But Francois at once fell in love with the little lady. Pimpette held breathless, clandestine interviews with her, 
and wrote to her passionate letters ending always with the refrain, I shall certainly love you forever. The affair was discovered, and he was sent home. He remembered Pimpet for several weeks. In 1715, proud of his 21 years, he went to Paris, just in time to be in at the death of Louis XIV. The succeeding Louis being too young to govern France, much less Paris, the power fell into the hands of a regent, and during this quasi-interregnum, life ran riot in the capital of the world, and young Arouet ran with it. He soon achieved a reputation as a brilliant and reckless lad. When the regent for economy sold half the horses that filled the royal stables, Francois remarked how much more sensible it would have been to dismiss half the asses that filled the royal court. At last all the bright and naughty things whispered about Paris were fathered upon him. And it was his ill luck that these included two poems accusing the regent of desiring to usurp the throne. The regent raged, and meeting the youth in the park one day said to him, Monsieur Arouet, I will wager that I can show you something that you have never seen before. What is that? The inside of the Bastille. Arouet saw it the next day, April 16th, 1717. While in the Bastille, he adopted, for some unknown reason, the pen name of Voltaire, and became a poet in earnest and at length. Before he had served eleven months, he had written a long and not unworthy epic, the Henriade, telling the story of Henry of Navarre. Then the regent, having discovered perhaps that he had imprisoned an innocent man, released him and gave him a pension, whereupon Voltaire wrote thanking him for taking care of his board and begging permission hereafter to take care of his lodging himself. Note, Carlyle thought it an anagram for A-R-O-U-E-T, Lejeune, the younger, but the name seems to have occurred among the family of Voltaire's mother. He passed now, almost with a bound from the prison to the stage. His tragedy, Oedipi, was produced in 1718 and broke all the records of Paris by running for 45 consecutive nights. His old father came to upbraid him, sat in a box, and covered his joy by grumbling at every hit. Oh, the rascal, the rascal. When the poet Fontenelle met Voltaire after the play and damned it with high praise, saying it was too brilliant for tragedy. Voltaire replied, smiling, I must reread your pastorals. The youth was in no mood for caution or for courtesy. Had he not put into the play itself these reckless lines, Our priests are not what simple folk suppose. Their learning is but our credulity. Act 4, Scene 1, and into the mouth of a raspy this epic-making challenge. Let us trust to ourselves, see all with our own eyes. Let these be our oracles, our tripods, and our gods. 2.5 The play netted Voltaire 4,000 francs, which he proceeded to invest with a wisdom unheard of in literary men. Through all his tribulations, he kept the art not merely of making a spacious income, but of putting it to work. He respected the classic adage that one must live before one can philosophize. In 1729, he bought up all the tickets in a poorly planned government lottery and made a large sum, much to the anger of the government. But as he became rich, he became ever more generous, and a growing circle of protégés gathered around him as he passed into the afternoon of life. It was well that he added an almost Hebraic subtlety of finance to his Gaelic cleverness of pen, for his next play, Artemir, failed. Voltaire felt the failure keenly. Every triumph sharpens the sting of later defeats. He was always painfully sensitive to public opinion and envied the animals because they do not know what people say of them. Fate added to his dramatic failure a bad case of smallpox. He cured himself by drinking 120 pints of lemonade and somewhat less of physic. When he came out of the shadow of death, he found that his Henriade had made him famous. He boasted with reason that he had made poetry the fashion. He was received and feted everywhere. The aristocracy caught him up and turned him into a polished man of the world, 
an unequaled master of conversation, and the inheritor of the finest cultural tradition in Europe. For eight years he basked in the sunshine of the salons, and then fortune turned away. Some of the aristocracy could not forget that this young man had no other title to place and honor than that of genius, and could not quite forgive him for the distinction. During a dinner at the Duc de Sully's chateau, after Voltaire had held forth for some minutes with unabashed eloquence and wit, the Chevalier de Rohan asked, Not sotto voce, Who is the young man who talks so loud? My lord, answered Voltaire quickly. He is one who does not carry a great name but wins respect for the name he has. To answer the Chevalier at all was impertinent. To answer him unanswerably was treason. The Honorable Lord engaged a band of ruffians to assault Voltaire by night, merely cautioning them. Don't hit his head. Something good may come out of that yet. The next day, at the theater, Voltaire appeared, bandaged and limping, walked up to Rohan's box and challenged him to a duel. Then he went home and spent all day practicing with the foils. But the noble Chevalier had no mind to be precipitated into heaven or elsewhere by a mere genius. He appealed to his cousin, who was minister of police, to protect him. Voltaire was arrested and found himself again in his old home, the Bastille, privileged once more to view the world from the inside. He was almost immediately released on condition that he go into exile in England. He went, but after being escorted to Dover, he recrossed the channel in disguise, burning to avenge himself. Warned that he had been discovered and was about to be arrested a third time, he took ship again and reconciled himself to three years in England, 1726 to 29. Two, London, Letters on the English. He set to work with courage to master the new language. He was displeased to find that plague had one syllable and auge two. He wished that Plague would take one half the language and Augie the other half. But soon he could read English well, and within a year he was master of the best English literature of the age. He was introduced to the literati by Lord Bolingbroke and dined with one after another of them, even with the elusive and corrosive Dean Swift. He pretended to no pedigree and asked none of others. When Congreve spoke of his own plays as trifles and desired to be considered rather a gentleman of leisure than an author, Voltaire said to him sharply, If you had had, had the misfortune to be only a gentleman like any other, I should never have come to see you. What surprised him was the freedom with which Bolingbroke, Pope, Addison, and Swift wrote whatever they pleased. Here was a people that had opinions of its own, a people that had remade its religion hanged its king, imported another, and built a parliament stronger than any ruler in Europe. There was no Bastille here and no Letters de Cachet by which titled pensioners or royal idlers could send their untitled foes to jail without cause and without trial. Here were thirty religions and not one priest. Here was the boldest sect of all, the Quakers, who astonished all Christendom by behaving like Christians. Voltaire never to the end of his life ceased to wonder at them. In the Dictionnaire Philosophique, he makes one of them say, Our God, who has bidden us love our enemies and suffer evil without complaint, assuredly has no mind that we should cross the sea to go and cut the throats of our brothers, because murderers in red clothes and hats two feet high enlist citizens by making a noise with two sticks on an ass's skin. It was in England, too, that throbbed with a virile intellectual activity. Bacon's name was still in the air, and the inductive mode of approach was triumphing in every field. Hobbes, 1588-1679, had carried out the skeptical spirit of the Renaissance and the practical spirit of his master into so complete and outspoken a materialism as would have won him in France the honor of martyrdom for a fallacy. Locke, 1632 to 1704, had written a masterpiece of psychological analysis. The essay on the human understanding, 1689, 
without so much as mentioning the soul. Collins, Tyndall, and other deists were reaffirming their faith in God while calling into question every other doctrine of the established church. Newton had just died. Voltaire attended the funeral and often recalled the impression made upon him by the national honors awarded to this modest Englishman. Not long ago, he writes, a distinguished company were discussing the trite and frivolous question, who is the greatest man, Caesar, Alexander, Tamerlan, or Cromwell? Someone answered that without doubt it was Isaac Newton, and rightly, for it is to him who masters our minds by the force of truth, and not to those who enslave them by violence, that we owe our reverence. Voltaire became a patient and a thorough student of Newton's work and was later the chief protagonist of Newton's views in France. One must marvel at the quickness with which Voltaire absorbed almost all that England had to teach him, its literature, its science, and its philosophy. He took all these varied elements, passed them through the fire of French culture and the French spirit, and transmuted them into the gold of Gaelic wit and eloquence. He recorded his impressions in letters on the English, which he circulated in manuscript among his friends. He did not dare to print them, for they praised perfidious Albion too highly to suit the taste of the royal censor. They contrasted English political liberty and intellectual independence with French tyranny and bondage. They condemned the idle aristocracy and the tithe-absorbing clergy of France with their perpetual recourse to the Bastille as the answer to every question and every doubt. They urged the middle classes to rise to their proper place in the state as these classes had in England. Note, Diderot was jailed six months for his letter on the blind. Buffon, in 1751, was made to retract publicly his teachings on the antiquity of the earth. Freire was sent to the Bastille for a critical inquiry into the origins of the royal power in France. Books continued to be burned officially by the public hangman until 1788 as also after the Restoration in 1815. In 1757, an edict pronounced the death penalty for any author who should attack religion, i.e., call in question any dogma of the traditional faith. Robertson, 7384-105-107, Pelessier, Voltaire Philosophie, Paris, 1908, page 92, Buckle, History of Civilization, New York, 1913, Volume 1, pages 529, F. Without quite knowing or intending it, these letters were the first cock's crow of the revolution. Three. Cire, the Romances. Nevertheless, the regent, not knowing of this Chanticleer, sent Voltaire permission in 1729 to return to France. For five years, Voltaire enjoyed again that Parisian life whose wine flowed in his veins and whose spirit flowed from his pen. And then some miscreant of a publisher getting hold of the letters on the English turned them without the author's permission into print and sold them far and wide, to the horror of all good Frenchmen, including Voltaire. The Parliament at Paris at once ordered the book to be publicly burned as scandalous. Contrary to religion, to morals, and to respect for authority. And Voltaire learned that he was again on the way to the Bastille. Like a good philosopher, he took to his heels, merely utilizing the occasion to elope with another man's wife. The Marquis de Châtelet was twenty-eight. Voltaire, alas, was already forty. She was a remarkable woman. She had studied mathematics with the redoubtable Maupertuis and then with Clairaut. She had written a learnedly annotated translation of Newton's Principia. She was soon to receive higher rating than Voltaire in a contest for a prize offered by the French Academy for an essay on the physics of fire. In short, she was precisely the kind of woman who never elopes. But the Marquis was so dull, and Voltaire was so interesting. A creature lovable in every way, she called him the finest ornament in France. He returned her love with fervent admiration, called her 
a great man whose only fault was being a woman. Formed from her and from the large number of highly talented women then in France, his conviction of the native mental equality of the sexes, and decided that her chateau at Cirey was an admirable refuge from the inclement political weather of Paris. Note, Talentire, 207, contrast Voltaire's God-created woman only to tame mankind, Lingenu, in Romances, 309, with Meredith's Women Will Be the Last Thing Civilized by Man, ordeal of Richard Feverell, page 1. Sociologists would side with Voltaire. Man is woman's last domesticated animal. The Marquis was away with his regiment, which had long been his avenue of escape from mathematics, and he made no objection to the new arrangements. Because of the marriages to convenances, which forced rich old men on young women who had little taste for salinity, but much hunger for romance, the morals of the day permitted a lady to add a lover to her menage, if it were done with a decent respect for the hypocrisies of mankind. And when she chose not merely a lover, but a genius, all the world forgave her. In the chateau at Cire, they did not spend their time billing and cooing. All the day was taken up with study and research. Voltaire had an expensive laboratory equipped for work in natural science, and for years the lovers rivaled each other in discovery and disquisition. They had many guests, but it was understood that these should entertain themselves all day long, till supper at nine. After supper, occasionally, there were private theatricals, or Voltaire would read to the guests one of his lively stories. Very soon, Cire became the Paris of the French mind. The aristocracy and the bourgeoisie joined in the pilgrimage to taste Voltaire's wine and wit, and see him act in his own plays. He was happy to be the center of this corrupt and brilliant world. He took nothing too seriously, and for a while made rear a fair rear his motto, to laugh and to make laugh. Catherine of Russia called him the divinity of gaiety. If nature had not made us a little frivolous, he said, we should be most wretched. It is because one can be frivolous that the majority do not hang themselves. There was nothing of the deceptic Carlyle about him. Dulce es deceptere in loco. It is sweet to be foolish on occasion. Woe to philosophers who cannot laugh away their wrinkles. I look upon solemnity as a disease. It was now that he began to write those delightful romances. Zadig, Candide, Micro Maga, Lanzenu, Le Monde Comme Va, etc., which give the Voltairean spirit in purer form than anything else in his 99 volumes. They are not novels, but humoresque, picturesque novelettes. The heroes are not persons, but ideas. The villains are superstitions. And the events are thoughts. Some are mere fragments, like Lanzenu, which is Rousseau before Jean-Jacques. A Huron Indian comes to France with some returning explorers. The first problem to which he gives rise is that of making him a Christian. An abbe gives him a copy of the New Testament, which the Huron likes so much that he soon offers himself not only for baptism, but for circumcision as well. For, he says, I do not find in the book that was put into my hands a single person who was not circumcised. It is therefore evident that I must make a sacrifice to the Hebrew custom, and the sooner the better. Hardly has this difficulty been smoothed over when he has trouble over confession. He asks where in the gospel this is commanded and is directed to a passage in the epistle of St. James. Confess your sins to one another. He confesses, but... When he had done, he dragged the abbe from the confessional chair, placed himself in the seat, and bade the abbe confess in turn. Come, my friend, it is said, we must confess our sins to one another. I have related my sins to you, and you shall not stir till you recount yours. He falls in love with Miss St. Ives, but is told that he cannot marry her because she has acted as godmother at his baptism. 
He is very angry at this little trick of the fates and threatens to get unbaptized. Having received permission to marry her, he is surprised to find that for marriage, notaries, priests, witnesses, contracts, and dispensations are absolutely necessary. You are then very great rogues, since so many precautions are required. And so, as the story passes on from incident to incident, the contradictions between primitive and ecclesiastical Christianity are forced upon the stage. One misses the impartiality of the scholar and the leniency of the philosopher. But Voltaire had begun his war against superstition, and in war we demand impartiality and leniency only of our foes. Micro Magas is an imitation of Swift, but perhaps richer than its model in cosmic imagination. The earth is visited by an inhabitant from Sirius. He is some 500,000 feet tall as befits the citizen of so large a star. On his way through space, he has picked up a gentleman from Saturn who grieves because he is only a few thousand feet in height. As they walk through the Mediterranean, the Syrian wets his heels. He asks his comrade how many senses the Saturnians have and is told, We have 72, but we are daily complaining of the smaller number. To what age do you commonly live? Alas, a mere trifle. Very few on our globe survive 15,000 years. So you see that in a manner we begin to die the very moment we are born. Our existence is no more than a point, our duration an instant, and our globe an atom. Scarce do we begin to learn a little when death intervenes before we can profit by experience. Note. Romances 339 CF. Shaw's Back to Methuselah. One of the most famous of Shaw's bon mots has its prototype in Voltaire's Memnon, the philosopher, who says, I'm afraid that our little terraqueous globe is the madhouse of those hundred thousand millions of worlds of which your lordship does me the honor to speak. I bid 394. As they stand in the sea, they take up a ship as one might pick up some animalcule, and the Syrian poises it on his thumbnail, causing much commotion among the human passengers. The chaplains of the ship repeated exorcisms, the sailors swore, and the philosophers formed a system to explain this disturbance of the laws of gravity. The Syrian bends down like a darkening cloud and addresses them. O ye intelligent atoms, in whom the supreme being hath been pleased to manifest his omniscience and power, without doubt your joys on this earth must be pure and exquisite. For being unencumbered with matter, and to all appearance little else than soul, you must spend your lives in the delights of pleasure and reflection, which are the true enjoyments of a perfect spirit. True happiness I have nowhere found, but certainly here it dwells. We have matter enough, answered one of the philosophers, to do abundance of mischief. You must know, for example, that at this very moment while I am speaking, there are hundred thousand animals of our own species covered with hats, slaying an equal number of their fellow creatures who wear turbans. At least they are either slaying or being slain, and this has usually been the case all over the earth from time immemorial. Miscreants, cried the indignant Syrian. I have a good mind to take two or three steps and trample the whole nest of such ridiculous assassins under my feet. Don't give yourself the trouble, replied the philosopher. They are industrious enough in securing their own destruction. At the end of ten years, the hundredth part of these wretches will not survive. Besides, the punishment should not be inflicted upon them, but upon those sedentary and slothful barbarians who, from their palaces, give orders for murdering a million of men, and then solemnly thank God for their success. Next to Candide, which belongs to a later period of Voltaire's life, the best of these tales is Zadig. Zadig was a Babylonian philosopher. As wise as it is possible for men to be, he knew as much of metaphysics as hath ever been known in any age, that is, little or nothing at all. Jealousy made him imagine that he was in love with Samira. In defending her against robbers, he was wounded in the left eye. A messenger was dispatched to Memphis for the great Egyptian physician Hermes, who came with a numerous retinue. He visited Zadig and declared that the patient would lose his eye. He even foretold the day and hour when this fatal event would happen. 
Had it been the right eye, said he, I could easily have cured it, but the wounds of the left are incurable. All Babylon lamented the fate of Zadig and admired the profound knowledge of Hermes. In two days the abscess broke of its own accord, and Zadig was perfectly cured. Hermes wrote a book to prove that it ought not to have healed. Zadig did not read it. He hurried instead to Samira, only to find that upon hearing Hermes's first report she had betrothed herself to another man, having, she said, an unconquerable aversion to one-eyed men. Zadig thereupon married a peasant woman, hoping to find in her the virtues which had been missing in the court lady Samira. To make sure of the fidelity of his wife, he arranged with a friend that he, Zadig, should pretend to die, and that the friend should make love to the wife an hour later. So Zadig had himself pronounced dead, and lay in the coffin while his friend first commiserated and then congratulated the widow and at last proposed immediate marriage to her. She made a brief resistance, and then, protesting she would never consent, consented. Zadig rose from the dead and fled into the woods to console himself with the beauty of nature. Having become a very wise man, he was made vizier to the king, to whose realm he brought prosperity, justice, and peace. But the queen fell in love with him, and the king, perceiving it, began to be troubled. He particularly remarked that the queen's shoes were blue and that Zadig's shoes were blue, that his wife's ribbons were yellow and that Zadig's bonnet was yellow. He resolved to poison them both, but the queen discovered the plot and sent a note to Zadig. Fly, I conjure thee, by our mutual love and our yellow ribbons. Zadig again fled into the woods. He then represented to himself the human species, as it really is, as a parcel of insects devouring one another on a little atom of clay. This true image seemed to annihilate his misfortunes by making him sensible of the nothingness of his own being and that of Babylon. His soul launched into infinity and, detached from the senses, contemplated the immutable order of the universe. But when, afterwards returning to himself, he considered that the queen had perhaps died for him. The universe vanished from sight. Passing out of Babylon, he saw a man cruelly beating a woman. He responded to her cries for help, fought the man, and at last, to save himself, struck a blow which killed his enemy. Thereupon he turned to the lady and asked, What further, madam, wouldst thou have me do for thee? Die, villain, for thou hast killed my lover. Oh, that I were able to tear out thy heart. Zadig was shortly afterward captured and enslaved, but he taught his master philosophy and became his trusted counselor. Through his advice, the practice of suti, by which a widow had herself buried with her husband, was abolished by a law which required that before such martyrdom the widow should spend an hour alone with a handsome man. Sent on a mission to the king of Serendib, Zadig taught him that an honest minister could best be found by choosing the lightest dancer among the applicants. He had the vestibule of the dance hall filled with loose valuables, easily stolen, and arranged that each candidate should pass through the vestibule alone and unwatched. When they had all entered, they were asked to dance. Never had dancers performed more unwillingly or with less grace. Their heads were down, their backs bent, their hands pressed to their sides. And so the story rushes on. We can imagine those evenings at Cire. Four. Potsdam and Frederick. Those who could not come to him wrote to him. In 1736 began his correspondence with Frederick, then Prince, and not yet great. Frederick's first letter was like that of a boy to a king. Its lavish flattery gives us an inkling of the reputation which Voltaire, though he had not yet written any of his masterpieces, had already won. It proclaims Voltaire as the greatest man of France and a mortal who does honor to language. I count it one of the greatest honors of my life to be born the contemporary of a man of such distinguished attainments as yours. It is not given to everyone to make the mind laugh. And what pleasures can surpass those of the mind? Frederick was a free thinker, 
who looked upon dogmas as a king looks upon subjects, and Voltaire had great hopes that on the throne Frederick would make the Enlightenment fashionable, while he himself perhaps might play Plato to Frederick's Dionysius. When Frederick demurred to the flattery with which Voltaire answered his own, Voltaire replied, A prince who writes against flattery is as singular as a pope who writes against infallibility. Frederick sent him a copy of the Anti-Machiavel, in which the prince spoke very beautifully of the iniquity of war and of the duty of a king to preserve peace. Voltaire wept tears of joy over this royal pacifist. A few months later, Frederick made king, invaded Silesia, and plunged Europe into a generation of bloodshed. In 1745, the poet and his mathematician went to Paris when Voltaire became a candidate for membership in the French Academy. To achieve this quite superfluous distinction, he called himself a good Catholic, complimented some powerful Jesuits, lied inexhaustibly, and in general behaved as most of us do in such cases. He failed, but a year later he succeeded and delivered a reception address which is one of the classics of the literature of France. For a while he lingered in Paris, flitting from salon to salon and producing play after play. From Oedipi at 18 to Irene at 83, he wrote a long series of dramas, some of them failures, most of them successes. In 1730, Brutus failed, and in 1732, Eraphile failed. His friends urged him to abandon the drama. But in the same year, he produced Zare which became his greatest success. Mohammed followed in 1741, Merope in 1743, Samaramis in 1748, and Tancredi in 1760. Meanwhile, tragedy and comedy had entered his own life. After 15 years, his love for Mademoiselle de Châtelet had somewhat thinned. They had even ceased to quarrel. In 1748, the Marquis fell in love with the handsome young Marquis de Saint-Lambert. When Voltaire discovered it, he raged. But when St. Lambert asked his forgiveness, he melted into a benediction. He had reached the crest of his life now and began to see death in the distance. He could not take it ill that youth should be served. Such are women, he said philosophically, forgetting that there are such men too. I displaced Richelieu, St. Lambert turns me out. That is the order of things. One nail drives out another, so goes the world. He wrote a pretty stanza to the third nail. Saint Lambert is all for thee, the flower grows. The rose thorns are all for me, for thee the rose. Then in 1749 came the death of Mademoiselle de Châtelet in childbirth. It was characteristic of the age that her husband and Voltaire and St. Lambert should meet at her deathbed with not one word of reproach, and indeed made friends by their common loss. Voltaire tried to forget his bereavement in work. For a time he busied himself with his siècle de Louis XIV. But what rescued him from despondency was the opportune renewal of Frederick's invitation to come to his court at Potsdam an invitation accompanied by 3,000 francs for traveling expenses was irresistible. Voltaire left for Berlin in 1750. It soothed him to find himself assigned to a splendid suite in Frederick's palace and accepted on equal terms by the most powerful monarch of the age. At first his letters were full of satisfaction. Writing on July 24th to Dargental, he describes Potsdam, 150,000 soldiers, opera, comedy, philosophy, poetry, grandeur and graces, grenadiers and muses, trumpets and violins, the suppers of Plato, society and liberty. Who would believe it? Yet it is very true. Years before, he had written, Mon Dieu, what a delightful life it would be to lodge with three or four men of letters with talents and no jealousy. What imagination! To love one another, live quietly, cultivate one's art, talk of it, enlighten ourselves mutually. I picture to myself that I shall someday live in this little paradise. And here it was. Voltaire avoided the state dinners. He could not bear to be surrounded with bristling generals. 
He reserved himself for the private suppers to which Frederick, later in the evening, would invite a small inner circle of literary friends. For this greatest prince of his age yearned to be a poet and a philosopher. The conversation at these suppers was always in French. Voltaire tried to learn German, but gave it up after nearly choking, and wished the Germans had more wit and fewer consonants. One who had heard the conversation said that it was better than the most interesting and best written book in the world. They talked about everything and said what they thought. Frederick's wit was almost as sharp as Voltaire's, and only Voltaire dared to answer him with that finesse which could kill without giving offense. One thinks boldly one is free here, wrote Voltaire joyfully. Frederick scratches with one hand but caresses with the other. I am crossed in nothing. I find a port after fifty years of storm. I find the protection of a king, the conversation of a philosopher, the charms of an agreeable man, united in one who for sixteen years consoled me in misfortune and sheltered me from my enemies. If one can be certain of anything, it is of the character of the king of Prussia. However, in November of this same year, Voltaire thought he would improve his finances by investing in Saxon bonds, despite Frederick's prohibition of such investments. The bonds rose and Voltaire profited, but his agent, Hirsch, tried to blackmail him by threatening to publish the transaction. Voltaire sprang at his throat and sent him sprawling. Frederick learned of the affair and fell into a royal rage. I shall want him at the most another year he said to La Mitri. One squeezes the orange and throws away the rind. La Mitri, perhaps anxious to disperse his rivals, took care to report this to Voltaire. The suppers were resumed. But, wrote Voltaire, the orange rind haunts my dreams. The man who fell from the top of a steeple and finding the falling through the air soft said, good, provided it lasts, was not a little as I am. He half desired a break, for he was as homesick as only a French man can be. The decisive trifle came in 1752. Maupertuis, the great mathematician whom Frederick had imported from France with so many others in an attempt to arouse the German mind by direct contact with the Enlightenment, quarreled with a subordinate mathematician, Koenig, over an interpretation of Newton. Frederick entered into the dispute on the side of Maupertuis and Voltaire, who had more courage than caution, entered it on the side of Koenig. Unluckily for me, he wrote to Madame Denis, I'm also an author, and in the opposite camp to the king. I have no scepter, but I have a pen. About the same time Frederick was writing to his sister, The devil is incarnate in my men of letters. There is no doing anything with them. These fellows have no intelligence except for society. It must be a consolation to animals to see that people with minds are often no better than they. It was now that Voltaire wrote against Maupertuis, his famous diatribe of Dr. Akakia. He read it to Frederick, who laughed all night over it, but begged Voltaire not to publish it. Voltaire seemed to acquiesce, but the truth was that the thing was already sent to the printer, and the author could not bring himself to practice infanticide on the progeny of his pen. When it appeared, Frederick burst into flame, and Voltaire fled from the conflagration. At Frankfurt, though in territory quite outside Frederick's jurisdiction, he was overtaken and arrested by the king's agents, and told that he could not go on until he surrendered Frederick's poem, The Palladium, which had not been adapted for polite society and out pucelled Voltaire's pucelle itself. But the terrible manuscript was in a trunk which had been lost on the way, and for weeks till it came Voltaire was kept almost in prison. A bookseller to whom he owed something thought it was an opportune moment to come and press for the payment of his bill. Voltaire, furious, gave him a blow on the ear, whereupon Voltaire's secretary, Colini, offered comfort to the man by pointing out, Sir, you have received a box on the ear from one of the greatest men in the world. Freed at last, he was about to cross the frontier into France when word came that he was exiled. The hunted old soul hardly knew where to turn. For a time he thought of going to Pennsylvania. One may imagine his desperation. 
He spent the March of 1754 seeking an agreeable tomb in the neighborhood of Geneva, safe from the rival autocrats of Paris and Berlin. At last, he bought an old estate called Le Delice, settled down to cultivate his garden and regain his health, and when his life seemed to be ebbing away into senility, entered upon the period of his noblest and greatest work. Five. Le Delice, the essay on morals. What was the cause of his new exile that he had published in Berlin? The most ambitious, the most voluminous, the most characteristic, and the most daring of his works. Its title was no small part of it. An essay on the morals and the spirit of the nations from Charlemagne to Louis XIII. He had begun it at Cire for Madame du Chatelet spurred on to the task by her denunciation of history as she has writ. It is an old almanac, she had said. What does it matter to me, a French woman living on my estate, to know that Egil succeeded Haquin in Sweden and that Ottoman was the son of Ortogorol? I have read with pleasure the history of the Greeks and the Romans. They offered me certain pictures which attracted me but I have never yet been able to finish any long history of our modern nations. I can see scarcely anything in them but confusion, a host of minute events without connection or sequence, a thousand battles which settled nothing. I renounced a study which overwhelms the mind without illuminating it. Voltaire had agreed. He had made his on Zenu say, History is nothing more than a picture of crimes and misfortunes and he was to write to Horace Walpole, July 15th, 1768. Truly the history of the Yorkists and Lancastrians and many others is much like reading the history of highway robbers. But he had expressed to Madame du Châtelet the hope that a way out might lie in applying philosophy to history and endeavoring to trace beneath the flux of political events the history of the human mind. Only philosophers should write history, he said. In all nations, history is disfigured by fable till at last philosophy comes to enlighten man. And when it does finally arrive in the midst of this darkness, it finds the human mind so blinded by centuries of error that it can hardly undeceive it. It finds ceremonies, facts, and monuments heaped up to prove lies. History, he concludes, is after all nothing but a pack of tricks which we play upon the dead. We transform the past to suit our wishes for the future. And in the upshot, history proves that anything can be proved by history. He worked like a miner to find in this Mississippi of falsehoods the grains of truth about the real history of mankind. Year after year, he gave himself to preparatory studies. A history of Russia, a history of Charles the Twelfth, the age of Louis the Fourteenth, the age of Louis the Thirteenth, and through these tasks he developed in himself the unflagging intellectual conscience which enslaves a man to make a genius. The Jesuit Père Daniel, who produced a history of France, had placed before him in the Royal Library of Paris twelve hundred volumes of documents and manuscripts. Spent an hour or so looking through them, and then, turning to Father Tornenamine, the former teacher of Voltaire, dismissed the matter by declaring that all this material was useless old paper which he had no need of for the purpose of writing his history. Not so Voltaire. He read everything on his subject that he could lay his hands on. He poured over hundreds of volumes of memoirs. He wrote hundreds of letters to survivors of famous events. And even after publishing his works, he continued to study and improved every edition. But this gathering of material was only preparatory. What was needed was a new method of selection and arrangement. Mere facts would not do, even if, as so seldom happens, they were facts. Details that lead to nothing are to history what baggage is to an army. Impedimenta. We must look at things in the large, for the very reason that the human mind is so small and sinks under the weight of minutia. Facts should be collected by analysts and arranged in some kind of historical dictionary where one might find them at need, as one finds words. 
What Voltaire sought was a unifying principle by which the whole history of civilization in Europe could be woven on one thread, and he was convinced that this thread was the history of culture. He was resolved that his history should deal not with kings, but with the movements, forces, and masses, not with nations, but with the human race, not with wars, but with the march of the human mind. Battles and revolutions are the smallest part of the plan. Squadrons and battalions conquering or being conquered, towns taken and retaken are common to all history. Take away the arts and the progress of the mind and you will find nothing in any age remarkable enough to attract the attention of posterity. I wish to write a history not of wars but of society and to ascertain how men lived in the interior of their families and what were the arts which they commonly cultivated. My object is the history of the human mind, and not a mere detail of petty facts. Nor am I concerned with the history of great lords. But I want to know what were the steps by which men passed from barbarism to civilization. This rejection of kings from history was part of that democratic uprising which at last rejected them from government. The essay sur le maire began the dethronement of the Bourbons and so he produced the first philosophy of history, the first systematic attempt to trace the streams of natural causation in the development of the European mind. It was to be expected that such an experiment should follow upon the abandonment of supernatural explanations. History could not come into its own until theology gave way. According to Buckle, Voltaire's book laid the basis of modern historical science. Gibbon, Neber, Buckle, and Grote were his grateful debtors and followers. He was the caput nili of them all, and is still unsurpassed in the field which he first explored. But why did his greatest book bring him exile? Because by telling the truth, it offended everybody. It especially enraged the clergy by taking the view later developed by Gibbon that the rapid conquest of paganism by Christianity had disintegrated Rome from within and prepared it to fall an easy victim to the invading and immigrating barbarians. It enraged them further by giving much less space than usual to Judea and Christendom, and by speaking of China, India, and Persia, and of their faiths, with the impartiality of a Martian. In this new perspective, a vast and novel world was revealed. Every dogma faded into relativity. The endless East took on something of the proportions given it by geography. Europe suddenly became conscious of itself as the experimental peninsula of a continent and a culture greater than its own. How could it forgive a European for so unpatriotic a revelation? The king decreed that this Frenchman, who dared to think of himself as a man first and a Frenchman afterward, should never put foot upon the soil of France again. Six, Fernie, Candide. Les Delis had been a temporary home, a center from which Voltaire might prospect to find a shelter of more permanence. He found it in 1758 at Fernie, just inside the Swiss line near France. Here he would be secure from the French power and yet near to French refuge if the Swiss government should trouble him. This last change ended his wanderjahre. His fitful runnings to and fro had not been all the result of nervous restlessness. They had reflected, too, his ubiquitous insecurity from persecution. Only at sixty-four did he find a house that could be also his home. There is a passage at the end of one of his tales, The Travels of Scarmentado, which almost applies to its author. As I had now seen all that was rare or beautiful on earth, I resolved for the future to see nothing but my own home. I took a wife and soon suspected that she had deceived me, but notwithstanding this doubt, I still found that, of all conditions of life, this was much the happiest. He had no wife, but he had a niece, which is better for a man of genius. We never hear of his wishing to be in Paris. There can be no doubt that this wise exile prolonged his days. He was happy in his garden, planting fruit trees, which he did not expect to see flourish in his lifetime. When an admirer praised the work he had done for posterity, he answered, Yes, I have planted four thousand trees. 
He had a kind word for everybody, but could be forced to sharper speech. One day he asked a visitor whence he came. From Mr. Hollers. He is a great man, said Voltaire, a great poet, a great naturalist, a great philosopher, almost a universal genius. What say you, sir, is the more admirable, as Mr. Holler does not do you the same justice? Ah, said Voltaire, perhaps we are both mistaken. Fernie now become the intellectual capital of the world. Every learned man or enlightened ruler of the day paid his court either in person or by correspondence. Here came skeptical priests, liberal aristocrats, and learned ladies. Here came Gibbon and Boswell from England. Here came de Lambert, Helvetius, and other rebels of the Enlightenment, and countless others. At last, the entertainment of this endless stream of visitors proved too expensive, even for Voltaire. He complained that he was becoming the hotel keeper for all Europe. To one acquaintance who announced that he had come to stay for six weeks, Voltaire said, what is the difference between you and Don Quixote? He mistook inns for chateau, and you mistake this chateau for an inn. God preserve me from my friends, he concluded. I will take care of my enemies myself. Add to this perpetual hospitality, the largest correspondence the world has ever seen, and the most brilliant. Letters came from all sorts and conditions of men. A burgomaster wrote from Germany asking, in confidence whether there is a god or not, and begging Voltaire to answer by return post. Gustavus III of Sweden was elated by the thought that Voltaire sometimes glanced at the north and told him that this was their greatest encouragement to do their best up there. Christian VII of Denmark apologized for not establishing at once all reforms. Catherine II of Russia sent him beautiful presents, wrote frequently, and hoped he would not consider her importunate. Even Frederick, after a year of doldrums, returned to the fold and resumed his correspondence with the King of Fernie. You have done me great wrongs, he wrote. I have forgiven them all, and I even wish to forget them. But if you had not had to do with a madman in love with your noble genius, you would not have gotten off so well. Do you want sweet things? Very well. I will tell you some truths. I esteem in you the finest genius that the ages have borne. I admire your poetry. I love your prose. Never has an author before you had a tact so keen, a taste so sure and delicate. You are charming in conversation. You know how to amuse and instruct at the same time. You are the most seductive being that I know, capable of making yourself loved by all the world when you choose. You have such graces of mind that you can offend, and yet at the same time deserve the indulgence of those who know you. In short, you would be perfect if you were not a man. Who would have expected so gay a host to become the exponent of pessimism? In youth, as a reveler in Paris's salons, he had seen the sunnier side of life despite the Bastille. And yet, even in those careless days, he had rebelled against the unnatural optimism to which Leibniz had given currency. To an ardent young man who had attacked him in print and had contended with Leibniz that this is the best of all possible worlds, Voltaire wrote, I am pleased to hear, sir, that you have written the little book against me. You do me too much honor. When you have shown in verse or otherwise why so many men cut their throats in the best of all possible worlds, I shall be exceedingly obliged to you. I await your arguments, your verses, and your abuse, and assure you from the bottom of my heart that neither of us knows anything about the matter. I have the honor to be, etc. Persecution and disillusionment had worn down his faith in life, and his experiences at Berlin and Frankfurt had taken the edge from his hope. But both faith and hope suffered most when, in November 1755, came the news of the awful earthquake at Lisbon, in which 30,000 people had been killed. The quake had come on All Saints' Day, the churches had been crowded with worshippers, and death, finding its enemies in close formation, had reaped a rich harvest. Voltaire was shocked into seriousness and raged when he heard that the French clergy were explaining the disaster as a punishment for the sins of the people of Lisbon. 
He broke forth in a passionate poem in which he gave vigorous expression to the old dilemma. Either God can prevent evil, and he will not, or he wishes to prevent it, and he cannot. He was not satisfied with Spinoza's answer that good and evil are human terms, inapplicable to the universe, and that our tragedies are trivial things in the perspective of eternity. I am a puny part of the great whole. Yes, but all animals condemned to live, all sentient things born by the same stern law, suffer like me, and like me also die. The vulture fastens on his timid prey and stabs with bloody beak the quivering limbs. All's well, it seems, for it. But in a while an eagle tears the vulture into shreds. The eagle is transfixed by shafts of man. The man prone in the dust of battlefields, mingling his blood with dying fellow men, becomes in turn the food of ravenous birds. Thus the whole world and every member groans, all born for torment and for mutual death. And o'er this ghastly chaos you would say, the ills of each make up the good of all. What blessedness! And as with quaking voice, mortal and pitiful ye cry, All's well! The universe belies you, and your heart refutes a hundred times your mind's conceit. What is the verdict of the vastest mind? Silence! The book of fate is closed to us. Man is a stranger to his own research. He knows not whence he comes, nor whither goes. Tormented atoms in a bed of mud, devoured by death, a mockery of fate. But thinking atoms, whose far-seeing eyes, guided by thoughts, have measured the faint stars. Our being mingles with the infinite, ourselves we never see or come to know. This world, this theater of pride and wrong, swarms with sick fools who talk of happiness. Once did I sing in less lugubrious tone the sunny ways of pleasure's general rule. The times have changed and taught by growing age and sharing of the frailty of mankind. Seeking a light amid the deepening gloom, I can but suffer and will not repine. A few months later, the Seven Years' War broke out. Voltaire looked upon it as madness and suicide, the devastation of Europe to settle whether England or France should win. A few acres of snow in Canada. On the top of this came a public reply by Jean-Jacques Rousseau to the poem on Lisbon. Man himself was to be blamed for the disaster, said Rousseau. If we lived out in the fields and not in the towns, we should not be killed on so large a scale. If we lived under the sky and not in houses, houses would not fall upon us. Voltaire was amazed at the popularity won by this profound theodicy, and angry that his name should be dragged into the dust by such a Quixote. He turned upon Rousseau. That most terrible of all the intellectual weapons ever wielded by man, the mockery of Voltaire. In three days in 1751, he wrote Candide, Never was pessimism so gaily argued. Never was man made to laugh so heartily while learning that this is a world of woe. And seldom has a story been told with such simple and hidden art. It is pure narrative and dialogue, no descriptions padded out, and the action is riotously rapid. In Voltaire's fingers, said Anatoly France, the pen runs and laughs. It is perhaps the finest short story in all literature. Candide, as his name indicates, is a simple and honest lad, son of the great baron of Thunder Ten Troc of Westphalia and pupil of the learned Pangloss. Pangloss was professor of metaphysical theological cosmonogology. It is demonstrable, said he, that all is necessarily for the best end. Observe that the nose has been formed to bear spectacles. Legs were visibly designed for stockings. Stones were designed to construct castles. Pigs were made so that we might have pork all the year round. Consequently, they who assert that all is well have said a foolish thing. They should have said all is for the best. While Pangloss is discoursing, the castle is attacked by the Bulgarian army, and Candide is captured and turned into a soldier. He was made to wheel about to the right and to the left, to draw his rammer, to return his rammer, to present, to fire, to march, 
He resolved one fine day in spring to go for a walk, marching straight before him, believing that it was a privilege of the human as well as the animal species to make use of their legs as they pleased. He had advanced two leagues when he was overtaken by four heroes six feet tall, who bound him and carried him to a dungeon. He was asked which he would like the best, to be whipped six and thirty times through all the regiment, or to receive at once two balls of lead in his brain. He vainly said that human will is free and that he chose neither, the one nor the other. He was forced to make a choice. He determined, in virtue of that gift of God called liberty, to run the gauntlet six and thirty times. He bore this twice. Candide escapes, takes passage to Lisbon, and on board ship meets Professor Pangloss, who tells how the Baron and Baroness were murdered and the castle destroyed. All this, he concludes, was indispensable, for private misfortune makes the general good, so that the more private misfortunes there are, the greater is the general good. They arrive in Lisbon just in time to be caught in the earthquake. After it is over, they tell each other their adventures and sufferings, whereupon an old servant assures them that their misfortunes are as nothing compared with their own. A hundred times I was on the point of killing myself, but I loved life. This ridiculous foible is perhaps one of our most fatal characteristics. Or is there anything more absurd to wish to carry continually a burden which one can always throw down? Or, as another character expresses it, All things considered, the life of a gondolier is preferable to that of a doge. But I believe the difference is so trifling that it is not worth the trouble of examining. Candide, fleeing from the Inquisition, goes to Paraguay. There the Jesuit fathers possess all and the people nothing. It is a masterpiece of reason and justice. In a Dutch colony, he comes upon a Negro with one hand, one leg, and a rag for clothing. When we work at the sugar canes, the slave explains, and the mill snatches hold of a finger, they cut off a hand, and when we try to run away, they cut off a leg. This is the price at which you eat sugar in Europe. Candide finds much loose gold in the unexplored interior. He returns to the coast and hires a vessel to take him to France. But the skipper sails off with the gold and leaves Candide, philosophizing on the wharf. With what little remains to him, Candide purchases a passage on a ship bound for Bordeaux, and on board strikes up a conversation with an old sage, Martin. Do you believe, said Candide, that men have always massacred one another as they do today? That they have always been liars, cheats, traitors, ingrates, brigands, idiots, thieves, scoundrels, gluttons, drunkards, misers, envious, ambitious, bloody-minded, calumniators, debauchees, fanatics, hypocrites, and fools? Do you believe, said Martin, that hawks have always eaten pigeons when they have found them? Without doubt, said Candide. Well then, said Martin, if hawks have always had the same character, why should you imagine that men have changed theirs? Oh, said Candide, there is a vast deal of difference for free will. And reasoning thus they arrived at Bordeaux. We cannot follow Candide through the rest of his adventures, which form a rollicking commentary on the difficulties of medieval theology and Leibnizian optimism. After suffering a variety of evils among a variety of men, Candide settles down as a farmer in Turkey, and the story ends with a final dialogue between master and pupil. Pangloss sometimes said to Candide, There is a concatenation of events in this best of all possible worlds, for if you had not been kicked out of a magnificent castle, if you had not been put into the Inquisition, if you had not walked over America, if you had not lost all your gold, you would not be here eating preserved citrons and pistachio nuts. All that is very well, answered Candide, but let us cultivate our garden. Seven, the Encyclopedia and the Philosophic Dictionary. The popularity of so irreverent a book as Candide gives us some sense of the spirit of the age. The lordly culture of Louis XIV's time, despite the massive bishops who spoke so eloquent a part in it, had learned to smile at dogma and tradition. 
The failure of the Reformation to capture France had left for Frenchmen no halfway house between infallibility and infidelity. And while the intellect of Germany and England moved leisurely in the lines of religious evolution, the mind of France leaped from the hot faith which had massacred the Huguenots to the cold hostility with which Le Maitre, Helvetius, Holbach, and Diderot turned upon the religion of their fathers. Let us look for a moment at the intellectual environment in which the later Voltaire moved and had his being. Le Maitre, 1709-51, was an army physician who had lost his post by writing A Natural History of the Soul and had won exile by a work called Man a Machine. He had taken refuge at the court of Frederick, who was himself something of an advanced thinker and was resolved to have the very latest culture from Paris. Lemaitre took up the idea of mechanism, where the frightened Descartes, like a boy who has burned his fingers, had dropped it, and announced boldly that all the world, not excepting man, was a machine. The soul is material, and matter is soulful. But whatever they are, they act upon each other and grow and decay with each other in a way that leaves no doubt of their essential similarity and interdependence. If the soul is pure spirit, how can enthusiasm warm the body or fever in the body disturb the processes of the mind? All organisms have evolved out of one original germ through the reciprocal action of organism and environment. The reason why animals have intelligence and plants none is that animals move about for their food while plants take what comes to them. Man has the highest intelligence because he has the greatest wants and the widest mobility. Beings without wants are also without mind. Though Le Maitre was exiled for these opinions, Helvetius, 1715-71, who took them as the basis of his book On Man, became one of the richest men in France and rose to position and honor. Here we have the ethic, as in Le Maitre, the metaphysic of atheism. All action is dictated by egoism, self-love, even the hero follows the feeling which for him is associated with the greatest pleasure. And virtue is egoism furnished with a spyglass. Conscience is not the voice of God, but the fear of the police. It is the deposit left in us from the stream of prohibitions poured over the growing soul by parents and teachers and press. Morality must be founded not on theology, but on sociology the changing needs of society and not any unchanging revelation or dogma must determine the good. The greatest figure in this group was Denis Diderot, 1713-84. His ideas were expressed in various fragments from his own pen and in the System of Nature of Baron Dolbach, 1723-89, whose salon was the center of Diderot's circle. If we go back to the beginning, says Holbach, we shall find that ignorance and fear created the gods, that fancy, enthusiasm, or deceit adorned or disfigured them, that weakness worships them, that credulity preserves them, and that custom respects and tyranny supports them in order to make the blindness of men serve its own interests. Belief in God, said Diderot, is bound up with submission to autocracy. The two rise and fall together. and. Men will never be free till the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last priest. The earth will come into its own only when heaven is destroyed. Materialism may be an oversimplification of the world. All matter is probably instinct with life, and it is impossible to reduce the unity of consciousness to matter and motion. But materialism is a good weapon against the church and must be used till a better one is found. Meanwhile, one must spread knowledge and encourage industry. Industry will make for peace, and knowledge will make a new and natural morality. These are the ideas which Diderot and de Lambert labored to disseminate through the great encyclopedia, which they issued volume by volume from 1752 to 1772. The church had the first volumes suppressed, and as the opposition increased, Diderot's comrades abandoned him but he worked on angrily, invigorated by his rage. I know nothing so indecent, he said, 
as these vague declamations of the theologians against reason. To hear them, one would suppose that men could not enter into the bosom of Christianity except as a herd of cattle enters a stable. It was, as Paine put it, the age of reason. These men never doubted that the intellect was the ultimate human test of all truth and all good. Let reason be freed, they said, and it would in a few generations build utopia. Diderot did not suspect that the erotic and neurotic Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712-78, to whom he had just introduced to Paris, was carrying in his head or in his heart the seeds of a revolution against this enthronement of reason, a revolution which, armed with the impressive obscurities of Immanuel Kant, would soon capture every citadel of philosophy. Naturally enough, Voltaire, who was interested in everything and had a hand in every fight, was caught up for a time in the circle of the encyclopedists. They were glad to call him their leader, and he was not averse to their incense. Though some of their ideas needed a little pruning, they asked him to write articles for their great undertaking, and he responded with a facility and fertility which delighted them. When he had finished this work, he set about making an encyclopedia of his own, which he called a philosophic dictionary. With unprecedented audacity, he took subject after subject as the alphabet suggested them and poured out under each heading part of his inexhaustible resources of knowledge and wisdom. Imagine a man writing on everything and producing a classic nonetheless. The most readable and sparkling of Voltaire's works aside from his romances, every article a model of brevity, clarity, and wit. Some men can be prolix in one small volume. Voltaire is terse through a hundred. Here at last Voltaire proves that he is a philosopher. He begins like Bacon, Descartes, and Locke and all the moderns with doubt and a supposedly clean slate. I have taken as my patron saint, St. Thomas of Didymus, who always insisted on an examination with his own hands. He thanks Bale for having taught him the art of doubt. He rejects all systems and suspects that every chief of a sect in philosophy has been a little of a quack. The further I go, the more I am confirmed in the idea that systems of metaphysics are for philosophers what novels are for women. It is only charlatans who are certain. We know nothing of first principles. It is truly extravagant to define God, angels, and minds, and to know precisely why God formed the world, when we do not know why we move our arms at will. Doubt is not a very agreeable state, but certainty is a ridiculous one. I do not know how I was made and how I was born. I did not know at all during a quarter of my life the causes of what I saw or heard or felt. I have seen that which is called matter, both as the star Sirius and as the smallest atom which can be perceived with the microscope, and I do not know what this matter is. He tells a story of the good Brahmin, who says, I wish I'd never been born. Why so? said I. Because, he replied, I have been studying these forty years, and I find that it has been so much time lost. I believe that I am composed of matter, but I have never been able to satisfy myself what it is that produces thought. I am even ignorant whether my understanding is a simple faculty like that of walking or digesting or if I think with my head in the same manner as I take hold of a thing with my hands. I talk a great deal, and when I am done speaking, I remain confounded and ashamed of what I have said. The same day I had a conversation with an old woman, his neighbor. I asked her if she had ever been unhappy for not understanding how her soul was made. She did not even comprehend my question. She had not for the briefest moment in her life had a thought about these subjects with which the good Brahmin had so tormented himself. She believed the bottom of her heart and the metamorphosis of Vishnu and provided she could get some of the sacred water of the Ganges in which to make her ablutions, she thought herself the happiest of women. Struck with the happiness of this poor creature, I returned to my philosopher, whom I thus addressed. Are you not ashamed to be thus miserable when not fifty yards from you 
There is an old automaton who thinks of nothing and lives contented? You are right, he replied. I've said to myself a thousand times that I should be happy if I were but as ignorant as my old neighbor. And yet it is a happiness which I do not desire. This reply of the Brahmin made a greater impression on me than anything that had passed. Even if philosophy should end in the total doubt of Montaigne's que sais je, it is man's greatest adventure and his noblest. Let us learn how to be content with modest advances in knowledge, rather than be forever wearing new systems out of our mendacious imagination. We must not say, let us begin by inventing principles whereby we may be able to explain everything. Rather, we must say, let us make an exact analysis of the matter, and then we shall try to see with much diffidence if it fits with any principle. The Chancellor Bacon had shown the road which science might follow, but then Descartes appeared and did just the contrary of what he should have done. Instead of studying nature, he wished to divine her. The best of mathematicians made only romances in philosophy. It is given us to calculate, to weigh, to measure, to observe. This is natural philosophy. Almost all the rest is chimera. Eight, écrasé l'enfant. Under ordinary circumstances, it is probable that Voltaire would have never have passed out of the philosophic calm of this courteous skepticism to the arduous controversies of his later years. The aristocratic circles in which he moved agreed so readily with his point of view that there was no incentive to polemics. Even the priests smiled with him over the difficulties of the faith, and cardinals considered whether, after all, they might not yet make him into a good capuchin. What were the events that turned him from the polite persiflage of agnosticism to a bitter anti-clericalism, which admitted no compromise, but waged relentless war to crush the infamy of ecclesiasticism? Not far from Ferny, the Toulouse, the seventh city of France. In Voltaire's day, the Catholic clergy enjoyed absolute sovereignty there. The city commemorated with frescoes the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, an edict which had given freedom of worship to Protestants, and celebrated as a great feast the day of the massacre of St. Bartholomew. No Protestant in Toulouse could be a lawyer, or a physician, or an apothecary, or a grocer, or a bookseller, or a printer. Nor could a Catholic keep a Protestant servant or clerk. In 1748, a woman had been fined 3,000 francs for using a Protestant midwife. Now it happened that Jean Calais, a Protestant of Toulouse, had a daughter who became a Catholic and a son who hanged himself, presumably because of disappointment in business. There was a law in Toulouse that every suicide should be placed naked on a hurdle, with face down, drawn thus through the streets, and then hanged on a gibbet. The father, to avert this, asked his relatives and his friends to testify to a natural death. In consequence, rumor began to talk of murder, and to hint that the father had killed the son to prevent his imminent conversion to Catholicism. Calais was arrested, put to the torture, and died soon after, 1761. His family, ruined and hunted, fled to Fernie and sought the aid of Voltaire. He took them into his home, comforted them, and marveled at the story of medieval persecution which they told. About the same time, 1762, came the death of Elizabeth Servans. Again, rumored charge that she had been pushed into a well just as she was about to announce her conversion to Catholicism. That a timid minority of Protestants would hardly dare to behave in this way was a rational consideration, and therefore out of the purview of rumor. In 1765, a young man by the name of Labar, aged 16, was arrested on the charge of having mutilated crucifixes. Subjected to torture, he confessed his guilt. His head was cut off and his body was flung into the flames while the crowd applauded. A copy of Voltaire's philosophic dictionary, which had been found on the lad, was burned with him. For almost the first time in his life, Voltaire became a thoroughly serious man. When D'Alembert, disgusted equally with state, church, and people, wrote that hereafter he would merely mock at everything, Voltaire answered, This is not a time for jesting. Wit does not harmonize with massacres. 
Is this the country of philosophy and pleasure? It is rather the country of the massacre of St. Bartholomew. It was with Voltaire now, as with Zola and Anatoly France, in the case of Dreyfus, this tyrannous injustice lifted him up. He ceased to be merely a man of letters and became a man of action, too. He laid aside philosophy for war, or rather turned his philosophy into relentless dynamite. During this time, not a smile escaped me without my reproaching myself for it as for a crime. It was now that he adopted his famous motto, Ecrase l'enfant, and stirred the soul of France against the abuses of the church. He began to pour forth such intellectual fire and brimstone as melted mitres and scepters broke the power of the priesthood in France, and helped to overthrow a throne. He sent out a call to his friends and followers, summoning them to battle. Come, brave Diderot, intrepid de Lambert, ally yourselves. Overwhelm the fanatics and the knaves, destroy the insipid declamations, the miserable sophistries, the lying history, the absurdities without number. Do not let those who have sense be subjected to those who have none and the generation which is being born will owe to us its reason and its liberty. Just at this crisis, an effort was made to buy him off. Through Madame de Pompadour, he received an offer of a cardinal's hat as the reward of reconciliation with the church. As if the rule of a few tongue-tied bishops could interest a man who was the undisputed sovereign of the world of intellect, Voltaire refused, and like another Cato, began to end all his letters with, Crush the infamy. He sent out his Treatise on Toleration. He said he would have borne with the absurdities of dogma had the clergy lived up to their sermons and had they tolerated differences. But, Subtleties, of which not a trace can be found in the Gospels, are the source of the bloody quarrels of Christian history. The man who says to me, Believe as I do, or God will damn you, will presently say, Believe as I do, or I shall assassinate you. By what right could a being created free force another to think like himself? A fanaticism composed of superstition and ignorance has been the sickness of all the centuries. No such perpetual peace as the Abbe de Saint-Pierre had pleaded for could ever be realized unless men learned to tolerate one another's philosophic political and religious differences. The very first step towards social health was the destruction of the ecclesiastical power in which tolerance had its root. The Treatise on Toleration was followed up with a Niagara of pamphlets, histories, dialogues, letters, catechisms, diatribes, squibs, sermons, verses, tales, fables, commentaries, and essays, under Voltaire's own name and under a hundred pseudonyms. The most astonishing pell-mell of propaganda ever put out by one man. Never was philosophy phrased so clearly and with such life. Voltaire writes so well that one does not realize that he is writing philosophy. He said of himself over-modestly, I express myself clearly enough. I am like the little brooks, which are transparent because they are not deep. And so he was read, soon everybody. Even the clergy had his pamphlets. Of some of them, 300,000 copies were sold, though readers were far fewer then than now. Nothing like it had ever been seen in the history of literature. Big books, he said, are out of fashion. And so he sent forth his little soldiers week after week, month after month, resolute and tireless, surprising the world with the fertility of his thought and the magnificent energy of his 70 years. As Helvetius put it, Voltaire had crossed the Rubicon and stood before Rome. He began with a higher criticism of the authenticity and reliability of the Bible. He takes much of his material from Spinoza, more of it from the English deists, most of it from the Critical Dictionary of Bale, 1647-1706, but how brilliant and fiery their material becomes in his hands. One pamphlet is called the questions of Zapata, the candidate for the priesthood. Zapata asks innocently, How shall we proceed to show that the Jews, whom we burned by the hundred, were for four thousand years the chosen people of God? Note, 
Selected Works, page 26, Voltaire himself was something of an anti-Semite, chiefly because of his not quite admirable dealings with the financiers. And he goes on with questions which lay bare the inconsistencies of narrative and chronology in the Old Testament. When two councils anathematize each other, as has often happened, which of them is infallible? At last, Zapata, receiving no answer, took to preaching God in all simplicity. He announced to men the common father, the rewarder, punisher, and pardoner. He extricated the truth from the lies and separated religion from fanaticism. He taught and practiced virtue. He was gentle, kindly, and modest, and he was burned at Valladolid in the year of grace, 1631. Under the article on prophecy in the Philosophic Dictionary, he quotes Rabin Isaac's bulwark of faith against the application of Hebrew prophecies to Jesus, and then goes on ironically. Thus, these blind interpreters of their own religion and their own language combated with the church and obstinately maintained that this prophecy cannot in any manner regard Jesus Christ. Those were dangerous days in which one was compelled to say what one meant without saying it, and the shortest line to one's purpose was anything but straight. Voltaire likes to trace Christian dogmas and rites to Greece, Egypt, and India, and thinks these adaptations were not the least cause of the success of Christianity in the ancient world. Under the article on religion, he asks slyly, After our own holy religion, which doubtless is the only good one, what religion would be the least objectionable? And he proceeds to describe a faith and worship directly opposed to the Catholicism of his day. Christianity must be divine, he says, in one of his most unmeasured sallies. Since it has lasted 1,700 years, despite the fact that it is so full of villainy and nonsense, he shows how almost all ancient peoples had similar myths and hastily concludes that the myths are thereby proved to have been the inventions of priests. The first divine was the first rogue who met the first fool. However, it is not religion itself which he attributes to the priests, but theology. It is slight differences in theology that have caused so many bitter disputes and religious wars. It is not ordinary people who have raised these ridiculous and fatal quarrels, the sources of so many horrors. Men fed by your labors and a comfortable idleness, enriched by your sweat and your misery, struggled for partisans and slaves. They inspired you with a destructive fanaticism that they might be your masters. They made you superstitious, not that you might fear God, but that you might fear them. Let it not be supposed from all this that Voltaire was quite without religion. He decisively rejects atheism, so much so that some of the encyclopedists turned against him, saying that Voltaire is a bigot. He believes in God. In The Ignorant Philosopher, he reasons towards Spinozist pantheism, but then recoils from it as almost atheism. He writes to Diderot, I confess that I am not at all of the opinion of Saunderson, who denies a god because he was born sightless. I am, perhaps mistaken, but in his place I should recognize a great intelligence who had given me so many substitutes for sight, and perceiving, on reflection, the wonderful relations between all things, I should have suspected a workman infinitely able. If it is very presumptuous to divine what he is and why he has made everything that exists, so it seems to me very presumptuous to deny that he exists. I am exceedingly anxious to meet and talk with you, whether you think yourself one of his works or a particle drawn, of necessity, from eternal and necessary matter. Whatever you are, you are worthy part of that great whole which I do not understand. To Holbach, he points out that the very title of his book, The System of Nature, indicates a divine organizing intelligence. On the other hand, he stoutly denies miracles and the supernatural efficacy of prayer. I was at the gate of the convent when Sister Fessou said to Sister Confit, Providence takes a visible care of me. You know how I love my sparrow. He would not have been dead if I had not said nine Ava Marias to obtain his cure. A metaphysician said to her, 
Sister, there is nothing so good as Ava Maria's, especially when a girl pronounces them in Latin in the suburbs of Paris. But I cannot believe that God has occupied himself so much with your sparrow. Pretty as it is, I pray you to believe that he has other things to attend to. Sister Fessou, Sir, this discourse savors of heresy. My confessor will infer that you do not believe in providence. Metaphysician, I believe in a general providence, dear sister, which has laid down from all eternity the law which governs all things, like light from the sun. But I believe not that a particular providence changes the economy of the world for your sparrow. His sacred majesty chance decides everything. True prayer lies not in asking for a violation of natural law, but in the acceptance of natural law as the unchangeable will of God. Similarly, he denies free will. As to the soul, he is an agnostic. Four thousand volumes of metaphysics will not teach us what the soul is. Being an old man, he would like to believe in immortality, but he finds it difficult. Nobody thinks of giving an immortal soul to the flea. Why then to an elephant or a monkey or my valet? A child dies in its mother's womb just at the moment when it has received a soul. Will it rise again, fetus or boy or man? To rise again, to be the same person that you were, you must have your memory perfectly fresh and present. For it is memory that makes your identity. If your memory be lost, how will you be the same man? Why do mankind flatter themselves that they are alone gifted with a spiritual and immortal principle? Perhaps from their inordinate vanity. I am persuaded that if a peacock could speak, he would boast of his soul, and would affirm that it inhabited his magnificent tail. And in this earlier mood, he rejects also the view that belief in immortality is necessary for morality. The ancient Hebrews were without it, just when they were the chosen people and Spinoza was a paragon of morality. In later days, he changed his mind. He came to feel that belief in God has little moral value unless accompanied by a belief in an immortality of punishment and reward. Perhaps, for the common people, the canai, a rewarding and avenging God, is necessary. Baal had asked if a society of atheists could subsist. Voltaire answers, Yes, if they are also philosophers. But men are seldom philosophers. If there is a hamlet, to be good it must have a religion. I want my lawyer, my tailor, and my wife to believe in God. Says in A, B, C. So I imagine I shall be less robbed and less deceived. If God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. I begin to put more store on happiness and life than on truth. A remarkable anticipation in the midst of the Enlightenment, of the very doctrine with which Immanuel Kant was later to combat the Enlightenment. He defends himself gently against his friends, the atheists. He addresses Holbach in the article on God in the Dictionary. You yourself say that belief in God has kept some men from crime. This alone suffices me. When this belief prevents ten assassinations, ten calumnies, I hold that all the world should embrace it. Religion, you say, has produced countless misfortunes. Say rather the superstition which reigns on our unhappy globe. This is the cruelest enemy of the pure worship due to the supreme being. Let us detest this monster which has always torn the bosom of its mother. Those who combat it are the benefactors of the human race. It is a serpent which chokes religion in its embrace. We must crush its head without wounding the mother whom it devours. This distinction between superstition and religion is fundamental with him. He accepts gladly the theology of which the Sermon on the Mount and acclaims Jesus in tributes which could hardly be matched even with the pages of saintly ecstasy. He pictures Christ among the sages, weeping over the crimes that have been committed in his name. At last he built his own church with the dedication Dio Erexit Voltaire, the only church in Europe, he said, that was erected to God. He addresses to God a magnificent prayer, and in the article Theist he expounds his faith finally and clearly. 
The theist is a man firmly persuaded of the existence of a supreme being as good as he is powerful, who has formed all things, who punishes without cruelty all crimes and recompenses with goodness all virtuous actions. Reunited in this principle with the rest of the universe, he does not join any of the sects which all contradict one another. His religion is the most ancient and the most widespread. For the simple worship of a god preceded all the systems of the world. He speaks a language which all people understand. While they do not understand one another, he has brothers from Peking to Kayan, and he counts all the sages for his fellows. He believes that religion consists neither in the opinions of an unintelligible metaphysic, nor in vain shows, but in worship and in justice. To do good is his worship. To submit to God is his creed. The Mohammedan cries out to him, Beware if you fail to make the pilgrimage to Mecca. The priest says to him, Curse on you if you do not make the trip to Notre Dame de Lorette. He laughs at Lorette and at Mecca, but he succours the indigent and defends the oppressed. 9. Voltaire and Rousseau Voltaire was so engrossed in the struggle against ecclesiastical tyranny that, during the later decades of his life, he was compelled almost to withdraw from the war on political corruption and oppression. Politics is not in my line. I have always confined myself to doing my little best to make men less foolish and more honorable. He knew how complex a matter political philosophy can become, and he shed his certainties as he grew. I'm tired of all these people who govern states from the recesses of their garrets. These legislators who rule the world at two cents a sheet, unable to govern their wives or their households, they take great pleasure in regulating the universe. It is impossible to settle these matters with simple and general formula, or by dividing all people into fools and knaves on the one hand, and on the other, ourselves. Truth has not the name of a party. And he writes to Vovanarga. It is the duty of a man like you to have preferences, but not exclusions. Being rich, he inclines towards conservatism, for no worse reason than that which impels the hungry man to call for a change. His panacea is the spread of property. Ownership gives personality and an uplifting pride. The spirit of property doubles a man's strength. It is certain that the possessor of an estate will cultivate his own inheritance better than that of another. He refuses to excite himself about forms of government. Theoretically, he prefers a republic, but he knows its flaws. It permits factions which, if they do not bring on civil war, at least destroy national unity. It is suited only to small states protected by geographical situation, and as yet unspoiled and untorn with wealth. In general, men are rarely worthy to govern themselves. Republics are transient at best. They are the first form of society arising from the union of families. The American Indians lived in tribal republics, and Africa is full of such democracies. But differentiation of economic status puts an end to these egalitarian governments. And differentiation is the inevitable accompaniment of development. Which is better? he asks. A monarchy or a republic? And he replies, For four thousand years this question has been tossed about. Ask the rich for an answer. They all want aristocracy. Ask the people. They want democracy. Only the monarchs want monarchy. How then has it come about that almost the entire earth is governed by monarchs? Ask the rats who propose to hang a bell about the neck of the cat. But when a correspondent argues that monarchy is the best form of government, he answers, Provided Marcus Aurelius is monarch. For otherwise, what difference does it make to a poor man whether he is devoured by a lion or by a hundred rats? Likewise, he is almost indifferent to nationalities, like a traveled man. He has hardly any patriotism in the usual sense of that word. Patriotism commonly means, he says, that one hates every country but one's own. If a man wishes his country to prosper, but never at the expense of other countries, he is at the same time an intelligent patriot and a citizen of the universe. 
Like a good European, he praises England's literature and Prussia's king while France is at war with both England and Prussia. So long as nations make a practice of war, he says, there is not much to choose among them. For he hates war above all else. War is the greatest of all crimes, and yet there is no aggressor who does not color his crime with a pretext of justice. It is forbidden to kill. Therefore, all murderers are punished unless they kill in large numbers and to the sound of trumpets. He has a terrible general reflection on man at the end of the article on man in the dictionary. Twenty years are required to bring man from the state of a plant in which he exists in the womb of his mother and from the state of an animal, which is his condition in infancy, to a state in which the maturity of reason begins to make itself felt. Thirty centuries are necessary in which to discover even a little of his structure. An eternity would be required to know anything of his soul, but one moment suffices in which to kill him. Does he therefore think of revolution as a remedy? No. For first of all, he distrusts the people. When the people undertake to reason, all is lost. The great majority are always too busy to perceive the truth until change has made the truth an error, and their intellectual history is merely the replacement of one myth by another. When an old error is established, politics uses it as a morsel which the people have put into their own mouths, until another superstition comes along to destroy this one, and politics profits from the second error as it did from the first. And then again, inequality is written into the very structure of society and can hardly be eradicated while men are men and life is a struggle. Those who say that all men are equal speak the greatest truth if they mean that all men have an equal right to liberty, to the possession of their goods, and to the protection of the laws. But equality is at once the most natural and the most chimerical thing in the world. Natural when it is limited to rights, unnatural when it attempts to level goods and powers. Not all citizens can be equally strong, but they can all be equally free. It is this which the English have won. To be free is to be subject to nothing but the laws. This was the note of the liberals, of Turgot and Condorcet and Mirabeau, and the other followers of Voltaire, who hoped to make a peaceful revolution, it could not quite satisfy the oppressed, who called not so much for liberty as for equality, equality even at the cost of liberty. Rousseau, voice of the common man, sensitive to the class distinctions which met him at every turn, demanded a leveling. And when the revolution fell into the hands of his followers, Marat and Robespierre, equality had its turn and liberty was guillotined. Voltaire was skeptical of utopias to be fashioned by human legislators who would create a brand new world out of their imaginations. Society is a growth in time, not a syllogism in logic, and when the past is put out through the door, it comes in at the window. The problem is to show precisely by what changes we can diminish misery and injustice in the world in which we actually live. In the historical eulogy of reason, Truth, the daughter of reason, voices her joy at the accession of Louis XVI and her expectation of great reforms, to which reason replies, My daughter, you know well that I too desire these things and more, but all this requires time and thought. I am always happy when, amid many disappointments, I obtain some of the amelioration I longed for. Yet Voltaire too rejoiced when Turgot came to power and wrote, We are in the golden age up to our necks. Now would come the reforms he had advocated, juries, abolition of the tithe, and exemption of the poor from all taxes, etc. And had he not written that famous letter? Everything that I see appears to be throwing broadcast the seed of a revolution, which must some day inevitably come, but which I shall not have the pleasure of witnessing. The French always come late to things, but they do come at last. Light extends so from neighbor to neighbor that there will be a splendid outburst on the first occasion, and then there will be a rare commotion. The young are fortunate. They will see fine things. Yet he did not quite realize what was happening about him, 
and he never for a moment supposed that in this splendid outburst all France would accept enthusiastically the philosophy of this queer Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who, from Geneva and Paris, was thrilling the world with sentimental romances and revolutionary pamphlets. The complex soul of France seemed to have divided itself into these two men, so different and yet so French. Nietzsche speaks of La Gaia Scienza, the light feet, wit, fire, grace, strong logic, arrogant intellectuality, the dance of the stars. Surely he was thinking of Voltaire. Now beside Voltaire put Rousseau, all heat and fantasy, a man with noble and jejun visions, the idol of la bourgeoisie gentile femme, announcing like Pascal that the heart has its reasons which the head can never understand. In these two men we see again the old clash between intellect and instinct. Voltaire believed in reason always. We can, by speech and pen, make men more enlightened and better. Rousseau had little faith in reason. He desired action. The risks of revolution did not frighten him. He relied on the sentiment of brotherhood to reunite the social elements scattered by turmoil and the uprooting of ancient habits. Let laws be removed and men would pass into a reign of equality and justice. When he sent to Voltaire his discourse on the origin of inequality, with its arguments against civilization, letters, and science, and for a return to the natural condition as seen in savages and animals, Voltaire replied, I have received, sir, your new book against the human species, and I thank you for it. No one has ever been so witty as you are in trying to turn us into brutes. To read your book makes one long to go on all fours. As, however, it is now some sixty years since I gave up the practice, I feel that it is unfortunately impossible for me to resume it. He was chagrined to see Rousseau's passion for savagery continue into the social contract. Ah, monsieur, he writes to Monsieur Baudet's. You see now that Jean-Jacques resembles a philosopher as a monkey resembles a man. He is the dog of Diogenes gone mad. Yet he attacked the Swiss authorities for burning the book holding to his famous principle. I do not agree with a word that you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And when Rousseau was fleeing from a hundred enemies, Voltaire sent him a cordial invitation to come and stay with him at Les Delis. What a spectacle that would have been. Voltaire was convinced that all this denunciation of civilization was boyish nonsense, that man was incomparably better off under civilization than under savagery. He informs Rousseau that man is by nature a beast of prey, and that civilized society means a chaining of this beast, a mitigation of his brutality, and the possibility of the development through social order of the intellect and its joys. He agrees that things are bad. A government in which it is permitted a certain class of men to say, let those pay taxes who work. We should not pay because we do not work. It is no better than a government of Hottentots. Paris, as its redeeming features, even amidst its corruption. In The World As It Goes, Voltaire tells us how an angel sent Babouk to report on whether the city of Persepolis should be destroyed. Babouk goes and is horrified with the vices he discovers. But after a time, he began to grow fond of a city, the inhabitants of which were polite, affable, and beneficent. Though they were fickle, slanderous, and vain, he was much afraid that Persepolis would be condemned. He was even afraid to give in his account. This he did, however, in the following manner. He caused a little statue composed of different metals, of earth and of stones, the most precious and the most vile, to be cast by one of the best founders of the city and carried it to the angel. Wilt thou break, said he, this pretty statue, because it is not wholly composed of gold and diamonds? The angel resolved to think no more of destroying Persepolis, but to leave the world as it goes. After all, when one tries to change institutions without having changed the nature of men, that unchanged nature will soon resurrect those institutions. Here was the old vicious circle, 
Men form institutions, and institutions form men. Where could change break into this ring? Voltaire and the liberals thought that intellect could break the ring by educating and changing men slowly and peacefully. Rousseau and the radicals felt that the ring could be broken only by instinctive and passionate action that would break down the old institutions and build, at the dictates of the heart, new ones under which liberty, equality, and fraternity would reign. Perhaps the truth lay above the divided camps. That instinct must destroy the old, but that only intellect can build the new. Certainly, the seeds of reaction lay fertile in the radicalism of Rousseau, for instinct and sentiment are ultimately loyal to the ancient past which has begotten them, and to which they are stereotyped adaptations. After the catharsis of revolution, the needs of the heart would recall supernatural religion and the good old days of routine and peace. After Rousseau would come Chateaubriand and De Stael and De Maistre and Kant. Ten. Denouement. Meanwhile, the old laughing philosopher was cultivating his garden at Fernie. This is the best thing we can do on earth. He had asked for a long life. My fear is that I shall die before I have rendered service. But surely now he has done his share. The records of his generosity are endless. Everyone, far or near, claimed his good offices. People consulted him, related the wrongs of which they were the victims, and solicited the help of his pen and his credit. Poor people guilty of some misdemeanor were his especial care. He would secure a pardon for them and then set them up in some honest occupation, meanwhile watching and counseling them. When a young couple who had robbed him went down on their knees to beg his forgiveness, he knelt to raise them, telling them that his pardon was freely theirs and that they should kneel only for gods. One of the characteristic undertakings was to bring up, educate, and provide a dowry for the destitute niece of Cornille. The little good I have done, he said is my best work. When I am attacked, I fight like a devil. I yield to no one. But at bottom, I am a good devil, and I end by laughing. In 1770, his friends arranged a subscription to have a bust made of him. The rich had to be forbidden to give more than a mite, for thousands asked the honor of contributing. Frederick inquired how much he should give, he was told. A crown piece, sire. And your name. Voltaire congratulated him on adding to his cultivation of the other sciences this encouragement of anatomy by subscribing for the statue of a skeleton. He demurred to the whole undertaking on the ground that he had no face left to be modeled. You would hardly guess where it ought to be. My eyes have sunk in three inches. My cheeks are like old parchment. The few teeth I had are gone. To which de Lambert replied, Genius has always a countenance which genius, its brother, will easily find. When his pet, Bellet Bon, kissed him, he said it was life kissing death. He was now 83, and a longing came over him to see Paris before he died. The doctors advised him not to undertake so arduous a trip. But, if I want to commit a folly, he answered, Nothing will prevent me. He had lived so long and worked so hard that perhaps he felt he had a right to die in his own way. And in that electric Paris from which he had been so long exiled. And so he went, weary mile after weary mile across France. And when his coach entered the capital, his bones hardly held together. He went at once to the friend of his youth, D'Argental. I have left off dying to come and see you he said. The next day his room was stormed by three hundred visitors who welcomed him as a king. Louis XVI fretted with jealousy. Benjamin Franklin was among the callers and brought his grandson for Voltaire's blessing. The old man put his thin hands upon the youth's head and bade him dedicate himself to God and liberty. He was so ill now that a priest came to shrive him. From whom do you come, Monsieur l'Abbé? asked Voltaire. 
from God himself, was the answer. Well, well, sir, said Voltaire. Your credentials? The priest went away without his prey. Later, Voltaire sent for another abbe, Gautier, to come and hear his confession. Gautier came, but refused Voltaire absolution until he should sign a profession of full faith in Catholic doctrine. Voltaire rebelled. Instead, he drew up a statement which he gave to his secretary, Wagner. I die adoring God, loving my friends, not hating my enemies, and detesting superstition. Signed, Voltaire, February 28, 1778. Though sick and tottering, he was driven to the academy. Through tumultuous crowds that clamored on his carriage and tore into sovereigns the precious police, which Catherine of Russia had given him. It was one of the historic events of the century. No great captain returning from a prolonged campaign of difficulty and hazard, crowned by the most glorious victory, ever received a more splendid and far-resounding greeting. At the Academy, he proposed a revision of the French Dictionary. He spoke with youthful fire and offered to undertake all such part of the work as would come under the letter A. At the close of the sitting, he said, Gentlemen, I thank you in the name of the alphabet. To which the chairman, Chastelieu, replied, And we thank you in the name of letters. Meanwhile, his play, Irene, was being performed at the theater. Against the advice of the physicians again, he insisted on attending. The play was poor, but people marveled not so much that a man of 83 should write a poor play, but that he should write any play at all and they drowned the speech of the players with repeated demonstrations in honor of the author. A stranger, entering, supposed himself to be in a madhouse and rushed back frightened into the street. When the old patriarch of letters went home that evening, he was almost reconciled to death. He knew that he was exhausted now, that he had used to the full that wild and marvelous energy which nature had given to him, perhaps more than to any man before him. He struggled as he felt life being torn from him. But death could defeat even Voltaire. The end came on May 30, 1778. He was refused Christian burial in Paris, but his friends set him up grimly in a carriage and got him out of the city by pretending that he was alive. At Cillier, they found a priest who understood that the rules were not made for geniuses. And the body was buried in holy ground. In 1791, the National Assembly of the Triumphant Revolution forced Louis XVI to recall Voltaire's remains to the Pantheon. The dead ashes of the great flame that had been were escorted through Paris by a procession of a 100,000 men and women, while 600,000 flanked the streets. On the funeral car were the words, He gave the human mind a great impetus. He prepared us for freedom. On his tombstone, only three words were necessary. Here lies Voltaire. Chapter 6. Immanuel Kant and German Idealism 1. Roads to Kant Never has a system of thought so dominated an epoch as the philosophy of Immanuel Kant dominated the thought of the 19th century. After almost threescore years of quiet and secluded development, the uncanny Scott of Konigsberg roused the world from its dogmatic slumber in 1781 with his famous critique of pure reason. And from that year to our own, the critical philosophy has ruled the speculative roost of Europe. The philosophy of Schopenhauer rose to brief power on the romantic wave that broke in 1848. The theory of evolution swept everything before it after 1859, and the exhilarating iconoclasm of Nietzsche won the center of the philosophic stage as the century came to a close. But these were secondary and surface developments. Underneath them, the strong and steady current of the Kantian movement flowed on, always wider and deeper. Until today, its essential theorems are the axioms of all mature philosophy. Nietzsche takes Kant for granted and passes on. Schopenhauer calls the critique the most important work in German literature and considers any man a child until he has understood Kant. 
Spencer could not understand Kant, and for precisely that reason, perhaps, fell a little short of the fullest philosophic stature. To adapt Hegel's phrase about Spinoza, to be a philosopher one must first have been a Kantian. Therefore, let us become Kantians at once. But it cannot be done at once, apparently. For in philosophy, as in politics, the longest distance between two points is a straight line. Kant is the last person in the world whom we should read on Kant. Our philosopher is like and unlike Jehovah. He speaks through clouds, but without the illumination of the lightning flash. He disdains examples and the concrete. They would have made his book too long, he argued. So abbreviated it contains some 800 pages. Only professional philosophers were expected to read him, and these would not need illustrations. Yet when Kant gave the MS of the critique to his friend Hertz, a man much versed in speculation, Hertz returned it half-read, saying he feared insanity if he went on with it. What shall we do with such a philosopher? Let us approach him deviously and cautiously, beginning at a safe and respectful distance from him. Let us start at various points on the circumference of the subject, and then grope our way towards that subtle center where the most difficult of all philosophies has its secret and its treasure. 1. From Voltaire to Kant The road here is from theoretical reason without religious faith to religious faith without theoretical reason. Voltaire means the Enlightenment, the Encyclopedia, the Age of Reason. The warm enthusiasm of Francis Bacon had inspired all Europe, except Rousseau, with unquestioning confidence in the power of science and logic to solve at last all problems and illustrate the infinite perfectibility of man. Condorcet, in prison, wrote his historical tableau of the progress of the human spirit, 1793 which spoke the sublime trust of the 18th century in knowledge and reason, and asked no other key to utopia than universal education. Even the steady Germans had their Alf Clarum, their rationalist Christian Wolf, and their hopeful Lessing. And the excitable Parisians of the Revolution dramatized this apotheosis of the intellect by worshipping the goddess of reason, impersonated by a charming lady of the streets. In Spinoza, this faith in reason had begotten a magnificent structure of geometry and logic. The universe was a mathematical system and could be described a priori by pure deduction from accepted axioms. In Hobbes, the rationalism of Bacon had become an uncompromising atheism and materialism. Again, nothing was to exist but atoms and the void. From Spinoza to Diderot, the wrecks of faith lay in the wake of advancing reason. One by one, the old dogmas disappeared. The Gothic cathedral of medieval belief, with its delightful details and grotesques, collapsed. The ancient god fell from his throne along with the Bourbons. Heaven faded into mere sky, and hell became only an emotional expression. Helvetius and Holbach made atheism so fashionable in the salons of France that even the clergy took it up and Lemaitre went to peddle it in Germany under the auspices of Prussia's king. When, in 1784, Lessing shocked Jacobi by announcing himself a follower of Spinoza, it was a sign that faith had reached its nadir and that reason was triumphant. David Hume, who played so vigorous a role in the Enlightenment assault on supernatural belief, said that when reason is against a man, he will soon turn against reason. Religious faith and hope, voiced in a hundred thousand steeples rising out of the soil of Europe everywhere, were too deeply rooted in the institutions of society and in the heart of man to permit their ready surrender to the hostile verdict of reason. It was inevitable that this faith and this hope, so condemned, would question the competence of the judge and would call for an examination of reason as well as of religion. What was this intellect that proposed to destroy with a syllogism the beliefs of thousands of years and millions of men? Was it infallible? Or was it one human organ like any other, with strictest limits to its functions and its powers? The time had come to judge this judge, to examine this ruthless revolutionary tribunal that was dealing out death so lavishly to every ancient hope. 
The time had come for a critique of reason. Two. From Locke to Kant. The way had been prepared for such an examination by the work of Locke, Berkeley, and Hume, and yet apparently the results were too hostile to religion. John Locke, 1632-1704, had proposed to apply to psychology the inductive tests and methods of Francis Bacon. In his great essay on human understanding, 1689, reason for the first time in modern thought had turned in upon itself and philosophy had begun to scrutinize the instrument which it so long had trusted. This introspection movement in philosophy grew step by step with the introspective novel as developed by Richardson and Rousseau. Just as the sentimental and emotional color of Clarissa Harlow and La Nouvelle Heloise had its counterpart in the philosophic exaltation of instinct and feeling above intellect and reason. How does knowledge arise? Have we, as some good people suppose, innate ideas as, for example, of right and wrong and God? Ideas inherent in the mind from birth prior to all experience? Anxious theologians, worried lest belief in the deity should disappear because God had not yet been seen in any telescope, had thought that faith and morals might be strengthened if their central and basic ideas were shown to be inborn in every normal soul. But Locke, good Christian though he was, ready to argue most eloquently for the reasonableness of Christianity, could not accept these suppositions. He announced quietly that all our knowledge comes from experience and through our senses. That there is nothing in the mind except what was first in the senses. This mind is at birth a clean sheet, a tabula rasa and sense experience writes upon it in a thousand ways until sensation begets memory and memory begets ideas. All of which seem to lead to the startling conclusion that since only material things can affect our sense, we know nothing but matter and must accept a materialistic philosophy. If sensations are the stuff of thought, the hasty argued matter must be the material of mind. Not at all, said Bishop George Berkeley, 1684 to 1753. This Lockean analysis of knowledge proves rather that matter does not exist except as a form of mind. It was a brilliant idea to refute materialism by the simple expedient of showing that we know of no such thing as matter. In all Europe, only a Gaelic imagination could have conceived this metaphysical magic. But see how obvious it is, said the bishop. Has not Locke told us that all our knowledge is derived from sensation? Therefore, all our knowledge of anything is merely our sensations of it, and the idea is derived from these sensations. A thing is merely a bundle of perceptions, i.e. classified and interpreted sensations. You protest that your breakfast is much more substantial than a bundle of perceptions, and that a hammer that teaches you carpentry through your thumb has a most magnificent materiality. But your breakfast is at first nothing but a congeries of sensations of sight and smell and touch, and then of taste, and then of internal comfort and warmth. Likewise, the hammer is a bundle of sensations of color, size, shape, weight, touch, etc. Its reality for you is not in its materiality, but in the sensations that come from your thumb. If you had no senses, the hammer would not exist for you at all. It might strike your dead thumb forever, and yet win from you not the slightest attention. It is only a bundle of sensations, or a bundle of memories. It is a condition of the mind. All matter, so far as we know it, is a mental condition, and the only reality that we know directly is mind. So much for materialism. But the Irish bishop had reckoned without the Scotch skeptic. David Hume, 1711-1776, at the age of 26, shocked all Christendom with his highly heretical Treatise on Human Nature, one of the classics and marvels of modern philosophy. We know the mind, said Hume, only as we know matter, by perception, though it be in the case internal. Never do we perceive any such entity as the mind. We perceive merely separate ideas, memories, feelings, etc., the mind is not a substance, an organ that has ideas. It is only an abstract name for the series of ideas. 
The perceptions, memories, and feelings are the mind. There is no observable soul behind the processes of thought. The result appeared to be that Hume had as effectively destroyed mind as Berkeley had destroyed matter. Nothing was left, and philosophy found itself in the midst of ruins of its own making. No wonder that a wit advised the abandonment of the controversy, saying, No matter, never mind. But Hume was not content to destroy orthodox religion by dissipating the concept of soul. He proposed also to destroy science by dissolving the concept of law. Science and philosophy alike, since Bruno and Galileo had been making much of natural law, of necessity and the sequence of effect upon cause, Spinoza had reared his majestic metaphysics upon the proud conception. But observe, said Hume, that we never perceive causes or laws, we perceive events and sequences, and infer causation and necessity. A law is not an eternal and necessary decree to which events are subjected, but merely a mental summary and shorthand of our kaleidoscopic experience. We have no guarantee that the sequences hitherto observed will reappear unaltered in future experience. Law is an observed custom in the sequence of events, but there is no necessity in custom. Only mathematical formulas have necessity. They alone are inherently and unchangeably true, and this merely because such formula are tautological. The predicate is already contained in the subject, 3 times 3 equals 9, is an eternal and necessary truth only because 3 times 3 and 9 are one and the same thing differently expressed. The predicate adds nothing to the subject. Science, then, must limit itself strictly to mathematics and direct experiment. It cannot trust to unverified deduction from laws. When we run through libraries persuaded of these principles, writes our uncanny skeptic, what havoc must we make? If we take in our hands any volume of school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. Imagine how the ears of the Orthodox tingled at these words. Here, the epistemological tradition, the inquiry into the nature, sources, and validity of knowledge, had ceased to be a support to religion. The sword with which Bishop Berkeley had slain the dragon of materialism had turned against the immaterial mind and the immortal soul. And in the turmoil, science itself had suffered severe injury. No wonder that when Immanuel Kant in 1775 read a German translation of the works of David Hume, he was shocked by these results and was roused, as he said, from the dogmatic slumber in which he had assumed without question the essentials of religion and the basis of science. Were both science and faith to be surrendered to the skeptic? What could be done to save them? Three. From Rousseau to Kant. To the argument of the Enlightenment that reason makes for materialism, Berkeley had essayed the answer that matter does not exist. But this had led, in Hume, to the retort that, by the same token, mind does not exist either. Another answer was possible that reason is no final test. There are some theoretical conclusions against which our whole being rebels. We have no right to presume that these demands of our nature must be stifled at the dictates of a logic which is, after all, but the recent construction of a frail and deceptive part of us. How often our instincts and feelings push aside the little syllogisms which would like us to behave like geometrical figures and make love with mathematical precision. Sometimes, no doubt, and particularly in the novel complexities and artificialities of urban life, reason is the better guide. But in the great crises of life, and in the great problems of our conduct and belief, we trust to our feelings rather than to our diagrams. If reason is against religion, so much the worse for reason. Such, in effect, was the argument of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778, who almost alone in France fought the materialism and atheism of the Enlightenment. 
What a fate for a delicate and neurotic nature to have been cast amidst the robust rationalism and the almost brutal hedonism of the encyclopedists. Rousseau had been a sickly youth, driven into brooding and introversion by his physical weakness and the unsympathetic attitude of his parents and teachers. He had escaped from the stings of reality into a hothouse world of dreams, where the victories denied him in life and love could be had for the imagining. His confessions revealed an unreconciled complex of the most refined sentimentality, with an obtuse sense of decency and honor and through it all, an unsullied conviction of his moral superiority. Note, The doctrine that all behavior is motived by the pursuit of pleasure. In 1749, the Academy of Dijon offered a prize for an essay on the question, Has the progress of the sciences and the arts contributed to corrupt or to purify morals? Rousseau's essay won the prize. Culture is much more of an evil than a good, he argued. With all the intensity and sincerity of one who, finding culture out of his reach, proposed to prove it worthless. Consider the frightful disorders which printing has produced in Europe. Wherever philosophy arises, the moral health of a nation decays. It was even a saying among the philosophers themselves that since learned men had appeared, honest men were nowhere to be found. I venture to declare that a state of reflection is contrary to nature, and that a thinking man, an intellectual, as we would now say, is a depraved animal. It would be better to abandon our over-rapid development of the intellect, and to aim rather at training the heart and the affections. Education does not make a man good, it only makes him clever, usually for mischief. Instinct and feeling are more trustworthy than reason. In his famous novel, Les Nouvelles et Louise, 1761, Rousseau illustrated at great length the superiority of feeling to intellect. Sentimentality became the fashion among the ladies of the aristocracy and among some of the men. France was for a century watered with literary and then with actual tears. And the great movement of the European intellect in the 18th century gave way to the romantic emotional literature of 1789 to 1848. The current carried with it a strong revival of religious feeling. The ecstasies of Chateaubriand's Genie du Christianisme, 1802, were merely an echo of the confessions of faith of the Savoyard Vicar, which Rousseau included in his epochal essay on education, Emile. 1762. The argument of the confession was briefly this, that though reason might be against belief in God and immortality, feeling was overwhelmingly in their favor. Why should we not trust in instinct here rather than yield to the despair of an arid skepticism? When Kant read Emile, he omitted his daily walk under the linden trees in order to finish the book at once. It was an event in his life to find here another man who was groping his way out of the darkness of atheism, and who boldly affirmed the priority of feeling over theoretical reason in these supersensual concerns. Here at last was the second half of the answer to irreligion. Now finally all the scoffers and doubters would be scattered. To put these threads of argument together, to unite the ideas of Berkeley and Hume with the feelings of Rousseau, to save religion from reason, and yet, at the same time, to save science from skepticism. This was the mission of Immanuel Kant. But who was Immanuel Kant? 2. Kant himself He was born at Konigsberg, Prussia, in 1724, except for a short period of tutoring in a nearby village. This quiet little professor, who loved so much to lecture on the geography and ethnology of distant lands, never left his native city. He came of a poor family, which had left Scotland some hundred years before Emmanuel's birth. His mother was a pietist, i.e. a member of a religious sect which, like the Methodists of England, insisted on the full strictness and rigor of religious practice and belief. Our philosopher was so immersed in religion from morning to night that on the one hand he experienced a reaction which led him to stay away from church all through his adult life, 
and on the other hand, he kept to the end the somber stamp of the German Puritan, and felt, as he grew old, a great longing to preserve for himself and the world the essentials, at least, of the faith so deeply inculcated in him by his mother. But a young man growing up in the age of Frederick and Voltaire could not insulate himself from the skeptical current of the time. Kant was profoundly influenced even by the men whom later he aimed to refute, and perhaps most of all by his favorite enemy, Hume. We shall see later the remarkable phenomenon of a philosopher transcending the conservatism of his maturity and returning in almost his last work, and at almost the age of seventy, to a virile liberalism that would have brought him martyrdom had not his age and his fame protected him. Even in the midst of his work of religious restoration, we hear, with surprising frequency, the tones of another Kant, whom we might almost mistake for a Voltaire. Schopenhauer thought it not the least merit of Frederick the Great that under his government Kant could develop himself and dared to publish his critique of pure reason. Hardly under any other government would a salaried professor. Therefore, in Germany, a government employee have ventured such a thing. Kant was obliged to promise the immediate successor of the great king that he would write no more. It was in appreciation of this freedom that Kant dedicated the critique to Zedlitz, Frederick's far-sighted and progressive minister of education. In 1755, Kant began his work as private lecturer at the University of Konigsberg. For 15 years he was left in his lowly post. Twice his applications for a professorship were refused. At last, in 1770, he was made professor of logic and metaphysics. After many years of experience as a teacher, he wrote a textbook on pedagogy, of which he used to say that it contained many excellent precepts, none of which he had ever applied. Yet he was perhaps a better teacher than writer, and two generations of students learned to love him. One of his practical principles was to attend most to those pupils who were of middle ability. The dunces, he said, were beyond all help, and the geniuses would help themselves. Nobody expected him to startle the world with a new metaphysical system. To startle anybody seemed the very last crime that this timid and modest professor would commit. He himself had no expectations in that line. At the age of 42, he wrote, I have the fortune to be a lover of metaphysics, but my mistress has shown me few favors as yet. He spoke in those days of the bottomless abyss of metaphysics and of metaphysics as a dark ocean without shores or lighthouse, strewn with many a philosophic wreck. He could even attack the metaphysicians as those who dwelt on the high towers of speculation. Where there is usually a great deal of wind. He did not foresee that the greatest of all metaphysical tempests was to be of his own blowing. During these quiet years, his interests were rather physical than metaphysical. He wrote on planets, earthquakes, fire, winds, ether, volcanoes, geography, ethnology, and a hundred other things of that sort, not usually confounded with metaphysics. His Theory of the Heavens, 1755, proposed something very similar to the nebular hypothesis of Laplace, and attempted a mechanical explanation of all the sidereal motion and development. All the planets, Kant thought, have been or will be inhabited and those that are farthest from the sun, having had the longest period of growth, have probably a higher species of intelligent organisms than any yet produced on our planet. His anthropology, put together in 1798 from the lectures of a lifetime, suggested the possibility of the animal origin of man. Kant argued that if the human infant, in early ages when man was still largely at the mercy of wild animals, had cried as loudly upon entering the world as it does now, it would have been found out and devoured by beasts of prey. That, in all probability, therefore, man was very different at first from what he had become under civilization. And then Kant went on subtly. How nature brought about such a development and by what causes it was aided, we know not. 
This remark carries us a long way. It suggests the thought whether the present period of history, on the occasion of some great physical revolution, may not be followed by a third, when an orangutan or a chimpanzee would develop the organs which serve for walking, touching, speaking, into the articulated structure of a human being, with a central organ for the use of understanding, and gradually advance under the training of social institutions. Was this use of the future tense Kant's cautiously indirect way of putting forth his view on how man had really developed from the beast? So we see the slow growth of this simple little man, hardly five feet tall, modest, shrinking, and yet containing in his head, or generating there, the most far-reaching revolution in modern philosophy. Kant's life, says one biographer, passed like the most regular of regular verbs. Rising, coffee drinking, writing, lecturing, dining, walking, says Hein. Each had its set time. And when Immanuel Kant, in his grey coat, cane in hand, appeared at the door of his house and strolled towards the small avenue of linden trees, which is still called the Philosopher's Walk, the neighbors knew it was exactly half past three by the clock. So we promenaded up and down during all seasons, and when the weather was gloomy or the grey clouds threatened rain, his old servant Lampe was seen plodding anxiously after with a large umbrella under his arm like a symbol of prudence. He was so frail in physique that he had to take severe measures to regimen himself. He thought it safer to do this without a doctor, so he lived to the age of 80. At 70, he wrote an essay on the power of the mind to master the feeling of illness by force of resolution. One of his favorite principles was to breathe only through the nose, especially when outdoors. Hence, in autumn, winter, and spring, he would permit no one to talk to him on his daily walks. Better silence than a cold. He applied philosophy even to holding up his stockings by bands passing up into his trousers' pockets where they ended in springs contained in small boxes. He thought everything out carefully before acting and therefore remained a bachelor all his life long. Twice he thought of offering his hand to a lady but he reflected so long that in one case the lady married a bolder man, and in the other the lady removed from Konigsberg before the philosopher could make up his mind. Perhaps he felt, like Nietzsche, that marriage would hamper him in the honest pursuit of truth. A married man, Talleyrand used to say, will do anything for money. And Kant had written, at twenty-two, with all the fine enthusiasm of omnipotent youth, I have already fixed upon the line which I am resolved to keep. I will enter on my course, and nothing shall prevent me from pursuing it. And so he persevered, through poverty and obscurity, sketching and writing and rewriting his magnum opus for almost fifteen years, finishing it only in 1781, when he was fifty-seven years old. Never did a man mature so slowly. And then again... Never did a book so startle and upset the philosophic world. 3. The Critique of Pure Reason Note A word about what to read. Kant himself is hardly intelligible to the beginner because his thought is insulated with a bizarre and intricate terminology. Hence the paucity of direct quotation in this chapter. Perhaps the simplest introduction is Wallace's Kant in the Blackwood Philosophical Classics. Heavier and more advanced is Polson's Immanuel Kant. Chamberlain's Immanuel Kant, two volumes, New York, 1914, is interesting but erratic and digressive. A good criticism of Kant may be found in Schopenhauer's World as Will and Idea. Volume 2, pages 1 to 159, but caveat emptor. What is meant by this title? Critique is not precisely a criticism, but a critical analysis. Kant is not attacking pure reason, except at the end to show its limitations. Rather, he hopes to show its possibility and to exalt it above the impure knowledge which comes to us through the distorting channels of sense. For 
pure reason is to mean knowledge that does not come through our senses, but is independent of all sense experience, knowledge belonging to us by the inherent nature and structure of the mind. At the very outset, then, Kant flings down a challenge to Locke in the English school. Knowledge is not all derived from the senses. Hume thought he had shown that there is no soul and no science, that our minds are but our ideas in procession and association, and our certainties but probabilities in perpetual danger of violation. These false conclusions, says Kant, are the result of false premises. You assume that all knowledge comes from separate and distinct sensations. Naturally, these cannot give you necessity or invariable sequences of which you may be forever certain. And naturally, you must not expect to see your soul even with the eyes of the internal sense. Let us grant that absolute certainty of knowledge is impossible if all knowledge comes from sensation, from an independent external world which owes us no promise of regularity of behavior. But what if we have knowledge that is independent of sense experience? Knowledge whose truth is certain to us even before experience. A priori? Then absolute truth and absolute science would become possible, would it not? Is there such absolute knowledge? This is the problem of the first critique. My question is, what can we hope to achieve with reason when all the material and assistance of experience are taken away? The critique becomes a detailed biology of thought, an examination of the origin and evolution of concepts, an analysis of the inherited structure of the mind. This, as Kant believes, is the entire problem of metaphysics. In this book, I have chiefly aimed at completeness, and I venture to maintain that there ought not to be one single metaphysical problem that has not been solved here or to the solution of which the key at least has not here been supplied. Exegi monumentum era perennus. With such egotism, nature spurs us on to creation. The critique comes to the point at once. Experience is by no means the only field to which our understanding can be confined. The experience tells us what is, but not that it must be necessarily what it is and not otherwise. It therefore never gives us any real general truths, and our reason, which is particularly anxious for that class of knowledge, is roused by it rather than satisfied. General truths, which at the same time bear the character of an inward necessity, must be independent of experience, clear and certain in themselves. That is to say, they must be true no matter what our later experience may be, true even before experience. True a priori. How far we can advance independently of all experience in a priori knowledge is shown by the brilliant example of mathematics. Mathematical knowledge is necessary and certain. We cannot conceive of future experience violating it. We may believe that the sun will rise in the west tomorrow, or that some day in some conceivable asbestos world fire will not burn stick. But we cannot for the life of us believe that two times two will ever make anything else than four. Such truths are true before experience. They do not depend on experience past, present, or to come. Therefore, they are absolute and necessary truths. It is inconceivable that they should ever become untrue. But whence do we get this character of absoluteness and necessity? Not from experience. For experience gives us nothing but separate sensations and events which may alter their sequence in the future. Note, Radical empiricism, James, Dewey, etc., enters the controversy at this point and argues against both Hume and Kant that experience gives us relations and sequences as well as sensations and events. These truths derive their necessary character from the inherent structure of our minds, from the natural and inevitable manner in which our minds must operate. For the mind of man, and here at last is the great thesis of Kant, is not passive wax upon which experience and sensation write their absolute and yet whimsical will, nor is it a mere abstract name for the series or group of mental states. 
It is an active organ which molds and coordinates sensations into ideas, an organ which transforms the chaotic multiplicity of experience into the ordered unity of thought. But how? 1. Transcendental Aesthetic The effort to answer this question, to study the inherent structure of the mind, or the innate laws of thought, is what Kant calls transcendental philosophy, because it is a problem transcending sense experience. I call knowledge transcendental, which is occupied not so much with objects as with our a priori concepts of objects. With our modes of correlating our experience into knowledge, there are two grades or stages in this process of working up the raw material of sensation into the finished product of thought. The first stage is the coordination of sensations by applying to them the forms of perception, space, and time. The second stage is the coordination of the perceptions so developed by applying to them the forms of conception, the categories of thought. Kant, using the word aesthetic in its original and etymological sense as connotating sensation or feeling, calls the study of the first of these stages transcendental aesthetic and using the word logic as meaning the science of the forms of thought, he calls the study of the second stage transcendental logic. These are terrible words, which will take meaning as the argument proceeds. Once over this hill, the road to Kant will be comparatively clear. Now just what is meant by sensations and perceptions, and how does the mind change the former into the latter? By itself, a sensation is merely the awareness of a stimulus. We have a taste on the tongue, an odor in the nostrils, a sound in the ears, a temperature on the skin, a flash of light on the retina, a pressure on the fingers. It is the raw, crude beginning of experience. It is what the infant has in the early days of its groping mental life. It is not yet knowledge. But let these various sensations group themselves about an object in space and time say this apple. Let the odor and the nostrils and the taste on the tongue, the light on the retina, the shape revealing pressure on the fingers and the hand, unite and group themselves about this thing. And there is now an awareness not so much of a stimulus as of a specific object. There is a perception. Sensation has passed into knowledge. But again, was this passage, this grouping, automatic? Did the sensations of themselves spontaneously and naturally fall into a cluster and an order, and so become perception? Yes, said Locke and Hume. Not at all, says Kant. For these varied sensations come to us through varied channels of sense, through a thousand aberrant nerves that pass from skin and eye and ear and tongue into the brain. What a medley of messengers they must be as they crowd into the chambers of the mind, calling for attention. No wonder Plato spoke of the rabble of the senses, and left to themselves they remain rabble, a chaotic manifold, pitifully impotent, waiting to be ordered into meaning and purpose and power. As readily might the messages brought to a general from a thousand sectors of the battle line weave themselves unaided into comprehension and command. No, there is a lawgiver for this mob, a directing and coordinating power that does not merely receive, but takes these atoms of sensations and molds them into sense. Observe, first, that not all of the messages are accepted. Myriad forces play upon your body at this moment. A storm of stimuli beats down upon the nerve endings, which, amoeba-like, you put forth to experience the external world. But not all that call are chosen. Only those sensations are selected that can be molded into perceptions suited to your present purpose, or that bring those imperious messages of danger which are always relevant. The clock is ticking, and you do not hear it. But that same ticking, not louder than before, will be heard at once if your purpose wills it so. The mother asleep at her infant's cradle is deaf to the turmoil of life about her. But let the little one move, and the mother gropes her way back to waking attention like a diver rising hurriedly to the surface of the sea. Let the purpose be addition, and the stimulus two and three bring the response five. 
Let the purpose be multiplication. And the same stimulus, the same auditory sensations, two and three, bring the response six. Association of sensations or ideas is not merely by contiguity in space or time, nor by similarity, nor by recency, frequency, or intensity of experience. It is above all determined by the purpose of the mind. Sensations and thoughts are servants. They await our call. They do not come unless we need them. There is an agent of selection and direction that uses them and is their master. In addition to the sensations and the ideas, there is the mind. This agent of selection and coordination, Kant thinks, uses first of all two simple methods for the classification of the material presented to it, the sense of space and the sense of time. As the general arranges the messages brought him according to the place for which they come and the time at which they were written, and so finds an order and a system for them all, so the mind allocates its sensations in space and time, attributes them to this object here or that object there, to this present time or to that past. Space and time are not things perceived but modes of perception, ways of putting sense into sensation. Space and time are organs of perception. They are a priori because all ordered experience involves and presupposes them. Without them, sensations could never grow into perceptions. They are a priori because it is inconceivable that we should ever have any future experience that will not also involve them. And because they are a priori, their laws, which are the laws of mathematics, are a priori, absolute and necessary world without end. It is not merely probable. It is certain that we shall never find a straight line that is not the shortest distance between two points. Mathematics, at least, is saved from the dissolvent skepticism of David Hume. Can all the sciences be similarly saved? Yes, if their basic principle, the law of causality, that a given cause must always be followed by a given effect, can be shown like space and time to be so inherent in all the processes of understanding that no future experience can be conceived that would violate or escape it. Is causality too a priori, an indispensable prerequisite and condition of all thought? 2. Transcendental Analytic So we pass from the wide field of sensation and perception to the dark and narrow chamber of thought, from transcendental aesthetic to transcendental logic. And first, to the naming and analysis of those elements in our thought which are not so much given to the mind by perception as given to perception by the mind. Those levers which raise the perceptual knowledge of objects into the conceptual knowledge of relationships, sequences, and laws. Those tools of the mind which refine experience into science. Just as perceptions arranged sensations around objects in space and time, so conception arranges perceptions, objects, and events about the ideas of cause, unity, reciprocal relation, necessity, contingency, etc. These and other categories are the structure into which perceptions are received and by which they are classified and molded into the ordered concepts of thought. These are the very essence and character of the mind. Mind is the coordination of experience. And here again observe the activity of this mind that was, to Locke and Hume, mere passive wax under the blows of sense experience. Consider a system of thought like Aristotle's. It is conceivable that this almost cosmic ordering of data should have come by the automatic, anarchistic spontaneity of the data themselves. See this magnificent card catalog in the library, intelligently ordered into sequence by human purpose. Then picture all these card cases thrown upon the floor, all these cards scattered pell-mell into riotous disorder. Can you now conceive these scattered cards pulling themselves up, Munchausen-like, from their disarray, passing quietly into their alphabetical and topical places in their proper boxes, and each box into its fit place in the rack, until all should be order and sense and purpose again? What a miracle story these skeptics have given us after all. Sensation is unorganized stimulus. Perception is organized sensation. 
Conception is organized perception. Science is organized knowledge. Wisdom is organized life. Each is a greater degree of order and sequence and unity. Whence this order, this sequence, this unity? Not from the things themselves, for they are known to us only by sensations that come through a thousand channels at once in disorderly multitude. It is our purpose that put order and sequence and unity upon this importunate lawlessness. It is ourselves, our personalities, our minds that bring light upon these seas. Locke was wrong when he said, There is nothing in the intellect except what was first in the senses. Leibniz was right when he added, Nothing except the intellect itself. Perceptions without conceptions, says Kant, are blind. If perceptions wove themselves automatically into ordered thought, if mind were not an active effort hammering out order from chaos, how could the same experience leave one man mediocre and in a more active and tireless soul be raised to the light of wisdom and the beautiful logic of truth? The world, then, has order not of itself, but because the thought that knows the world is itself an ordering. The first stage in that classification of experience which at last is science and philosophy. The laws of thought are also the laws of things, for things are known to us only through this thought that must obey these laws, since it and they are one. In effect, as Hegel was to say, the laws of logic and the laws of nature are one, and logic and metaphysics merge. The generalized principles of science are necessary because they are ultimately laws of thought that are involved and presupposed in every experience, past, present, and to come. Science is absolute and truth is everlasting. 3. Transcendental Dialectic Nevertheless, this certainty, this absoluteness of the highest generalizations of logic and science is paradoxically limited and relative, limited strictly to the field of actual experience and relative strictly to our human mode of experience. For if our analysis has been correct, the world as we know it is a construction, a finished product, almost, one might say, a manufactured article to which the mind contributes as much by its molding forms as the thing contributes by its stimuli. So we perceive the top of the table as round, whereas our sensation is of an ellipse. The object, as it appears to us, is a phenomenon an appearance perhaps very different from the external object before it came within the can of our senses. What that original object was, we can never know. The thing in itself may be an object of thought or inference, a noumenon, but it cannot be experienced, for in being experienced it would be changed by its passage through sense and thought. It remains completely unknown to us what objects may be by themselves and apart from the receptivity of our senses. We know nothing but our manner of perceiving them, that manner being peculiar to us and not necessarily shared by every being, though no doubt by every human being. Note. Critique, page 37. If Kant had not added this last clause, his argument for the necessity of knowledge would have fallen. The moon, as known to us, is merely a bundle of sensations, as Hume saw, unified, as Hume did not see, by our native mental structure through the elaboration of senses into perceptions, and of these into conceptions or ideas. In result, the moon is for us merely our ideas. Note, so John Stuart Mill, with all his English tendency to realism, was driven at last to define matter as merely a permanent possibility of sensations. Not that Kant ever doubts the existence of matter and the external world, but he adds that we know nothing certain about them except that they exist. Our detailed knowledge is about their appearance, their phenomena, about the sensations which we have of them. Idealism does not mean, as the man in the street thinks, that nothing exists outside the perceiving subject, but that a goodly part of every object is created by the forms of perception and understanding. We know the object as transformed into idea. What it is before being so transformed we cannot know. 
Science, after all, is naive. It supposes that it is dealing with things in themselves, in their full-blooded external and uncorrupted reality. Philosophy is a little more sophisticated and realizes that the whole material of science consists of sensations, perceptions, and conceptions, rather than of things. Kant's greatest merit, says Schopenhauer, is the distinction of the phenomenon from the thing in itself. It follows that any attempt by either science or religion to say just what the ultimate reality is must fall back into mere hypothesis. The understanding can never go beyond the limits of sensibility. Such transcendental science loses itself in antimonies, and such transcendental theology loses itself in paralogisms. It is the cruel function of transcendental dialectic to examine the validity of these attempts of reason to escape from the enclosing circle of sensation and appearance into the unknowable world of things in themselves. Antinomies are the insoluble dilemmas born of a science that tries to overleap experience. So, for example, when knowledge attempts to decide whether the world is finite or infinite in space, thought rebels against either supposition. Beyond any limit, we are driven to conceive something further, endlessly, and yet infinity is itself inconceivable. Again, did the world have a beginning in time? We cannot conceive eternity. But then, too, we cannot conceive any point in the past without feeling at once that before that something was. Or has that chain of causes which science studies a beginning, a first cause? Yes, for an endless chain is inconceivable. No, for a first cause uncaused is inconceivable as well. Is there any exit from these blind alleys of thought? There is, says Kant, if we remember that space, time, and cause are modes of perception and conception which must enter into all our experience, since they are the web and structure of experience. These dilemmas arise from supposing that space, time, and cause are external things independent of perception. We shall never have any experience which we shall not interpret in terms of space and time and cause. But we shall never have any philosophy if we forget that these are not things, but modes of interpretation and understanding. So with the paralogisms of rational theology, which attempts to prove by theoretical reason that the soul is an incorruptible substance, that the will is free and above the law of cause and effect, and that there exists a necessary being, God, as the presupposition of all reality, transcendental dialectic must remind theology that substance and cause and necessity are finite categories modes of arrangement and classification which the mind applies to sense experience and reliably valid only for the phenomena that appear to such experience. We cannot apply these conceptions to the noumenal or merely inferred and conjectural world. Religion cannot be proved by theoretical reason. So the first critique ends. One could well imagine David Hume, uncannier Scott than Kant himself, viewing the results with a sardonic smile. Here was a tremendous book, 800 pages long, weighted beyond bearing almost with ponderous terminology, proposing to solve all the problems of metaphysics and incidentally to save the absoluteness of science and the essential truth of religion. What had the book really done? It had destroyed the naive world of science and limited it, if not in degree, certainly in scope, and to a world confessedly of mere surface and appearance, beyond which it could issue only in farcical antinomies. So science was saved. The most eloquent and incisive portions of the book had argued that the objects of faith, a free and immortal soul, a benevolent creator, could never be proved by reason so religion was saved. No wonder the priests of Germany protested madly against this salvation and revenged themselves by calling their dogs Immanuel Kant. And no wonder that Hein compared the little professor of Konigsberg with the terrible Robespierre. The latter had merely killed a king and a few thousand Frenchmen, which a German might forgive. But Kant, said Hein, had killed God had undermined the most precious arguments of theology. 
What a sharp contrast between the outer life of this man and his destructive, world-convulsing thoughts. Had the citizens of Konigsberg surmised the whole significance of those thoughts, they would have felt a more profound awe in the presence of this man than in that of an executioner who merely slays human beings. But the good people saw in him nothing but a professor of philosophy, and when at the fixed hour he sauntered by, they nodded a friendly greeting and set their watches. Was this caricature or revelation? Four, the critique of practical reason. If religion cannot be based on science and theology, on what then? On morals. The basis in theology is too insecure. Better that it should be abandoned, even destroyed. Faith must be put beyond the reach or realm of reason. But therefore the moral basis of religion must be absolute, not derived from questionable sense experience or precarious inference not corrupted by the admixture of fallible reason. It must be derived from the inner self by direct perception and intuition. We must find a universal and necessary ethic, a priori principles of morals as absolute and certain as mathematics. We must show that pure reason can be practical, i.e., can of itself determine the will independently of anything empirical. That the moral sense is innate and not derived from experience. The moral imperative which we need as the basis of religion must be an absolute, a categorical imperative. Now the most astounding reality in all our experience is precisely our moral sense, our inescapable feeling in the face of temptation that this or that is wrong. We may yield, but the feeling is there nevertheless. In the morning, I make good resolutions. In the evening, I commit follies. But we know that they are sotis, and we resolve again. What is it that brings the bite of remorse and the new resolution? It is the categorical imperative in us, the unconditional command of our conscience, to act as if the maxim of our action were to become by our will a universal law of nature. We know not by reasoning, but by vivid and immediate feeling, that we must avoid behavior which, if adopted by all men, would render social life impossible. Do I wish to escape from a predicament by a lie? But, while I can will the lie, I can by no means will that lying should be a universal law, for with such a law there would be no promises at all. Hence the sense in me that I must not lie even if it be to my advantage. Prudence is hypothetical. Its motto is honesty when it is the best policy, but the moral law in our hearts is unconditional and absolute. And an action is good not because it has good results or because it is wise, but because it is done in obedience to this inner sense of duty, this moral law that does not come from our own personal experience but legislates imperiously and a priori for all our behavior, past, present, and future. The only thing unqualifiedly good in this world is a good will. The will to follow the moral law regardless of profit or loss for ourselves. Never mind your happiness. Do your duty. Morality is not properly the doctrine how we make ourselves happy, but how we make ourselves worthy of happiness. Let us seek the happiness in others, but for ourselves, perfection, whether it bring us happiness or pain, to achieve perfection in yourself and happiness in others. So act as to treat humanity, whether in thine own person or in that of another, in every case as an end, never only as a means. This too, as we directly feel, is part of the categorical imperative. Let us live up to such a principle, and we shall soon create an ideal community of rational beings. To create it, we need only to act as if we already belong to it. We must apply the perfect law in the imperfect state. It is a hard ethic, you say, this placing of duty above beauty, of morality above happiness. But only so can we cease to be beasts and begin to be gods. Notice, meanwhile, that this absolute command to duty proves at last the freedom of our wills. How could we ever have conceived such a notion as duty if we had not felt ourselves free? 
We cannot prove this freedom by theoretical reason. We prove it by feeling it directly in the crisis of moral choice. We feel this freedom as the very essence of our inner selves, of the pure ego. We feel within ourselves the spontaneous activity of a mind molding experience and choosing goals. Our actions, once we initiate them, seem to follow fixed and invariable laws, but only because we perceive their results through sense, which clothes all that it transmits in the dress of that causal law which our minds themselves have made. Nevertheless, we are beyond and above the laws we make in order to understand the world of our experience. Each of us is a center of initiative force and creative power, in a way which we feel but cannot prove each of us is free. And again, though we cannot prove we feel that we are deathless, we perceive that life is not like those dramas so beloved by the people, in which every villain is punished and every act of virtue meets with its reward. We learn anew every day that the wisdom of the serpent fares better here than the gentleness of the dove, and that any thief can triumph if he steals enough. If mere worldly utility and expediency were the justification of virtue, it would not be wise to be too good. And yet knowing all this, having it flung into our faces with brutal repetition, we still feel the command to righteousness. We know that we ought to do the inexpedient good. How could this sense of right survive if it were not that in our hearts we feel this life to be only part of a life, this earthly dream only an embryonic prelude to a new birth, a new awakening? If we did not vaguely know that in that later and longer life the balance will be redressed, and not one cup of water given generously but shall be returned a hundredfold. Finally, and by the same token, there is a God. If the sense of duty involves and justifies belief in rewards to come, the postulate of immortality must lead to the supposition of the existence of a cause adequate to this effect. In other words, it must postulate the existence of God. This, again, is no proof by reason. The moral sense, which has to do with the world of our actions, must have priority over that theoretical logic which was developed only to deal with sense phenomena. Our reason leaves us free to believe that behind the thing in itself there is a just God. Our moral sense commands us to believe it. Rousseau was right. Above the logic of the head is the feeling in the heart. Pascal was right. The heart has reasons of its own, which the head can never understand. 5. On Religion and Reason does this appear trite and timid and conservative? But it was not so. On the contrary, this bold denial of rational theology, this frank reduction of religion to moral faith and hope, aroused all the Orthodox of Germany to protests, to face this forty-parson power, as Byron would have called it, required more courage than one usually associates with the name of Kant. That he was brave enough appeared in all clarity when he published at 66 his Critique of Judgment, and at 69 his Religion Within the Limits of Pure Reason. In the earlier of these books, Kant returns to the discussion of the argument from design which, in the first critique, he had rejected as an insufficient proof of the existence of God. He begins by correlating design and beauty. The beautiful, he thinks, is anything which reveals symmetry and unity of structure as if it had been designed by intelligence. He observes in passing, and Schopenhauer here helped himself to a good deal of his theory of art, that the contemplation of symmetrical design always gives us disinterested pleasure, and that an interest in the beauty of nature for its own sake is always a sign of goodness. Many objects in nature show such beauty, such symmetry and unity, as almost to drive us to the notion of supernatural design. But on the other hand, says Kant, there are also in nature many instances of waste and chaos, of useless repetition and multiplication. Nature preserves life, but at the cost of how much suffering and death. The appearance of external design, then, is not a conclusive proof of providence. The theologians who use the idea so much should abandon it, and the scientists who have abandoned it should use it. It is a magnificent clue and leads to hundreds of revelations. For there is design, undoubtedly, but it is internal design, the design of the parts by the whole, 
And if science will interpret the parts of an organism in terms of their meaning for the whole, it will have an admirable balance for that other heuristic principle, the mechanical conception of life which also is fruitful for discovery, but which alone can never explain the growth of even a blade of grass. The essay on religion is a remarkable production for a man of 69. It is perhaps the boldest of all the books of Kant, since religion must be based not on the logic of theoretical reason, but on the practical reason of the moral sense. It follows that any Bible or revelation must be judged by its value for morality and cannot itself be the judge by a moral code. Churches and dogmas have value only insofar as they assist the moral development of the race. When mere creeds or ceremonies usurp priority over moral excellence as a test of religion, religion has disappeared. The real church is a community of people, however scattered and divided, who are united by devotion to the common moral law. It was to establish such a community that Christ lived and died. It was this real church which he held up in contrast to the ecclesiasticism of the Pharisees. But another ecclesiasticism has almost overwhelmed this noble conception. Christ has brought the kingdom of God nearer to earth, but he has been misunderstood, and in place of God's kingdom, the kingdom of the priest has been established among us. Creed and ritual have again replaced the good life, and instead of men being bound together by religion, they are divided into a thousand sects, and all manner of pious nonsense is inculcated as a sort of heavenly court service by means of which one may win through flattery the favor of the ruler of heaven. Again, miracles cannot prove a religion, for we can never quite rely on the testimony which supports them. And prayer is useless if it aims at a suspension of the natural laws that hold for all experience. Finally, the nadir of perversion is reached when the church becomes an instrument in the hands of a reactionary government. When the clergy, whose function it is to console and guide a harassed humanity with religious faith and hope and charity, are made the tools of theological obscurantism and political oppression. The audacity of these conclusions lay in the fact that precisely this had happened in Prussia. Frederick the Great had died in 1786 and had been succeeded by Frederick William II, to whom the liberal policies of his predecessor seemed to smack unpatriotically of the French Enlightenment. Zedlitz, who had been Minister of Education under Frederick, was dismissed, and his place was given to a pietist, Volner. Volner had been described by Frederick as a treacherous and intriguing priest who divided his time between alchemy and Rosicrucian mysteries and climbed to power by offering himself as an unworthy instrument to the new monarch's policy of restoring the Orthodox faith by compulsion. In 1788, Volner issued a decree which forbade any teaching in school or university that deviated from the Orthodox form of Lutheran Protestantism. He established a strict censorship over all forms of publication and ordered the discharge of every teacher suspected of any heresy. Kant was at first left unmolested because he was an old man, and, as one royal adviser said, only a few people read him and these did not understand him. But the essay on religion was intelligible, and though it rang true with religious fervor, it revealed too strong a strain of Voltaire to pass the new censorship. The Berliner Monat Schrift, which had planned to publish the essay, was ordered to suppress it. Kant acted now with a vigor and courage hardly credible in a man who had almost completed three score years and ten. He sent the essay to some friends at Jena, and through them had it published by the press of the university there. Jena was outside of Prussia, under the jurisdiction of that same liberal Duke of Weimar, who was then caring for Gotha. The result was that in 1794 Kant received an eloquent cabinet order from the Prussian king, which read as follows. Our highest person has been greatly displeased to observe how you misuse your philosophy to undermine and destroy many of the most important and fundamental doctrines of the Holy Scriptures and of Christianity. We demand of you immediately an exact account and expect that in future you will give no such cause of offense, but rather that, in accordance with your duty, you will employ your talents and authority so that our paternal purpose may be more and more attained. If you continue to oppose this order, you may expect unpleasant consequences. 
Kant replied that every scholar should have the right to form independent judgments on religious matters and to make his opinions known, but that during the reign of the present king he would preserve silence. Some biographers who can be very brave by proxy have condemned him for this concession. But let us remember that Kant was 70, and he was frail in health and not fit for a fight, and that he had already spoken his message to the world. 6. On Politics and Eternal Peace The Prussian government might have pardoned Kant's theology, had he not been guilty of political heresies as well. Three years after the accession of Frederick William II, the French Revolution had set all the thrones of Europe trembling. At a time when most of the teachers in the Prussian universities had rushed to the support of legitimate monarchy, Kant, 65 years young, hailed the revolution with joy, and with tears in his eyes said to his friends, Now I can say like Simeon, Lord, let now thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. He had published in 1784 a brief exposition of his political theory under the title of The Natural Principle of the Political Order Considered in Connection with the Idea of a Universal Cosmopolitical History. Kant begins by recognizing in that strife of each against all which had so shocked Hobbes, nature's method of developing the hidden capacities of life, struggle is the indispensable accompaniment of progress, if men were entirely social, man would stagnate. A certain alloy of individualism and competition is required to make the human species survive and grow. Without qualities of an unsocial kind, men might have led an Arcadian shepherd life in complete harmony, contentment, and mutual love. But in that case, all their talents would have forever remained hidden in their germ. Kant, therefore, was no slavish follower of Rousseau. Thanks be then to nature for this unsociableness, for this envious jealousy and vanity, for this insatiable desire for possession and for power. Man wishes concord, but nature knows better what is good for his species, and she wills discord, in order that man may be impelled to a new exertion of his powers, and to the further development of his natural capacities. The struggle for existence, then, is not altogether an evil. Nevertheless, men soon perceived that it must be restricted within certain limits and regulated by rules, customs, and laws, hence the origin and development of civil society. But now, the same unsociableness which forced men into society becomes again the cause of each commonwealth's assuming the attitude of uncontrolled freedom in its external relations, i.e., as one state in relation to other states, and consequently, any one state must expect from any other the same sort of evils as formerly oppressed individuals and compelled them to enter into a civil union regulated by law. It is time that nations like men should emerge from the wild state of nature and contract to keep the peace. The whole meaning and movement of history is the ever greater restriction of pugnacity and violence, the continuous enlargement of the area of peace. The history of the human race, viewed as a whole, may be regarded as the realization of a hidden plan of nature to bring about a political constitution, internally and externally perfect, as the only state in which all the capacities implanted by her in mankind can be fully developed. If there is no such progress, the labors of successive civilizations are like those of Sisyphus, who again and again, up the high hill, heaved a huge round stone only to have it roll back as it was almost at the top. History would then be nothing more than an endless and circuitous folly. And we might suppose, like the Hindu, that the earth is a place for the expiation of old and forgotten sins. The Essay on External Peace, published in 1795 when Kant was 71, is a noble development of this theme. Kant knows how easy it is to laugh at the phrase and under his title he writes, These words were once put by a Dutch innkeeper on his signboard as a satirical inscription over the representation of a churchyard cemetery. Kant had before complained, as apparently every generation must, that 
Our rulers have no money to spend on public education because all their resources are already placed to the account of the next war. The nations will not really be civilized until all standing armies are abolished. The audacity of this proposal stands out when we remember that it was Prussia itself which, under the father of Frederick the Great, had been the first to establish conscription. Standing armies excite states to outrival one another in the number of their armed men, which has no limit. To the expense occasioned thereby, peace becomes in the long run more oppressive than a short war, and standing armies are thus the cause of aggressive wars undertaken in order to get rid of this burden. For in time of war the army would support itself on the country by requisitioning, quartering, and pillaging preferably in the enemy's territory, but, if necessary, in one's own land. Even this would be better than supporting it out of government funds. Much of this militarism, in Kant's judgment, was due to the expansion of Europe into America and Africa and Asia, with the resultant quarrels of the thieves over their new booty. If we compare the barbarian instances of inhospitality with the inhuman behavior of the civilized, and especially the commercial states of our continent, the injustice practiced by them even in their first contact with foreign lands and people fills us with horror. The mere visiting of such peoples being regarded by them as equivalent to a conquest. America, the Negro lands, the Spice Islands, the Cape of Good Hope, etc., on being discovered, were treated as countries that belonged to nobody. For the aboriginal inhabitants were reckoned as nothing. And all this has been done by nations who make a great ado about their piety, and who, while drinking up iniquity like water, would have themselves regarded as the very elect of the orthodox faith. The old fox of Konigsberg was not silenced yet. Kant attributed this imperialistic greed to the oligarchical constitution of European states. The spoils went to a select few and remained substantial even after division. If democracy were established and shared in political power, the spoils of international robbery would have to be so subdivided as to constitute a resistible temptation. Hence the first definitive article in the conditions of eternal peace is this. The civil constitution of every state shall be republican, and war shall not be declared except by a plebiscite of all the citizens when those who must do the fighting have the right to decide between war and peace, history will no longer be written in blood. On the other hand, in a constitution where the subject is not a voting member of the state, and which is therefore not Republican, the resolution to go to war is a matter of the smallest concern in the world. For, in this case, the ruler, who as such is not a mere citizen, but the owner of the state, need not in the least suffer personally by war, nor has he to sacrifice his pleasures of the table or the chase, or his pleasant palaces, court festivals, or the like. He can, therefore, resolve for a war from insignificant reasons, as if it were but a hunting expedition. And as regards its propriety, he may leave the justification of it without concern to the diplomatic corps, who are always too ready to give their services for that purpose. How contemporary truth is! The apparent victory of the revolution over the armies of reaction in 1795 led Kant to hope that republics would now spring up throughout Europe, and that an international order would arise based on a democracy without slavery and without exploitation and pledged to peace. After all, the function of government is to help and develop the individual, not to use and abuse him. Every man is to be respected as an absolute end in himself and it is a crime against the dignity that belongs to him as a human being to use him as a mere means for some external purpose. This, too, is part and parcel of that categorical imperative without which religion is a hypocritical farce. Kant, therefore, calls for equality, not of ability, but of opportunity for the development and application of ability. He rejects all prerogatives of birth and class, and traces all heredity privilege to some violent conquest in the past. In the midst of obscurantism and reaction and the union of all monarchical Europe to crush the revolution, he takes his stand, despite his seventy years for the new order, 
for the establishment of democracy and liberty everywhere. Never had old age so bravely spoken with the voice of youth. But he was exhausted now. He had run his race and fought his fight. He withered slowly into a childlike senility that came at last to be a harmless insanity. One by one, his sensibilities and his powers left him. And in 1804, aged 79, he died quietly and naturally, like a leaf falling from a tree. Seven. Criticism and Estimate And how does this complex structure of logic, metaphysics, psychology, ethics, and politics stand today, after the philosophic storms of a century have beaten down upon it? It is pleasant to answer that much of the great edifice remains, and that the critical philosophy represents an event of permanent importance in the history of thought. But many details and outworks of the structure have been shaken. First, then, is space a mere form of sensibility, having no objective reality independent of the perceiving mind? Yes and no. Yes, for space is an empty concept when not filled with perceived objects. Space merely means that certain objects are, for the perceiving mind, at such and such a position or distance, with reference to other perceived objects and no external perception is possible except of objects in space. Space, then, is assuredly a necessary form of the external sense. And no, for without doubt such spatial facts as the annual elliptical circuit of sun by earth, though statable only by a mind, are independent of any perception whatever, the deep and dark blue ocean rolled on before Byron told it to, and after he had ceased to be, nor is space a construct of the mind through the coordination of spaceless sensations. We perceive space directly through our simultaneous perception of different objects and various points, as when we see an insect moving across a still background. Likewise, time as a sense of before and after, or a measurement of motion, is of course subjective and highly relative. But a tree will age, wither, and decay whether or not the lapse of time is measured or perceived. The truth is that Kant was too anxious to prove the subjectivity of space as a refuge from materialism. He feared the argument that if space is objective and universal, God must exist in space and therefore be spatial and material. He might have been content with the critical idealism which shows that all reality is known to us primarily as our sensations and ideas. The old fox bit off more than he could chew. Note, the persistent vitality of Kant's theory of knowledge appears in its complete acceptance by so matter-of-fact a scientist as the late Charles P. Steinmetz. All our sense perceptions are limited by and attached to the conceptions of time and space. Kant, the greatest and most critical of all philosophers, denies that time and space are the product of experience but shows them to be categories, conceptions in which our minds clothe the sense perceptions. Modern physics has come to the same conclusion in the relativity theory, that absolute space and absolute time have no existence. But time and space exist only as far as things or events fill them, that is, they are forms of perception. Address at the Unitarian Church, Schenectady, 1923. He might well have contented himself, too, with the relativity of scientific truth, without straining towards that mirage, the absolute. Recent studies, like those of Pearson in England, Mach in Germany, and Henry Poincare in France, agree rather with Hume than with Kant. All science, even the most rigorous mathematics, is relative in its truth. Science itself is not worried about the matter. A high degree of probability contents it. Perhaps, after all, necessary knowledge is not necessary. The great achievement of Kant is to have shown once for all that the external world is known to us only as sensation, and that the mind is no mere helpless tabula rasa, the inactive victim of sensation, but a positive agent selecting and reconstructing experience as experience arrives. We can make subtractions from this accomplishment without injuring its essential greatness. We may smile with Schopenhauer at the exact baker's dozen of categories so prettily boxed into triplets, 
and then stretched and contracted and interpreted deviously and ruthlessly to fit and surround all things. And we may even question whether these categories or interpretive forms of thought are innate, existing before sensation and experience. Perhaps so in the individual, as Spencer conceded, though acquired by the race, and then again probably acquired even by the individual. The categories may be grooves of thought, habits of perception and conception, gradually produced by sensations and perceptions automatically arranging themselves, first in disorderly ways, then by a kind of natural selection of forms of arrangement, in orderly and adaptive and illuminating ways. It is memory that classifies and interprets sensations into perceptions and perceptions into ideas, but memory is an accretion that unity of the mind which Kant thinks native, the transcendental unity of apperception is acquired, and not by all, and can be lost as well as won, in amnesia or alternating personality or insanity. Concepts are an achievement, not a gift. The 19th century dealt rather hardly with Kant's ethics, his theory of an innate a priori absolute moral sense, the philosophy of evolution suggested irresistibly that the sense of duty is a social deposit in the individual. The content of conscience is acquired, though the vague disposition to social behavior is innate. The moral self, the social man, is no special creation coming mysteriously from the hand of God, but the late product of a leisurely evolution. Morals are not absolute. They are a code of conduct more or less haphazardly developed for group survival and varying with the nature and circumstances of the group. A people hemmed in by enemies, for example, will consider as immoral that zestful and restless individualism which a nation youthful and secure in its wealth and isolation will condone as a necessary ingredient in the exploitation of natural resources and the formation of national character. No action is good in itself, as Kant supposes. His pietistic youth and his hard life of endless duty and infrequent pleasure gave him a moralistic bent. He came at last to advocate duty for duty's sake, and so fell unwittingly into the arms of Prussian absolutism. There is something of a severe Scotch Calvinism in this opposition of duty to happiness. Kant continues Luther in the Stoic Reformation, as Voltaire continues Montaigne in the Epicurean Renaissance. He represented a stern reaction against the egoism and hedonism in which Helvetius and Holbach had formulated the life of their reckless era, very much as Luther had reacted against the luxury and laxity of Mediterranean Italy. But after a century of reaction against the absolutism of Kant's ethics, we find ourselves again in a welter of urban sensualism and immorality, of ruthless individualism, untempered with democratic conscience or aristocratic honor. And perhaps the day will soon come when a disintegrating civilization will welcome again the Kantian call to duty. The marvel in Kant's philosophy is his vigorous revival in the second critique of those religious ideas of God, freedom, and immortality, which the first critique had apparently destroyed. In Kant's works, says Nietzsche, his critical friend, Paul Rhee, you feel as though you were at a country fair. You can buy from him anything you want, freedom of the will and captivity of the will, idealism and a reputation of idealism, atheism and the good Lord. Like a juggler out of an empty hat, Kant draws out the concept of duty of God, immortality and freedom, to the great surprise of his readers. Schopenhauer too takes a fling at the derivation of immortality from the need of reward. Kant's virtue, which at first bore itself so bravely towards happiness, loses its independence later and holds out its hand for a tip. The great pessimist believes that Kant was really a skeptic who, having abandoned belief himself, hesitated to destroy the faith of the people for fear of the consequence to public morals. Kant discloses the groundlessness of speculative theology and leaves popular theology untouched. Nay, even establishes it in a nobler form as a faith based upon moral feeling. This was afterwards distorted by the philosophers into rational apprehension and consciousness of God, etc., 
While Kant, as he demolished old and revered errors and knew the danger of doing so, rather wished through the moral theology merely to substitute a few weak temporary supports, so that the ruin might not fall upon him, but that he might have time to escape. So too Hein, in what is no doubt an intentional caricature, represents Kant, after having destroyed religion, going out for a walk with his servant Lampe, and suddenly perceiving that the old man's eyes are filled with tears. Then Immanuel Kant has compassion and shows that he is not only a great philosopher, but also a good man, and half kindly, half ironically, he speaks. Old Lampe must have a god or else he cannot be happy, says the practical reason. For my part, the practical reason may then guarantee the existence of God. If these interpretations were true, we should have to call the second critique a transcendental anesthetic. But these adventurous reconstructions of the inner Kant need not be taken too seriously. The fervor of the essay on religion within the limits of pure reason indicates a sincerity too intense to be questioned, and the attempt to change the base of religion from theology to morals, from creeds to conduct, could have come only from a profoundly religious mind. It is indeed true, he wrote to Moses Mendelssohn in 1766, that I think many things with the clearest conviction, which I never have the courage to say, but I will never say anything which I do not think. Naturally, a long and obscure treatise like the Great Critique lends itself to rival interpretations. One of the first reviews of the book, written by Reinhold, a few years after it appeared, said as much as we can say today. The critique of pure reason has been proclaimed by the dogmatists as the attempt of a skeptic who undermines the certainty of all knowledge, by the skeptics as a piece of arrogant presumption that undertakes to erect a new form of dogmatism under the ruins of previous systems, by the supernaturalists as a subtly plotted artifice to displace the historical foundations of religion and to establish naturalism without polemic by the naturalists as a new prop for the dying philosophy of faith, by the materialists as an idealistic contradiction of the reality of matter, by the spiritualists as an unjustifiable limitation of all reality to the corporeal world, concealed under the name of the domain of experience. In truth, the glory of the book lay in its appreciation of all these points of view and to an intelligence as keen as Kant's own, it might well appear that he had really reconciled them all and fused them into such a unity of complex truth as philosophy had not yet seen in all its history before. As to his influence, the entire philosophic thought of the 19th century revolved about his speculations. After Kant, all Germany began to talk metaphysics. Schiller and Goethe studied him. Beethoven quoted with admiration his famous words about the two wonders of life, the starry heavens above, the moral law within, and Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, and Schopenhauer produced in rapid succession great systems of thought reared upon the idealism of the old Konigsberg sage. It was in these balmy days of German metaphysics that Jean-Paul Richter wrote, God has given to the French the land, to the English the sea, to the Germans the empire of the air. Kant's criticism of reason and his exaltation of feeling prepared for the voluntarism of Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. The intuitionism of Bergson and the pragmatism of William James. His identification of the laws of thought with the laws of reality gave to Hegel a whole system of philosophy and his unknowable thing in itself influenced Spencer more than Spencer knew. Much of the obscurity of Carlyle is traceable to his attempt to allegorize the already obscure thought of Goethe and Kant, that diverse religious and philosophies are but the changing garments of one eternal truth. Caird and Green and Wallace and Watson and Bradley and many others in England owe their inspiration to the first critique and even the wildly innovating Nietzsche takes his epistemology from the great Chinaman of Konigsberg, whose static ethics he so excitedly condemns. After a century of struggle between the idealism of Kant, variously reformed, and the materialism of the Enlightenment, variously redressed, the victory seems to lie with Kant. 
Even the great materialist Helvetius wrote paradoxically, Men, if I may dare say it, are the creators of matter. Philosophy will never again be so naive as in her earlier and simpler days. She must always be different hereafter and profounder because Kant lived. 8. A Note on Hegel Not very long ago, it was the custom for historians of philosophy to give to the immediate successors of Kant, to Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, as much honor and space as to all his predecessors in modern thought from Bacon and Descartes to Voltaire and Hume. Our perspective today is a little different, and we enjoy perhaps too keenly the invective leveled by Schopenhauer at his successful rivals in the competition for professional posts. By reading Kant, said Schopenhauer, the public was compelled to see what is obscure is not always without significance. Fichte and Schelling took advantage of this, and excogitated magnificent spiderwebs of metaphysics But the height of audacity in serving up pure nonsense and stringing together senseless and extravagant mazes of words, such as had previously been known only in madhouses, was finally reached in Hegel and became the instrument of the most barefaced general mystification that has ever taken place, with a result which will appear fabulous to posterity and will remain as a monument to German stupidity. Is this fair? George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel was born at Stuttgart in 1770. His father was a subordinate official in the Department of Finances of the state of Württemberg, and Hegel himself grew up with the patient and methodical habits of those civil servants whose modest efficiency has given Germany the best-governed cities in the world. The youth was a tireless student. He made full analysis of all the important books he read and copied out long passages. True culture, he said, must begin with resolute self-effacement, as in the Pythagorean system of education where the pupil for the first five years was required to keep his peace. His studies of Greek literature gave him an enthusiasm for Attic culture which remained with him when almost all other enthusiasms had died away. At the name of Greece, he wrote, the cultivated German finds himself at home. Europeans have their religion from a further source, from the East. But what is here, what is present, science and art, all that makes life satisfying and elevates and adorns it, we derive directly or indirectly from Greece. For a time, he preferred the religion of the Greeks to Christianity, and he anticipated Strauss and Renan by writing a life of Jesus in which Jesus was taken as the son of Mary and Joseph, and the miraculous element was ignored. Later, he destroyed the book. In politics, too, he showed a spirit of rebellion hardly to be suspected from his later sanctification of the status quo. While studying for the ministry at Tübingen, he and Schelling hotly defended the French Revolution and went out early one morning to plant a liberty tree in the marketplace. The French nation, by the path of its revolution, he wrote, has been freed from many institutions which the spirit of man has left behind like its baby shoes, and which therefore weighed upon it, as they still weigh upon others like lifeless feathers. It was in those hopeful days, when to be young was very heaven, that he flirted like Fichte with a kind of aristocratic socialism, and gave himself, with characteristic vigor, to the romantic current in which all Europe was engulfed. He was graduated from Tübingen in 1793 with a certificate stating that he was a man of good parts and character, well up in theology and philology, but with no ability in philosophy. He was poor now and had to earn his bread by tutoring in Bern and Frankfurt. These were his chrysalis years. While Europe tore itself into nationalist pieces, Hegel gathered himself together and grew. Then, 1799, his father died and Hegel, falling heir to some $1,500, considered himself a rich man and gave up tutoring. He wrote to his friend Schelling for advice as to where to settle and asked for a place where there would be simple food, abundant books, and ein gutes Bier. Schelling recommended Jena, 
which was a university town under the jurisdiction of the Duke of Weimar. At Jena, Schiller was teaching history. Tiek, Novalis, and the Schlegels were preaching Romanticism, and Fichte and Schelling were propounding their philosophies. There, Hegel arrived in 1801 and in 1803 became a teacher at the university. He was still there in 1806 when Napoleon's victory over the Prussians threw the scholarly little city into confusion and terror. French soldiers invaded Hegel's home, and he took to his heels like a philosopher carrying with him the manuscript of his first important book, The Phenomenology of Spirit. For a while, he was so destitute that Goethe told Nebel to lend him a few dollars to tide him over. Hegel wrote almost bitterly to Nebel, I have made my guiding star the biblical saying, the truth of which I have learned by experience. Seek ye first food and clothing, and the kingdom of heaven shall be added unto you. For a while, he edited a paper at Bamberg. Then, in 1812, he became head of the gymnasium at Nuremberg. It was there, perhaps, that the stoic necessities of administrative work cooled the fires of romanticism in him and made him, like Napoleon and Goethe, a classic vestige in a romantic age. And it was there that he wrote his Logic, 1812-16, to which captivated Germany by its unintelligibility and won him the chair of philosophy at Heidelberg. At Heidelberg, he wrote his immense Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences, 1817, on the strength of which he was promoted in 1818 to the University of Berlin. From that time till the end of his life, he ruled the philosophic world as indisputably as Goethe, the world of literature, and Beethoven, the realm of music. His birthday came on the day after Goethe's, and proud Germany made a double holiday for them every year. A Frenchman once asked Hegel to put his philosophy into one sentence, and he did not succeed so well as the monk who, asked to define Christianity while standing on one foot, said simply, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Hegel preferred to answer in ten volumes, and when they were written and published and all the world was talking about them, he complained that only one man understands me, and even he does not. Note, ruthless critics, as we might have expected, challenge the authenticity of this story. Most of his writings, like Aristotle's, consist of his lecture notes, or worse, of the notes taken by students who heard his lectures. Only the logic and the phenomenology are from his hand, and these are masterpieces of obscurity, darkened by abstractness and condensation of style, by a weirdly original terminology, and by an over-careful modification of every statement with a gothic wealth of limiting clauses. Hegel described his work as an attempt to teach philosophy to speak in German. He succeeded. The logic is an analysis not of methods of reasoning, but of the concepts used in reasoning. These Hegel takes to be the categories named by Kant, being, quality, quantity, relation, etc. It is the first business of philosophy to dissect these basic notions that are so bandied about in all our thinking. The most pervasive of them all is relation. Every idea is a group of relations. We can think of something only by relating it to something else and perceiving its similarities and its differences. An idea without relations of any kind is empty. This is all that is meant by saying that pure being and nothing are the same. Being absolutely devoid of relations or qualities does not exist and has no meaning whatever. This proposition led to an endless progeny of witticisms which still breed, and it proved to be at once an obstacle and a lure to the study of Hegel's thought. Of all relations, the most universal is that of contrast or opposition. Every condition of thought or of things, every idea and every situation in the world leads irresistibly to its opposite, and then unites with it to form a higher or more complex whole. This dialectical movement runs through everything that Hegel wrote. It is an old thought, of course, foreshadowed by Empedocles and embodied in the golden mean of Aristotle, who wrote that the knowledge of opposites is one. The truth, like an electron, is an organic unity of opposed parts. The truth of conservatism and radicalism is liberalism, an open mind and a cautious hand, an open hand and a cautious mind. 
the formation of our opinions on large issues is a decreasing oscillation between extremes. And in all debatable questions, veritas in medio stat, the movement of evolution is a continuous development of oppositions and their merging and reconciliation. Schelling was right. There is an underlying identity of opposites, and Fichte was right. Thesis, antithesis, and synthesis constitute the formula and secret of all development and all reality. For not only do thoughts develop and evolve according to this dialectical movement, but things do equally. Every condition of affairs contains a contradiction which evolution must resolve by reconciling unity. So no doubt our present social system secretes a self-corroding contradiction. The stimulating individualism required in a period of economic adolescence and unexploited resources arouses, in a later age, the aspiration for a cooperative commonwealth, and the future will see neither the present reality nor the visioned ideal, but a synthesis in which something of both will come together to beget a higher life. And that higher stage, too, will divide into a productive contradiction and rise to still loftier levels of organization, complexity, and unity. The movement of thought, then, is the same as the movement of things. In each, there is a dialectical progression from unity through diversity to diversity in unity. Thought and being follow the same law, and logic and metaphysics are one. Mind is the indispensable organ for the perception of this dialectical process and this unity and difference. The function of the mind and the task of philosophy is to discover the unity that lies potential in diversity. The task of ethics is to unify character and conduct. And the task of politics is to unify individuals into a state. The task of religion is to reach and feel that absolute in which all opposites are resolved into unity. That great sum of being in which matter and mind, subject and object, good and evil, are one. God is the system of relationships in which all things move and have their being and their significance. In man, the absolute rises to self-consciousness and becomes the absolute idea. That is, thought realizing itself as part of the absolute, transcending individual limitations and purposes, and catching, underneath the universal strife, the hidden harmony of all things. Reason is the substance of the universe. The design of the world is absolutely rational. Not that strife and evil are mere negative imaginings. They are real enough, but they are, in wisdom's perspective, stages to fulfillment and the good. Struggle is the law of growth. Character is built in the storm and stress of the world, and the man reaches his full height only through compulsions, responsibilities, and suffering. Even pain has its rationale. It is a sign of life and a stimulus to reconstruction. Passion also has a place in the reason of things. Nothing great in the world has been accomplished without passion. And even the egoistic ambitions of a Napoleon contribute unwittingly to the development of nations. Life is not made for happiness, but for achievement. The history of the world is not the theater of happiness. Periods of happiness are blank pages in it, or they are periods of harmony. And this dull content is unworthy of a man. History is made only in those periods in which the contradictions of reality are being resolved by growth, as the hesitations and awkwardness of youth pass into the ease and order of maturity. History is a dialectical movement, almost a series of revolutions, in which people after people and genius after genius becomes the instrument of the absolute. The great men are not so much begetters as midwives of the future. What they bring forth is mothered by the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. The genius merely places another stone on the pile, as others have done. Somehow his has the good fortune to come last, and when he places his stone, the arch stands self-supported. Such individuals had no consciousness of the general idea they were unfolding. But they had an insight into the requirements of the time, what was ripe for development. This was the very truth for their age, for their world, the species next in order, so to speak, and which was already formed in the womb of time. Such a philosophy of history seems to lead to revolutionary conclusions. The dialectical process makes change the cardinal principle of life. No condition is permanent. 
In every state of things there is a contradiction which only the strife of opposites can resolve. The deepest law of politics, therefore, is freedom, an open avenue to change. History is the growth of freedom, and the state is, or should be, freedom organized. On the other hand, the doctrine that the real is rational has a conservative color. Every condition, though destined to disappear, has the divine right that belongs to it as a necessary stage in evolution. In a sense, it is brutally true that whatever is, is right. And as unity is the goal of development, order is the first requisite of liberty. If Hegel inclined in his later years to the conservative rather than to the radical implications of his philosophy— it was partly because the spirit of the age, to use his own historic phrase, was weary of too much change. After the revolution of 1830, he wrote, Finally, after forty years of war and immeasurable confusion, an old heart might rejoice to see an end of it all and the beginning of a period of peaceful satisfaction. It was not quite in order that the philosopher of strife, as the dialectic of growth, should become the advocate of content. But at sixty, a man has a right to ask for peace. Nevertheless, the contradictions in Hegel's thought were too deep for peace, and in the next generation, his followers split with dialectical fatality into the Hegelian right and the Hegelian left. Weiss and the younger Fichte found in the theory of the real as rational a philosophical expression of the doctrine of providence and justification for a politics of absolute obedience. Feuerbach, Molschott, Bauer, and Marx returned to the skepticism and higher criticism of Hegel's youth and developed the philosophy of history into a theory of class struggles leading by Hegelian necessity to socialism inevitable. In place of the absolute as determining history through the zeitgeist, Marx offered mass movements and economic forces as the basic causes of every fundamental change, whether in the world of things or in the life of thought. Hegel, the imperial professor, had hatched the socialistic eggs. The old philosopher denounced the radicals as dreamers and carefully hid away his early essays. He allied himself with the Prussian government, blessed it as the latest expression of the absolute, and basked in the sun of its academic favors. His enemies called him the official philosopher. He began to think of the Hegelian system as part of the natural laws of the world. He forgot that his own dialectic condemned his thought to impermanence and decay. Never did philosophy assume such a lofty tone, and never were its royal honors so fully recognized and secured as in 1830, in Berlin. But Hegel aged rapidly in those happy years. He became as absent-minded as a storybook genius. Once he entered the lecture room with only one shoe having left the other unnoticed in the mud. When the cholera epidemic came to Berlin in 1831, his weakened body was one of the first to succumb to the contagion. After only a day's illness, he passed away suddenly and quietly in his sleep. Just as the space of a year had seen the birth of Napoleon, Beethoven, and Hegel, so in the years from 1827 to 1832, Germany lost Goethe, Hegel, and Beethoven. It was the end of an epoch the last fine effort of Germany's greatest age.